Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe McNabb, Northeast Indemnity, Johnny. Oh, hi, Joe. What's up? At the moment, my blood pressure. Too much work? No. Prospect of having to pay off on a $100,000 life insurance policy. Uh Uh-oh. Fella, I think you know, Johnny. Art Wesley. Oh, sure. Been a pal of mine for years. Reporter. Yeah. Apparently, he's working on a story right now that somebody doesn't want him to report. What do you mean? Night before last, he got beat up in an alley. Yesterday, a car made a pass at him at high speed. What about today? It's early yet, Johnny. Oh, yeah, sure. But let's hope it's not too late. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northeast Indemnity Affiliates, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Big Scoop matter. Expense account item one, $18.40. Transportation and incidentals to New York City. I called Art Wesley's paper. He wasn't in and nobody seemed to know where he was. Then I remembered a small bar called Tony's over on 3rd Avenue. I took a cab. That's item two, a dollar and a quarter, and found him in a corner booth. Sorry, Johnny, no bodyguard. The informants I'm working with will take off fast if they spotted one. No informants, no story. That insurance policy your paper took out on you. Who's the beneficiary? A dear departed wife, Joan. Departed? I thought... We split up a couple of months ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Art. Yeah, we were living in two different worlds. I wanted a home and family. She wanted a trip to the moon every night. Where is she now? Who knows? On her way to the moon, I guess. Hey, look. This story you're working on, Art... It's hot, Johnny. And big, real big. A national gambling syndicate. And run by a guy right here in New York. Who? I'm getting close, but I'm not sure yet. When I am, then out come my articles. What's this guy going to do when you push him into a corner? Look, I'm worried about you. You look, Johnny, I'm not as foolish as you think. I've got his name written down and put in a safe deposit box with what evidence I got. That's my real insurance. Oh, all right, look, we've been friends a long time. I'm not going to let you do this alone. Sorry, Johnny. I've got to go it alone. Since I'd gotten nowhere with Art, I decided to try his wife, Joan, even though they were separated. I found her in an apartment on East 68th, but she was hardly what you'd call cooperative. Look, Mr. Dollar, so you're a friend of Art's. At the moment, I'm not. Mrs. Wesley, your marriage with Art is none of my business. But that insurance policy his paper took out on him is. And incidentally, you're still the beneficiary. So? So he could be in danger, those articles he's writing. Why doesn't he drop it? Oh, look, you know Art better than that. Then what am I supposed to do about it? That story is his business. How I feel about things is my business. And come to think of it, I can't see that either of those things is your business. Item three, a dollar eighty cab fare to police headquarters in the office of my old friend, Detective Lieutenant Rastelli. Sure, sure, I know about those attempts on Art's life. So I talked to him and got nowhere. He told me the stories about a national gambling syndicate. It's more than he told me. Supposedly the big boss is here in New York. Now, what are you going to do about it? Look, the minute Art quits thinking he's got to hit the jackpot all by himself and lets us in on it, we'll give him all the protection he... Lieutenant Rostelli. Yeah, yeah, just a minute. It's for you, Johnny. Oh, thanks. Hello? Art Wesley, Johnny. They told me at your hotel where to reach you. Anything new, Art? I'm leaving town for a few hours. This could be it, Johnny. Tonight could be the jackpot. Well, listen, let me go with you. Sorry, I gotta go alone. It's part of the deal. Art, it could be a trap. I can take care of myself. Call you when I get back. Wish me luck. Well, look, wait. Art! Art! <laughs> Item four, a dollar eighty cab to Art's apartment, where I persuaded the manager to let me in. I was looking for anything that would give me a lead. Then, near the phone on a scratch pad, I found where he'd written the word Watika several times. Sure, Lake Watika, upstate. Art had a lodge there. Item five, twenty-five dollars even for a rented car. It was a three-hour drive to Lake Watika, which was bad enough. But to top it off, it started to rain and rain hard. Hey, 
When I finally got to the highway turn off, the side road to the lake was a mass of mud. Then I got two quick breaks. It stopped raining, and I spotted the six-mile road into Art's place. Half an hour further on, I saw a light. Art's car was parked at one side, and the front door of the lodge was wide open. When I got to it, I saw why. Art was lying in the doorway. Yeah. He was the one who wanted to hit the jackpot. But you can't hit the jackpot with a slug, particularly when that slug is right between your eyes. I drove to the sheriff's office and reported it. Sheriff Tompkins and his boys took over. But in the darkness and the mud, they could only make a routine check. He asked me to meet him at the lodge the next morning, so I did. Uh, uh, Buddy was right here in the doorway, huh, son? Yeah, Sheriff, I didn't move it. And uh, Wesley probably got shot when he answered the door by somebody standing out there on the ground. Because of that bullet hole in the roof? Yeah, right over that shelf that's stocked with canned goods, sugar, salt, and the like. Apparently, he used this place regular. Yeah, he used to do some of his writing here. Were you able to determine time of death? Coroner says between 10.30 and 11 last night. Uh, What time did you arrive? About half an hour after the rain stopped. I'd say quarter to 12. Means it was uh, still raining a good half hour after the killing. Uh, No wonder we found no tracks. Hey, look, Sheriff. Art was working on a hot story about a national gambling syndicate. Could be that he found out who the boss was last night, the hard way. Oh? Then uh, you think the killer was from out of town, maybe New York? Yeah. Yeah. Now, where would he stay? Is there a hotel around here? Lake Watika Inn, just outside the village, about six miles from here. Sheriff, I'll check it out. The guests here at the inn, Mr. Dollar, well, we have only two who checked in yesterday. It's the off-season, of course. Yeah, clerk, who are they? Well, uh, Mr. Cooper, yesterday afternoon, and a Mr. Buckley, around dark. Uh Uh-huh. Are they still here? Mr. Cooper is sitting right out there on the terrace, but... uh, Mr. Buckley paid in advance and left quite early this morning. I see. Did Buckley give any reason for stopping here? He said he was a traveling man and didn't like to drive in the rain. (laughs) Okay, okay. I'd like you to write down a description of him. I'll pick it up on the way out. Oh, I'll be glad to, sir. Hi. Oh, good morning. Enjoying the scenery? Yes, immensely. Oh, sit down, won't you? Sure, thanks. My name's Dollar. Mine's Cooper. You just check in? I'll just drop by. Uh, I came yesterday. Uh Uh-huh. Pretty up here this time of year. Yes. Yes, certainly is. I I really enjoy places like this in the off-season. It's a nice change. Too bad the weather hasn't been better, huh? The rainstorm last night? (laughs) Oh, I enjoyed that, too. You were out in it? Oh, no. (laughs) <laughs> no. No, I enjoyed it the way a storm should be enjoyed. In front of the fireplace in my cottage with a drink and a good book. No, Mr. Dollar, I stayed in last night. And that was that. I picked up the description of the other guest, Buckley, from the clerk, and gave it to Sheriff Tompkins, who got out a bullet mine. Then I drove back to New York City, turned in my rented car, and took a cab. That's item six, a dollar seventy, to Joan Wesley's apartment. Yes. They notified me this morning about Art's death. I don't know what to say. What is there to say? (laughs) Good question, Mrs. Wesley. If only he hadn't been so stubborn. If only he'd given up that story about the gambling syndicate or whatever it was. Yeah. You, uh, you figure somebody in the syndicate killed him? Why, of course. Mrs. Wesley, did you know Art had gone on up to the lodge at Lake Watika? No. Mr. Dollar, I'm rather tired. One more thing. Did you go out last night? No. It was raining. I stayed here in the apartment. All evening? All evening. I see. Well, thanks, Mrs. Wesley. Maybe I was imagining, but it seemed to me Joan Wesley hesitated just a little before telling me she hadn't been out of her apartment last night. And if she had gone to Lake Watika, I checked the basement garage. Her car was clean. Too clean. 
Item 7, $5 to the garage attendant for some very interesting information. Joan Wesley had ordered her car washed first thing this morning. Why? Because the wheels were covered with mud from last night. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Better schools mean better citizens, better neighbors, better families. But we can't expect our children to respond, to learn and grow, if we ourselves are indifferent to their school environment. CBS Radio urges that you write to Better Schools, 9 East 40th Street, New York 60, New York, for information about how citizens can spark community action to improve their schools. That address again is Better Schools, 9 East 40th Street, New York 16, New York. Now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Big Scoop Matter. I tell you, I didn't leave this apartment last night. Your car says differently, Joan. Car. You had it washed today because it was all muddy. And the reason it was muddy was because you had it out in the rain last night. Look, Another I... thing. You told me you didn't know Art had gone to the lodge. You hadn't heard from him. But the switchboard operator told me you had a call from him yesterday. Now, why else would he call you except to tell you where he was going? Well, how about it, Joan? All right. Art did call me yesterday and told me he was going to Lake Watika. And how about last night? Yes. I went out, but not to Lake Watika. Art wouldn't give you a divorce. By killing him, you get your freedom and a hundred thousand bucks. I didn't kill Art. I didn't go up there last night. And where did you go? Might as well know. The reason I wanted a divorce from Art was because I'd found someone else. Oh? That's where I went for a few minutes last evening. Why did you lie about the phone call from Art yesterday? I don't know. I don't know. I was confused. I was... I was afraid it would look bad for me if it came out that I knew Art had gone up there. It doesn't look good for you this way, believe me. Oh, Johnny, I'm telling the truth. Who is this fellow you're interested in? I don't see why he Who is he? His name is Ted Nash. Will will you have to talk to him? I sure will. And right now. But I was wrong about talking to Ted Nash right now. I called his apartment and got no answer. Item 9 and dollar sixty cab fare to police headquarters in the office of Detective Lieutenant Rostelli. You figure this guy Nash and John Wesley could have killed Art and used a gambling syndicate threat as a cover, huh? It's a possibility, Lieutenant. Well, I'll see what I can find out about Nash. How'd you do at Lake Watika? Two guests checked in the day of the killing. One, a man named Buckley. He left early this morning. Sheriff Tompkins has a bullet knot on him. Who else? A fellow named Cooper, who apparently likes to go places in the off-season. Nothing to tie him in particularly. Cooper? We had a rumble some time ago that a guy named Cooper was involved in that gambling syndicate. What? The trouble is, we got no proof. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? I told me he'd put the name of the man he was after in a safe deposit box. If we could find the key to that box. How about Art's apartment? Let's take a look. So we looked, and we found the key, tucked away in a desk, but only a number on it. Nothing to tell where it was located. I gave it to Lieutenant Rostelli, and he promised to check every bank in town if necessary. While I went on back to Lake Watika to see if the man named Cooper at the inn was the same one Rostelli told me about. When I got there, after a frantic three-hour drive, I found him comfortably sitting by the fireplace. Well, uh, Mr. Dollar, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Cooper, I want to get right to the point. You told me you came up here to enjoy the scenery. Yes, that's right. Why? The man who was killed last night, Art Wesley, he was trying to expose a national gambling syndicate. Oh, that's very interesting. So? So, I know a police detective in New York who thinks you're a member of that syndicate. Well, now, Mr. Dollar, that's a very serious charge. I presume you have proof. Well? Uh-huh. No proof. Well, in that case, I don't Mr. think there's any... Dollar, any... Uh, long-distance call for you. You can take it on that phone right beside you. Thanks, Clark. Johnny Dollar. Rostelli in New York, Johnny. Hi, Lieutenant. You locate that... Yeah, the safe deposit box. And in it, we found the name of the man Art Wesley was closing in on. It's Cooper. Thanks very right, much. So you... Well, Cooper, 
You want a proof? We've got it. Evidence that ties you in with the syndicate clerk. Well, now, this is ridiculous. Is it? Let me tell you the facts about this thing. Is is something the matter, Mr. Dollar? Get Sheriff Tompkins on the phone, clerk. Tell him I've got Art Wesley's killer here. You mean Mr. Cooper? Oh, now, wait a minute. Now, look, Dollar... If you'd get your facts straight, you'd drop this silly notion of yours. What kind of facts, Cooper? What time was Wesley killed? Between 10.30 and 11 last night. But, Mr. Dollar, Mr. Wesley's place is some six miles from here. That's right. Why? Well, then Mr. Cooper couldn't have killed him. What do you mean? Last night, I took a drink to Mr. Cooper's cottage here at the inn. What time? Around 20 to 11, and I chatted with him for at least 15 minutes. Are you sure about that? Oh, quite sure. Well, Mr. Dollar, I'll buy you a drink sometime. Cooper strolled back to the bar with a satisfied smirk on his face. So the one man who had to be Art's killer couldn't have killed him. I collared the clerk again and had him repeat his story in detail. If you recall, it rained heavily last night, Mr. Dollar. Yes, yes, I drove through it on my way up here. Well, I was making the rounds of the inn, checking windows, things like that, when the house phone rang. It was Mr. Cooper calling from his cottage. He wanted a drink. You say that was at 20 to 11? Uh, Yes, I always jot down the time when I am called away from the desk. All right, go on, go on. Well, when I got to Mr. Cooper's cottage, he was sitting in the living room in front of the fire with a book. Yeah. We chatted a while, and then when I returned here to the desk, I jotted down the time again. 10.55. Well, that does it. What do you mean? Oh, it's a good 20-minute drive from here to Art Wesley's lodge. If he was killed between 10.30 and 11, and Cooper was here at that time, he, he couldn't have done it. Well, I'm sorry, but facts are facts. Oh, excuse me. Lake Watika Inn. Uh, yes, just a moment. Sheriff Tompkins, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Hi, Sheriff. Thought you ought to know, son. Remember that man Buckley we were looking for? Yeah, sure, the other guest at the inn. Yeah, we picked him up. I've been questioning him for an hour. Any luck? No, sir. He's just a traveling salesman who stayed at the inn because he didn't want to drive in the rain. You sure? Buckley swears he doesn't even know Cooper. Just between you and me, Johnny... I think we got the wrong fella. No place again. I decided to start all over. Got into my car and drove to Art Wesley's place. Nothing was changed. I remember the trip I'd made the night he was killed, how it rained heavily until about half an hour before I arrived. How I'd found him lying in the open doorway, a bullet hole in his head. Yeah, and the hole in the ceiling over the shelf of provisions, marking the path of the bullet. It was there, so were the provisions... Canned food, mustard, sugar, package of crackers. There was some... Wait a minute. Sugar. The sugar bowl. I stared at it for a moment. I remembered a couple of things the room clerk at the inn had told me. And suddenly the whole deal slid neatly and quietly into place. I drove back to the inn fast. Cooper's cottage was empty, so I went inside to the bedroom and took a look around. Then I spotted one of the pictures on the wall, a little out of place. I looked behind it. Yeah, just what I expected. Outside, I found Cooper sitting on the terrace in front of the main building. I slid into a chair across from him. Well, Mr. Dollar, what fantastic crime are you going to accuse me of today? Cooper, I got a one-track mind, and it's still stuck on murder. Oh, now, look. Dollar, we've been over this before, and personally, I I find it quite boring. So much so that it's interfering with my vacation here. That's too bad. Yes, it is. So I'm leaving this evening. I don't think so, Cooper. Oh, come now. Art Wesley was trying to expose a figure in a gambling syndicate. You. Well, that's a matter of conjecture. You had to stop him for keeps. Oh, now, look, Dollar. The time of Art Wesley's death has been established as between 10.30 and 11 last night. That's right, between 10.30 and 11 last night. And I'm sure you remember the room clerk telling you he was with me in my cottage living room from 10.40 to 10.55. I sure do. So that I certainly couldn't have killed your friend Wesley six miles from here during that time. Except that Art Wesley wasn't killed at his lodge. What are you talking about? You see, I remembered something else the clerk had told me. The night of the killing had stopped raining a little after 11. All right, what difference does that make? All the difference in the world, believe me. Here's what really happened, Cooper. 
You killed Art Wesley in the bedroom of your cottage here at the inn. I don't mean to read. You immediately called the room clerk over and chatted with him in your living room for about 15 minutes. He didn't know there was a corpse in the next room. Oh, really? After he left, you took Wesley's body the six miles to his place and planted it in the doorway. Well, now, look, Don, Your I problem th- was to make it look like he'd been killed there. Then you remembered. The slug that had killed him hit the wall in your bedroom. That gave you an idea. You figured out the right angle at the lodge and fired a shot upwards from the outside the door. It went through the ceiling at the back. All right, Dollar, I've had enough of your half-baked theories with no proof whatsoever to back them up. Correction, Cooper, this time I've got proof. There was a shelf of food under the bullet hole and a bowl of sugar directly under it. A bowl of... So what? When sugar gets wet, it gets crusty and it stays that way. But the sugar in that bowl was dry. Now, if the killing was between 10.30 and 11 and it rained heavily until after 11, then some rain would have dropped through the bullet hole into the sugar. I see. But, Cooper, the sugar was dry. So the bullet hole was made after the time of the murder when you planted Wesley's body there. Just a little detail, Cooper, but it nails you. That and, of course, the fact I found the slug that really killed Wesley just a couple of minutes ago. Buried in the wall of your bedroom behind a picture. You'd move slightly to cover it. Well, Dollar, I may as well tell you that I saw you come out of my cottage a few minutes ago. I figured you knew... So ever since you sat down here, I've been holding a gun on you under the table. You know, Cooper, I may as well tell you. Ever since I sat down here, I've been holding a gun on you, too. Well, you... Let's have it. Well, you... You didn't have any gun. A big-time gambler bluffed right out of the game. Cooper, you're slipping. Item 10, 3750. Transportation and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total $187.40. Remarks? Cooper's awaiting trial. About Art Wesley? Well, I guess that sugar bowl was a dead man's revenge. And come to think of it, that revenge was pretty sweet. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. In days long since gone by, one had to go out in search of daring do. But in a fast-moving world, exciting things are happening right around the clock. Things you can be in on no matter what else you're doing, as long as your radio is nearby. With CBS Newsmen on the job, you can make CBS Radio your listening post for world events. Stay tuned now for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by the FBI in Peace and War. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, colorful New Orleans, from nightlife in the Latin Quarter to the dismal, deadly swamps. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Russell Thorson, Barney Phillips, Stacey Harris, Larry Thor, Parley Bear, and Les Tremaine. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman here. Foreman? Uh, Tri-State Life and Casualty. I'm the branch office manager down here. Oh, sorry, Mr. Foreman, but the answer is no. Well, this is an arson case, Dollar, and we're already having to make one payoff on it. I'm sorry, but it'll have to wait. I'm going to get as far away from this New England winter as I can. Well, for that, I don't blame you, but there's no reason you shouldn't come Look, I've had a rough year of it. I'm tired and I'm cold. And unless I can get down to where the warm, balmy breezes waft in... Dollar, I have got to have you on this case. There's a lot at stake. Now, my office is down here in... No, sir, I'm sorry. You see... Down here in Sarasota. I just can't do it, Mr. Foreman. I've already made a plane reservation for Sarasota, Florida. And this is one time I'm going to... Where did you say your branch office is? Sarasota, Florida. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the burning car matter. Expense account item one, which I'd thought I was going to have to absorb myself. $129, transportation and incidentals to Sarasota, Florida. It was nearly 5 p.m. when I got there, so instead of checking into a hotel, I taxied, that's item two, a dollar even, I taxied to Earl Poorman's office in the Conroy building. He turned out to be a tall, lanky, easygoing fellow with clear blue eyes and a ready smile. Sit in an office and talk business this time of day? You're in Florida now, Johnny. Well, I thought from your call this was a pretty urgent matter, Mr. Poorman. It is. Arson, you said. Yeah, probably, but here's no reason we can't go out to my little shack on the key and be comfortable while we talk about it. Besides, Michael wants you for dinner. Mike? Uh, my wife, Gertrude. Oh. Uh, come on, my jalopy's right out at the curb. Come on, Johnny. <laughs> Poor man was a misnomer for this man because his jalopy turned out to be a spanking new Cadillac, complete with air conditioning and all the fixings. And the shack, anything but. It was on St. Armand's Key across Sarasota Bay from the mainland, a beautiful two-story concrete and stucco job. The big yard backed on a quiet bayou, and there tied up at a private dock was a 24-foot lap strake speedboat, ideal for fishing the Gulf of Mexico. After all, as long as you're down here on expense account. Yeah, but it's charged to your company, remember? Oh. <laughs> hey, there she is at the door. Huh? The big, fat, overbearing broad I'm married to. This was another switch. For Earl's wife standing in the doorway was the cutest little trick I'd seen in a long time. Petite, pretty, and blonde, and with eyes that you notice right away because they were almost green. Eyes that suddenly narrowed as she looked at me. And I wondered why. Johnny? Dollar, did you say? That's right. Insurance investigator down here to look into those fires. Oh. Any objections? No. No, of course not. Just set your bags here in the hall, Johnny. All right, thanks. And wouldn't you like a drink after your long trip? Yeah, and you can get me one, too. Scotch, Johnny? Martin ZVO. Oh, great. Well, soda, please. Uh, sit down, sit down. Thanks. I, uh, I take it Mike isn't too interested in the insurance business, huh? <laughs> Uh, you know, she used to be a singer, dancer. Oh, well, this is a little different. But now, tell me all. Well, actually, I guess we ought to wait until Arnold Carr gets back. Carr? Uh, Carr Brothers, Lumber Enterprises. Arnold runs the business, and his brother Edward... (laughs) Well, Ed just shares the profits. Real black sheep of the family, from what I've been able to learn. Oh. Anyway, they have yards all over the state. There's one here in Sarasota, one up the coast a ways at Fort Pierce, and still another at Arcadia. That's about 40 miles inland, just east of here. And there was one up in Orlando. Was? Completely destroyed by fire a couple of weeks ago. And a $120,000 claim has been filed. A hundred and... Wow. That's where Arnold Carr is then, in Orlando, trying to clear things up. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. Here, Earl. Yeah, well, to the gods and goddesses and us. But shouldn't I be up in Orlando then? Uh, Arnold's on his way back here now. He lives here. 
He just went up there to arrange for clearing off and selling the property. You mean he's planning to just pocket the money? If Tri-State pays off, I mean. Looks like it. But I take it you suspect arson. Yes, Earl suspects arson, Johnny, and so does Arnold Carr. At least he says he does, but they have no reason. No? How about the other fires? Or attempted fires? Oh, where? At Arcadia, for one, but they got it out in time. At least that's the way Arnold Carr reported it. The way he Let tells me it... tell it, Mike. Oh. There was another at the yard here in Sarasota. Arnold himself discovered it one night when he was just driving around. But nothing to indicate it was attempted arson. No, well, and it... the authorities up in Orlando found no indication of it there. Mike, you know as well as I do that a lumberyard fire will obliterate signs of arson better than any other kind of fire in the world. Yeah, but she has a point, though, Earl. Unless there's some evidence of arson. Of course. Yeah, why send for me? Well, mostly because... Actually, because Arnold Carr suspects him. But he's given you no real reason. None at all. I think he has a real reason, but he just won't tell us. Wait till you see him. He's going to call when he gets in. We'll run over to his place on Longboat Key. What about his brother? Edward, did you say? I've never met him. He's always stayed in Orlando. I was wondering if he might tell things that Arnold is holding back. Oh, Ed... Edward Carr wouldn't know anything. Uh, you can never be too sure. Uh, look, why can't you agree with me for a... Uh, that must be Arnie now. Excuse me. Hello? Uh, this is Arnold Carr. Oh, hi, Arnie. Uh, Johnny Dollar arrived, so we'll be... Uh, well, here, I'll let you talk to him. Here, Johnny. Uh, no. Okay. No, Earl, listen. What? Uh, I told you before it was arson. It was arson again tonight. Tonight? What's that? Arcadia just went up in flames. The whole yard. Good Lord. Did you hear that, Johnny? Yeah, I heard it. Well, can you prove it was arson uh, tonight in Arcadia and before in Orlando? I... I have proof. Well, Arnie, we'll be over just as fast no. as... No. What? No. Wait for me there at your home. Well, but look now... You mustn't come here. And I, I mustn't stay here because I... I... Uh, now, listen, man. You, uh, uh, Arnie? Well, I guess he's ready to tell us now. A suspicion began to grow in my mind. A suspicion that Mike apparently shared with me. That Arnold Carr himself might be responsible for the fires. After all, he was the only one who had seemed to know about the two unsuccessful attempts. He himself had planted the idea of arson. He'd lost no time in filing claim for the Orlando burnout. But Earl said I was wrong. Arnold was too honest a man. Earl had also said we were only 15 minutes from Carr's home. So when half an hour passed, we called him back. Got a busy signal. After the fourth try, the three of us took off in Earl's cab. As we pulled into Carr's driveway, we could see him through the picture window, sitting at his desk, telephone in hand, apparently engrossed in a call. Then, as we walked up to the door, I noticed something else. Arnold Carr looked enough like me to be my brother. Maybe that explained Mike's reaction when she first saw me. Hey, Arnie. Can't you see? He's on the phone in there. Well, the least he can do is hear his own doorbell. Earl, wait. Good Lord. What's the matter? Through the window. Oh, no. Earl? Stand back. Earl, for heaven's sake, what is it? Couldn't you see from out there? No, what's wrong? I... Oh, he's... Well, Johnny... Right through the forehead, Earl. Looks like a thirty-eight. Before I could stop him, Earl took the phone out of the dead man's hand and called headquarters. Mike turned pale and slumped into a chair. And I gave the place a quick rundown, checked doors, windows, etc. A few minutes later, an officious young sergeant named Larkin arrived and took over. Thirty-eight caliber straight through the middle of the forehead. Were all three of you here when it happened? Mr. Foreman, Mrs. Foreman, and uh, who are you? The answer to your first question, Sergeant, is no, none of us was here. And this is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Hiya. You insurance guys work pretty fast. You related to Mr. Carr? No, why? You look a little like him. Who busted in the front door? The killer? I did. When we drove up, we saw Mr. Carr sitting there at his desk. We rang the doorbell and knocked, but... And when he didn't move, you took things in your own hands and busted in, huh? That's right. You haven't moved anything, have you? No. Except I took the phone out of his hand to call you. Dollar, if you're any kind of investigator, you should have known better than let him touch anything. Now, now, let's see. The shot must have come from somewhere near this window by the fire. Ah, oh, sure, here we are. Bullet hole right through the pane. Bullet was fired from outside. 
You're sure, Sergeant? Sure, I'm sure. Look for yourself. You call yourself an investigator? Hey, Cummings, will they? Check the area around that window beside the chimney out there for footprints. Maybe an empty cartridge case. Now, you folks get out of here so I can call Doc Hanley over and get on with my investigation. And no, Dollar, I don't need any of your help. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Your job is fires, not... Hey, where did Mrs. Foreman go? Out to the car. Why? Who told her she could leave? Who told her she had to sit here looking at a corpse? All right, Dollar, all right. Just be sure the three of you stick around town in case I decide to question you further. Oh, of course, Sergeant. Yeah. Yeah. Not shot by somebody standing outside? What do you mean, Johnny? Oh, I spotted that bullet hole in the window, too. So? I also noticed there were no particles of glass on the inside sill. But there were some on the outside. Yeah. The shot that made that hole was fired from inside that room to make it look as though it had come from outside. Then somebody was in there with Arnold Carr. Yeah. Either somebody he let in or who had normal access to the house. And he had to stop Arnold from talking about the fire in Arcadia. Hey, how much do you know about his brother, Edward? Well, nothing really outside of what Arnold told me. Was either of them married, family of any sort? Arnie wasn't, but I... Arnold's death means Edward will own the business then. Yes. And he lives up in Orlando, scene of the first big fire. Yes, very good heavens. Johnny, you don't think his own brother... Where can I rent a car? Take Mike Chevy. It's in the carport at the house. But what are you going to do? Drive up to Orlando by way of Arcadia. When I got to Arcadia, only a few people were standing around the remains of the fire. One hose company was still working on it, and a couple of police were poking about in the embers. Walking toward it, I almost stumbled over a little old man sitting alone in the darkness beside a palm tree, hunched over, his head in his hands, sobbing. He didn't even look up when I stopped beside him. It's like losing part of my own life, which is... You, uh, you lost someone in the fire, sir? No, son. Only part of my life. I helped build up that yard, me and Mr. Arnie. Arnold Carr. All along, he's been worried about it. Last week, when him and me smelled smoke and come over here and put out the barrel of trash that was smoldering, he knew. Knew what? That somebody was trying to burn him out? That's why he stopped by tonight on his way home. That's why we drove over here, him and me. And I brought my gun just in case. Yeah. Well, we got here too late. It was already blazing. And when he seen the automobile pulling away... What auto? Yes, Frank, he said to me. I knowed he was the one trying to burn me out, he said. Who? Who, old timer? Who do you mean? He he didn't say. Then he called the fire department. That car that pulled away, what was it? Just an auto, big white Buick. But he tied it in with whoever set the fire. All he said was, I knowed he was the one. Do you know who it was he meant? He told me even if I didn't know, I should never tell. Even the police. Well, who do you think it was? Break my word to Mr. Arnie? Uh Uh-uh. Never, son. All right, look, old man, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. Mr. Arnie's dead. What? What, he... But he can't be. He was... You. Huh? Uh, Maybe you thought in the darkness I wouldn't know you. But I do know you, you... Oh, now, just a minute, old timer. If Mr. Arnie's dead, it's because you killed him. What? Just like you set the fire. No, no, I'm not who you think I am. And I'll kill you. That's what I'll do. Put down that gun. I'll kill you. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Back in the old days, the very old days, that is, a girl named Cassandra had a corner on the Oracle market. But nowadays, you can do some foretelling yourself. On Jukebox Jury, for example, you can help decide which of Tin Pan Alley's new recordings are destined for the hit brackets and which ones are likely to spiral all the way down to oblivion. Remember, Jukebox Jury is yours to hear on most of these same stations every Sunday. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the burning car matter. (laughs) 
Expense account, item three, $5.15, gas for the borrowed Chevy to keep me going to Orlando. Either the old man's eyesight was bad or he was just a lousy shot. Either way, it was okay by me. I hated to slap him down, but there was no point hanging around Arcadia trying to explain things to the local authorities. So after making sure I hadn't really hurt him, I appropriated his gun and took off fast. He'd thought I was someone else. Even I had noticed a family-type resemblance to myself in Arnold Carr. Sergeant Larkin had asked me if I was related to him. And now the old man at the fire had apparently thought I was the one who... Oh, well, I'm afraid I made the rest of the trip to Orlando in somewhat less than legal time. And at police headquarters, I barged into the office of Lieutenant Cal Hudson without bothering to be announced. So early in the morning? Sit down while I finish up report, Mr. Carr. Uh, thanks. I was trying to reach you, but we got no answer to the phone at your house. Well, that's very interesting, Lieutenant. I'm afraid I have the painful duty of notifying you that your brother Arnold down in Sarasota last night... Why did you say very interesting, Mr. Carr? Or had you already learned... Well, I'll be doggone. Yeah. You're not the first one. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I can't believe it. You... Dollar, you look enough like Edward Carr to be his twin... You even sound a lot like it. I take it you haven't located Edward yet? Well, no. Lieutenant, I think Edward Carr is the firebug we're after. And the killer. Wait a minute. Briefly as possible, I told him of Arnold Carr's phone call to Earl Poorman. His emotional upset just before he was killed. I told him Arnold had been murdered by someone inside the house, someone close to him. And that everything indicated that someone could very well be Edward Carr. That's still all just theory, Dollar, without any proof. Well, I will admit that Edward is a pretty worthless playboy living off the profits of the lumberyard. In any event, the lieutenant promised to put out an APB on Edward Carr. That was at breakfast for the two of us, item four, three dollars and a quarter. Before I left him, he gave me Ed Carr's address, 1726 Allen Place. As I expected, there was no answer to the doorbell at 1726, so I tried visiting up the street. It quickly became clear that Ed Carr wasn't very popular in this otherwise quiet, well-ordered neighborhood. Those big, noisy parties at all hours of the night, cars parked up and down the street, blocking respectable people's driveways. Yes, ma'am, You know, well... once in a while you expect a person to have callers and such. Me, I have the Ladies' Bridge Club every third Wednesday, for instance. Well, that's nice. But these are all ladies, not like some of the trash that that man and his friends have, dancing and drinking and carrying on at all hours. Yes, you mentioned cars, Mrs. You know, Oh, uh, people like Mrs. Herford Robin. She's awfully nice. And Janet Osterworthy. Now, she's a widow. Well, and, you know, she could have her pick of anybody she likes. But does she ever look at another man? No, sir. And then there's Mrs. Mrs. Harper. Uh, yes? You mentioned cars. Do you know what kind Mr. Carr drove? Why, yes. It was a big white one. And the make? Well, no. My husband, when he was alive, always drove a Maxwell, and I guess that's the only kind I ever got to know by name. But Mr. Cars is white. Only I guess that isn't much help to you, is it? All the white cars here in Florida, I mean. Look. Now, even that blonde hussy who's around him all the time drives a white car. Oh, I really shouldn't use a word like that, though, should I? But it fits... Wait a minute. What blonde, Mrs. Harper? Mr. Dollar. I don't pay any attention to people like that. Why, you think she owned that house of his, the way she keeps popping in and out all hours as if she belonged there. Mrs. Harper. And drives all the way up from Sarasota, too. Do you know who she is? I do not. I refuse to pay any attention to people like... And the way she dresses, too, like a newly rich chorus girl with all her fancy clothes and furs and things. How do you know she comes from Sarasota? By the license on her car, of course. Every city has its own number. You know that very well. And hers is 12WW something. And you don't know her name? Of course not. Flaunting all those expensive furs as though she bought and paid for them herself. And if there's anything I hate to see, it's a little shrimp loaded down with furs. Now, a tall person I like see. me... I see. Well, her thanks. Eyes, oh, if there's anyone I don't trust, it's a person with green eyes. Well, Thank I you, can't... Mrs. Harper. Her description of Carr's girlfriend stopped me in my tracks. That description could fit Mike Poorman to the letter. Petite, blonde, green eyes, and she came from Sarasota. And then I remembered Mike's reaction when she first saw me. 
Her dismissal of Edward as a possible suspect. There was obvious friction between Earl and Mike, too. I figured it was just normal in a couple who'd been married for a while. But now... Item five, a dollar thirty phone call from the nearest booth I could find to Earl Poorman at his office in Sarasota. No, she isn't, Johnny. Why? Well, do you know where Mike is? When I woke up this morning, I could hear her talking to her girlfriend, Betty, on the phone downstairs. Betty? Uh, Betty lives here in Sarasota. They used to be on the stage together, sister act, you know. Yeah, well... Uh... Uh, well, then when I went down for breakfast, she was gone. Took my car, too. I had to come here to the office in a taxi. Yeah, well, okay, Earl. Thanks a lot. Yeah, hey, uh, now, wait a minute. How are you doing? You found out anything I ought to know about this arson and murder business? Uh, no, Earl. Nothing that you need to worry about. Liar. I sat down at a corner drugstore. That's item five, 80 cents, over a sandwich and a Coke to try to think things out. But I'm afraid I didn't like anything that I thought. Finally, I drove over to Allen Place again. I parked a couple of blocks away and walked to 1726. I rang the front doorbell, knocked a couple of times. Then I slipped around to the back door, finagled a lock on it with a little celluloid pocket calendar, finally got it open. I left it open for the sake of a quick exit if such became necessary. But I guess that was a mistake. For a couple of minutes later, as I rounded the corner from the den into the living room, I felt the barrel of a gun poked into my back. Out of town, huh? Now, wait a minute. Don't move, Eddie boy. Trying to stall off, pay me the five grand by saying you're going to be out of town, huh? Okay, so you think I'm Edward Carr. You kidding. Don't you know what happens when somebody tries to stall me? This! I don't know exactly how long I was out, but when I came to, it was dark. Except for the glow from a streetlight outside. And what roused me was the sound of footsteps, feminine steps, cautiously entering the back door. Then, briefly, silhouetted against a window, I saw a trim, petite figure that was all too familiar coming toward me. And she saw me, too. Oh, darling, you're hurt. What happened? Uh, what do you think? Who did this? Who struck you? You don't know? Yes, of course. It was Tony. Because you didn't pay him soon enough for the Arcadia job. Here, Eddie, let me help you. No, no, just let me rest for a minute. I thought that was Tony I passed on the road in from Sarasota. Why'd you come over from Sarasota? To see you. I knew you'd be here. Oh, why? Why? So the police could surprise you with the news of your poor dear brother's death. But why did you come to the house? Because I hoped you'd come here, I guess. Eddie, you should have waited until I could raise the money to pay off Tony. You mean for killing Arnold, too? Of course. No. Are you trying to say you didn't kill Arnold? But I saw you from outside in the Buick. You'd swear to that, wouldn't you? I, I don't know what to... Eddie, you sound like you don't trust me. We're in this thing together. Yeah, you sure of that? What are you talking about? Whose idea was it to knock off Arnold? But you had to. When he saw you at Arcadia, he, he knew that you were having the yards burned up. That's the way you figured it from the beginning, wasn't it? Now look, baby. First burn up the lumber yards and collect the insurance on them. Then convince me that you and I should have it all by putting Arnold out of the way. But you had to kill Ar... I don't understand you, Eddie. Yeah... And I wish I didn't understand you, Mike. Mike? Come on. Let's turn on a light. No. No. Somebody sees us. Eddie, you... Who... Who are you? Are you kidding, Mike? I... Wait a minute. Who are you? You're that insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, that Mike told me. Let me out of here. Oh, no, you don't. You're staying right here. Mike Poorman's sister, aren't you? Well? Oh, sister. So we once did a sister act before she married that poor man guy. Now, let, let me go. Not by a long shot. You may as well, Dollar. What? Eddie. Don't move, Dollar. Get his gun, Betty. Get it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Here, Ed. Good. Ed Carr, huh? That's right. You know, we do look alike, you and me. Yeah, sure. Enough for Betty here to have told me all I need to know. Don't believe him, Eddie. He's lying. I heard, No, baby. Eddie, I, I thought he was you. Don't you see? Sure, him? sure. Why'd you come up here anyway? Because Mike told me that Dollar was coming up here. You've been shooting off your mouth to her, too? She knew about us. She thought you might have something to do with the fire. She was my friend. She was trying to get me out of this whole mess, and I wish I'd listened to well, her. Well, it's too late now, baby. Eddie, what are you going to do? Now i got to get rid of both of them. No! And figure some way to shut up Tony's mouth. Ed, please! You know you'd never get away with it, Carr. Oh, no, I'll call him. That's what I'll do. 
Yeah, Betty, and he'll come here to get his money. Then I'll call the police, see? Tell him to come right away. Tell him I found out about you having Tony start the fire. What? That's right, that you had him burn up the yard so there'd be even more money for you to bleed from me, like all the dough you got from me already. You're crazy, Ed. I'll tell the police to meet me here. And when they come in, it'll just be in time to see me kill Tony in self-defense. After getting here too late to save you, I'll tell them. You're out of your mind. They'll check that gun of yours so fast. And that'll prove it. Because the only shot out of my gun will be the one that gets Tony. This gun of yours is the one that's going to knock you two off. And they'll think it's Tony. Oh, Eddie, please, you're drunk. Are you crazy? Crazy to save my own life, to keep you and Tony and Dollar from putting a noose around my neck? If you think that harebrained scheme of yours will ever work, you're it's off your It's got to work, because it's my only chance. So it's going to work now. <laughs> Thanks, Lieutenant. I'm afraid I was too late to save it, Johnny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But Eddie Carl lived to face a jury. What brought you here anyhow? I did, Johnny. Mike, stay there. Stay right here, Mike. I know. I don't want to see it. She was my friend. Where's Earl? I came alone. When I talked to Betty this morning, I knew your suspicions about Ed were right because, you see, I knew Betty and Ed were going together. Earl didn't know. Yeah. Maybe you better call him. Expense account item six, nine dollars eighty cents, gas and incidentals for the drive for the two of us back to Sarasota. Remarks? Betty, of course, has already paid for her part in the deal. And I guess it's pretty obvious what'll happen to Ed Carr and Tony Ricardo. The insurance money in the Carr estates will be distributed according to Florida law. Further remarks, the apparent friction between Earl and Mike was only part of a normal married life. They're a pretty nice pair. Oh, and I thoroughly enjoyed three days of fishing in the Gulf, thanks to Earl. Expense account total, including all the incidentals I could think of, 385-26. Our star will return in just a moment. You don't have to be an efficiency expert to figure out that it's easier to lend your support to several worthwhile fundraising campaigns all at once than it would be helping one campaign at a time. That kind of efficiency is yours to enjoy through the United Community Campaigns. CBS Radio hopes that when the United Community Campaigns are underway in your town, that you'll remember how much good you can accomplish with one gesture of support. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case with a real twist. One that I think will just about tear your heart out. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harley Bear, Victor Perrin, Bob Bruce, Harry Bartell, Vivi Janus, Tony Barrett, and Junius Matthews. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking.
If you're looking for murder, I know a guy who can get it for you wholesale. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar. To West Coast Underwriters, San Francisco Branch, Attention Bradford L. Coates, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of uh, the little man who wasn't all there, or in most cases, there at all, or the unpaid premium payoff. Expense account, item one. Three cents postage due on your airmail special delivery letter containing said assignment. I can just hear you dictating it. Take a letter. To Johnny Dollar, you'll find his address in the files. Dear sir, better make that dear Dollar. Enclose fine copies of letters received by us from one Mr. James Yarbo, period. This man's wife was insured with our company until recently. One day before her death, her period of grace and an unpaid premium ran out. We canceled her policy in the amount of $20,000. Her husband, Yarbo, first made every effort to collect, then threatened us. Since then, we've received the enclosed series of letters intimating, without confessing, that he's had a hand in the accidental death of at least 12 of our policyholders to date. The police have been working on it, but are getting nowhere. If you are available, please come immediately. Uh, uh, yours very truly, uh, so far. Expense account, item two, $176.87. Airfare, Hartford to San Francisco. Item three, 540. Cab fare, airport to your office. Dollar, glad you got him. You've no idea what okay, a mess is Okay, okay, Mr. Coates, okay, don't get excited. We'll nail this guy before you run out of policyholders. Well, the dozen he's apparently done away with already have cost this darn near quarter of a million. You've got to move fast, Dollar. The man is a homicidal maniac. Yeah, but a smart one, though. He's put just enough in those letters to, he sent you to let you know that he's working on a grand-scale revenge against your company. But... He leaves out just enough so the law can't lock him up. He's had perfect alibis in every case. Uh, look, uh, Mr. Coates, tell me, have all these deaths been local right around here? No, they've been all over California. Mm hmm. Well, one other thing the method. From this list you gave me, Mr. Yarbo seems to have a preference for killing people through the noisy and gory method of fake automobile accidents. Yes, very true. But what about this last one? Airplane crash. That was a $30,000 loss to us. Just think, our poor innocent policyholder flying around and then his engine quit, thanks to a man he's never even seen. Tell me, Mr. Coates, <sighs> just how difficult would it be to get a list of your California policyholders' names and addresses, you know? Why, that would take days, but goodness gracious, man, you can't hope to keep an eye on them all. Besides, the minute you went off the job, he'd strike again. That's a preposterous Whoa, idea. Cut time. Look, I don't want the list. I was just wondering how Yarbo got it. Oh, now, so far, you've given me nothing to go on. I'd like you to add two things to that. Yarbo's home address and a $50,000 life insurance policy made out to me. What on earth is that for? Well, look, in the first place, if we're going fishing for Mr. Yarbo, I might as well be the worm. In the second place, if I should get gobbled up in the line of duty, that $50,000 life insurance would make several attractive young ladies of my acquaintance very happy. Not, mind you, as happy as I can make them by remaining alive. Expense account, item four. $30. Rental of limousine complete with chauffeur. I figured if I was riding the trouble, I was riding in style. So I started on a house-to-house -house survey. You might say, knocking at death's door. Yes. What is it, the police? Oh, I'm sorry to bother you, Mrs. Chianelli, but I'm from the insurance company. Oh, yes. It'll only take a moment. One question about your son. Oh, poor Angelo. What do you want to know about my poor son? He'd drive away in his automobile. That's all. 
I'll never see him in life again. Yes, I, I, I know. Uh, tell me, Mrs. Chianelli, did you ever hear your son mention a man named Yarbo? Yarbo? Yeah. Yarbo. I don't know about no such Yarbo. Not please. Please leave me. There was so much sadness in my house. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Dykes? Yes. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm from the insurance company. About your son's plane crash. Oh. I thought all those details had been taken care of. But just one thing, Mr. Dykes. Did your son ever mention a man named Yarbo? Yarbo? Yeah. That's an unusual name. I'm sure if he had, I would have remembered. Okay, sir. I'm sorry to bother you. And thanks. <laughs> Yes, sir. May I help you? Yes, I'd like to have a word with Mrs. Weatherly. I'm from the insurance company. Well, sir, Mrs. Weatherly has been indisposed, not receiving visitors. What is it, Brian? Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Weatherly? My name is Johnny Dollar. Oh, dear, dear. Uh, you may go, Brian. Oh, I'm ashamed to let you see me in this condition, Mr. Dollar. Just ashamed. But you understand. I, I do indeed. Oh, it was bad enough. The accident, I mean. But the scandal! Oh, oh, I'll never be able to hold my head up again. Yes, and uh, no. If Harvey had to get himself in an automobile accident, why, oh, why, I ask you, did he have to have that awful Mrs. Barclay in the car? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, it was very unthoughtful of him, yes. uh, Mrs. Weatherly. Would you mind answering one question? Well, if I can. Did your husband ever mention a man named Yarbo? Well, no. No, he never mentioned a man named Yarbo. But neither did he ever mention Mrs. Barclay. I tried a half a dozen of the other beneficiaries left behind by Mr. Yarbo's list of victims. All I got out of it was a very watery afternoon. The tears were falling like monsoon time in Burma. But of information, I got none. This brought me right smack up to a point I didn't want to have to reach. The point of contacting Mr. Yarbo in person. At 8.30 that night, I took a plan on Yarbo's house on Lombard Street. At 11.30, I saw the lights go out, as did Yarbo. He was a little guy, stooped over like he was looking for cigarette butts on the sidewalk, needing a haircut, and, true to type, wearing a long black overcoat. But worst of all was the little satchel he was carrying... Items like this always set off a chain reaction in my imagination, and I could just see him on his way to atomizing the Oakland Bay Bridge, thus causing the biggest automobile accident in history. I very cleverly forced my way into the house by breaking a first-floor window, reaching in and opening same. Cyclops' eye of my flashlight started picking up information on the subject of Mr. Yarbo immediately. The room I had entered looked like the Hobby Lobby of an English Bobby, a crime museum if I ever saw one. On one wall, a gun case. On another, a crime library. And scattered around the room, a grisly collection, ranging from blood-stained hatchets to shrunken heads. But the most surprising criminal curio of all stood right behind me. <laughs> Mr. Yarbo, complete with little black bag. Well, well, I must say, the current second story man dresses well, but I must also say you, my man, must have the old masters of the art turning in their graves. For you, young man, are a heavy-fingered bungler. Sure, let's have a better look at you. Now, that flashlight, I'll feel better after you've dropped it. Hey, what am I doing? You're not even pointing a gun at me. Don't feel too comfortable, you are well covered from many points. A step from you in any direction may detonate any number of explosive devices. Uh, why did I pick this joint to burgle? I feel like a city councilman playing a call in the White House. You seem more the kind of a guy I should be working for instead of on. What's your racket? Racket? Yeah. You were in a racket, my little friend. My pastime is a science. Yes, I, I take it you are impressed with my collection. Uh, uh, who, who wouldn't be? Well... If you're interested, 
come here. Uh, about those booby traps. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Note well the design in the rug. The large roses. Avoid stepping on them for the time being. Oh, great. And I was in here stumbling around in the dark. May your good luck continue. But look, look here in this case, the small vial on the right. That was purloined for me to order from the famous Black Museum in Scotland Yard. That little vial once rested in the case of the fabulous murderer, Dr. Crippen. And there, beside it, that lock of hair, mm-hmm. that is from the head of the second victim of the noted mass murderer, Neil Cream. And up there, look up there, mm-hmm. the hangman's noose over the mantle, from that one swung the body of the notorious Western bad woman, Fanny China. Oh, uh, how's chances for running this place for Halloween? Uh, well, well, all right then, since you no longer seem interested in playing the part of a bungling burglar, then I assume that I am also free to discontinue my pose as a victim of your disguise, Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh. Ah, looks like the chips are down and I'm the fish. Yes. And there are a lot of other fish in your sea, Mr. Dollar. Poison eels, that's what you are, the lot of you. Parasites, gambling on death, and then not paying when you lose. Uh, listen, Mr. Yarbo, you're placing a big hunk of blame where it doesn't belong. You're confused about that. Confused? Yes. When your wife's insurance premium was overdue, you were allowed a 30-day period of grace. And when that went by, the policy was canceled. Now, that's not the insurance company's fault. It was your fault. But it wasn't. I gave her the money. She spent it on herself. I didn't make it up. I told them so after she died. I told them, but they wouldn't listen. I'll show you. I'll show you. Yarbo looked like he was headed to show me the chopping end of an axe laying on top of a small table. I hit him just as he hit the table. As he hit the floor, I noticed what I was standing on. One of those big red roses in the carpet. It hadn't exploded yet, but that was one flower I wasn't standing around waiting to see bloom. It took a lot of nerve picking up a telephone in that room. But I finally got a good hold on my nerves and a fair hold on an imitation of Yarbo's voice. Took one deep breath and picked up the phone. Yes? Hello, James. This is Martha. I'm at the office. I have good news. Two more. Mr. and Mrs. Granville Morse. Killed tonight on the Great Highway. Two miles south of Seal Rock. 8.45 tonight. Ran into a post. Both killed. Insured for a total of 80,000. I gotta go now. Goodbye, James. Well, congratulations, Brother Yarbo. Two more at 8.45 tonight. And who's your new alibi? Me. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first... Did you ever think of and as a comedy word? Maybe not, but you'll get a full demonstration on CBS this Wednesday night. There'll be Groucho Marx and his guest on that hilarious quiz, You Bet Your Life. For it's the guests who sometimes floor Groucho with their wisecracks. There'll be Bing Crosby in his regular Wednesday night CBS show and his special guest, Bob Hope. There'll be George Burns and Gracie Allen and Bill Goodwin. And and becomes more filled with comedy... When you tell or learn that Lum and Abner will have their premiere as Wednesday night regulars on most of these same CBS stations. Yes, this fall, you hear them all on C and B and S. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Yarbo might have been lying unconscious on the floor, but in that setting, I was still afraid of him. I'd have looked the place over with a fine tooth comb, only having none. I used my hands. I put the pat test to Yarbo's pockets for a gun. He was unloaded. Then turned my attention to the little black bag he'd been carrying when I saw him leave the house, and which he still had with him when he returned. I hoped it wasn't booby-trapped. Opened it and discovered that it was a trap, the type my kind of booby stepped into. Inside the bag was a small radio receiver tuned to something I looked for and found in the room. A small radio transmitter of the type formerly used in army tanks. 
Through this, Yarbo had heard me enter his little museum of murder and had returned to catch me in the act of prowling the premises. About then, I caught him in the act of coming, too. Well, welcome home, Yarbo. Time to get up. I just had a long chat on the phone with Martha. She thought I was you. You think you're very clever, don't you? Martha knows my voice. If she talked to you at all, she didn't tell you anything. Of that, I am sure. So save your breath. There is no use your telling me she gave you any information. Oh, no, you got me wrong, pal. I only told you Martha called to let you know I know there is a Martha. I figured it might make you nervous. And nervous men are easy to beat. Other nervous men may be easy to beat, Dollar, but not James Yarbo. The police have tried and they couldn't prove a thing against me. Now, may I have your permission to get up? Yeah. Maybe the police haven't been able to get anything on you, but I have something. Attempted murder... The hatchet you went for. <laughs> the pitiful mistake of a pitifully suspicious mind, Dollar. I wasn't reaching for that hatchet on the table. I was trying to show you something in the table drawer. There it is, spilled out on the floor. My wife's insurance policy. The one your unscrupulous thieving superiors refused to pay. The vampires. Here, look at it. All in order. Much of it in fine print. Fine. Just fine. <laughs> okay, Yarbo, that did it. Come on, ahead of me. Uh, where are we going? To find some place to lock you up. I was hired to stop you, and until I do, I'm at least going to try and slow you down. Now move. <laughs> Linen closet. No room here. Come on. Bathroom. No window. Yeah, this'll do. Go on, get in there. No, 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 not in here. Anywhere but in here. It's a good place. You may get thirsty. No, no, no. This is where my wife died. Not in here. No. Which, on the surface, may seem to have been a move on the cruel side. But Yarbo was a man obviously off his rocker, and I needed him more nervous than I already had him. Too nervous to attempt killing any more people. Expense account item five, a nickel. Phone call, downtown office, state police. A Mr. and Mrs. Granville Morse had indeed crashed to their death on the great highway south of Seal Rock at 845, which made the lady with the early telephone news flash, Martha, a gal with whom I wanted an early date. Come on, come on, answer the phone. Hello? Uh, what is it? Hello, Mr. Coates. This is Dollar. Uh, oh, yes, Dollar. What do you want? Well, first I want to tell you that you just lost two more policyholders. List price, 80000 Oh, good Lord. This is terrible. Who, how, what... Never time? mind that. I've also got something else. On the good side. I need your help tonight. Uh, of course. Anything. What can I do? Meet me at your office. You and I are going to go looking for a dame named Martha. Martha? Martha who? I don't know. But I hope she works for you. I'll be there in a half hour. Make that 20 minutes and you'll be 10 minutes closer to happy days. The office personnel records of the West Coast underwriters turned up not one, but three employees named Martha, which gave me three choices as to who had been supplying Yarbo with a list of West Coast policy, insurance, policy holders. Finding the exact Martha was even easier. On the phone, she had told me that she was calling from the office. And the night elevator operator's in and out book showed the signature of one Martha Kinsey. And I just couldn't wait to hear her report. Who is it? I've got a message from Mr. Yarbo. Oh, just a minute. Message from James? Oh, what does he want? Well, what he really wants is to get out of the bathroom. That's where I've got him locked up. Who are you? You ought to know who I am. I assume you're the one that told Yarbo he could be expecting a call from an insurance investigator named Dollar. Well, that's me. Well, I don't care. James told me girls give out lists of names all the time. Sell them for mailing lists. Ten cents apiece. May not be ethical, but it's not against the law. James told me, and I believe James. Oh, he's the smartest man I ever knew. He may be the smartest, but he's right in line to be numbered among the deadest. 
One of these fine mornings, the state is going to give him a cyanide egg for breakfast. What do you mean? You should know. Murder. Execution. Gas chamber. Well, you can't prove a thing. James told me so, and he knows. But he's smart. I hope he's not smart enough to pick a lock with a bath mat. Now, come on, sit down. You and I are going to have a nice, long talk. We are not. I won't say a thing. I don't have to, unless you have a warrant, an indictment, and a court reporter. James told me so. Yeah, I know. He's smart. But no matter what he told you, you're going to tell me a few things. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. So, I was wrong. Martha didn't tell me anything. But her stubborn attitude did. She was in love with Mr. Yarbo, a stupid middle-aged woman having her last fling at romance doing her best to keep her last chance alive in the person of the man who had made her his partner in crime. As crazy as it was, this grotesque pair of lovebirds created the only real emotion in the case to date and switched my thoughts from the widely scattered deaths which had brought me into the case and over to the single death of Yarbo's wife. And closed find a transcript of statement made to me at 2 o'clock in the morning by the doctor who signed Mrs. Yarbo's death certificate. Cause of death, cerebral hemorrhage, result of severe fracture of skull, region medulla oblongata, contributing factors, woman bathing in bathtub at home, slipped and fell, striking head on shower spigot. Coroner's finding death due to misadventure, accidental. It took the doctor two minutes to get around to making that statement. I figured it would take Martha at least 30 minutes to get her hair out of her curlers and make herself presentable enough to risk being seen on the street. That left me 28 minutes to get back to Yarbo's house before she did. And I didn't need half that long. In a cab on my way over, I took inventory. One, to date, Yarbo's alibis covering him on all the so-called revenge murders had been perfect. Too perfect. Second, when I first faced Yarbo, he screamed about his wife's death, not in the light of having lost his lady love, but in the light of having lost her insurance money. Just as my third and most important conclusion came upon me, the taxi came upon our destination, and I had to go to work. Once inside the little horror house on Lombard Street, I got set for a long search. But it turned out to be a short one, and it proved two things. Yarbo was not only a murderer, he was as crazy as he'd acted in having kept the evidence around. Okay, Yarbo, come on out. Well, I hope you have enjoyed your waste of time, Mr. Dollar, as I've enjoyed my chance for meditation. You saw Martha, I suppose? Yes, I saw Martha. Bless her silent little soul. Yes, I was sure of Martha. She believes in me. Uh, you can say that again. Come on out here. Mr. Dollar, I suppose you are aware that this is the second time tonight you have been guilty of breaking and entering. I am, however, willing to forgive that should you come to your senses and decide to go back to Hartford and leave me alone. Uh-uh. Oh. Mm. Um, mind treading on the roses in the rug, Mr. Dollar? Sorry, Yarbo. I fell for that gag earlier tonight. People who smile at that joke give me the last laugh. Now, look, Yarbo, I know exactly what you've been up to, and I know why you've done it. But your little war of nerves has got to stop. It will never stop. No one can prove anything against me. I can. I can prove that you haven't done a thing to bring about those accidental deaths you've been taking credit for. Martha has sat down that insurance office, uh, office and notified you every time there's been an accidental death of a policyholder in this part of the country. Then you've written the company your little letters and gotten your little kicks out of it, right? That's a lie, lie, lie. This is a switch, a guy yelling that loud that he's guilty. You'll have to prove it. You will have to prove it. Don't worry, chum. I'm not going to waste a breath proving murders that you didn't commit. But, brother, I'm really going to go to town on the one that you did. Your wife, Mr. Yarbo. That is the most ridiculous statement you have yet made, young man. Look around you. Take note. I have profited by all the mistakes made by the original owners of these bloody souvenirs from Dr. Crippen on down. You will see in me the living composite of them all. And I intend to stay that way, alive. I'm afraid you will, but it's going to be inside an upholstered room. And this is what will put you there. Oh, 
Yeah, Mr. Yarbo. You carried your little hobby of crime souvenirs too far when you saved this hunk of pipe and the faucet with which you clubbed your wife to death. She slipped and fell. She was in the tub. I'm sure the police microscopes can give you a strong argument on that one. Now, come on. And let's make it easy on each other, shall we? No, no, I didn't do it. I, I didn't do it. Let go. Whoa. Let go of me. You, you have to prove it. Hey, What's he doing? Help me, Martha. Help me. Hit him with something. I'd have bet on myself against the two of them if I didn't have to fight while playing hopscotch over those roses in the carpet, about which I still wasn't quite sure. It was touch and go. Martha would try to touch the back of my head with something, and I'd go. Do something, Martha! Do something! I'll fix him! I'll fix him! Something Martha tried to do was pick up a heavy-based urn and aim it at me. She missed. It started to roll across the rosy carpet. When Yarbo saw where it was headed, he wrenched himself loose and dove to stop it. I dove the other way. He got there just too late. I didn't have to look twice to know he was dead. Fate had called James Yarbo up on his own carpet. When Martha threw that urn at me, it had rolled straight for the only rose in the rug that had been booby traps. Which only goes to prove that sometimes a rose by any other name can be anything but sweet. Expense account, item six. A dollar and forty cents. Three months subscription, Love Life magazine. Sent to accessory to murder, Martha Kinsey, to Hatchaby State Prison. I figured three months was about all she had, the judges and juries in California being rather efficient that way. Expense account, uh, item seven. Six bucks. Dinner and diving for pearls in a barrel of blue points at Fisherman's Wharf. Diving for Pearl's earring, which she lost while bending over the barrel trying to see what oysters looked like. Uh, item eight, $176.87. Airfare, San Francisco to Hartford. Uh, expense account total, $942.08. Not including defense lawyer fees if you decide to sue me for not being able to add correctly. Signed, yours, uh... Truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Jay Novello, Martha Wentworth, Paul Dubois, Gigi Pearson, and Larry Dobkin. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatt. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Everyone is concerned about world affairs these days. If we want world peace, we'll have to have national peace first. In order to keep America's strength and prestige, in order to preserve her freedom, we must do away with group prejudice. Let's stop judging people by the color of their skin or the place where they worship and start considering them for what they do. We'll be sure to have a happier world. Stay tuned now for Vaughn Monroe and his caravan, following immediately on most of these CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
from Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Harry Poulton, ship is indemnity. Johnny, how soon can you get to Buffalo? Six hours by train. Take a plane. All right, I'll take a plane. Why? So you can get on this case while it's still hot. Get on what case, Harry? Atlantic Central Railway. Some guys knocked over one of their boxcars last night and heisted half the load. We carry a blanket policy on all their freight, so get going. Yes, sir, Mr. Poulton, right away. And watch your expense account. Edmund O'Brien in another transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Harry Polden. Shippers Indemnity, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenditures incurred during investigation of Atlantic Central Railway's claim regarding missing freight, or the story of the 1008. Expense account item, transportation, plane fare, Hartford to Buffalo, $48.16, plus cab fare, $6.35, to the main offices of the Atlantic Central Railway, where a tall, heavyset man in a dusty blue surge pulled a cold cigar from the side of his mouth and spun a swivel chair in my direction. I'm Abe Grimm's, Donna. Sit down. Now, let me close this door. Well, you didn't take long getting him. I wasn't very far away. I'm the cinder bull for this outfit, and I'd be doing what you're going to do if it was like the old days. Only Shipper's Indemnity handles the insurance, and it's our job now. That's the service you pay for, Mr. Grimm. Uh, when they stuck me in this desk, I'd been knocking deadheads around for 20 years and seeing they got themselves 30 days on the road gang. Now I'm just... I guess they figure I'm too old. Well, maybe you can give me a hand on this. Well, I'd like to, Don. I need some action. You want to tell me about it, Mr. Grimms? You bet. Atlantic Central hustled six gully jumpers a day up to Rochester. Five hours after the 1008 leaves here last night, she jerks up at Batavia so the clowns can water her down. That's when the Donegan notices one of her brownies is busted open and half the jig is gone. So, right away, he wang doodles a copper buster up the line. Uh, are you getting this? I think so. Translated, you mean the brakeman at Batavia found the boxcar had been broken into and half the cargo stolen, and he phoned ahead to the telegraph office. That's it. All sorts of stuff on the car. Don't know what all's gone yet. It was a make-up, any kind of freight, you know. I got the poodles over in the bullpen looking up the invoices to see exactly what's missing. It'll take a while. Good, that'll help. Who was in charge of the loading here? Andy Matson. Been with us 13 years. He inspected it and sealed it down himself. I talked to him already, but call him in if you like. Well, I might want to see him later. What about the brakeman in Batavia? A gandy dancer, Skeeter Minkowski. Nah, he couldn't have done it. That highball only lingered there long enough to get water. Can't unload a brownie in three minutes. Take more like three hours. What other stops did she make? One. Six minutes at the junction, 15 miles outside of here, waiting for a hot-shot passenger to get by. And all in all, the train stopped ten minutes at the most, huh? Not long enough to unload a kitty car. An uh, engineer named Aropa claims he spotted a dame in a red dress hanging around the yards yesterday afternoon. And the boys at the roundhouse say the same dame was in asking questions about trains leaving. Said she was from a newspaper. She give a name? Ruth Smith. I checked. No newspaper in town got any Ruth Smith working for him. Well, she's our tipster. Let's get somebody out to look for her. Already got somebody out doing that. Good. Now, uh, along the route up to Rochester, between here and Batavia, there there must be a highway running parallel to the track somewhere. And whoever cracked into that boxcar had to get aboard at the junction, then toss the stuff from the moving train and jump off somewhere this side of Batavia. And there had to be a truck following along on the road to pick up the stuff in the dark. You been out there yet, Mr. Grimms? No. Kind of thought I'd wait around and see what sort of bulwarkers the insurance companies are turning out these days. <laughs> I like you, Johnny. You're all right. You figured how it was done fast. Other guys that are hemmed and hawing around asking train crews questions I already asked. Well, what's next? Find out who did it. <laughs> kind of frisky, ain't you? I like that, too. Hey, um, have you got a car I can borrow, Mr. Grimms? I got a Jeep and a chauffeur to go with it. Who's the chauffeur? Me. You said you might want me to help you. I bought the thing from Army Surplus. I want to see if I got a bargain.
expense account. Item, $4.38 for gasoline, which went into a Jeep that Eve Grimms and I used to follow the lonely stretch of old road that ran parallel to the Atlantic Central Railroad tracks. Two miles beyond the junction, we found heavy-duty tire marks, which could have been made by a truck, which could have left the road, then driven over the flats as far as the embankment to pick up freight, which could have been thrown from the moving train. Following the right-of-way... We found several such tire marks at several points turning off the road, but no building nearby. Finally, at one place, we found an unpainted shanty that stood barren and lonely against the sky. It belonged to a man named Bogatus. Big truck, you're dang right I did, mister. You're dang boodly doodle right. Woke me up, it did. Well, what did the truck look like? Eh? Uh, Do you remember what the truck looked like? Yellow. Yellow it was. All yellow. Seen it plain, even though it was night. You happen to notice the license number? You kidding, Sonny. All right, forget it. But you happen to notice any lettering on the truck, Mr. Bogartis? Don't read, never learn, never believed in it. Nope. Well. Don't make no difference, though. It wasn't nothing writ on it anyhow. Oh. The trucks usually got printing on them. Dang things making all that noise. Grunting and heaving and waking a man out of his sleep. Ain't had nothing like that since the Army maneuvered here in 41. No, sir. Are you going to stop it? Well, I hope so. Good. Did you happen to see who was driving the truck? Nope. Do you know about what time it was here? Nope. Did you happen to say anything to the nope. man? Nope. Well, do you know in which direction it went from yep. here? Yep. Huh? It turned around and headed back for Buffalo. Which is exactly what we did, back to Buffalo where we began to look with the help of the police for a big yellow truck with no lettering on it. We tried garages, trucking concerns, and any place big enough to hide such a truck. It wasn't an easy job, but it turned up. Hello? Hello, Don. I got a yellow truck all loaded down with stolen freight. What? Yeah. Meet you over at the West End Viaduct. Highway Patrol just found it. Good. Only one thing. It's wrecked. Passing motorist had a flat tire right here. He got out of his car to fix the flat and saw here where it tumbled down. Good tumble. Must be 30 feet anyhow. Yeah, they're trying to get the driver out of the cab now. He may still be alive. They're using acetylene torches. Ten minutes later, the ambulance crew dragged the driver out of the twisted cab. The interns worked on him for a short time, and one of them straightened up, handed me a billfold. Well, here you are. His name's Blakey. Blakey. Rick's Blakey. Mm -hmm. For the moment, he won't live another five minutes. Fractured skull, neck broken. If you've got any questions to ask, you better hurry. Thank you. Blakey. Blakey, listen to me. Listen, you haven't got long. We know this is all stolen cargo in your truck. We want to know who worked with you. Jake. Get Jake. Jake? Jake who? Jake. Jake slugged me. Put it in gear and rolled me over the side of the road. Get him, Mr. Cop. Get him for doing this to me. <sighs> I stayed around the wrecked truck watching Eve Grimm's crew stacking the cargo. And then I saw something that could have fallen out of Blakey's wallet when the intern handed it to me. It was a card. On one side was printed Horseshoe Bar and Grill. And there was an address underneath it. But on the other side was written, Jake, 8 o'clock Tuesday. He's always there. <laughs> the horseshoe bar and grill was short on lights and even shorter on drinks. After a couple, I signaled the bartender. Yeah? Another one? Uh-huh. Sure. Dame Trouble, pal? I'm here to see Jake. Here's your drink. Even in here tonight? That'll be 50 cents. Jake hangs around here, doesn't he? Look, the minute you walk in, I look at your feet and I say to myself, flatty, gumboots, glim-heeled cop. <laughs> Not city hall type guy, but something else, I say. Something different that uh, still spells law. I was asking about a guy named Jake. Something else, I say. Maybe private people. And I say, if he's working, he's got himself a bib. <laughs> and a bib means it don't come out of his pocket when he's around looking for somebody and asking for guys. Will this help? Ah, oh, 
thanks. Old Abe took a great picture. Uh, what was you asking? About a guy named Jake. Sit tight, Shamus. I'll tip you when he comes in. An hour went by, and about the time I was wondering if I was going to be able to write that five bucks off on the expense account, the bartender slipped out from behind the bar and went through a door in the back marked private. I finished my drink and strolled after him. He was just hanging up the phone as I walked in. Oh, there's a lot of customers waiting to be served out front. Yeah, I want to get right back to... Wait a minute. Uh, Haven't we got some unfinished business? Well, yes and no. I come back here to slip myself a quick smoke and the phone is ringing. you never guess who it is. Jake. What's his last name? How do I know? Across the bar, a guy's just Jake or Sam Morrell. Anyhow, Jake says he ain't coming by tonight. He called you up to tell you that? No, no. You see, Jake says he lost his glasses when he was here last night. He was called to ask if I found him. Did you? Uh, no. But Jake says that uh, if I do find him, I can send him over to the embassy hotel. That's where he is. Room 210. Embassy hotel. Where is that from here? Two blocks north. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> sure, anytime. <laughs> Anytime you got an expense account. I walked over to the embassy hotel, and naturally enough, there was no one in room 210 named Jake. As a matter of fact, there was no room 210. But when I stepped outside and started back for the horseshoe bar and grill, a pair of wide shoulders and a coat collar fell on step beside me. He shoved something against my back. Let you and me kind of turn in here. I... I'd blast you right here and you know it. In the alley. I want you should meet a friend of mine. Jake? Hmm. How'd you guess? Okay, hold it. Here he is, Jake. A tall, thick figure with an odor of fine cologne around it stepped from the shadows. His hat was down and his collar was up. He stood very close in front of me and asked, Why do you want me? Who are you? I'll ask you first. I. All right. Frisk him, Trench. See who he is. Everything became very quiet then, except for one voice that belonged to a man who had died earlier that day. I kept hearing it. Get him. Get him for doing this to me. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, this Wednesday night and every Wednesday night over most of these same CBS stations, you're invited to hear the Bing Crosby Show. Bing Crosby with the music of John Scott Trotter, the Rhythm Airs, Ken Carpenter, and of course, a top name star each week as his special guest. Here's the show designed for the whole family. A pleasant and diverting mixture of music and merriment. Guided by the one and only Bing Crosby. Plan now to make Wednesday night Crosby night on your listening schedule. That's the Bing Crosby Show every Wednesday night on CBS. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I was lying in a dirty alley with my face up against a cold brick wall. And something warm was dripping down the back of my neck. I didn't move. I couldn't. There was a steady ringing in my head. And my body seemed far away. I struggled to my feet and headed for the man who had led me into this. What do you want? Uh, uh, hey, what's this all about? Let go of me. Look, I've been beaten and slugged and frisked, all because I talked to the wrong guy. I looked for you in the bar. They told me you went home. Now spit it out. Spit what out? Does that remind you of anything? You tipped Jake off that I was looking for him. Why? Let go of me. I can't talk like this. If you can breathe, you can talk. Come on. Look, 
Jake's a steady customer of mine. I got to treat him right. I never seen you before in my life. What's Jake's full name? What does he do? And where can I find him? I don't know. You don't know what? Anything about him. Except that he's a big black-haired guy who dresses like a bookie. Flash. He just comes in with some guys and drinks. The name is Jake Samuels. He has a sidekick named Trench. I don't even know his last name. What does Jake do? I don't know. He don't say nothing personal to me. Well, what do you think he does? Maybe he plays the horse's books. How do I know? And you don't know where he lives? Mister, if he owed me a hundred dollar bar bill, I couldn't find his house. It was late and my head hurt and I wanted to lie down somewhere. So I made for the Imperial Hotel Eve Grimes had recommended. I took a shower and polished off the drinks they sent up. And I felt well enough to call Grimms again. But before I lifted the phone, he walked into my room with some interesting information. Sorry you got beat up, Johnny. It's all right. I'm covered with accident insurance, you know. I wish I could help you with this Jake Samuels fellow, but I never heard of him. Thanks anyway, Eve, but I'll, I'll run him down sooner or later. I do have something that might help, Johnny. Yeah? We checked all that cargo that was found in the wreck truck, and... I don't know exactly what it means, but everything was there except one barrel. What was that? A barrel. And listen to this. Of all things, a barrel of jeweler's rouge. The stuff they use for gem polishing? That's what an intelligent friend of mine told me. It was insured that... Uh, when I go right here. $247. Now, why would anybody want that? Well, who sent it? A jeweler by the name of Ralph Morton. Morton Jewelry Company, 1312 Shenandoah Street. Sent to Michael Adelson, A-D-E-L-S-O-N, 177 Carling Terrace, Boston, Mass. Adelson, huh? Yeah, Adelson or Adelson. Know him, Johnny? Uh, not sure. Something rings a bell. Well, thanks a lot, Grimms. I'll have a talk with that jeweler, Ralph Morton, in the morning. In the morning, I rented a small car and started for the Morton Jewelry Company on Shenandoah Street. I found it in the middle of the block, a small, hungry-looking neighborhood jewelry store. But the most interesting thing about it was standing in a doorway across the street from it. A middle-aged man. He was a plant, if ever I saw one. I ignored him and entered the store. It was a small man with thinning brown hair bent over the insides of a watch and a snappy-looking blonde job dusting counters about four paces away. I spoke to the watchmaker. He took out his eye lens and looked up. Yes? Two days ago, you shipped some jeweler's rouge to Michael Adelson in Boston. Yes, I, I did. What about it? Well, it was hijacked out of the freight car yesterday. Oh, Clumsy this morning. A hijack, you say? Stolen. Somebody wanted it pretty bad. They passed up a lot of other stuff more valuable. Well, I... Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator with the Shippers Indemnity Company. Oh, it was insured, of course. Well, you it... should know. For $247. I'm sorry it was stolen. I presume your company will have to pay for it. Well, we don't mind paying if we know what we're paying for. What do you mean by that? Why would anybody want to steal Rouge? I'm sure I don't know. Whoever did it went to a lot of expense and trouble, and they murdered a man for good measure. Andrea! Why must you always be knocking things down? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Morton. My hand slipped. Well, be more careful. You say they killed a man, Mr. Dollar? Surely they did not do this over my little shipment of jewelers, Rouge. It sounds stupid, I know, but it was done. Why did you send Rouge all the way to Boston to Michael Adelson when you could buy the same stuff there? Oh, no, you're wrong. This is a private formula I developed myself. I sell it to a number of widely scattered people. They seem to prefer my mixture. Uh-huh. Who is Michael Adelson? A designer of expensive jewelry. His reputation in the field is first class. Well, Mr. Morton... That's all. That's all for today. But I'll be back.
All the time I was in there, the blonde, Miss Phillips, kept her blue eyes and her pink ears focused on me. My common sense spoke to my vanity and told it to play dead. She was interested in more than my profile. Outside, I spotted the plant across the street. I thought he was growing in the doorway until I approached him. He ducked clumsily and walked away with such obvious nonchalance that I was tempted to follow him, and I did. To a corner drugstore with a good view of the Morton Jewelry Company. We shared adjoining stools while he cut into a butterscotch sundae. Hey, uh, a little more butterscotch on this, please. You got the 20 cent special. What do you want for 20 cents? Butterscotch. Mm, okay. Okay, I don't pay for it anyway. What's the job? What's the. Huh? Oh, it's you. Well, beat it. Here. We're both in the same racket. Oh, insurance? Are you working on the Arcadia job, too? No. What's the Arcadia job? What are you working on? A railroad hijack. What's the Arcadia job? Oh, Ben Sanchez is my name. How do you do, Dollar? How do you do? Yeah, I'm working independent. I I, I don't take divorce cases. Me in two months, I haven't had a decent job. But I got myself a little old idea. You see, three months ago, a wholesale jewelry house was pried open, see? And 250000 worth of uncut stuff disappeared. And so far, none of it has showed up anywhere. And somebody will pay a lot of money if it's found. Especially an outfit called the Erie Mutual Fidelity. What's Morton's edge on it? Well, I, I could be wrong, but I've seen that guy operate for a number of years. See? Here's the butter, Scott. Yeah. Oh, thanks, thanks. A little jewelry store stuck off in a forgotten part of the city, you know, buys watches for ten bucks and sells them for twelve. Well, lots of guys do that. Yeah, okay. yeah, but they don't own a little old eighty five thousand dollar house in the Long Acre section with two new cars in the garage. And you think Morton has the Arcadia jewels? I think he's been a fence for a long time. There hasn't been nothing good to fence since the Arcadia job. He has a record? He has. Say what they steal of his from a railroad car. Just some jeweler's ruse, that's all. Oh, gee, maybe I'm wasting my time. Well, I hope you... Pardon me. A blonde came out of the jewelry store with a coat and hat on and climbed in an automobile parked down the street. I made for my you-drive-it model and followed her. At eight cents a mile, I was out about a buck twenty-five before she shut off a key and coasted into a curb. I went past her around the block, parked the car, and sauntered back to the house she had entered. It was just a house, nothing special, a... A few more bricks, maybe flagstones instead of cement for a walk. That was all. I stood looking straight at the house. When it turned out, I should have been looking straight behind me. Why don't you kind of put your hands behind your neck? That's it. You won't need this heater. Seems to me I've heard that voice before, and it was just as unpleasant. <laughs> now, why don't you kind of walk into the house? I would have been amused to know that I kind of wanted... Sorry. He would have been amused to know that I kind of wanted to get into that house as much as he kind of wanted me, too. We went up the walk arm in arm. He opened the door and graciously allowed me to enter first. The living room was empty, but I could hear voices Don't plainly in the next that room. Line. That stuff was worth more than you've ever seen before. Oh, shut up. I took a long time looking for two guys. Oh, what a lousy couple of chiselers I got stuck with. Hey, it's me, Trent. There's nobody got a even trust in this world. Hey, it's me. We stood there, trench beaming and me frowning, and they came into the room. The guy was big, black haired, and overdressed, the way the bartender had tagged him. It was Jake Samuels, all right, and hanging on his elbow, giving him a hot ear, was the jeweler's dame. Samuels wasn't in too good a frame of mind. Oh, blasted all over town. And you won't be able to touch me, because I got protection. Now, will you shut up? I got to talk with a friend. Johnny Dollar, Jake. Yes. Welcome to my house. Just the same, it's too bad you had to come. This isn't exactly the day we're receiving. Well, I work weekends, and this is the only time I could make it. <laughs> Jake will do the talking. What is it you want to see me about? Last night and the night before. Oh, you mean when we roughed you up? That and the Atlantic Central job and Rick's Blakey, whom you killed at the wheel of his truck. Then there's the little matter of your blonde girlfriend here. I saw her in Morton's jewelry shop. 
She couldn't possibly be the phony reporter who was hanging around the railroad yards. Or uh, could she? Jake, this guy really knows... Shut up, it. shut up. Is that all you can say? Yeah, is that all you can say? Shut up. Well, listen here. Shut up. I won't. You owe me $45,000. What are you talking in front of him for? What do I care about him? That's your worry. $5,000 for 300000 worth of jewelry. <laughs> Go on now, get out of here. Take what you got and consider it lucky. We took all the risk, now beat it. All right. All right, I'll beat it. When I come back, you're going to wish you were dead, Jake. Go on, you cheap... When she reached the door, she pulled a gun from somewhere, spun, and Trench got both slugs. He dropped groaning to the floor, and I kicked his gun into a corner. Jake Samuels stood frozen to the rug looking at the barrel of the automatic she held. The next one's going to be for you, Jake. You going crazy or something? Put down that gun. Go on. Say shut up to me now. Go on, say it. You yellow two-bit woman beater. Andrea, you're making a big mistake. No. Am I going to get my 45000 or not? But I, uh, I don't have that much in the house. Well, then call somebody and get it. I'll come up with some jewelry. Uh, yes, tomorrow. T- tomorrow, I promise. Not well. tomorrow. Today, now. Miss Phillips. I'm talking to him. And don't you get any ideas? Look, there's only one way for you to get out of this, and that's to kill everybody in this room. If you leave me alive, I'll track you down. That's what I get paid for. If you... Can the lecture. I know what I'm doing. If you leave Trench or Jake alive, they'll get you too. You bet we will. Oh, I'm so scared. Come on, Jake. The money. Right now, you've only got a petty crime against you. Do any more and it'll be murder. You'll last a month if that long. What are you getting at? Give me these two guys. Are you kidding? Turn them over to me and I'll go the limit in helping you. I'll forget the 5000 you got from them. The most you can get is a year in the county. 5000 clear is good dough. What happens to them? They're wanted for murder. I'll say in my report you turn them over to me. Maybe you won't get anything. Are you level? Well, of course he isn't, Andrea. I'm as level as a guy can get. Come on. Give me the gun, Miss Phillips. I don't know. It's that or a murder rap. Come on. Stay away from me. It's freedom or murder. Which one do you want? Give me the gun. Here. Here, take it. I didn't want to do this anyway for the start. This isn't living. This is... This is dying every day. You're lucky. You found it out in time. Miss Phillips. You know, except for the guy in the gas station, nobody ever called me Miss Phillips. And that polled him is the way it all wound up. I called the police and they took things in hand. The jewels, of course, were... Buried in the barrel of the jeweler's rouge, and Miss Phillips, knowing that Morton was unloading them in Boston, sold the information to Jake and friend for $50,000, which she didn't get. The Arcadia Wholesale Company jewels were in the stuff the police picked up. Oh, by the way, you'll notice one item on the expense account, $4.85. That was a gift, a foam rubber seat for Eve Grimm's surplus Jeep. Total expenses, $312. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman and John Michael Hayes with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can currently be seen starring in the Harry M. Popkin United Artists production, D.O.A. Featured in our cast were Ted DeCorsia, Pat McGeehan, Harold Durenforth, John Daner, Bill Boucher, Gene Bates, and Clayton Post. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. This is Bob Case, Dollar. Piedmont Mutual. I've got to see you right away. What's the rush? The girl was pulled out of the East River. It turned out to be a policyholder. What am I, a private eye? Why don't you go to the police to find your killers? Oh, we know the killer. He's being executed right after midnight. What we want to know about is the victim. Edmund O'Brien in another transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Piedmont Mutual Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my search for the beneficiary of policyholder Pearl Carassa. Expense account, item one, 450, mileage, Hartford to Sing Sing Prison, last place of residence of the girl's convicted murderer, Marty Pruitt. He was sitting in his cell playing solitaire. Hey, what time is it? About 11, Marty. An hour or more. How much did you say the policy was for? $5,000. $5,000. <laughs> That's funny. Just what I got paid for the job. Who'd she leave it to, the old lady? Yeah. yeah. I knew she would. You know where I can find the beneficiary? The beneficiary? You didn't know the beneficiary, did you? Never had the pleasure. And if you'd known her, you wouldn't be looking for her. Mrs. Carras's virtues are none of my business, Marty. The company is $5,000, and I've got to help them get rid of it. What good are you doing yourself by not telling me where she is, if you know? What time is it now? A little after 11. Boy, did that money look good. You know all the things you can do at $5,000? This girl back home. I was going to get married. Ah, nah. I wasn't going to get married. I'd have put it in roulette like all them other times. You never did say who hired you. No, that's right. I never did. Marty, I know you've been through this before, but you've got to admit it's a good point. You're going to die, and the real murderer is getting off free. Does that make sense to you? What's your business, mister? Insurance. Stick to it. I think I will. You know what I'd do if I was you? I'd take that $5,000 and put it in flowers. Thanks, anyway. Hey, Dollar, let me give you some last-minute advice. Leave it alone. It's the most unnatural mess you ever got yourself into and on your life. Expense account, item two, 356 mileage, Ossining, New York, to police headquarters, New York City, where the next morning, Lieutenant Bernard Goldberg offered me photographs of the dead girl, a cigar, and what little information he had. A body. We got the name off the wallet in her hip pocket. What? Slacks. Oh. A patrolman down at the docks picked up Marty Pruitt right at the scene. The trial was cut and dry. That's such a but it's funny about these guys. Yeah. He's crazy loyally to yeah, somebody yeah. who maybe wouldn't think twice about Hello, slitting his own... Yeah? Uh, two M's in remit. Uh, Donna, two M's in remit? No. No. Thanks, Donna. You don't have any idea where I can start looking for the mother. Most I can do for you is to give you the girl's last known address. But we've been over the ground a hundred times. It's a rooming house. Nice but stupid old couple that don't know nothing. This Seattle address on the policy. The 1941. Mm. Then San Diego. Then to Cairo, maybe. Who can know? But we're still working on it. Hey, Lieutenant. How do you spell parasitical? Tell them. Parasitical. Tell them to look it up. Look it up, Sergeant. What am I, a Webster? Expense account, item three, $1.50 cab fare to a stack of dirty bricks on the Lower East Side. Well, you have no business being up here in the first place, and especially with your husband in that condition. Looking for somebody, mister? Yeah, the manager. Third door to your right. Thanks. Now, don't tell me it's none of my business. Not when I bring soup down there every single day. Why, I never heard the like of you. Oh, you come in. Like Howard, why don't you sit down? Thanks. You the manager? 
I am the manager. Howard's the manager. Well, my name is Johnny Dollar. I'm with the... It's house. all right. We don't ask for references, do we, Howard? Except under special circumstances. I'm afraid you misunderstand. I'm not looking for an apartment. I'm an investigator with an insurance company, and I'd like to ask you a few questions. We never had a fire in this building that was next door. They keep rubbish in the basement. The company's warned them time and time again. Never does any good. I'd like some information about a girl who I understand was a tenant here. A Miss Pearl Carassa. The police were already here, Mr. Dollar. Four times. Yes, Lieutenant Goldberg thanked us for our cooperation. She was such a nice girl. Quiet. Homelike. And generous. Oh, yes, terribly. How long was she with you? How long was it, Howard? Uh, just two weeks. Just two weeks. But we got to know her so well. She was such a lonely girl. She used to come down after dinner sometimes and talk about music and all the places she'd been. Well, where'd she come from originally? She never said, but she'd been everywhere. In Florida. Everywhere. Did she have any visitors? Oh, no. I know, and the first thing she told us was no visitors. If anybody asked for her, she wasn't home. Such a lonely girl. So pretty, too. You think she'd have boyfriends? No, Mr. Dollar, no visitors. Did she act as if she were frightened of something? That's just what the police asked us, and we told them before, and we told them at the trial that we thought she was frightened. Yes, we had her luggage here for a while, but the police took it. I went through it, thanks. Did you notice all the labels from all over everywhere? Wonder what they're going to do with all those lovely dresses and shoes. Look, I know the police asked all these questions, but did you happen to notice if she got any mail? Yes, we did. She didn't. No, not a single letter, no. Hmm. She spend much time away from her apartment? Very little, only. Yeah, twice a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon, but she always came back within an hour. I don't suppose you have any idea where she went. That's right, we don't. Mm. What'd you say you were again? Insurance investigation. Thanks for your time. Expense account item four, fifty dollars in cab fares. It took me the rest of that day and half of the next visiting neighborhood postal substations. It looked like a beautiful way to waste time, but I was betting on the impossibility that her daily excursions had been for mail. This kind of foot padding taught me very little other than the fact that there are a good number of substations in any given half hour area. The second afternoon, I dragged into a fruit store which advertised postal station three two four along with a special on honeydew melon. I walked up to the little cage. Anything for Carassa today? Who? Carassa, general delivery. Just a minute. Grant? Carassa. C-A-R-R-A-S-A. Carassa. Just a minute. Yes, here we are. Please send postage to Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> I looked at the envelope. Pearl Carassa, all right. It had been forwarded from Las Vegas three days before. I said something to myself about hard work, patience, and fool's luck. Then headed for a phone. Hello? This is Dollar Bob. On the Carassa thing, I'm still cold on the beneficiary, but we've got the girl traced as far as Las Vegas. Well, that's a long haul for a $5,000 policy. Do you have a final address on her there? A letter was forwarded to General Delivery here in New York that was originally addressed to the Rambo Club. I got a permit and had it open. It's nothing but a dressmaker's bill. I guess the Las Vegas Postal Authority sent it on. That's all I got. You want me to follow it up? Nothing else we can do. You hereby have authorization. Get going. Expense account, item six, $200, air travel and expenses to Las Vegas, Nevada. Specifically, the Rambo Club. It's always the same when I hit Las Vegas. I expect to find tuxedos and evening gowns playing the games, but I never do. A boot black comes in off the street with the last quarter he made and plunks it down on 21. A grandmother with a California pension. A red-headed kid with Oscar's super service tattooed on his overalls. I always ask myself, where's all the big money? The answer is they're getting rid of it in the back room. Oh, Jackpot on the nickel one. How do you like that? Oh, boy. Come on. Jackpot. I told my relief I had to go powder my nose. What I really wanted was a drink. <laughs> sly, real sly. <laughs> Is this taken? No, sit down. Thank you. Uh, what do you have, mister? Uh, a good bourbon, soda. Oh, thanks for your confidence in me. I'll fix you up. 
You worked here long? Mm, have I? You like Nevada? Mm. <laughs> What's your hometown? Las Vegas, there I had in the summer. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess you know a lot of people here, huh? Mm, by sight, mostly. Very few by name. Everybody's a stranger. Say, uh, maybe you know a friend of mine. I went to school with her. Uh, what was her name again? Uh, oh, yeah, Carassa. Pearl Carassa. Save me my drink, Eddie. I gotta get back to work. Take it easy, mister. Best bourbon in the house. Thanks. Yeah, that's a buck and a half. This is a real clip joint. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. Thanks. Say, wait a second. You know where I can find Mrs. Henrietta Carassa? She's the mother of a girl that used to hang around here. Pearl. Well? Yeah. I think I can help you. Harry, take over. Here's your buck and a half. Come on. Oh, I'm sure going to win it this time. I'll tell you, boys. Wait a minute. Grace. Grace, will you quit? Grace, will you? Will you quit, Grace? Grace, I'm telling you, quit. Listen to me, Grace. Will you quit? Grace, quit. Ah, shut up. The stairway led to the mezzanine. I followed the bartender along the thickly carpeted hall to a door labeled Peter Barron. My benefactor knocked, a shadow loomed on the frosted glass, and just like that, there he was. A long red gash of a scar ran across the left side of his face, twisting it into a humorless smile. The barkeep was dismissed with a nod. We sat down. Cigar? Thanks, no. What can I do for you? I'm looking for a Mrs. Henrietta Carassa. Why? I got business with her. What kind of business? Insurance. She don't need no insurance. Where can I find her? She don't need no insurance. Well, thanks, anyhow. Sit down. What for? You see this mark across my face? You know how I got this? Asking foolish questions and not giving the right answers. Suppose you tell me what you want with Mrs. Henrietta Carassa. I'll tell Mrs. Carassa you were interested. Oh, look, look. This is no way to talk to me. Now, I got a lot of respect for your business ethics and all that, but you know how it is sometimes. Now, come on, Mr. Insurance. What do you want with Mrs. Carassa? Are you a pretty good shot with that thing? 38's on my specialty. In that case, I've got a check. What kind of a check? A $5,000 kind of a check. From whom? A daughter. Pearl? Pearl. She left her mother $5,000. How did you trace Pearl to Las Vegas? Ah, never mind. You know what you look like to me? You look like a city official. It's the pinstripe. Now, how do I find Mrs. Carassa? It's very simple. Mike. Mike, this is Mr. What's your name, insurance? Dollar, Johnny. Take Mr. Dollar to see Mrs. Henrietta Carassa. Treat him gentle. He's got some money for her. The place looked and sounded the same on the way out, but something was different. Maybe it was the four six-footers standing at the door. As they fell in behind me, I thought maybe I'd asked one question too many. At the alley, I found out how right I was. He was a tough one. Would have been easier to slip him a Mickey. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, you hear them all on CBS, and some of the funniest parts of that all comes from the bird brain of a woman, Miss Gracie Allen of Burns and Allen. Top troopers on the American stage for years. Top radio stars after that. George and Gracie are now playing a big part in CBS's great Wednesday night lineup. Bing Crosby, Groucho Marx, George and Gracie, and Dr. Christian. Join George Burns and Gracie Allen this Wednesday night on most of these same CBS stations. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. No 
There's a lot more to this case than a $5,000 insurance payoff. I'd sensed that from the beginning. A hired killer with a still unknown employer had searched out the girl in her New York hideaway and done a thorough, if not profitable, job. His warnings, which a man of my profession is bound to ignore, were beginning to materialize. As I woke up, I could hear voices. Could have brought another wallet with him and left at the hotel, you know. in the alley and Joe and Harry. Now, wait a minute. There. Wait a minute. Huh? I think he's waking up. Hold his head. Okay. Hey, you ought to get a doctor for him, maybe. Nah, doctor. Well, he looks terrible. Dollar. Dollar, can you hear me? Dollar. Huh? Where you yeah. from? Yeah, what's this insurance stuff? Who are you really working for? Is it the New York Police Department? Where did you get these cards in your wallet? Come on, Dollar. Answer me, Dollar. Uh, give me some water. Get him some water. Hey, get some water, Joe. Now, sit up. Come on, come on, sit up. Here, I'll help you. There. All right. All right, now, what's the idea? That's what we'd like to know. Where do you know Pearl Carasso from? Oh... That name. Come on. I'm looking for her mother. What do you want with her mother? Uh, she left an insurance policy. Girl, $5,000. Hey, here's the water. Thanks. Ah. Who are you? Pete Barron. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the face is familiar. You mustn't be bitter, Dollar. Why? Why questions? Look, I'm just a working man. It's It's so simple. There's a company in Hartford, an insurance company. They sold a policy. The girl aboard is dead. Policy is for $5,000. The money goes to her mother. All I want to know is, where is mother? No kidding. Are you really an insurance man? No kidding. Well, why didn't you say so? Why didn't you come right out with it? Why do you go sneaking into bars asking funny questions? Mister, do you know a Mrs. Henrietta Carassa? Here in Las Vegas? Here in Las Vegas. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll look it up for you. Thanks. Now, lay me back down again. <laughs> Expense account, item seven. Twenty dollars, doctor bills. Nothing serious, but I couldn't go out in the street looking like that. I stayed in my hotel room for two days until the swelling went down. On the third morning, I had a visitor. It was the girl who gave me the brush off in Rambo's bar. She had an overnight bag with her. There was a label. Bloomington, Indiana. You're in trouble, you know that? Three days ago, that information would have done me some good. I'm in real trouble. You don't think Pete Barron let you out of there because he believed your story. No more than you think you weren't followed here. I know, I know. She'd never come here. But Pearl, get a message to her, will you? Tell her never to show up here again. She won't. What do you mean she won't? She's dead. They got to her. Do you know why? I gotta get out of here. Wait a minute. Why did Pete Barron hire Pruitt to kill her? Let go. I gotta get out of here. She came up here for a purpose. Yeah, but I didn't know she was dead. You're gonna let him get away with it? It's narcotics. The gambling place is up front. They fly it up from Mexico at night and get out by morning. Pearl found out about it, and that's why they did it. Does Baron know Pearl told you all this? I don't think so. But I'm not taking any chances. I got a bus ticket. It leaves from across the street. I only got a minute. Good luck, honey. As she left, I went to the window and watched her leave the hotel and cross the street. A nice girl, I thought. And I wondered how she got mixed up with Baron's crowd. The bus door opened and she put one foot on the step. She crumpled to the sidewalk. The little overnight bag tumbled into the gutter. I got downstairs just ahead of the deputy sheriff, just after the bus had left. The people were still standing around. She was a nice kid. You knew her? Not for long. Did you see this happen? Yeah. Step over here for a second, will you, please? May I have your name, please? Yeah, sure. Here, here's my ID card. Insurance investigation. Something about her? No, a friend of hers. Pulled out of the East River. Pearl Carassa. Shot to death. Carassa? Yeah, you didn't know? Oh, we heard she left town. That was about all. She got mixed up with Pete Barron and her family disorder. Well, did you see what happened to this girl? She was just getting on the bus. Sounded like a rifle. She was working for Pete Barron, too. Yeah, I thought I recognized her. 
She just come up to see me, had quite a story to tell. Baron's running narcotics up from Mexico by plane. Yes, so I've heard. We had our eye on him for months, but we aren't ready to pick him up yet. Why would she tell you that? She had to tell somebody. She had a message she wanted me to deliver. To Pearl. Well, this is beginning to tie up. Uh, but what's insurance got to do with it? Caressa girl left a policy, $5,000 to her mother. <laughs> her conscience must have bothered her. It comes from one of the finest families in this part of the country and starts downhill with a crowd like that. Now, her mother needs $5,000 like I need two haircuts. And, mister, if I were you, I'd take that check out to Caracas and catch the next plane out of town. You know something, Sheriff? That's just what I'm going to do. And that's just what I try to do. Expense account item, eight fifty cents cab fare to the Carassa State on Juniper Drive. They should have charged admission. There was an ivied stone wall running all around it and a mild drive through a cactus rock garden to the mansion. I felt a little like a grocery boy delivering a check for a measly $5,000. I was met at the door by a butler in a business suit and was toured around an indoor swimming pool and potted palms to the library. Buried in a large leather chair, reading a 25-cent version of How to Be Your Own Gardener, was the man of the house. I was introduced and left alone with him. Insurance? Investigation. How long since you've heard from your daughter? Oh, such a long time, such a long time. I- is she in more trouble? She's dead, Mr. Carrasco. Dead? Pearl dead? Can't be. What happened? She was killed. An accident? No, it wasn't. Not an accident. Someone hired a killer. Oh. It's my fault. I knew. I knew, and I did nothing. Gregory. Gregory, I've been looking all over for you. Have you watered the palms today? No. You didn't water the palms. Now, Gregory, the leaves will get all yellow and fall all over the floor, and it'll take simply minutes to clean up the mess around the pool. And I told you specifically that the music club had changed from Wednesday to Monday, and Monday is tonight. This is a man from the insurance company. How do you do? Now, Gregory, please do this one thing for me. You know how much I have to do. Henrietta, it's Pearl. I told you never to speak that name in my presence. She's dead. Dead? She was murdered, Mrs. Grasso, in New York. I'm not sorry. Maybe I should be, but I'm not. Not in the least. She's never done anything but bring shame to me and to her father. She brought these awful people to the house. To this house, mind you. Humiliating me in front of my friends. She even wanted to marry one of them. Henrietta, please, not now, Henrietta. I'm not adept at putting on false grief like you are, Gregory. She was no good. When she brought this man in, I told her right there and then, you're not my daughter. Go to the people that you fit in with. Well, this is the way it had to end. I'm going upstairs. Uh, Mrs. Carassa, just one thing more. If you'll sign this paper, my job will be over. I have a check for you. A check? What kind of a check? She left you $5,000. Me? She left me $5,000? I remember. The policy she took out in high school. She never canceled it. Even when you sent her away. I don't want it. I don't want it. Tell me. Do you know who killed my daughter? Well, the man that did the actual killing has already been executed in New York State. The man who hired him, it's only a suspicion I'd rather not say. Baron. What about this check? I I don't think she wants the money. You can tell your company that. Look, Mr. Crasser, I've come a long way. I'll leave it here. You can sign the form and mail it. Do you mind calling me a cab? Expense account item nine, 50 cents cab fare. Just as we pulled out of the driveway, somebody else pulled in. I don't know if he saw me, but I saw him. It was Pete Barron. Are you sure, Donna? Positive. Sheriff, I woke up looking at that face. What would Barron be doing at Carassa's place? Could be a connection you didn't know about. Yeah, this could be the tie-up. We've been looking for somebody who supplied the dough. It's a big operation. I'm sure Baron didn't have enough dough to start it. Well, what are we waiting for? I rode down with the sheriff. We bypassed the butler by taking him into custody. 
We heard voices coming from the library and stopped outside the door. I had to do it. She threatened to go to the police. She may have been your daughter, but she wasn't mine. Now, why did you tell her? I didn't. She found out. She knew about us? Sure, she knew about you. She knew about everything. She would have turned you and your wife in a long time ago if you hadn't been her parents, but she was willing to turn me in, and I did what I had to. Wasn't my idea you coming into this thing, but now that you're in it, you've got to learn that things like this happen. Yes, and things like this happen, too. Come on. Drop it, Carassa. And look who's here. Hello, Mrs. Carassa. Let's go, Carassa. No, wait. I want you to know about this woman. I want you to know what she is. All respectability and shine. Chamber music and non-objective paintings in high society. And where did the money come from, Henrietta? From narcotics. From the same people you hated so much. Gregory, stop I it. had a tile business before the war, but it wasn't good enough for her. She wanted this place, Italian marble, tapestries. She met Baron in back rooms and arranged to have me buy into his gambling casino. That was the first thing. Don't you dare put the blame on me. Whose idea was it to have the narcotics flown in? How many times did I beg you to stop? But you never listened to me. You couldn't keep from impressing the ladies and gentlemen. And when Pearl wanted to marry a decent young man, you insulted him right out of this house. This is the woman who sent her daughter away because her friends were not good enough. I don't think you need me anymore, Sheriff. I'll just take that check and go home. Expense account, item 10, $200, transportation back to Hartford. I don't know what you can do with a check. If it were up to me, well, I'd use it to clean up the respectable slums. But that's not my problem. Expense account total, $712.55. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd and David Ellis with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can currently be seen starring in the Harry M. Popkin United Artists production, D.O.A. Featured in our cast were High Everback, Joseph Kern, Bill Johnstone, Bill Conrad, Martha Wentworth, Sarah Selby, Howard McNair, and Virginia Gregg. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. There's no more pitiful sound in the world than that of a hungry child. And it's a sound which can be easily heard in Europe and Israel, Korea, and the islands to the east. You can do much to help alleviate this condition through your continued purchases of care packages. Help banish the sound of hunger through your donations of care packages now. There's a man with a little black bag turns up on most of these CBS stations every Wednesday night. And out of it comes some of the most light-hearted and most moving stories on the air. The man? Why, it's Dr. Christian, of course. And tomorrow night's the night for another of his famous visits. Be sure to hear Dr. Christian starring Gene Hirschholt as the beloved small-town physician every Wednesday night. Now stay tuned for The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, which follow immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Wednesday night is Bing Crosby night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
from Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, Bob Hall at Plymouth. We've got a bad thing down here. Oh, what's that? One of our company investigators has been killed. I think you knew him, Gene Reimer. Gene Reimer is dead. Yeah, shot to death. We learned of it this morning. Sent him down to Charleston to look into a murder. Does his wife know yet? She was with him. I mean, she went to Charleston with him. We want to put somebody right on it, Johnny. That's why I called. Uh, oh, sure, Bob. I'll, I'll come right over and get the rest of the story from you. Edmund O'Brien in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense accounts, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Plymouth Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Leland Blackburn matter. Expense account item 1250, cab fare from my apartment to the Plymouth building. Hey, Johnny. Yeah? Oh, hi, Merle. What are you doing down here? It was Gene Reimer shooting. I wondered if it heard... He talks a lot about you. You were good friends. We learned the business together in the Pinkerton Agency. Almost opened our own office. It didn't pan out. I wish it had. We're going to miss him around here. He was a great guy. Yeah. When Bob Hall's waiting for me, Merle, I'd better get in there. Sure. Good luck, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Dollar. He's waiting for you. You can go right in. Thanks. How are you, Bob? Thanks for coming right over, Johnny. Wouldn't have blamed you if you turned it down. Forget it. I feel pretty awful about it. I gave the case to Gene myself. He wasn't up for one, but there would have been some extra money for him. I knew he needed it. He didn't have to take the case. He didn't have to earn a living this way. It's a funny thing for you to say. Well, there's no other way to look at it. You can't hunt trouble forever without finally running into some. I got the idea that you were his friend. I was. But you aren't hiring a friend, Bob. You're hiring an investigator. If you want me to go to work on this, I'd better get some facts. I don't understand you. What about the case he was on? You said it was murder? A policyholder named Leland Blackburn was bludgeoned to death in his home. How long had Gene been on it? Less than a week, five days. Had he sent in any report on what he'd learned? No, he hadn't. Is that all? That's all I know. He was staying at the Hotel Lee. His wife is still there. As I said, she'd been with him. I suggest you talk to her first. I will. I'll leave as soon as I can get plain space. All right, John. Good luck. Expense account item two, eighty-five dollars transportation between Hartford and the Hotel Lee in Charleston. It was 8.30 p.m. by the time I checked in, and my first move was to the phone. Yes? This is Johnny, Barbara. Johnny? Where are you? The floor above you. The Plymouth Company sent me down to look into Jean's death. Oh, I'm glad you're here, Johnny. When will I see you? As soon as possible. Well, give me just 15 minutes to put a face on it. Come on down. Johnny. Hello. It's been a long time. I I can't tell you what a shock it was to hear your voice on the phone. I I've been thinking about you. Oh? Well, it was natural to. You've been the only one I turned to when there was trouble. How did the company happen to send you? Because I knew Jean, I guess. Was anything said about us? There was no reason for that. Everything between you and me stopped when you got married. We'd better keep it that way now. Sure. It was a beautiful marriage all the way around. I told you it would be. You remember that? Yes. But there was a side of Jean Reimer that hardly anybody knew. You didn't believe me. I learned to. And you made some pretty serious statements to me after you did. I want to get that off my chest before we go any farther. I don't know how many times you told me that you were afraid you were going to kill him for what he'd done to you. And you meant it, didn't you? Johnny. The last time was less than a month ago. You don't think I killed him? I remember what you said. Johnny, don't. Why did you come to Charleston with him? Because he made me come. Why? Because it... I don't want to tell you. Why not? It doesn't have anything to do with what happened. Then you shouldn't mind telling me. He found out about somebody I'd been seeing in Hartford. I know it sounds cheap, but you must realize... Never mind that. 
Jean brought you down here to keep you away from this guy. Yes. Johnny, you can't think I killed him. I hope you didn't. For old times' sake, I'd hate to learn that you did. There were good times, Johnny. What do you know about the case Gene was working on? Nothing. He never talked about any of them. Well, I'll start on it tomorrow. Good night, Barbara. Expense account item three, two dollars, cab fare. The next morning, the police headquarters where I met Lieutenant Sims, the officer in charge of both killings. Well, looks to me like they piled a load of work on your shoulders, Dollar. You signed to both murders? Chances are that they go together, don't you think? Hard to figure that far yet. Well, what have you got on this Leland Blackburn? The file isn't complete on him. The widow and son refused to authorize an autopsy. It took a few days to force it through, so we got no report. Who was he? An old codger, a pillar of the old South, so to speak. He was a broker, him and his son Rollin, pretty wealthy folks. What do you think was the motive? Well, we're thinking it was robbery. Nobody knows how much, but old Leland's wallet was empty when they found it. He just told the phone operator he wanted the police when he was hit. The phone was still in his hand. Well, I'll have to go and talk to the family. Help yourself. Now, this other Hartford man, a likable kind of fellow, you know him? Yeah, I, I know Gene for quite a few years. Makes it bad when it's a friend, don't it? Well, it doesn't help. Do you have anything on his death? No, absolutely nothing. He was shot three times at close range with a thirty-two caliber gun. All three slugs went through him and smashed up on a brick wall behind him. Spoiled him for ballistics. Why did it happen? In an alley off Magazine Street. And that's why we can't figure any connection between that shooting and the Blackburn killing. You know this town? No. Why, no Blackburn had set foot in that Magazine Street section. They'd live at the other end of the town, south of Broad Street. That's a whole lot closer to heaven, I can tell you that. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Lieutenant. Looks like I've got a lot of cold trail to follow, so I'd better get moving. Later that day, after checking by phone to learn when the sun would be home, I went to the Blackburn residence. It was a warm, friendly estate glowing with southern tradition. The same thing could have been said about the widow, Mrs. Blackburn. But son Rollin must have taken after his father. What I resent most of all is that you are here simply because you suspect either Mother or me or both of us of nefarious plot. Now, Rollins. Isn't that right? Murder is a hard thing to ignore, Mr. Blackburn. I am not ignoring it, but I believe our local police are quite able to do what must be done. I just think you'd be interested in having as many people as possible working to clear it up. Naturally, I want to see my father's killers brought to justice. But I don't think father would appreciate the... Importation of investigators from Hartford? Rollin, please. I came here primarily to investigate the death of the first Hartford man. I'm afraid you'll have to put up with me until I satisfy myself that there's no connection between your father and what that. What possible connection could there be? I don't know. There isn't any. And if I hear of you dragging the Blackburn name into a sword of murder in that part of town, I will personally thrash you to within an inch of your life. Rollin, I must insist. I think perhaps that if you left, Mr. Dollar and I could conclude this meeting much more rapidly. Don't you have an appointment someplace? Don't you forget what I said, Dollar. I won't. Oh, I must apologize, Mr. Dollar. You don't have to. The loss of his father has been a great shock to him. And I must say that other young man who was here as pleasant as he tried to be did leave us with the impression that he suspected us. One doesn't say things like that about the Blackburns. It is an extremely proud and moral family. I understand. I don't want you to think that I... Now, Mr. Dollar, what do you want me to do? Well, I think you've probably been asked these questions by Mr. Reimer, but if you'll bear with me... Of course. Ah. Were you here the night your husband died? Yes. I was in the other wing where our bedrooms are. Rollin was there, too... But he came down to the kitchen, that's through there, and found poor Leland. Neither of you heard anything? No. I had my radio on, I remember. But even so, it is quite a big house. It's a beautiful house. Miss Blackburn, do you have any idea who could have done this thing? Any enemies of your husband's? I knew of nobody who disliked Leland. He was a charitable, honest man. And a pious one. I'm sorry, Mrs. Blackburn. I won't bother you any longer. 
My only hope is that I may join him soon. Lieutenant Sim. This is Dollar, Lieutenant. Oh, yeah. What have you been up to? I went out to see the Blackburns. How did you reconstruct the killing out there? Well, like I said, he still had the phone in his hand. He'd been hit a number of times with some blunt instrument. Anything to make you think there was more than one killer? No. The wounds were all on the right side of the head. Struck from behind by a right-handed man. Why? The son. He was a little agitated at my being there. He said killers. What's that? He said he wanted to see his father's killers brought to justice. Plural. What would make him say a thing like that? I don't know. Well, as it stands, it's not worth anything as evidence, but I thought I'd tell you. To me, at that moment, it meant there was a possibility that Rollin Blackburn knew more than he was saying. I spent another two hours trying to find something to strengthen that possibility, the financial condition of both the family and their brokerage firm. I got no place with it, but I returned to my hotel with the feeling that that one slip was going to develop into the link to connect Gene's death with the Blackburn investigation. The feeling lasted only a few seconds after I met the man who was waiting for me outside my room. Mr. Dollar, I'm Hal Brand. Oh, yeah? I'm the hotel detective here. Oh. I think I'd better talk to you. What about? The woman down in 413, Mrs. Reimer. How'd you find out about me? I've been keeping my eye on her. I saw you go to see her and checked on you. I had an idea that insurance company would send somebody else. Why have you been watching her? Her husband paid me to. I guess there was something wrong between them. Yeah. A man showed up to see her the day the husband was killed. I didn't get a chance to tell him, but I thought I ought to tell you. Who is he? Richard is his name. George. He's in the Clemens Hotel up the street. He checked in from Hartford, too. Come on the room, Brian. I want to hear the rest of it. Sure. There isn't much more. This Richard showed up at the Rhymer room about one in the afternoon. Rhymer was out, so I didn't get to him. And then he was shot that night about ten. Maybe it don't mean anything. You know where Richard's is now? He checked out this afternoon and took the 540 plane to New York. Want me pour you a drink, Brian? Sure. You know a man's a fool to marry a woman as beautiful as that? It always means trouble. That's my personal opinion, anyway. My wife's as ugly as sin, but that's as far as it goes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Have you told this to the police, Brian? Not yet. Why not? Oh, I figure a couple of days won't make any difference. If the police don't come up with something else, but then I'll tell them. You talk to her. What do you think? I don't know, but I'm going down to see her. Wouldn't be very smart, would it? Maybe not. That's the way I have to play it. Help yourself to another drink, Brian, and... And thanks. I've got to see you. Sure, Johnny. Come in. What's the matter? Why'd you lie to me last night? I, I didn't. I, I don't understand. George Richards. Why didn't you tell me he was here? How did you find out? He was seen coming to this room. Why didn't you tell me? I was afraid to. Yeah, that I believe. I put myself out on a limb for you today because I thought there was a chance you wouldn't lie to me. I withheld information. They want a motive for Gene's murder, and I didn't mention you. I didn't kill him. That doesn't mean anything now that there's Richards. I didn't know he was here until I opened that door. He stayed here ten minutes, and I made him leave. I told him to go back home or there'd be real trouble. He didn't leave until this afternoon. I didn't know that. Johnny, I, I know I should have told you last night. I've always trusted you, but I knew how bad the situation would look, and I I just prayed that nobody would know George was here. You weren't covering up for him? No. I didn't know, Johnny. I I didn't know he was still here. Quit it. Quit it, will you? Come on, sit down. Get a hold of yourself. Look, I want to believe you, Barbara. You know that. But it doesn't make any difference now whether I do or not. The police are going to learn about Richards. Are you going to tell them? I imagine they'll tell me. But I can't hold back anymore. And with the answers I'll have to give them, they can probably indict you for murder, or at least accessory with Richard. I didn't kill him. I, I don't know anything about stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I don't need hysterics. I need proof. 
How can you prove to me that you knew nothing about it? I don't know. Would Richards have done it alone? No. How can you prove that? It's a thing I know. I can't use things, you know. I need people and statements. People who will swear that they saw you at the time Gene Reimer was killed. People who will swear they saw Richard. It was nine o'clock. I was here. I can check that. That's all I know. Johnny, stop. Please stop. I can't stand anymore. Oh. All right, Angel. I'll stop. <laughs> I tried to find an alibi for George Richards that night, but a stranger in a city the size of Charleston is hard to nail down. I went to the Clemens Hotel and questioned bellboys, clerks, maids, and bartenders, but those who remembered him hadn't seen him during the evening in question. And I tried cab drivers with no better success. It was after midnight when I went to bed and nine the next morning when I was awakened by a summons from the police, accompanied by official transportation. Here he is, Lieutenant. Thanks, Sergeant. You can wait outside. Yes, sir. Sit down, Dollar. Thanks. I had an interesting chat with the hotel detective where you were stopping. Oh, I'm not surprised, Lieutenant. What's the matter with you, son? You put yourself in a pretty darn serious position by holding back information from me. Why did you do it? I'm not sure. You admitted knowing that Gene Reimer. Why didn't you tell me then that you, you knew about trouble between him and his wife? Well, I wanted to check the other angles first, the Blackburn investigation. How bad was this trouble? Pretty bad. Reimer had a mean streak that didn't show, except to his closest friends and intimates. You'd say uh, he did her bodily harm? Yep, lots of it. How'd you find out? From her. How well did you know her? I knew her before they were married. In love with her by any chance? If I had been, I would have married her. I know what you're driving at, Lieutenant. The possibility that, that I came down here to protect her from a murder charge. Well, that's half true. What's that? She's been my friend. I didn't want to see her pulled in if she wasn't mixed up in it. You don't think she was? I'll have to leave that for you. I know she had a motive, and to make it better, a possible accomplice turns up. But so far, it's all circumstantial. Well, we put a searcher out on this man, Richards. That's how good them circumstances look to us. Sure. And I'll bet I can reconstruct your reconstruction. A phony tip to rhyme on how to crack the Blackburn thing, an appointment on Magazine Street, and the payoff. Huh? You break that down? No, I tried. Barbara has an alibi, but Richards hasn't. Well, i got to have somebody for that killing, Dollar. I'm going to bring her in. I'm surprised you haven't already. I want to talk to you first. I want you to stay here while I talk to her. Why? Why, you think she'll break down because of me? What's the matter with that board? I'll be right back. i got to go get a man to pick her up. Contemplating suicide. Where's Lieutenant Sims? Just went out the other door. I'll be right back. Hey, you finally got the autopsy report on old man Blackburn. You sound as if you really didn't believe he was dead. Oh, no, he's dead all right. What is it, Sergeant? The Blackburn autopsy report. Yeah, look here. Hmm? Well, I'll be... Narcotics user. The press has been waiting for this, Lieutenant. And they've got a right to it. No, wait. Uh, don't give it to him yet. This has been pretty hard on that family. Hold on to it. No use dragging them through any more mud. At least till the federal men go to work on it. All right, sir. She'll be here in a few minutes, Dollar. So relax. I got to run through a few reports while we wait. It was hardly the time for relaxation, but I tried. We sat through an hour of questions to which there was no provable answers. And at the end of it, Barbara Reimer was booked on suspicion of murder and I was released on bail, charged with suspicion of being accessory after the fact. I had only one place to go. Good afternoon, Miss Blackburn. Good afternoon. Hi, Mr. Dollar. You remember me? Of course I do. I wasn't expecting you. I'm sorry I didn't have time to phone. May I come in? Yes. Your son at home? No, he's at the office. What is it, Mr. Dollar? A girl has been arrested because the police think she killed Mr. Reimer, the other man from Hartford. Oh, I didn't know. I don't think she did it. I don't think I understand, Mr. Dollar. Why have you come here? 
Because I think you know she didn't do it, Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Dollar. Could we sit down someplace? Yes. In the drawing room. Now, if you please, sir, what is the meaning of this? Why did you refuse to allow an autopsy to be performed on your husband? Because I believe it to be a revolting and savage practice. A mental torture that no one has the right to ask the survivors to experience. I will not condone it. Usually laws are stronger than human feelings. Do you know that one had been performed? I refused. Oh, Roland told me there was nothing to fear. He was wrong. I will not condone it. It's a matter of official record now, Mrs. Blackburn. The report says your husband was a narcotics user. He was not. He was. Your son knew it, and I think you did. I shall have to ask you to leave, Mr. Dollar. Please, Mrs. Blackburn, that wouldn't do any good. When I was here before, maybe you remember, your son said something he didn't intend to say. He told me that more than one man killed your husband. He said killers. He was upset. Both murders had something to do with the narcotics your husband used, didn't they? No. The police haven't been able to find a link between the Blackburn name and the magazine street section. The narcotics made that link, isn't that right? No. Gene Reimer must have found out. He was killed. Now a woman is charged with a murder she had nothing to do with. What else do you want? Oh, we thought we were doing the right thing. Why did you think that? We hoped to save Leland that shame. And Rollin, his son, and his widow. Gene Rhyme, I must have learned from you. No. No one was to be told. Mr. Rhyme discovered it himself. When he faced us, we begged him to say nothing. But when he threatened us, we told him their names. The names of the people who supplied your husband? Yes, and made a hell of our lives. They've extorted money from us for almost ten years. We, of the inviolate family. They killed your husband? They came that night to force him to buy more. And when he refused and tried to telephone the police, they killed him. I want you to tell me who these people are. We told Mr. Rama. And, and he... I won't go alone. It will be finished then. This farce we live. It would be finished anyway. Oh, yes. We go no further. There are two. One is named Miller. The other, Stone. Why do I find him? You won't go alone. We've caused one day. I'll be all right. All right. I'll tell you where to find them. I hadn't planned to go alone, but on the way I began to wonder if the time I spent interesting the police wouldn't be used by Mrs. Blackburn to warn the two men whose capture would put the finish to the family reputation. So I didn't contact Lieutenant Sims. Instead, I stopped by my hotel to pick up an automatic and cab to the Magazine Street address by myself. I'd take it easy up there if I was you. Thanks, I will. Here you are. Thanks, sir. What's the difference? None. Hey, hey, now, what is this? Who are you? Miller. What's the idea of pushing in? I just came from the Blackburn place. Where? The old lady is tired of trying to save the family pride. She talked again. What? What other reason would I have for being here? She's ready to talk to the police about her husband. I'm ready to talk to you about Gene Reimer. I don't get it. You'd better start. Come on. Where? Out the door. We'll find our way. Now, listen to me. You can't pull a man around like this without saying why I haven't done nothing. Then why argue? All right, I'll go. Miller! Miller! Miller? Get away from me. Find Stone, I... I gotta talk to Stone. He did get a chance to talk to Stone, but not before Lieutenant Sims heard him out and added his statement to that of the surviving Blackburns, which cleared Barbara Reimer and yours truly. 
Expense account item three, $110. Miscellaneous expenses in Charleston. Item four, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total. Oh, excuse me. Yep. Hello, Johnny. Oh. Hi, Barbara. I, I thought you were coming over. It's after four. Uh, well, as a as a matter of fact, I was just going to phone. I I can't make it. What's the matter, Johnny? I've got another case. What's the matter, Johnny? I I have to earn a living. All right. You know where to find me if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, I'll try to call you when I get back to town. Okay? Goodbye. Uh, expense account total, $345.75. Remarks? This was a fairly personal assignment, and it brings to mind a fairly personal observation. Cops, private or otherwise, should never marry. They're lousy husbands because they're away from home so much. But more important, they leave too many widows. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien's latest picture is the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were John Daner, Jim Nusser, Jeanette Nolan, Georgia Ellis, John McIntyre, and Larry Dobkin. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dan Coverley inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. You can sing it again on CBS tonight for a whole hour of fun-packed, music-packed entertainment. And maybe Dan Seymour will be calling you to solve one of the tuneful little riddle songs that lead to a chance at radio's largest cash jackpot, $5,000, plus $10,000 more in wonderful prizes. Alan Dale, Judy Lynn, Bob Howard, the Riddlers, and Ray Block Orchestra are on hand to sing and play the riddle tunes leading up to Dan Seymour's Coast to Coast Calls. Be listening again later tonight when Sing It Again comes along on most of these same CBS stations. Now stay tuned for Von Monroe's Caravan, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you laugh with Lucille Ball and my favorite husband on Saturday nights, the Columbia Broadcasting System. John Lund as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Eastern Indemnity and Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the King's Necklace matter. Expense account item one, $134.70. Airfare and incidentals between Hartford and Miami. Waiting at the airport, as promised, was your southern state's agency manager, Marty Fenton. Over a cup of brew in the coffee shop, he briefed me on the assignment. Ever hear of King Rawlings, Johnny? King Rawlings? Financial tycoon, wasn't he? Retired some 15, 20 years ago? That's the lad. About a year ago, he wrote a policy in a quarter of a million dollar necklace that he owned. Which has suddenly turned up among the missing? Uh, Not yet. You expect it to? We got a letter from him day before yesterday. Claims somebody attempted to break into his safe. Thinks they were after the necklace. Well, I'm usually sent for after the crime's been committed. True, my lad, true. Pass the sugar, will you please? Sure. So what am I doing here now? The policy's coming up for renewal, Johnny. There have been nasty rumors circulating around about Rawlings' present financial condition. Brady's starting a build-up to put in a fraudulent claim? It's been done before. 
The boys in Hartford get pretty stuffy about that kind of skullduggery. Now, we want you to check around Los Banos and see what you come up with. Is that where the gentle sea breezes waft through the palm trees? Two thousand imported ones. Los Banos is Rawlings' own personal island off the coast of Cuba. He's lived there for 20 years, surrounded by his memories, his trees, and his collection. Of precious stones? Uh Uh-uh. People. Oh, your plane's waiting, Johnny. I hired a little amphib to fly Let's not brush off the collection of people, Marty. Who am I to prejudice a stalwart investigator about to brave the dangers of Rawlings Isle? On your way, lad. May the blessings of Eastern Indemnity follow you even unto the ends of Los Banos. After one and a half hours of white clouds and blue sky, the plane put down in an even bluer sea and taxied over to a landing dock on a picture book island. King Rawlings had collected palm trees, all right, but I didn't know about the people. From where I stood, there was nothing to be seen but the landing dock, a gravel path, and those trees. The path led through a seemingly deserted tangle of exotic flowers, sweet-scented vines, and the ever-present palm trees. It was like a tropical paradise, peaceful, serene, untouched by men. I'd just about decided that nobody on this island ever made use of this lush garden spot when I learned that I couldn't have been more wrong. Over here, please. Well, hello, wherever you are. Over here, in the clearing to your right. Hello. Who are you? My name's Johnny Dollar. I am Nita Valdez, Mr. Dollar. Well, I'm glad to know you, Miss Valdez. You are the man who arrived on the plane a few minutes ago, no? I didn't think anyone had heard. The hospitality is overwhelming. You have become accustomed to it. Everyone here is too occupied with himself to bother concerning anyone else. Like me, I have been too busy sunbathing. Yes, uh, so I noticed. If it bothers you, you could hand me my robe. Oh, no, no. That won't be necessary. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. You have come to see the king about the attempt to steal his necklace? Apparently sunbathing hasn't interfered with your learning about that. You obviously do not know King Rawlings very well. Why do you say that? Everyone on this island has been accused of attempting the theft. Including you? Why should I be an exception? Oh, just wondering. Because I'm young and beautiful, you think perhaps I hold some special place of esteem in King Rawlings' affections? Well, do you? Can you reach that bottle of suntan lotion? Yeah, sure. The back of my shoulders, would you mind? It is a difficult place for me to reach. Oh, I'll be glad to. About the necklace, Mr. Dollar, I would not be too concerned about it if I were you. Oh? Why not? Well, if anyone had actually made an attempt to steal it, the king knows who he is. But he's still accused everybody here, huh? It affords him a great deal of pleasure to make others squirm and be uncomfortable. You don't like him very much, do you? I hate him. Then why do you stay here? Same reason as everyone else. Money. Oh, that will do nicely, thank you. You're welcome. Do you mind explaining that bit about money, Miss Valdez? Later, perhaps. The sun is still warm and I wish to take advantage of it. We will meet again. A polite dismissal if I ever heard one. You're wondering, perhaps, why I stopped you to talk this way? The thought had occurred to me, yes. When you meet the king, get to know him a little... I think you will understand why. And if I don't? I sunbathe here every day at this time. I'll think about that, too. I found that Rawlings, like all good kings, lived in a castle. This one, obviously imported stone by stone from some Moorish province. A nervous little man came to the main gate and escorted me inside to the baronial hall. Harley is my name, Mr. Dollar. Timothy B. Harley. I'm Mr. Rawlings' secretary. In here, please. Mr. Rawlings, steady. He'll be down to join you shortly. Thanks, Mr. Harley. I presume you're here about the uh, necklace, Mr. Dollar? A favorite topic of conversation around here, isn't it? 
I beg your pardon? The necklace. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, under the circumstances, you see, the attempted theft and all, it, uh... Has someone else mentioned it to you? Any reason why they shouldn't? Oh, and, oh no, 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 not at all, no. It was just that, well, um... Was it Nita Valdez, by any chance? What makes you think so? Why, oh, nothing. Oh, no, no, nothing at all. Only, you see, it was where, uh, to tell you the truth, I, I've suspected something for a long time. It's come to my attention. You talk too much, Charlie. Oh, oh Mr. Rawlings. Oh, oh, I didn't hear you come in. I was just telling you. Get out. Oh, well, well, of course, Mr. Rawlings. Of course. You're from the insurance company? That's right. Johnny Dollar. Why you instead of Marty Fenton? He's an agent. I'm a special investigator. I didn't request an investigation. You made a report of an attempted robbery. What do you want me to do? Have you declare the policy void because I didn't? What do you want us to do? Thank you for letting us pay out a quarter of a million if the necklace turns up missing. Over here, darling. There's the safe I keep it in. Hmm. Pretty substantial job. Fenton supervised the installation himself. Those scratches near the combination, those what made you think somebody tried to force it? Only a hammer and chisel could make those marks. Uh Uh-huh. I'd like to see the necklace. Of course. Who do you think was after it? Either Harley or my protege, Anita Valdez. Why suspect them? They love money and hate me. You care to go into that? You're investigating the necklace, Dollar, not my relationships with the people on this island. There it is. Oh. Beautiful workmanship. What else did you expect for a quarter of a million dollars? A little more than this, Rawlings. Hmm? I'm no expert on precious stones, but ten will get you twenty if these aren't paste. Let me see. Hmm. You're right, they are. Any explanations? None. You've no idea how the switch was pulled? I have not. When was the last time the necklace was appraised? When the policy was written. Who else has the combination of this safe? No one. Oh. Kind of puts you in a spot, doesn't it? Not at all. I'm insured. The law says we don't have to pay off on fraudulent claims. I know. The law also says you have to prove that fraud exists. I broke the news to Marty and looked around for something to improve the shining hours while waiting for him to arrive. I found it. Dressed in a clinging silk gown on a patio overlooking the sea. It was obviously the cocktail hour. Mind if I join you? Oh, please do. I can't make up my mind. To what, Mr. Donner? Which shows you off to greater advantage? That dress or the sunset? <laughs> For that, you may have a choice of rewards. Scotch or martini? Nothing, thanks. Well, what did you think of him? The king? Yes. I'm more interested in what you think of him. I have already told you. I know. He confirmed your statement. That I hate him? Mm Mm-hmm. You can believe it. I do. What I want to know is why. King Rawlings is a collector. Stamps, butterflies, out-of-state license plates? Of people, Mr. Dollar. How does this fascinating game of his work? He specializes in aspiring artists with little or no talent. An actress like myself. A would-be poet like Harley. He baits his trap with a promise of money to aid their careers. Keeps them dangling as long as they can amuse him and feed his ego. Then he cuts them off. Very amusing. Yes, isn't it? Well, if you know what he is, why stay on? Oh, it's much easier to cling even to a remnant of a dream than to face the harshness of reality. How tough would it be to face reality with a quarter of a million dollars? The necklace is gone. Does that surprise you? No. It was too great a temptation. For you or Harley? For either of us, if we had known the combination to that safe. 
<laughs> no, Mr. Dollar, it was the king himself who was tempted. Well, that doesn't figure. Not with his money. If he still has it. Why do you think he hasn't? What other answer could there be? Hmm. Might be interesting to try to find out. Oh, you would be wasting your time, Mr. Dollar. I've got some to spare. Perhaps I could find you some. I don't have any money. Oh, that was rather cruel. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Dollar, is that you? Uh, oh, yes, yes, of course it is, yes. Why the oh. excitement, Harley? Tell me, is it true that the necklace has been stolen? Looks like it. Why? I wonder if that could possibly account for it. For what? Uh, Mr. Rawlings. He's lying on the second floor landing. I think he's dead. Timothy B. Harley couldn't have been more right. King Rawlings was lying stone cold dead on the second floor landing. When Marty Fenton flew in three hours later, accompanied by a Captain Fuentes of the Havana police, I gave them a fast briefing. Marty's reaction was predictable. Nobody gets off this island until we learn what's happened to that necklace. Right, Captain Fuentes? Yes, I agree, Senor Fenton. Up to a certain point. What point? What do you mean? The good captain apparently feels there might be something more important about all this than a missing necklace. What could be more important than a quarter of a million in stolen jewels? How about murder? Never entered my mind. Naturally not. Eastern indemnity only insured Rawlings Stones, not his life. Uh, I guess I had that coming. Senor Dollar is quite correct, however. The cause of Senor Rawlings' death is not apparent at the moment. It will require an autopsy to determine. And if it's murder? We must then regard everyone who was present upon this island with suspicion. Uh, what help can you give us regarding that, Senor Dollar? Well, just what I've told you. Outside of the servants, only Harley, Miss Valdez, and I were among those present. And who was the last to see Senor Rawlings alive? So far as I know, I was. But Harley could have been with him after Rawlings left me in the study. For that matter, Miss Valdez could have seen him, too. Before our little tete a on the patio. Look, fellows, me lads, I don't want to appear single-minded about this little affair, but we don't know whether Rawlings was murdered or not. However, we do know Eastern indemnities out of cool 250 G's if that necklace doesn't turn up. Uh, payable, of course, to Senor Rawlings' estate. Sure, but who cares who it's payable to? What I'm interested in is not paying it. Thinking of possible motives, Captain? Uh, the heir to Senor Rawlings' fortune might well be suspect. So would whoever stole the necklace. If Rawlings had tumbled to him. And there's always plain hate, isn't there? You have something specific in mind, Senor Dollar? Mm, just a suggestion, Captain. When he's had his plane fly Rawlings' body back to Havana for posting, while he conducted a very thorough, if unenlightening, questioning of those present. Apparently, no one had seen Rawlings after he left me in the study, had any idea how he died, or what had happened to that necklace. Fuentes knocked off around midnight, and everyone ostensibly went to bed. I still had a few unanswered questions kicking around, so I went up to Harley's room to try them out. Why, yes, Mr. Dollar, Mr. Rawlings had a will, but as I told Captain Fuentes, it's locked in the safe. And it'll take a court order and some professional safe crackers to get at it, I know. But what about the copy? Copy? It's customary for the attorney who drew it up to retain a copy. Oh, yes, of course, I hadn't thought. Uh, Senor Chavez must have one in Havana. He's an attorney there? Yes, as a matter of fact, he handled most of Mr. Rawlings' financial affairs. Well, he must have a copy. Oh, why don't you ask him? Oh, I will. But uh, first, I'd like to know why you were planning to leave Los Banos. Leave Los Well, how did you know? Well, maybe you can think of another reason for having a half-filled suitcase laying there on your bed. Oh, that, oh yes, of course. Yes. I was planning to leave. Uh, no reason why I shouldn't. After all, my employment here has been terminated. Have you discussed the idea with Captain Fuentes? Well, uh, no, but why should he object? I'm not guilty of anything. Just a thought, Harley. Mind if I take a look at that suitcase? No, no don't. Don't touch that. I don't. Well, what do you know? 
A brown paper parcel neatly wrapped and tied. You mind telling me what's in it? It's none of your business. Put that down. It wouldn't be a necklace by any chance, would it? Put it down, Dollar. Oh, sure. Right away. Well, now that's interesting. All new, crisp, in hundred-dollar denominations. Hmm. Must be close to ten thousand dollars here. Well, what of it? It's mine. Oh, I don't doubt that. I'm just wondering where you got it. I saved it. Working for Rawlings? Yes, why not? I saved it working for Rawlings. It's mine. Okay, Harley. I don't want it. Don't you really know why Captain Fuentes might object to your leaving now? No. I most certainly don't. Huh. Remarkable. There wasn't anything I could do before morning rolled around except smoke a last cigarette and try to think things out. So I went out in the same patio where Anita and I had had our talk and lit up. The one cigarette turned into two. Then I started to light a third one. That was a mistake. I saw the muzzle flash. It came from somewhere inside a clump of palm trees. But with a full moon behind me, I wasn't going to get heroic about it. I made a dive for a concrete retaining wall. I didn't think the shots I'd snapped out had done any good, and I had no intention of finding out. Not with that moon lighting things up. So I made myself comfortable with my back to the wall and waited for the Cuban Marines in the person of Captain Fuentes to come charging to the rescue. Some 15 minutes later, Marty, the captain, and I held a council of war on our way down to the landing docks. I found these two empty shells under one of the palm trees, Senor Dollar. But that was all. No trace of the person who fired them. What about Harley? He's not in his room. So far, I've been unable to locate him. Now, hardly seems reasonable, Johnny. What could be so important about that money you saw to make him want to kill you? I don't know that he did, Marty. But I'd like to ask him a couple of questions about it. But why come down here to the boathouse, Senor? Well, with your plane gone, there's only one way off this island. Rawling speedboats. We'd better make sure they're locked up tight. One of the slips is empty. It wasn't when I got here. We heard no motor, senor. Well, that's nothing that a paddle and a pair of willing arms can't explain. Harley? That's my guess. And it's ten to one he has the necklace with him. Expense account item two. Five dollars and sixty-five cents. Breakfast for two in Havana, where Martin Fenton and I found the Bougainvillea and the tourist rates in full bloom. We wanted to talk to Senor Chavez, Rawlings' lawyer, and after a rough trip on one of the speedboats and that rougher breakfast tab, we made our way to his office. See, I have a copy of Senor Rawlings' will, but... You understand I cannot disclose its contents until the court so order. But we don't want any details, Senor Chavez. Huh? But I understood you were inquiring about beneficiaries. All we want to know is if he left anything to a Timothy Harley or Anita Valdez. I see. Well, we've explained the circumstances, Senor Chavez. It can't violate any professional ethics to give us a yes or no to those two names. No, uh... No, I do not believe it is unethical to tell you this much. No individuals were named in the will. Only charitable and public welfare institutions. Well, that eliminates the heir apparent angle, Jenny. Mm. One more thing, Senor Chavez. There have been rumors that Rawlings' fortune was almost gone. Any truth to them? Not a bit. All his investments were most judiciously placed. He was perhaps wealthier at the time of his death than at any time during his life. Well, you've been a big help. Thanks. For now, it is an attorney's duty to obey the law, is it not? Any time you are here in Havana, please to stop in. It would be my pleasure. I will do, Senor Chavez, and thanks again. Well, that was a great help. I cleaned up some loose ends. It's a loose necklace I'm worried about, Johnny. Where do we go from here? We can check out the local police, see if they've picked up anything on Harley. Good as anything, I guess. Oh, which way? We passed it on the way up here. We'll the go right... Senor Dollar. 
It is most fortunate that you are still here. There is a phone call for you in my office from the island of Los Baños. Oh, thanks, Senor Chavez. Uh, there, on my desk, Senor. Johnny Dollar. This is Captain Fuente, Senor Dollar. I have some information for you. Oh? What is it, Captain? First of all, the autopsy report on Senor Rawlings has come in. Natural death? See, huh? si, that is correct. From an old aggravated heart condition. But how did you know? No real reason for anybody to murder him. What else? We have found Senor Harley's body at the north end of the island. Apparently his motor stopped and his surf dashed him against the rocks. His skull was fractured. You didn't find the necklace on him? No, but he's the one who stole it. What makes you think so? In his wallet we found a slip of paper, senor. On it was written, the combination of the safe. Expense account item three. Thirty-five dollars. Transportation of speedboat back to Los Bernas. With Captain Fuente's report, there was no need to report directly to the island, and Marty was anxious to get back to the office and bring you up to date. So he chartered a plane, and we took off for Miami. Well, Johnny, my lad, we chalk up another happy collaboration, huh? Yeah, you might call it that, Marty. A king there was. You know, somehow I don't think Rawlings was a very happy man with all his dough. Hold up on that island, nothing but hate around him. Well, money's not the answer to everything. No, but as the saying goes, it sure helps. But then I guess it didn't help Harley much either. I wonder if we'll ever find that necklace. It'll turn up. You're pretty optimistic, aren't you? No, I'm sure of it. Well, come on, Johnny, give. Where do you think it is? Right there in your briefcase. It's not a very funny gag, Johnny. No, Marty. It's not. And how about changing the snapper? I wish I could, Marty. But it figured all along. Mm. Looking for every possible loophole, I guess. But they all closed up on me. Where did I slip? Where they all slip. At the very beginning. When you first thought of it. What tipped you? Rawlings swore that only he knew the combination of that safe. He was wrong. One other man knew it. The one who supervised its installation. <laughs> you should have known you'd tumble to that. The paste pinned it down even closer, Marty. The reproduction was too good. No wonder. You had every descriptive detail in your copy of the policy. Weights, dimensions, photographs, everything. I didn't go back to the island, Johnny. How could I make the switch? That's where Harley came in. You slipped him the combination and he made the switch. That's why the 10000 payoff... And why you had to kill him and frame it as an accident. Maybe I should have killed you, too, when I had the chance on the patio. You've still got your gun. Nah. What's the use? It was wrong all the way. Besides, I never could outshoot you. Expense account item four, $32.15. Hotel bill and incidentals in Miami. Item five, $141.10. Plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $348.60. Remarks. With all due deference to my chosen profession, sometimes this is a lousy business. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Sidney Marshall with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were Jack Moyles, Lillian Bayef, Tom Tully, Howard McNear, Nestor Piva, and Don Diamond. 
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Ned Talbot, Johnny. What are you working on? Why, nothing at the moment. I was thinking of going to New York for a couple of days. Why? Well, I have one here on my desk you might be able to do something with while you're there. Well, tell me about it. Corinthian covers a textile outfit in New York, Wallace Cottons and Company. This week, their auditors found a shortage in the books. How much of a shortage? Well, it's nearly 5,000. Wait, I got it right here. Uh, $4,185. And I'm supposed to find out who took it? Oh, no, we already know who did that. One of the bookkeepers in their office, uh, Lester James. He's been arrested and admitted everything. I thought maybe you could find out what he did with all that money. Well, I'm going to New York anyway. I'll see what I can do. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lester James matter. Expense account item one, $32.56. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. After receiving from Ned Talbot the necessary information concerning the indemnity claim of Wallace Cottons and Company, Incorporated. I arrived in New York at 1.30 in the afternoon and checked in at the New Weston. Central Division told me that Lester James was being held in the 17th Precinct Jail. I went right over. Well, here you are, darling. Now what? Take it easy, James. This is Johnny Dollar. He wants to talk to you. Hello, James. Hi. Uh... I'll see you later, Dollar, huh? Yeah, thanks, Sergeant. You'll give me a yell when you finish, huh? Right. Well, what are you? Lawyer or something? Nope. I don't want a lawyer. I said somebody would be around to talk to me again, but I don't want to see anybody. Why not? I just don't want to see anybody, that's all. Well, you'll have to be represented by counsel when you go into court. All right, let somebody represent me. Just a technicality, anyhow. I know what'll happen in court. I've got my confession. Who are you, anyway? I'm an insurance investigator. Well, what are you doing here? A swell day outside. I'm trying to find out what you did with that 4,185 bucks that you took from Wallace Cottons. That? Yeah, that. How about it, James? Isn't it enough that I'm in jail? It's enough for the police, but not for my insurance company. I don't have anything to say to you. Now, look, don't be foolish. A whole or a partial recovery will have a lot to do with what happens to you in court. I don't want to be foolish. It's just that I spent it all, every dime of it. No way to pay it back. Spend it on what? Doesn't make any difference. Might make a lot of difference. I don't have anything to tell you. You've never been in trouble before, have you? No, no. They think of things like that when a man comes up for sentencing. Now, this is your first offense. I know, I know. You trying to shield somebody, James? Why don't you go away? You been trying the market? Did you gamble with it? No, no, just leave me alone. 
I won't tell you anything, Mr. Dollar. If you bought something with it or gave it to somebody, if it can be recovered in some way... No, part... no, I tell you... Go away, leave me alone. I'd like to, but you're a thief, James. And you're going to get what's coming to you. I can't leave you alone. Listen. Now, you listen to me. If I don't get the information I want from you, I'll get it elsewhere. I'm going to be real honest with you. Corinthian Liability wrote a blanket policy on Walls, Cottons, and Company, promising to pay them in full for every loss caused by fire or theft on their premises. Now, no insurance company takes the word of some guy sitting in a jail cell where there's cash to be recovered. It's the same as stolen property. If you gave it to someone or spent it when it wasn't yours, it's still redeemable. Now, what do you have to say? Look, Mr. Dollar, this won't do you any good. I'm no low forehead job who got caught crawling in a drugstore window. I'm a college graduate. I've been in the business world for ten years or better. I know what I want to tell you and what I want to keep to myself. And I don't want to talk about this, do you understand? And there's no way or no person who can make me talk about it. I took the money, I admitted that. I did a bad job of it, I was caught, I've confessed, and you've got me. And that's the whole story. Okay. Have it your way, Lester. Go away. Just go away, please. Lester James was a tall, dark-complexioned man in his early 30s. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His features regular. Not good, not bad. The kind of man you see every day on the street. Somehow, the kind of man I hadn't expected to meet. Expense account item two. Dollar thirty-five, cab fare. I went over to the apartment on 59th Street where Lester James had lived. According to the penciled note above the first door to the right of the entrance, Mrs. Anastasia Denovich was the manager. Yes, what is, please? Uh, you're uh, Mrs. Denovich? Yes, what do you want, mister? I understand that uh, Mr. Lester James lived here, is that right? Oh, yes, dead. Dead. I hear he steals money, and that's bad. Yeah. Uh, I'm from the insurance company, Mrs. Denovich. We're trying to recover some of that money if we can. Wonder if you could help me. I fixed dinner now for my son. He's come home from work. What I do? Well, I want to know about Lester James. What is? It works, Mrs. Denovich. Did he drink? Gamble? Did he stay in nights or go out? Did he pay his rent? You're a policeman? Insurance investigator. Oh, please. Sometime else. Okay, it's important now. I talked to Lester on phone. He said I don't have to answer any question. Well, you don't have to, but I'd appreciate it if you would. My son home soon. Uh, oh. All right, mister. I know these things. You ask about men who live here. Well, look, how about his friends? Who visited them? I no. I cannot say. No visitor. Oh, is he a good tenant? No trouble. Like Mr. O'Sullivan on third floor, always drunk. Fine. Did you ever meet his girl? Girl? Oh, sure, his girl. He oh. has a girlfriend. No, I, I never see girlfriend. Uh, how long have you known him? Five, six years, maybe, ever since he moved in here, this place. You know how he spent his time? Work. He wore a cart. No, I mean besides working at the textile company. How else? I, no. He poor fellow, that one. How's that? He's still money through, but he poor fellow, just same. For him, I feel. Yeah. Lester, he quiet and he think. I know he live up in that little room quiet. Think he does all the time, he think. Oh, my son's dinner, please. You go now. Just a minute. I'd like to see his apartment if I can. Mm. No matter. You bring key back, please. Mm. Thank you, Mrs. Denovich. The apartment Lester James had lived in was as dismal as the neighborhood. A tiny closet kitchen, a bed that came out of the wall, and a pair of grimy windows that looked across the court into another pair of equally grimy windows. The furniture was early 30s and threadbare. Among his personal effects, I found nothing of value. The apartment yielded no more information than James had. Expense account item three, $1.95, dinner. I had it in a neighborhood restaurant called the 59er. A place where, I learned, Lester James had frequently eaten. The restaurant manager remembered him and liked him. 
A woman who ran a bakery shop across the street told me how he'd come back from the war in 1946 and had worn his uniform for a month until he got a job and could buy some civilian clothes. All in all, I was getting a composite picture of Lester James that didn't look quite right. Whatever he was to the people who knew him casually, he wasn't a man who ever had any money to spend. Well, hiya. Hi. No good, huh? Uh-uh. Well, that's where it goes. We had some action here today, no? Oh? Sit down. Jim's preliminary hearing was this afternoon. A man from the district attorney's office took about 15 minutes to lay out the evidence against James. Uh-huh. And the public defender took about three minutes trying to get James to answer one question. What did he do with the money? Did I miss anything? No, not a thing. Wouldn't open up at all. Just said that he'd spent it. Well, public defender about threw up his hands. I'm about ready to throw up mine. When is the trial set for? Uh, sometime next week. I'd like to talk to him again. He been moved yet? Didn't go to the sheriff's office. Somebody bail him? He bailed himself. $200 he had in war bonds. Has he left yet? No. Well, get out till about six. That's when the ship changes. Are oh, you still want to see him? Yeah, I'll wait. An hour later, when Lester James emerged from the doorway and turned right, I followed him about a half a block behind. When he caught a cab and headed uptown, I caught one. Stayed right with him. When he got out of the Empress Theater and walked around to the stage door, I was standing at the alley entrance. Ten minutes later, he came out and hailed a cab. Once more, I followed. This time, he went back to his apartment on 59th Street. I waited 15 minutes before I went in. James? James? James, it's me. Johnny Dollar. I got a couple of whiffs of it standing there in front of the door. <coughs> the room was acrid, stinging with gas fumes. And Lester James was stretched out on the floor of his six-foot kitchen. <coughs> when I picked him up and carried him out, I didn't know whether he was alive or dead. John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Thirty seconds after I found Lester James, I'd called a police ambulance. In a matter of minutes, an intern was working over him with a pull motor. There was no telling how much gas he breathed in or for how long a time the jet had been open. Hand me that. Thanks. Swab. Okay. You alive? Maybe. Hard to say on these. That shot should cause some reaction. Oh? This your place? No, it's his. You know him? His name is Lester James. I met him earlier today. Can you give me that? Uh, We might be getting something here. About this thing? Yeah. He'll be sick if... Oh. What? He's catching on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's have a little more. Getting some pulse. Respiration, too. What are you making? It depends. If he had a heart condition, it'll be tough. Nothing more we can do here. Let's move him. Now, where'll he be? 48th Street Emergency. Why? Well, I'd like to talk to him when he comes around. Better phone in first. Oh, sure. Well, that's the third one tonight. What is it, the weather? Not for him. You know why? He's out on bail. Goes to trial on an embezzling charge pretty soon. Oh. Well, be sure and call in. Yeah, right. Investigating officers questioned me regarding the circumstances of Lester James's attempted suicide. I told them what had happened and gave them my business address for reference. After that, I went back to my hotel and had dinner. Then I went over to the Empress Theater. 
A musical show was playing there. And it had just finished. I didn't quite get that, mister. A dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar. What can I do for you, sir? Between 6.30 and 7 o'clock tonight, a man came here to the stage entrance and talked to you. Uh, a lot of people talked to me here. What man? His name was Lester James. Uh, no, I don't remember no Lester James. Maybe he didn't give you his name. Uh, you come here to see somebody? Is that, that it? He might have. I don't know. He's about 5'11". Weighs 175 or 80. Didn't have any hat on. Raincoat. Dark man. You remember him? Oh, oh, yes, of course. Him, yes. You remember him? Oh, sure, yeah. He's been around a lot of times. Lester Joe. Yeah, I didn't even recognize that name first. It... Would you mind telling me what he was doing here? Well, he comes here to see Margie Cook. That his girlfriend? Oh, no, I don't think so. She never sees him when he has. Who's Margie Cook? Uh, she sings here. You ever seen them together? Well, don't know. I've never seen them together. Is she still here? Uh, what's that? I'd like to talk to her. Is she still here? Oh, no, no, Margie left. She finishes in the second act. Could you tell me where she lives? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I can't tell you that. Well, where can I phone her? Well, I just can't tell you that either. Look, would you do me a favor? Well, if I can, what is it? Would you telephone her and tell her my business and ask her if she'd see me? Well, I suppose I can do that all right, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Take a chair right there. I'll just see what I can do for you. Expense account item four, $2.65. More cab fare. This time to the apartment of Margie Cook, singer. She met me at the door with cold cream on her face, wrapped in a chenille dressing gown. Now, uh, Miss Cook? You must be Mr. Dollar. Come in, please. Thank you. I, I didn't quite understand Frank on the telephone. Frank? Oh, the, the doorman at the theater. Yeah. Yes. I didn't quite know what to make of it. Goodness, are you really an insurance detective? Yeah, investigator. Can I fix you a drink? No, no, thanks. You mentioned something about a man named Lester James, Mr. Dollar? Yes. Do you know him? Well, n no, I don't. There's a, sort of a reservation in the way you say that, Miss Cook. You know his name. Yes, I know the name. What's this all about? Oh, just a routine investigation. Are you sure? Oh, yes. I'm curious. How did you get my name? How am I connected with Lester James? Well, that's what I want you to tell me. Oh, first, about my name. Well, James was at the theater tonight asking for you. I found that out from the doorman. And then I asked to speak to you. Oh. I understand James has been around there quite a bit. I... <laughs> I really don't know how to tell you this. I've only seen the man once in my life. Is that so? Honestly. He's... Well, he's really quite impossible. I... Oh, dear... This is very embarrassing to be asked about a thing like this by a complete stranger. Well, maybe I can save you that embarrassment if you'll answer one question. All right. He ever give you any presents? Yes. What? Well, that cigarette case there. This one? Mm-hmm. And the lighter to go with it. Uh-huh. Tiffany's. Pretty, aren't they? And expensive. What else? Well, let me think. Oh, that wasn't from him. Oh, that was. What? The lamp over there. Uh-huh. And the fur piece. Uh, could I see that? I'm afraid I gave it away. Oh, I see. I gave it to my kid's sister who was visiting me a couple of months ago. What kind of fur piece was it? Ermine. Ermine. I think that's about it. Except for orchids that used to come every night. A dozen orchids every night. He sent them to you? Mm-hmm. For about three months. You only saw him once, and he gave you all these gifts. Oh, dear, I, I know how that must sound. Look, it started about six months ago, I guess. I got a card in my dressing room one night asking me to dinner. It was signed Lester James. Well, I'd never heard of anyone named Lester James, and I tore it up. But every night after that, I kept getting a card, and pretty soon flowers, and then the lighter and the cigarette case came. That's when I saw him. I didn't even dine with him, Mr. Dollar. We had one drink, and I told him I had a headache. I see. Gifts still kept coming. Flowers, invitations, and I ignored them. I tried to send the things back, but I didn't know where to send them, so I gave away some, and some I've kept, and that's it. Why didn't you see him after that one night? Oh, he was... He was so different than what I'd imagined. I mean, I've had my share of stage door Johnnies, but this man was... Well, he couldn't say a word without stumbling. He had no poise, no sophistication, nothing. All he had was money. I see 
Well, he didn't have money either, Miss Cook. What? He worked for $72 a week as a bookkeeper. But all the gifts, the things he gave me, sent me, he had to have money. He's been stealing it to buy those things for you. For heaven's sake. Why, for heaven's sake. And that's why you're here. No wonder. He tried to commit suicide a couple of hours ago. Suicide? No. Oh, no. I'm sorry I had to come to you to get this information. He wouldn't tell anybody what he'd done with the money. Will he go to prison? I'm afraid so. Oh, but we had nothing. He was just a name to me. Well, apparently, you were something more to him. I spent the next two days tracking down the places from which the gifts had been purchased and ascertaining their retail values. Total, $2,780. I also learned from Margie Cook that Lester James had made appointments to meet her at various times at different expensive restaurants around town. She had never once kept any of these appointments. A check with the Waldorf, 21, the Stork, and several other places revealed that James had always made elaborate arrangements to entertain her. His restaurant bills, which were paid, came to $835. The florist bill, $680. Total, $4,295. Hello? Hi. Remember me? Sure. Insurance man. What now? How do you feel? Okay. You saved me, didn't you? I suppose so. Why? Well, for the same reason you'd save a man who was dying, James. <laughs> you know what I've been doing? What? Answering the questions that you wouldn't answer. I met Margie Cook. What? It's my job. I had to. Listen, you had no right to go to her. You had no right. Look, it's the company's money you were spending on her. I had every right. Unpleasant as it may be. And she... She knows all about me? Yep. We took back all the things you gave her. You, you dirty scum. Look, look, don't get mad at me. Get mad at yourself. I didn't steal the money. You did. Why didn't you leave it alone? What difference does the money make to you? Nothing to me. What do you want now? Well, I didn't get all of it traced down. There's still $410 I'm worried about. I, uh... Yeah. Here. I've got this much. Yeah. Can you remember what you did with the rest of it? Pretty thorough, aren't you? I try to be. Well? Oh, come on, Lester. We've got most of it. What difference does it make now? You and your money. That's all it is to you. Dollars and cents. Dollars and cents that were stolen. Remember that. What did you do? See her on the stage one night? No. She was in the office. Office? Your office? Yes. Some fashion convention about six months ago. She was modeling some of our fabrics for them. The publicity people brought her over. I never saw anyone like that before. You figured a little money would attract her to you, huh? I heard that's the best way to do it. Well, it's one way, but it's not the best way, Lester. Right. I pictured myself knocking on her door one night and saying... I'm a bookkeeper, and I live on 59th Street. Why don't you come over and have a bottle of beer with me? You know, she might have come. What makes you think so? I met her. Up until the time I talked with Lester James in the emergency hospital, I had my doubts about love at first sight. But after I talked to him, I was convinced that it could and did happen to him. I was sorry that he didn't know quite how to handle it. I was also wondering if I'd been in his shoes, would I have done the same thing? Johnny Dollar. Oh, I was afraid you might have left town. Well, I'm just packing up. Who's this? Margie Cook. Remember me? Oh, yeah, sure. I haven't been able to sleep thinking about, well, thinking about that man. Buster James? Yes. What'll happen to him? He'll go to prison. Even with all the money returned? Only half of that stuff's redeemable. Take at least, oh, 2,500 more. And then what? Well, then it would be up to the court. 
I want to pay it. What? I want to make it up. The whole thing. Look, Miss Cook, uh, I know your motives are the best, but uh, you're not responsible in any way for this man's actions. He just went... a dollar. He's the first man I've ever known who actually went out on a limb for the girl he loves. I'm the girl and he's the man. Are you serious? Poor Dumbbell. He doesn't belong in any prison. He ought to get married to some nice girl. I want to help him. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah. What's the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Expense account item five. $28, $28, hotel. Item six, $37, meals. Item seven, $15.15, miscellaneous. Item eight, same as one, transportation back home. Total, $151.22. Remarks, James comes to trial next week in view of Margie Cook's paying back the money he stole. James just might get a suspended sentence, but... As always, that's up to the court. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. WBBM FM, Chicago. Chewing gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Donald Maynard, Johnny. Hold on, Mr. Maynard. You employed? No, not a bit. Just closed out a case. Fine. Can you go to New York? Yeah, I guess so. What's it all about? Well, this company insures Maury Productions Incorporated. It's a film television company shooting in New York. The star is Philip Maury. Uh-huh. Well, production stopped last Wednesday. We were notified that Maury had suffered a breakdown and couldn't continue for a while. It's costing us plenty. They've got a pretty big company. Cast and crew are all under contract and have to get paid. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, anything you can. The doctor definitely confirms the breakdown, but... He says he's sure it's due to some personal crisis. See what you can find out. See if you can't do something to snap Maury out of it. Okay. Right away, huh? As soon as I pack a bag. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Philip Maury matter. Expense account item one, $19.85, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. Item two, 75 cents, cab fare to a hotel, where I registered and called the offices of the Maury Production Company. I made an appointment to see Mr. Milton Gradke, the producer. Expense account item three, 55 cents for another cab to Gradke's well-appointed office on 45th Street. Really, Mr. Dollar, I'm just as concerned about this situation as the insurance company is. In fact, I'm probably a whole lot more concerned. A whole lot. Well, we've got a schedule to meet. We've got a sponsor and a network to account to. And if our star is sick, I... I just came down to see if I could help. It's a breakdown, Mr. Dollar. Who can help with a breakdown? Are you a doctor? You're a close friend, huh? Yes, yes, very close. I can't do anything. How could you? What caused the breakdown? 
Such a question. What causes the breakdown? What causes breakdowns? Again, it's for a doctor to say, I'm only a producer. Well, the company doctor felt it was something of a personal nature. Something more than just overwork. Well, I, I know Phil is sick. He's really in a bad shape. And I know if he doesn't snap out of it, this show is going on the rocks. It may be personal, but that's not for me to say. Phil's had enough trouble in the past. Well, this time he could be ruined. Who's his personal physician? Ewing, Charles Ewing. The best man for this sort of thing. I got the best. I'd like to talk to him. He's probably over with Phil now. Oh, fine. I'll stop by. Oh, he, uh, he won't allow you to see Phil. You can't see him, Mr. Dollar. Okay, then I'll just talk to the doctor. Maybe Ewing's back at his office now. Why don't you, uh, go over to his office instead, huh? It'll be a whole lot easier if you go over to Mr. his... Mr. Gradke. Yes? What's the matter? Don't you want me to talk with Philip Maury? He's sick. Very sick. You sure that's all? Of course that's all. You got the doctor's report? Yeah, but if you don't mind, I'll check it myself. Your company may be in trouble, Mr. Gradke. But my company is paying for it. Expense account item four. A dollar and twenty-five cents for still another cab. Philip Morey was residing in an apartment on Park Avenue. I had trouble getting by the doorman, the receptionist at the switchboard, and the elevator operator, but I got by them. I walked down the third floor of the building and knocked on the door to Philip Morey's apartment. Yes? Uh, Dr. Ewing? Uh, no, he just left. My name is Dollar. I'd like to see Mr. Morey. Oh, I'm sorry, no one can see Mr. Morey. He's quite ill. Who are you? What business is that of yours? I'm a special agent for National Life and Casualty. I was sent here to make a report on Mr. Morey's condition. Well, then I suggest you talk to Dr. Ewing. Now, wait a minute. Look, I told you... Hey, to... Richard. Where, where's the beef? What's going on? Mr. Morey? Yeah? Phil, you better go on back in your room. Why? What do you want, Edward? My name is Dollar, Mr. Morey. Okay. What's it all about, huh? I told him you weren't seeing anyone. Yeah. He's from the insurance company. I don't want any. You already have it. I just came down here to wait see if I could help... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want any insurance. I'm a lousy risk. Phil. No, no. Go on, fella. Beat it, do you hear me? Go on. Okay, okay, don't get rough. You're in no condition. Uh, you think so, huh? Look, Mr. Morey, my company got a report that you'd suffered a breakdown. Yeah. Well, good for them. It looks to me more like a 90-proof breakdown, and it smells like it, too. Well, what's it to you? Plenty. My company's paying a lot of money while you're laid up. As long as it's a legitimate illness, they're obligated to keep on paying. And if I'm just drunk? I doubt if my company would think kindly of you, Mr. Morey. <laughs> well, isn't that just too bad? Mr. Dollar, he didn't start hitting the bottle until last just night. Just forget the excuses. Just drop it. And you get out of here now, huh? Go on, get out. Okay, okay. And tell your stinking company I'm going to stay drunk until we have another blue snow. Okay. It's fine with me. I'll send you a sled with a coffin on it. I was supposed to help Maury straighten himself out. But this wasn't just a breakdown. He was boiled to the eyebrows. And if you could go on past performances, it was an odds-on bet he'd stay that way. Expense account item five. A dollar and thirty-five cents cab fare from the Park Avenue apartment to the hotel, where I went to the bar to cool off. I had a fast one and was reaching for another when I was interrupted. Mr. Dollar? Hmm? Oh. I talked with Milt Gradkin. He told me you were staying here. Okay. Uh, first, let me apologize for what Forget happened. Forget it. Uh, can I sit down? Sure. Well, we really didn't meet officially. I'm Richard Long. I'm the writer-director on the series. Well, if Maury stays loaded, you're going to be out of a job. He just started drinking last night. Insurance doesn't cover a lost weekend. I'll have to report it. They'll cancel. It's going to be rough. His wife left him. Oh, that's the reason, huh? Yeah. She's going to sue They've been trying to do everything we could to get Phil in shape. Well, from the way he looked, you'd better forget it. Well, if this one blows up, he's through. He's finished for good. 
It's happened before. Yeah. But isn't it too bad? Yeah, I guess it is. He's one of the biggest talents we've ever had in this business. And he's gotten into more trouble. Look, I, I'm not defending his mistakes, just his talent. If you're going to ask me not to make that report to Look, my Mr. company... Mr. Dollar, I know you've got a job. I know your company can't be expected to keep on paying while Phil's in this condition. Well, I'm glad you understand. But they've paid up till now, and believe me, you've got my word until last night. Phil Maury hadn't touched a drop. Well, even if that's true, Maury's drinking now, and he looks like he's good for a long, long time. He's fallen off before, hasn't he? Yes. He lost his motion picture contract the last time, didn't he? Yes, but all that straightened itself out. It looked pretty crooked this afternoon. <laughs> this would never have happened in a million years if it wasn't for that wife. Well, that's another one of his patterns, isn't it? He's been sued by more ex-wives. Mr. Zoller, I've never said he was right. I, I never said any of the trouble was anything else but his own fault. But you don't know him. Not, not many people do. This guy is the most considerate, charitable... When he's sober... Listen, if you've got about 12 hours sometime, I'd like to impress you with some of the good things on the other side of the ledger. He's given Janet everything she could want. Sure, he was wrong. He should have belted her one and told her to keep in line. He's made the same mistake with every woman he's ever been involved with, and they've all taken him. Nearly everyone's taken him. Business managers, agents. You think them up, and they've had their fingers in the pie. But for a while, it was a pretty big pie. Sounds like fodder for a good psychoanalyst. Yeah, but... Well, Janet's leaving him was too much. Even as bad as he was, he didn't hit the bottle. He just kind of folded up, but he stayed on the wagon. Until last night. Yeah. Her lawyer called, and Phil got to the phone before I did. He was almost well, didn't care if he ever saw her again. The lawyer said lawsuit, and Phil headed for the bar. Well, a breakdown is one thing, but a drunk is something else. And he doesn't exactly have the cleanest record in the world. A couple of his binges turned into marathons. Well, I don't know what to do. That's why I wanted to see him. I was sent down here to straighten him out if I could. Get that dame to lay off the lawsuit and you can. Well, maybe she thinks she's got a case. The other wives did all right. Well, that's why he flipped. He just can't afford it. You got any idea how much alimony he's paying right now? Yeah, I've heard. And it's more than just the dough. This one's taking him. He's played it straight all the way. Gave her everything she wanted. Laid off the booze. Really, I know. He tried to make this one work. And why did she leave him? She figured it was the right time. He's going good. Still got a lot of money. She's a tramp. Does he think so? Well, he does now. I never said anything to him while they were together, and there was a lot I could have said, but, you know, you, you just don't do those things. No, it never helps. After she left him, I finally sat him down and gave it to him straight. He gets sore, but he listened, and he started putting things together. She played around all over the place while she was with him, but she did it smart. It's the old story about the husband being the last one to know. And he took it? Yeah. And it helped. I really gave it to him, everything I knew. He must have made quite a study. Well, she threw a few pitches my way. Well, if you know all these things, why not let her take it to court? Sounds like you've got enough on her to stop any kind of a suit. Oh, no, no. I, I said she played it smart. It's all hearsay. She'd just deny it, and who's going to call her a liar? The guys she was mixed up with? Maybe. Uh-uh. Not these guys. They were hand-picked. You said she threw a few pitches your way. Look, Dollar, Maury's my closest friend. What do you think I'm going to do? Well, I came down here to see if I could help. But it looks pretty hopeless. I don't know. He looked like he was headed for a wet evening. Anyone holding his hand? Yeah, I left Milt with him. We've been working in shifts. His wife's name is Janet, isn't it? Yeah. Where does she live? Uh, 55 West 125th Street. Okay. Why don't you wait for me here? You going over to see her? I'm supposed to save my company money, Mr. Long. Maybe Mrs. Morey can suggest something. Are you kidding? Yeah. But have you got a better idea? Good luck. Friends... Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work 
And at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I left Long in the hotel bar and ran up expense account item six, one dollar and forty-five cents, for one more cab to take me to Mrs. Philip Morey's apartment building. I buzzed for the elevator, and when it arrived, a man stepped out and brushed my shoulder. Sorry. I'd seen him before someplace, and while the elevator took me up to the fourth floor, I tried to place him. Oh, I couldn't remember. But for some reason, the man seemed to be important. I got off at the fourth floor, still trying to place the face, and walked down the hall to Mrs. Morey's apartment. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Morey? Yes? My name is Dollar. I'm a special investigator for National Life and Casualty. Insurance? Yes. Well, I'm sorry, but I... My company insures your husband's television production. Oh. You mind if I come in and talk to you? No. Come on in. I don't quite understand, Mr. Uh, Uh, Dollar. Mr. Dollar. Sit down, please. Oh, thanks. My husband's production company is insured? That's right. Insured for what? Oh, accidents, illness. Oh. Well, how'd you find me? Mr. Long. I see. I have to make a complete investigation, Mrs. Morey. You see, when your husband was taken ill... Taken ill? Well, that's the report that was turned into the company. (laughs) I guess you could call it that. What would you call it? He's plastered. You know what that means. I sure do. I left him. I'm going to get a divorce. Well, aside from your personal differences, if your husband is just drinking, if that's the reason that production has been held up, My company will cancel his insurance. So? He won't be able to get insurance from any other company. Look, Mr. Dollar, do you know anything about Phil? Well, just what I've read. Well, that's been bad, all right, but you've got to live with a guy to really get the full effect. You wouldn't believe it. Well, I understood he's been a pretty good boy until recently. Why don't you go talk to my husband? I saw him earlier today. How'd you like it? It was a little tense. Was he sober? Not even close. Well. But I understand he just started drinking. Oh, that's dandy. Do you think they're going to tell you that he's been blind for the last month? You can take my word for it. He's no good. I tried. I was number four, and I certainly tried to do everything I could to make it work. Well, if it was that bad, I can't blame you. But this will ruin him. He was ruined the day he was born. Oh, he'll get along. He's still got a lot of money. After all the alimony he's been paying out? Mr. Dollar, Phil has made over six million since he started in the business. He could still afford a dozen more wives if anyone will have him. Well, I'm glad to hear that you'll be taken care of. You bet your life I'll be taken care of. After all I put up with, I deserve to be taken care of. Taken care of good. Uh Uh-huh. Well... Oh, you don't have to go. Let me buy you a drink. Well, sure. What's your poison? Anything that's handy. Just uh, water it. Bourbon? Fine, fine. I suppose Richard Long told you what a terrible woman I am. He mentioned something about it. Yeah, he would. He's a jealous little fellow. There you are. Oh, thanks. Cheers. Sure. Richard tried everything he could to break us up. And what a heel. After we'd been married for only a couple of months, Richard started making the old pitch. How do you like that? Well, uh, I can understand it. Hmm, thanks. But Richard's supposed to be Phil's closest friend. An attractive woman can fracture a friendship in a hurry, under the right circumstances. The circumstances were anything but right, Mr. Dollar. 
Well, can't blame a man for trying. Don't you have any scruples? A couple. But I left them back in the third grade. Insurance business, huh? Yeah. You make a lot of money? Enough. It has other compensations. Tell me about them. Well, uh, good drink now and then. I bet you meet a lot of interesting people. Oh, lots, lots. What did you say your first name was? I didn't. But it's Johnny. Johnny Dollar. Mm Mm-hmm. Nice, expensive sound. You should get a load of my expense account sometime. I'd love to. You know, uh, I saw a picture of you once. Really? Yeah. In a bathing suit. I was a model before I met Phil. I had lots of pictures taken in bathing suits. I think this was taken just before you married him. It was on the front page. Showing you were the girl that was going to be the fourth Mrs. Morey. Oh, that one. Yeah. That was a rather good one. Rather. That book there on the table is just full of pictures taken while I was modeling. Oh? Oh, this one? Mm Mm-hmm. Browse around. Oh, I'd love to. That's a good one. Yes. Oh, and here's one. We need a whole bunch of these on the beach. This is the best one of the lot. Yeah, yeah. Nice, um, nice tan. (laughs) Isn't that one cute? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Dollar. Hmm? How are your drink? It just curdled. Let me build you a fresh one. Oh, no, thanks. I have to go. (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. You won't be, honey. I don't think I understand that, Johnny. I'll tell you all about it sometime. It'll give you a real kick. I left Mrs. Morey looking a little worried. And whether she knew it or not, she had a right to be. In one of the pictures she'd shown me, I'd spotted the man. The man I'd bumped into coming out of the elevator. And I remembered who he was. Expense account item seven, one dollar and forty-five cents. Cab fare back to the hotel, where I told Richard Long about the man in the picture. Eugene Sweet. Ever heard of him? No. I couldn't remember until I saw that picture. It was a big case in L.A. He was convicted and sentenced. Did three years for forgery. I was in on the case. Sweet. No, I don't know. And there was a girl mixed up in it. Janet? No, no. But it was an interesting setup. Sweet introduced the girl to a wealthy old man. The girl married the wealthy old man. Now, it seems the girl would have Sweet sign her husband's name to a check, then she'd fill in the amount and cash it. Not big checks. But after about four years, they added up. Well, a man named Swift introduced Phil to Janet. I never did like him. He used to hang around all the time. Phil got tired of him in a hurry and gave him a bounce. What did he look like? I was tall, kind of greasy around the edges, weighed about, I don't know, about as much as I do. Where does he live? I don't know. I've only seen him a couple of times since Phil got rid of him. Why, you think Swift might be this, uh, this sweet or whatever his name is? Well, it's a long shot, but you never know. I guess I could find out. Milk might know. Would Janet? Sure. She might. Why don't we ask her? Yeah. Why don't we just go back to her place and you have a look at that picture book? I'm with you. Long's car was parked outside the hotel. We piled in and drove back to Mrs. Morey's apartment building. We parked just in time to see a man enter by the front door. That's him, Swift. He just went into Janet's building. And he came out about an hour ago. You mean Swift's the guy you were talking to? Eugene Sweet. Arrested in Los Angeles in 1949. Well, come on. Well, it might be perfectly innocent. In a pig's eye. I bet that dame has been working the same kind of setup you told me Sweet worked with the other one. He doesn't do anything. How does he support himself? Well, if he's with Mrs. Morey, we can always ask him. We went into the lobby and waited for the elevator to come down. Long looked happier than a kid in an acre of new cement, and there was just a chance he had a right to be. The elevator arrived, and so did Milt Gradke, the producer, who came busting into the lobby from the street. Milt? Richard. Richard, I've been calling you all over the place. What's the matter? Phil, he's loose. I couldn't keep him in the apartment. Oh, no. I tried, but he got rough. He tried calling Janet, but she hung up on him. Then he went wild. You think he's here with Janet? 
Yes, and that's not the half of it. Come on, we better get up there. There's no telling what he might do. You know about it? What do you mean about Sweet? Who? Sweet. I'll tell you later. I thought you meant the gun. Gun? Yes, Phil's got a gun with him. On the way up, Long explained as much as he could to Gradke, and Gradke continued to apologize for not being able to restrain Maury. We left the elevator on the fourth floor and hurried down to Mrs. Morey's apartment. The door was ajar. Sounds like they're all in there. Well, what are we going to do? Well, if he's got a gun... He sure has. I'm going in. Get back! Get back. Get back. He's crazy! Do something! Put down the gun, Maury. Don't, don't come near me. Get back. I warn you. Don't anybody get near me. I... Where I'll shoot. Phil. Not even you, Dick, no. You too, Milk. Get back. Miss Dane. Miss Dane thought she was going to take me. Well, she's not going to get away with it. Phil, no, please. No, no, no. I am through. Nothing's left. So I'm going to do it up brown. What? What do you think of this Dame Dick? Look. Look who comes to see you. His real name's Sweet, Eugene Sweet. Huh? What? That's right, Maury. He's done time. Yeah? <laughs> Maury, put down the gun. Uh-uh. It's a better than even bet that your wife's been pulling a fancy bit of hijacking with Sweet. Huh? That's right. Tell him about it, you little tramp. Yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> Look, Phil. I want the whole thing. How did you take me? Come on. He introduced you to Janet, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he did. They had it all settled. She marries you, sticks around for a while, and Sweet, being a good forger, signs your name to some checks. Tell him, Janet. Yeah. Phil. Yeah. Phil, look, you didn't do wrong. You did everything right, for goodness sakes. Phil, nobody's going to blame you now. Yeah. Only put away that gun. Put it down, Mr. Morey. Stay back. Mr. Morey. Yeah. These two men have a lot of belief in you. Yeah. They think you can straighten out in spite of everything that's happened. Now, nobody's going to blame you for anything unless you use that gun. Frankly, what happens to you doesn't make any difference to me. It doesn't make any difference to anyone. It does to these two guys. Why don't you start thinking about somebody else for a change? Let's see you prove you're worthy of their friendship. Stay away. Give me that gun. Uh, oh, come on. Uh, you're not whipped. Everybody gets in a slump now and then. Come on. Uh, Give me the gun, Mr. Moria. <laughs> By the time the cops got there, Janet and Sweet had told me the whole story. They admitted cashing Ford's checks to the tune of $300,000. And that wasn't counting what Maury had given her legally. If I hadn't recognized Eugene Sweet... Janet would probably have won a nice settlement to go along with everything else. Maury had written so many checks, he never would have noticed the extra ones. Oh, he was a setup. He spent money hand over fist, and his business manager would never think a dozen small checks a week were forged. Expense account item eight, $54, hotel bill. Item nine, $18.83. Train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $99.38. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley Spearmint gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. (laughs) 
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Joe Duvall, Sidney Miller, High Averback, Bill Johnstone, and Jeanette Nolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Here are Chicago's favorite shows on... WBBM-FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Stanley Mitchell Dollar. Oh, how are you, Mr. Mitchell? I'm fine. Are you employed? No, not since last Tuesday. Then you can take an assignment. Fast as you can give it to me. Go to New York and see a Mr. Alan Saxton. He recently returned from Europe where he purchased a supposedly priceless painting. Supply to our company for insurance on it. You said supposedly priceless. Is there a doubt? Yeah, a big one. Several experts have examined the painting, claim it's a forgery. Saxton yelled foul all over the place. He paid 200000 for the article. Well, I do a little yelling myself. A whole group of experts are going to give the painting every test there is, and if it stands up, we're obliged to insure it. And if it doesn't, I leave before Saxton comes to a boil, huh? That's about it. I'll get right on it, Mr. Mitchell. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Great Eastern Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Alan Saxton matter. Expense account item one, $21.65, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived at Grand Central late in the afternoon and went directly to a hotel where I registered and made arrangements to rent a car. Saxton resided in a quaint three-story house on an estate across the river in Jersey that looked impressive enough to be an annex to Fort Knox. An old cad butler met me at the door and led the way into a mahogany and leather study where I was left to wait for the master of the house. Mr. Dollar? That's right. <coughs> Glad to know you. Mitchell of your company called, said you'd be down. Yes, sir. Well, sit down, sit down. A cigar? Uh, no, thanks. Mm. Aren't you a little premature? How do you mean? <laughs> Well, there'll be no positive confirmation in my painting till after it's been examined, you know. When will the examination take place? <laughs> nasty cough. Yeah, nasty. <laughs> well, I'm to turn the painting over to Mr. Uh, Farmer from the museum tomorrow morning. I imagine he'll have it for a day or so. I understand you paid 200000 <laughs> Yeah, I, I sure did. 200000 fat American dollars, Mr. Dollar. 
Have you any idea how long it takes to make $200,000, Mr. Dollar? Well, that kind of depends on who's making it. Yeah. Me, I start getting senile around a buck ninety-eight. <laughs> Oh, Lord. If I keep hacking like this, I'll end up doing business in an oxygen tent. <laughs> you like to see the painting, Mr. Dollar? Sure. Yeah, come on. Mr. Dollar, if I've been swindled, I'm going to cause more trouble than a hungry snake and a rabbit pen. Who'd you buy the painting from? Who? One of the biggest, most respectable dealers in Paris is all. You ever been to Paris, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. In here. Hey, how about that Paris, eh? Oh, I rather enjoyed myself. <laughs> I, I rather did, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been there a dozen times now, and I never get tired of anything. Not anything, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> the last trip I You're met... A terrible old man. Huh? Oh, Barbara. I didn't see you. Obviously. Hello. Hello. This is my impish daughter, only child, spoiled rotten. Barbara. Johnny Dollar. Just going to show Mr. Dollar the painting. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. yeah. You don't really like it, do you, Mr. Dollar? Well, I really don't know much about it, Miss Saxton. Barbara. You don't care for it, Mr. Dollar? Well, I... I guess it's very good. G- good. Dollar, that's an original Marshall. Marshall. <laughs> oh. They're beginning to call Dad the hacking sack. <laughs> yeah, hacking sack. Nasty little brat, isn't she? Who told you the painting was a forgery, Mr. Yeah, Sykes? a miserable little man named Lippert fancies himself an authority. Just jealous of what he is. Give his right clavicle for that painting. Right around telling everyone how old Saxton got taken for 200 grand, miserable little cuss. You gonna be in town long, Mr. Oh, Dollar? Oh, stop rolling your eyes. That's about as crude And that eye rolling went out with high button shoes. Uh, who did you say sold you the painting? Look out for her, Dollar. Get that tone. Are you gonna be in town long, Mr. Dollar? I wanna know. Uh, the painting? Uh, I bought it from Rene Francois, most reputable dealer in Paris. He's only going to be in town till after they establish my paintings of forgery. Isn't that right, Dollar? Uh, who? Uh, Ronnie Francois? You! I'm doing my best to save you from this designing female. Now, agree with me. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm only going to be in town until after... Then you can stay after... for dinner. He cannot. Why not, Mr. Dollar? Uh, well... Because uh, we haven't got enough food. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Now, you go on back to wherever you're staying, Mr. Dollar, and I'll get in touch the minute they finish with the painting. Now, take my word for it, Dollar. Quit while you're ahead. Stick around for dinner and you end up a cripple. Oh. Well, are you going to stay for dinner or not, Mr. Dollar? He is not. Seems like a nice fella. But he never played polo in his life. How about it, Dollar? No, just an occasional game of stickball. Stick... What position? Oh, mostly gutter. Wonderful. I was a gutter man <laughs> myself. <laughs> you were raised in Hell's Kitchen, Mr. you know. Mr. Dollar, please stay for dinner. No. You can talk over old times, bring back the good old days when you were out cracking skulls. You were going to leave. I am. Then show Mr. Dollar a Saxon's word is as good as his bond. Her bond. I'm a her. her she. Yeah, her. Sometimes I wonder. Come on, Dollar. I'll walk you to the door. You don't have to drag him. Mr. Dollar. Goodbye, Miss Saxton. Please. No! Look <laughs> out! Ah, getting better, but you're putting too much of a curve on it. I hate you. <laughs> Come on, Dollar. You're quite a girl, huh? Yeah. There's nothing really wrong. Just spoiled. Got too much money. I'd ask you to stay, but you really seem like too nice a fella. Well, uh... Well, what? Just Well... At the moment, that's about as glib as I can get. I left the Saxon house, shook my head a few times to get my brain turned around, and drove back to New York in my hotel. There wasn't much for me to do until the experts examined the painting. So I showered, shaved, got dressed in my other suit, and called a few numbers I'd collected during several investigations to see if I could get what looked to be a dull evening back on its feet. I struck out three times and was dialing the fourth when... Yeah? Come on in. Hello? May I come in? Well, uh... 
Yeah, yeah, sure. I hope I didn't interrupt an important call. No, no. Sit down. Thanks. Where's Daddy? Home. He wouldn't tell me where you were staying, so I found out who he was insured with. I had to call his lawyer. Then I called your insurance company. Oh, I'm flattered. I'm determined. Daddy's liable to spank. I don't think so. He's really not the general he tries to be. He blusters and lays down the law, and we butt heads. And you get what you want. If it's important enough. Well, I'm sorry I spoiled your record. You haven't. Well, then my staying for dinner wasn't important. Oh, yes. Very important. Well, then you lose. Mm Mm-hmm. If you can't fight him, join him. Well, that's a practical bit of philosophy, but I don't see quite how it applies. I've had no dinner. Uh Uh-huh. You wouldn't accept my home-cooked invitation, so now it's going to cost you. My expense account just turned yellow. Where would you like to take me to dinner? Where would you like me to take you to dinner, shy Violet? (laughs) Maybe I'm not the most conventional type in the world. I'll go along with that. But I don't want to argue. Don't want to have to coerce you. I don't want you to do anything you don't really want to do. You just want me to take you to dinner. It's a nice way to start off an evening. Yeah. And you'll take me to dinner? Johnny? Expense account item two, $22.78, dinner at a small Italian restaurant. I'm pretty sure the dinner was excellent, but I'm positive that Barbara Saxton was more woman than I'd run into in a long time. Delilah was a Girl Scout by comparison. We got back to the Saxon home in Jersey about three in the morning, parked the car at the front door, and said good night. I had a wonderful evening. Will you call me tomorrow? Right after my two o'clock shock treatment. Weren't you happy? Well, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I think we had a little too much to drink. Who had a little too much to drink? Okay. I had a little too much to drink. You're fractured. I love you, Johnny. Let's get married. Come on, dear love. Oh, I don't want to go in yet. I want to get married. Johnny, let's drive to some place where we can get married. No, I'm once more a clear-thinking, cautious bachelor. I can fix that. Now, well, I'm conscious. Want to bet? Oh, come on. Be a good little girl. Get out of that car and let me walk you to the door or I'll scream for help. You're mean. The word is coward. Yes. Now, come on, dear. Oh, all right. You're right. You're a coward. But a single one. Now, come on. Kiss me goodnight first. Barbara. Kiss me goodnight or I won't budge. I'll kiss you goodnight at the front door. It's a deal. (laughs) Where's your key? First. Now, honey. You promised. The front door. This is it. Go, front door. Okay. Good night, honey. Let's get married. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Now. Shh. Now. Honey, the door was open. I don't want to go in. I'm not going to go in. Barbara, up. look. No. I'm going to sit right down here. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, that's nice. Carry me, Johnny. Carry me to a minister and let's get married till death do us part. There. You're on your own. Good night. Johnny, you come back here. You can't leave me just standing here like this. Drink a big glass of milk and get some sleep. Johnny. Good night. (laughs) What the... Johnny! Oh, Johnny! What is it? What's wrong? In the library, Dad! What? He's lying there. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work, and at other times, too. 
Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Barbara Saxton was hysterical. I had a slapper to calm her down. Then together we went into the darkened Saxton house where I found her father, Alan Saxton, lying on the floor, bleeding from a nasty scalp wound. Johnny! He's all right. Call a doctor. Well, come on, come on. Mr. Saxton. You can't stop him. Don't try to sit up. What? The picture. You all right? Yeah. What happened? Oh, oh, Dollar. Now you better stay right there till we get a doctor. Oh, just sit up. Oh, oh, my head. Oh, it doesn't look too bad. There's a lot of blood. <sighs> my painting. Now just take it easy. Now he got it. Look, it's gone. Okay, okay, but don't try to get up. It might be a concussion. Dollar, he stole my painting. Cut it right out of the frame. Who did? I don't know. A man. I heard something and came down. Servant's night off. Shouldn't have been anyone down here. What did he hit you with? A oh, flashlight, I think. Doctor will be right over. Dead? Traitor. I thought you were dead. I couldn't be. I'd feel better. You deserted me. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake, stop that. I'm the one who got clobbered. He nearly scared me half to death. Well, I couldn't help it. What happened? Some dirty lowlife swiped my painting. No. Well, look. The marshal. Yeah, caught him in the act. Would have captured him, too, but he crowned me with his flashlight. Better get some hot water and a towel. But they have to take 50 stitches. Well, it's just a little cut. It is not. It's good for at least 50 stitches. Dear love. Yes, dear love. Get the hot water and a towel while I go call the robbery details. Yes, John. Wait, wait. Yes, dear love. Yes, Johnny. He took me to dinner. Well, it's 3.30 in the morning. 3.35. What day? Tuesday. What time do you finish dinner? Look, while you're getting your suspicions up, the thief is putting a lot of miles between dollar, this house and... Dollar, the... answer me one question. She didn't get you drunk and get you to marry her. I sure tried. But you didn't. No. Yeah, you're a lucky boy, Johnny. Oh, don't look so smug. You just think everyone wants to marry me for my money. Well, don't they? Not Johnny. I'm going to call the police. Wait, wait, wait. Just one more question. If you married my daughter, would it be for her money? In the first place, I'm not going to marry your daughter. Johnny. In the second place, if I did, it wouldn't be for her money. See? If I was going to marry her at all, it would be for your money. Johnny! (laughs) (laughs) Barbara got a towel and some hot water, and I called the police. I stuck around while old Saxton gave his heroic side of the incident. Then I took off and drove back to the hotel, where I put in a call to the Paris branch of the company. I talked with Howard Gilbert and asked him to check on the departure of René Francois, who, according to Saxton, wasn't expected to arrive in the States until late that afternoon. There had to be a good reason why anyone would steal a painting that had been publicized as a possible fake. Saxton wouldn't have the painting stolen, because without insurance, he'd just be out the 200000 he'd paid for it. René Francois might have a reason, though. Because if the painting was proved a forgery, his reputation would suffer, not to mention having to return the 200,000 to Saxton. Well, Gilbert promised to wire the information regarding Francois's departure the minute he had it, and I left the hotel and headed across town to see an old friend, a continental stool pigeon with a way of knowing about such things as stolen $200,000 paintings. It was close to 5 o'clock when I rang his doorbell. Whoever it is, you're just being ridiculous. Allez, c'est bon. Henri, open up. Not by the hair of my little goatee. If I owe you money, come back at a respectable hour. It's Johnny Dollar. I don't believe it. Only my landlord or or a vampire would go to such extremes. Look, Henri, I'm going to slip a little something under the door. Uh, Another ten might convince me... Okay, but you'll never go to heaven. I'm convinced. (laughs) 
mon ami. <rire> entrez, entrez. <rire> eh, I miss you, Johnny. Are you that broke? Well, until this windfall, I was completely fractured. But, um, what can I do for you? Some information. Eh bien, bien. Mais, is this so important that you must seek me out before the, the sun has risen? You ever heard of a Mr. Alan Saxton? Saxton? He's been in the papers. Well, a few hours ago, someone hit him over the head and swiped a very expensive painting. Oh, is that the Saxon who recently purchased the supposed Marshal? That's the one. But there was some doubt as to the authenticity of the painting. Experts were going to examine it today. He paid 200000 for it. Two? Marshal? I would have painted him something far superior for, for much less. Who do you think would pull a job like that? Well, what is so special about a job like that? Break into a house, steal a painting? An amateur could handle it. No, no. It's a special job for a special talent. The thief knew his Marshaux. There were a lot of other paintings in that room. Well, but he could read, couldn't he? Marshaux certainly signed the work. Or if it's a forgery, whoever painted it certainly signed Marshaux's name. This painting wasn't signed. That's one of the reasons why there's some doubt about it. Uh Uh-huh. Not only that, but why would someone take that painting when it's worthless until proven authentic? Mm -hmm. You have a point. I'm thinking of a European. Oh, Johnny, I wouldn't touch a job like this. Someone with an international reputation. Please, Johnny, I am innocent. Mon ami, please believe me. Someone who could possibly be hired in Paris, or if he happened to be in the United States, could be contacted. Someone that would know this particular Marshall and be qualified to break into the Saxton house. Henri? Wait, wait, wait. You have that knowing look. Well, I, you know, I was just thinking about my landlord. Yeah, sooner or later, he'll trap me. It's the law of average. So far, so far, I've cleverly avoided this ingenious... How much? Uh, pardon? How much do you own? Oh, a paltry two months rent, uh, forty dollars. Okay. Yeah, but, but what sense is there in paying when it will only provide me with a legal claim to this disgusting dwelling? And I have no sustenance to keep me alive for longer than a week. Well, then just pay him for a week. You would have me starve? How much will keep you alive for two months? Well, I, I would at least like to take care of uh, Greenbaum's delicatessen. Ten bucks? Well, the, the exact amount is, uh, fifteen. Uh, Oh, you're lucky I've got an expense account. <laughs> you think I don't know it? <laughs> All right, who is he? Well, you might go to the Shelton Arms and inquire about a man named Gaston Chambray. It has been rumored that he arrived from Paris only yesterday. Who is he? Well, that is for you to discover. There are certain things I am bound by honor not to diverge. But any policeman in the world could help you out. <laughs> I left the little Frenchman and went back to my hotel, where a cable was waiting from Gilbert at the Paris office. It told me that René Francois had booked passage on Air France and was due to arrive late in the afternoon. I left, climbed into the rented car, and drove to the Shelton Arms on East 108th Street, where a sleepy night clerk gave me Gaston Chambray's room number and accepted a $10 bribe not to inform Chambray that I was on my way up. Is it? A cable for you, Mr. Chambray. Oh. It's from René Francois. How do you know that? I peeked. You are not a messenger boy. Sure I am. I've got a message from René Francois. Well, give it to me. He says to give me the painting. Oh. oh. Uh-uh. I'm coming in. You have no right to come in. You got something to hide? Get out of here before I call the police. Oh, no. I'll just stick around. But if you want to call the police, why don't you go right ahead? Maybe you'd like to tell them where you were earlier this morning. I was right here in my room. I have been in my room since early last night. You didn't take a short trip over to Jersey? I certainly did not. You arrived from Paris yesterday, huh? Yes, but what has... Oh, police. You are a policeman. I'm surprised you didn't decide that when I pushed my way in here. I have done nothing. But you know a René Francois. Yes, but I know nothing about a painting. Now, look, I know all about you. Of course, but you can't prove anything. You want me to tear this apartment to pieces, or do you want to hand over the Marchaux? I told you I have no painting. I just said Marchaux. That could be something you shampoo your hair with. You mentioned a painting, then Marchaux. Any fool would know they are one and the same. 
as for your tearing my apartment to pieces, as you so crudely put it, I think you would be making a serious mistake. Really? You have no warrant. Well, now you're making a serious mistake. Uh, really? I don't need one. You're still going under the assumption that I'm a policeman. You, you are not? No, not a bit. All right, get up. Now, where's the painting? Who sent you? I sent myself. Now, where's the painting? Okay. No, no. Wait a minute. It's it's under the pillows on the couch. Uh Uh-huh. Why did you steal it? Maybe you didn't understand me. No. All right. I was hired. Sure you were. Bernie Francois? Yes. Okay. Now, as long as you're so suspicious about policemen, put on your clothes. I'll take you downtown, introduce you to a few of the gentlemen in blue. Gaston Chambray gave a complete confession to the police. He'd been hired by the Paris art dealer, René Francois, to steal the painting, had been discovered by Alan Saxton, and in order to make his escape, was forced to clout the old boy on the skull with his flashlight. René Francois was met at the plane, and when confronted with the evidence, readily confessed. He explained that when the Marchot was proclaimed a possible forgery, he realized that if it really was, his business would be ruined, and he would have to return the 200000 to Saxton. He checked with the sources that had originally sold him the painting and discovered that there was a strong possibility that the painting was a fake. He offered Chambray $10,000 to do the job. He'd arrive in the States after the robbery, offer his condolences, meet Chambray at a predetermined spot and take the painting. Well, Saxton took it in stride. And after Francois gave him back the money, he even laughed about it. (laughs) You really did a fine job, Dollar. I'd like to make it worth your while. Well, it'll just cost you the $85 I paid out in bribes. (laughs) The rest goes on the expense account. Johnny. Oh, you look pretty bad. Terrible hangover. Daddy, don't be mean. You're responsible for this. You got my 200,000 bucks for me. It was that Francois. He was behind the whole thing. Some guy named Daddy. Jim. Well, don't you want to hear about it? Johnny, will you take care of me? I need somebody to take care of me. Oh, dear love, I'd love to. Really? But I've got to get back to Hartford. I can be packed in an hour. Oh, there you go with that eye rolling again. I'm not rolling them. They're rolling themselves. I have absolutely no control yeah. whatsoever, Johnny. Dear love. Yes, dear love. Can I go with you? Uh, no. Why not? Well, I'm an insurance man. What's the matter with that? Oh, nothing. Only I know a bad risk when I see one. Johnny, I'm not a bad risk. No. But I am. Ah, I bet. Ah, here, have a cigar. <laughs> Expense account item three, $55.85, hotel bill and car rental. Item four, $19.65, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $119.93. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum every day. And we know you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. 
Featured in tonight's cast were Edgar Barrier, Hal March, Virginia Gregg, and Jay Novello. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. WBBM-FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hanley Conrad, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Conrad. You employed? No, no, I'm not. All right. Ever heard of a man named Howard Arnold, big attorney? Represents some of the biggest... Oh, uh... yeah, yeah, that one. I've been reading about him. Attorney for George Castro. That's right. Represents the whole rotten syndicate. Yeah. We insure him for a half million dollars. We wouldn't want anything to happen to him. With that outfit behind him, nothing could. Mm. Castro's got more guns than the Army and Navy. I've known Arnold for a long time. Went to law school with him. He called me up the other night. I met him in New York. He's worried. He didn't say it, but I think he's had that falling out with Castro. He wanted to know if I could give him some protection. Why doesn't he go to the police? That's what I asked him, but he said the police wouldn't lift a finger unless he helped expose Castro. Now, what do you want me to do? See him, find out what's on his mind, and stick with him till he feels safe. Okay. Thanks, Johnny. He lives at 944 Sutton Place. I can leave in an hour. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund and another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes the time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, World Insurance, and Indemnity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Howard Arnold matter. Expense account item one, $23.55, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. Expense account item two, $1.75, cab fare to the hotel. Where I registered, went up to my room, and put in a call to the illustrious barrister... Mr. Howard Arnold. Hello? Is Mr. Arnold home? No, he isn't. Who's calling? Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Arnold's not home. May I take a message? Just tell him I'm staying at the Ellsworth Hotel. Maybe I can reach him at his office. No, he's not there. I've been trying to reach him all morning. But I'll certainly tell him you called. Thank you. I unpacked my clothes, had some lunch, and waited around the hotel for the rest of the afternoon. I called Arnold's office twice, but his secretary said she hadn't seen Arnold for several days. Presumed he was out of town on business. I went down to the bar, had something cool, and returned to my room. Around seven o'clock, there was a knock at my door. Mr. Dollar? That's right. Howard Arnold. Oh, come in. My wife told me you'd called. Yes, and I checked with your office several times. I haven't been to my office. I haven't been home, even. Sit down. Thanks. 
You got a light? Thanks. How much do you know about me, Mr. Dollar? Only what I've read in the paper and what Hanley Conrad told me over the phone. Yeah, I went to law school with Hanley. Mm, that's what he said. You know about George Castro? Just what I've read. He'd like to kill me. Why? Because I know too much and he's afraid I'll tell someone. I thought you were in pretty solid with Castro. Yeah, solid as anyone gets with him. Our relationship's been getting thinner and thinner for the last year. It finally stretched too tight and snapped. I called Hanley right after it happened. I knew Castro's next step would be to try to liquidate me. Well, I'm here to see that he doesn't. Yeah, Hanley mentioned you, said you were capable. But just to be with me in order to keep Castro's boys away isn't very practical. Well, I didn't think so either. If Castro wants you, it'd take a lot more than me to stop it. But if you think so, too, I, uh, why did you... I really want you to keep something for me. It's better insurance than 20 efficient bodyguards. I'd have given it to Hanley the other night, but I didn't have it then. That's why I asked him for someone like you, someone who's capable of holding on to something as hot as this is. Just what is it? Has enough in this envelope to send Castro and the rest of the outfit away for a hundred years. Couldn't you just leave me a bundle of dynamite? <laughs> as long as I have this evidence and Castro knows that if anything happened to me to get to the police, I'm safe. Castro knows you've got it? He sure does. I told him by phone a half hour ago. And all you want me to do is hang on to it? That's right. For how long? Until I make some arrangements, I'll let you know. Then what do you want me to do with it? You'll give it back to me. Wherever I am, you'll get it to me. Okay. All right, there you are. Now, if you don't mind, I'll use your phone. My wife's probably worried. I looked at the large envelope and thought about George Castro, the big boy of the outfit. One-fourth man, three-fourths rat. If he ever found out where that envelope was, yours truly could stop planning for his old age. I had dinner, sat in the bar listening to a thin blue piano player for about an hour, then went back up to my room, where I'd hidden the envelope in the dresser, taped to the bottom of the second drawer. Shut the door. What? The... Shut it. What goes on? Must be a good little boy. I'll get over there and sit down. Okay, okay. Hey, I know you. Good. You're Marty Fleet. One of Castro's happy little trigger men. All right for you. Sit down. Now let's have it. Have what? Don't play games, huh? A little while ago, you had a visitor. I did? Yeah, and he left something with you. Let's have it. Have what? You're going to make me go to all the trouble of tearing this joint apart. Not if it's going to make you grouchy. If I spend a lot of time looking for it, what are you going to be doing? You want me to help you? Uh, no, I do better by myself. You're going to tell me where it is? If I knew what you were talking about, I'd be... Okay, okay, so I waste my time and tear the joint apart. Shall I, uh, turn my back? No, uh, you just take a nap. Uh I finally got my eyes open and found myself alone in the middle of a pile of furniture. The gorilla had departed, and to my amazement, I discovered that he hadn't found the envelope. I called Howard Arnold. Hello? Is Mr. Arnold there? Who's calling? Johnny Dollar. Just a moment. For you, dear, and Mr. Dollar. Hello, Dollar? Well, I think so, but I wouldn't swear to it until I find my head. What's wrong? One of Castro's boys paid me a visit. Did he know I'd been there? Obviously. He wanted the envelope. You didn't give it to him? He was persistent in a physical sort of way, but I still have the ugly little thing. That's bad. You're darn right it is. He'll tell Castro he couldn't find it. If Castro even thinks you've got it. Well, let's relieve his mind. You take it back. Well, certainly it's no good you're keeping it if Castro suspects you still might have it. Look, you meet me. Where? Well, certainly not in my house. Castro's probably having me watched. He won't do anything until he knows. 
knows he can get his hands on that envelope. Well, any place you say, but if you think you're being watched... I'll be careful to lose anyone who might be following. I know a spot. It's about two miles off the main highway to Connecticut. Well, why all the way out there? Can't we just meet in a gas station or something? No. When you turn over that envelope, I want to be in the safest place possible. But that's a long way. It just doesn't make... Please, Mr. Dollar, this is the way I'd like it. I know what I'm doing. It's deserted, away from everything, and the last place Castro would think of. Okay, if that's the way you want it. I rented a car and drove for a good 40 minutes till I spotted the turnoff. I swung right, hit a stretch of dirt road, drove two miles, and then my light picked up Arnold's car. I pulled up in front of him. Took your time. I've been waiting 20 minutes. I had to come a little farther than you did. I was had the envelope. This place gives me the creeps. Yeah, sure. Here. Both of you hold it right there. What? Oh, no. Don't move a muscle. Dollar, do something. Who's got muscles? Hello, Fleet. Aren't you a long way from home? How's your head? Fleet, wait a minute. Oh, shut up. Hey, Castro's been worried about that envelope. At all time, huh, Dollar? Cross my heart and hope to... No. No, I take that back. Can't we make a deal? No, not now. Please, Fleet, uh, I'll give you 5000 No. Ten. Sorry. Fifteen. You got 15000 No, but he has. Yeah, fifteen. I'll, I'll make it fifteen. Can't see it. Then what do you want? Well, first, I want to make Mr. Dollar sorry for lying the way he did. Look. So turn around. Now, wait a minute. I said turn around. Go on. The law knows about your fleet. If they find me dead, it won't... You going to turn around? Okay. Now what? I said I was going to make you sorry for lying. Well, there it was again. That disgustingly familiar deep black hole. The hole works. I don't know how long I was out this time, but when I slowly pulled myself back, I thought at first that part of the dream had stayed with me. I got to my feet and made my way to the edge of the road. The whole sky seemed to burn with a brilliant yellow light. I looked down in the ravine, and there was Arnold's car, resting on its side where it had rolled, the flames roaring up around it, the charred arm of a man hanging out of the window. Friends, this coming Friday or Saturday evening, you'll probably have a lot of youngsters ringing your doorbell and calling out tricks or treats. Well, here's a suggestion that'll make a real hit with those youngsters and give you a lot of Halloween fun, too. Make your treat Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Kids love chewing gum, and they really appreciate it when you give them sticks or packages of Wrigley's Spearmint. It's a wholesome, healthful treat, too. And it's inexpensive. You can treat a whole army of little goblins and spooks without running up a big cost or going to a lot of trouble. So, when you go to the store, get some packages or a box of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. You'll agree, it's a perfect treat for Halloween. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I made it back to the road and flagged a car that drove me to a phone. I called the police and the fire department. Forty minutes later, the fire department arrived, and the wagon hauled what was left of Arnold down to the morgue. I explained what had happened to a Lieutenant David of Homicide... Then we drove back to the station where I made a statement. I'm having Castro picked up now. Got a call out on Marty Fleet, too. I still can't figure how Fleet got out on that road, Lieutenant. You followed Arnold. No, he couldn't have. Fleet worked me over and took my room apart. And when I woke up, he was gone. All in all, I was out for about ten minutes. Yeah. Arnold lives a good thirty minutes from my hotel. 
When I arrived, Arnold said he'd been waiting 20 minutes. Uh Uh-huh. It would be impossible for Fleet to tail Arnold, then. Unless he had wings. Ever think he might have waited around, tailed you? No, he was already there when I arrived. Maybe somebody could have told him. Who? How do I know? Maybe Arnold told his wife and she said something. She's down in the morgue now, making an identification on the body. Yeah? We've got George Castro downstairs. Well, hold him. He got Castro downstairs. Yeah, I heard. I want to talk to him. Is that it? Yeah. Is Arnold's outside? She identify him? Yeah. Said the body was Arnold, all right. Pretty hard to tell, but the ring and the watch clinched it. She's feeling pretty bad. I'll bring her in. Yes, yeah, sir. Now, come in, Mrs. Arnold. Yeah, this is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? Hello. Yeah, sit down, please. Thank you. Now, uh, I'll try to make this as brief as possible. I'd appreciate it. I understand you identified the body. Yes, it was Howard. You could tell. I'm certain. That was the watch and the ring. They belonged to Howard. Did you know your husband was going to meet Mr. Dollar before he was killed? No. He didn't say where he was going. He'd been acting very strangely for the past few weeks. Did he tell you he'd been to see me earlier today? No. I didn't even know he knew you. Well, do you know why anyone would want to kill him? Lieutenant, you know who my husband was. What he did, the people he represented. See them. (sighs) All right, Mrs. Arnold. I'll have someone take you home. Thank you, but I have my own car. Well, if you don't feel well... I'm all right. (laughs) Nice meeting you, Mr. Dell. Goodbye. Goodbye. She's taking it pretty good. Uh Uh-huh. You wanted to talk to George Castro. Yeah. Yes, Lieutenant. Send in George Castro. All right. I think we'll be able to hold Mr. Castro for a while this time. One thing really bothers me. What? Why didn't Fleet kill me? Just knock me out. Kill Arnold, run him off a cliff. Something really out of place in this one. Here's Castro, Lieutenant. Well, how are you, Lieutenant? Sit down, Castro. Uh, Are you going to introduce me? If it's important to you, the name is Dollar. Okay. (laughs) Now, what's this all about? Howard Arnold was killed a couple of hours ago. Uh Huh? You don't say. Shot. Piled in his car and run off a cliff. Caused quite a fire. Oh, such a shame. Well, don't look at me. It's all right, Castro. We've got strong stomachs. This one of your cops, David? No, but I agree with him. That's too bad, because I don't like him. So, uh, I guess I don't like you either. I'm getting all choked up. That might be arranged, too. Listen, Castro, you keep your mouth shut until I ask you a question. You may throw a lot of weight around this town, but you're on a diet when you're in this office. One of your boys killed Arnold. I doubt that. Marty Fleet, and I'll swear to it in court. Fleet, huh? No. Who pushed your face around, funny man? Fleet, on your orders. I don't even know you. You sent Fleet to find something that Arnold had given to me. Something that could put you away for a hundred years. Really? You want to know something? I don't think Arnold had anything like that. Fleet said you sent him. Ah, That's pretty weak, funny man. Let's see how weak it is when I testify. Look, boys, you're not playing with no punk kid. Now, you look. Your boy Fleet came into my office, drew a gun on me, worked me over because he said you sent him. Howard Arnold told me he was afraid you were going to have him killed. Tonight I met Arnold and Fleet showed up with his gun again. He put me to sleep and when I... Yeah. Yeah, go on. What is it? Huh? I just thought of something. Castro, you say you had nothing to do with it. That's what I said. And tell me where I can find Fleet. Oh, don't get me started laughing. I'm too tired. Okay, then hang. This guy's got rid of sense of humor, Lieutenant. You should have him on the force with the rest of your funny cops. I don't think it's so funny, Castro. He's just telling you the truth. I'm going to hold you this time. There's not going to be any writ. Huh? <laughs> you making any book on that? I'm even giving odds. I got more than one lawyer. Yeah, and both of them have already seen Judge Phillips. You're not going to get a writ from anyone. The pressure's on. Fleet your boy and everybody knows it. The DA's got an election coming up, and the papers have been yelling for your scalp. Oh, stop it. Even if your lawyers show up with a writ, you're not going to be here. 
I'll move you to every jail in this district, and I'll keep moving you. I'm going to nail you to the wall until you're convicted. Ah, go ahead. I had nothing to do with this. Then tell us where we can find Fleet. Ah, go on, Castro. If you had nothing to do with it, tell us. <sighs> okay. Okay. Maybe you can find him over on 64th Street. The Orton Arms. I'll check it. Can I go now? Not till I check it. While you're doing that, I want to go over and talk to Mrs. Arnold. What do you got? Just a hunch. Yes? Oh. I'd like to talk to you, if I may, Mrs. Arnold. I really don't feel much like discussing anything, Mr. Dollar. This is pretty important. All right. Come in. Sorry I had to disturb you. So am I. But if it's important... Well, you want to get your husband's killer, don't you? Certainly. We can go in here. You know, this happened so suddenly, it's it's hard to really believe it. Now, Mr. Dollar, how can I help? Well, I'd like to know a few things about your husband. He, uh... He provided for you, didn't he? Yes. But I don't see how that can be of any importance. Well, I just want to know a few things. Your husband made quite a bit of money, didn't he? Yes. You uh, got along? You were happy? Very. You know, there's something awfully funny about this killing. What do you mean? Do you mind if I smoke? No. Please go right ahead. Oh, thanks. Would you like one? No, thank you. What did you mean, that there's something awfully funny about my husband's death? Well, a man named Fleet is supposed to have done it. Works for George Castro. My husband was always afraid of Castro. This Fleet came to my room at the hotel, said he was working for Castro, wanted some evidence your husband gave me in an envelope. Fleet knocked me unconscious, and then, for a professional hoodlum, did a remarkably poor job of searching. Why haven't the police picked him up? Well, they're looking for him, but I doubt if they find him. Why not? Why won't they find him? He met your husband and me out in the road. Knocked me unconscious again. Then when I awoke, it looked like he'd killed your husband and shoved the car over the cliff. Oh, please. Can't this wait until tomorrow? I think you can help me. But I don't know what you're getting at. Well, Fleet couldn't have followed me because he was already out there. And he couldn't have followed your husband because there wasn't enough time. Somebody told him where we were going to meet. He had time to get there, but not to follow us. Now, Fleet knew that I knew him, could identify him. Why didn't he kill me? I don't know. And I don't know what you're getting at. Now, if you don't One mind... more question, Mrs. Arnold. Yes. When I called your husband this afternoon, I talked to you, didn't I? Yes. At the station, you said you didn't even know your husband knew me. That's right. But when I told you my name over the phone, you knew who I was. I did no such thing. Oh, I'm afraid you did. You said, oh, yes, Mr. Dollar, the first time I called. Well, that's not so unusual. My husband has a great many clients. It was just a matter of diplomacy. Mm Mm-hmm. You know what I think, Mrs. Arnold? I'm really not interested in what you think, Mr. Dollar. I'd like you to leave. I think someone wanted me to identify Fleet as your husband's killer. I don't think Fleet killed your husband. Well, someone certainly did. I think someone else wanted the police to think George Castro was behind it. Might even have hired Fleet, unknown to Castro. Told Fleet to be sure and tell me he was doing the job for Castro. How can I possibly help with all this? Your husband wanted me to hold the evidence until he could make some arrangements. What kind of arrangements? How should I know? He was safe as long as the evidence was safe. Castro wouldn't do anything. Arnold could have put the envelope in a safety deposit vault with instructions to have the police open it in case of his death. Mr. Dollar. Instead, your husband gave me the envelope. Said he'd take it back when he'd made arrangements. Now, how could that help him? I don't know. He couldn't hide, go to another country. He knew you can't run away from a man like Castro. And if he ever had the evidence on him, Castro would kill him in a minute. All right. You've said what you had to say. No, not quite. You know what I think? I think the arrangements had already been made. I think the best way for your husband to escape Castro was to... Have himself killed. <laughs> 
You're insane. If he was dead, you'd have all his money and a half a million more in insurance. Get out of here. But he isn't dead at all, is he? The man in that car was Fleet. Get out. Your husband leaves the country. Everyone thinks he's dead. Castro stops looking for him. And after you collect the money, you meet him. Get out. Get out. How? Well, hello, Mr. Arnold. You don't even look singed. And what a lovely gun. I didn't credit you with this much sense, Dollar. Howard, what are we going to do? We're going to do just as we planned, with one slight change. Your car's in front, isn't it, Dollar? Yeah. Get our car, Beth. You're going to follow us. Where? Get the car. Fleet was the body in the burning car? Yes. You hired him to throw the blame on Castro? Of course. You're really a pretty messy guy, Arnold. You won't have to worry about it long. The police know I came here. They're going to wonder who killed me. What's the matter with Castro? Uh-uh. He's sitting in the lieutenant's office right now. He has so many efficient assassins. Let's go. Okay. Howard! You just follow us. All right, Dollar. Over to your car. You drive. Howard! What? There's a car coming up the drive. Howard! Look at that nice squad car! <laughs> <laughs> Going on. Oh, hi, Lieutenant. You've met Mr. Howard Arnold? Holy! He's alive! Yeah, but slightly unconscious. Better get them both in the car. Right. Here, Sergeant. Now, uh, what's going on? I'll tell you all about it as soon as we can sit down in some nice, loud saloon. Okay? Well, uh... It's on the expense account. Okay. We picked up the not-so-honorable Mr. Howard Arnold and took him back to the station, along with his weeping wife. I filled in some of the details on the way, and later, after I changed my shirt, the lieutenant met me in the bar, and I explained the whole thing from start to finish. Between the start and the finish, I ran up expense account items 3 through 25, $27.75, drinks and dinner for two. Expense account item 26, $49.18, car rental and hotel bill. Item 27, $21.43, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $123.66. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. And remember, Halloween is coming, so be sure to have plenty of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum on hand for the youngsters who come calling for tricks or treats. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were David Young, Jeanette Nolan, John McIntyre, Hi Averback, Frank Nelson, and Bill Conrad. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
This is the CBS Radio. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Atkins at Northwest Indemnity. Oh, hiya, Georgie. How'd you like to go to New York, Johnny, and get into the game, mad world of the theater? Thanks a lot, Georgie, but no thanks. I'm not the grease paint type. I know, but Amy Bradshaw is. Amy Bradshaw? Yeah, we wrote a policy on her a couple of years ago. Look, if it's her autograph you want, why send me? It's not that simple. Anyhow, she's got all the fans she wants. I know, I'm one of them. I think she's great. Johnny, looks like somebody's trying to kill her. Georgie, I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Expense account item one, $16.50. Transportation and incidentals to New York City. I checked in at a hotel and then went over to the Criterion Theater on West 44th, where Amy was starring in a play called The Unguarded Hour. David Coleman, the director, was standing in the wings watching the third act on stage. Let me see, There's no other David Coleman? Yes? I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator, sent over by Northwestern Indemnity. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Dollar, I called them. Uh, let's go over here where we can talk. Okay. How's the play going? Well, 22 weeks now. Been going along just fine until this business came up. How did it start? Last evening, just before curtain time, I dropped by Amy's dressing room. She looked, well, strange. How so? Pale, trembling. She was staring at a note in her hand that sounded like some sort of crank note. Do you know, uh, you are an evil woman. You will be punished by sudden death, unquote. Have you reported this to the police? Oh, no. Uh, I was afraid that if I did, it might get into the papers, and we don't want that kind of publicity. I see. How about if I talk to Amy after the show? I told her you'd be down and she'll talk to you. Oh, good. Well... Um, Mr. Dollar, the strain of this whole thing is beginning to show up in her performance. She's making mistakes and it rattles the cast, especially the young ingenue, or Sheila Mitchell. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll see what I can do. There's always the possibility that it is just a crank note and that Amy will never hear any more of it. Well, that's what I'm hoping. But we might as well face another possibility. That somebody close to Amy is using the crank note as a cover... Has that thought ever occurred to you? Why, no. No, it hasn't, Mr. Dollar. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly Holy happy Santa, he stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals Box 1580 Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund. But keep the giant talking sat as our gift. 
Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. I waited for Amy Bradshaw in her dressing room at the theater. Fifteen minutes later, after the final curtain, she swept in. Oh, there you are, Mr. Dodd. I'd never seen her from closer than the 15th row before, and needless to say, I was impressed. But I didn't have a chance to say so. I didn't have a chance to say anything. Oh, well, that's the way it goes. If you'll just give me a minute to get some of this makeup off. Now? Now. Hi. Hi. I knew it was only a question of time until you ran down. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I get a little overcharged out on the stage. Sure. Listen, it's nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar, and I know why you've come down here, but I think you're wasting your time. Oh? Yeah. This whole thing's really pretty silly, you know. I hope so, Miss Bradshaw. You mean Amy. Okay, Amy. Say, look, uh, how about having a drink with me somewhere? We can talk about it. I'd love to, but I'm afraid I have a date tonight. Could we make it tomorrow, maybe? Sure, okay, any time. <laughs> Excuse me. Come in. Oh, Mike. Oh, hello, Amy. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had company. That's all right. This is Johnny Dollar. Johnny, Mike Pomeroy, my agent. Mr. Pomeroy. How are you? And what'd you think of it tonight, Mike? Well, they seem to like it okay. Oh. Uh, uh, tell you what, Amy, I'll see you tomorrow, eh? Uh, tomorrow, Mike? I've got a few things I've got to take care of tonight. Uh, contracts to go over, you know, th- things like that. I... Oh, of course. Well, glad to meet you, Dollar. Uh, night, Amy. Is that offer of a drink still good, Johnny? Well, sure, but I thought you said you have... Oh, oh, sure, let's go. Thanks for understanding. Anywhere in particular? There's a little place right down the street, small and quiet. Good. Oh. What's the matter? Would you mind if we crossed the stage and went out the other door? Oh, no. Why? I think someone's waiting for me outside this exit. Oh. Sort of a friend of mine, Porter Kane, but he can be a little wearing, and I'm rather tired. Sure. I could see him through the open door. A thin-faced, rather elegant-looking man in a black Homburg. We went out the other side and down the street to a bar a few doors away. Item two on expense account, four dollars, drinks. After the first one, Amy relaxed a little. I wanted to get her talking about herself, and it wasn't too tough to do. There's not really much to tell about me. I've been acting a long time. Sometimes it seems too long. I've come a long way. Some people would say up. I hope it is. (laughs) You make it sound pretty simple, Amy. I guess we do what we have to. All of us. I had to act, so... So, just like that, huh? (laughs) Just like that. You've always gotten everything you wanted, haven't you? I think so. Hasn't anyone ever gotten in your way? No, Johnny, that's never happened. If it did... It looks to me like somebody's standing in your way right now. What do you mean? That threatening letter you got the other day. I told you, the whole thing's silly. There's nothing to it. Now, that's what you told me, but I don't think you believe it. Okay. So maybe I have worried a little about it. I I wouldn't have if it hadn't been... It was probably only my imagination. What was, Amy? Well, last night after the show, I felt like walking a little. I went west on 44th Street to Times Square, and as usual, it was crowded. I stood on the curb waiting for the light to change, and suddenly I got shoved out into the street. Oh? Right out into the traffic. I jumped back just in time. You see who did it? How can you tell in a crowd like that? I know. It was probably only coincidence that it happened right after I got that note, but... Oh, Johnny, I I still just can't believe anybody is really trying to do me harm, but I guess what's been making me nervous during the performance is staring out at that blackness past the footlights, wondering if there's somebody out there who hates me. Uh Uh-huh. I guess I can't stand being hated, Johnny. I've got to be loved. Look, Amy... Did it ever occur to you this might not be a crank out in the audience? That it might be someone closer to you? What? Johnny, that's impossible. Isn't? I don't have many friends. They've mostly to do with the play, but 
Those I have are good ones. Who else besides your agent, Pomeroy? How about the director? David Coleman. He's a very old friend and one of the best. How about the producer? Emery's the last person in the world who'd wish me harm. On a dollars and cents basis, if nothing else, he and Dora both. Dora? His wife. I like her very much. Does she like you? Why shouldn't she? What about this man you wanted to duck tonight? The one who was waiting outside the theater? Porter Kane. Oh, he's a sort of a fan, I guess. A little eccentric, maybe, but he's been very good to me. Johnny, really, it couldn't be any of them. Maybe, maybe not. Look, Amy, I was sent down here because Northwestern Indemnity holds a policy on you. I know. Now, who's the beneficiary? William York. Who's he? My husband. You. Oh. I didn't know you were married. We separated six months ago. What I wanted, he didn't. What he wanted, I didn't. It's as simple as that. Well, where is he now? Here in New York somewhere, I guess. I don't know. He's a writer, sort of. Johnny, I'm tired. Oh, yeah, sure, you must be. I'm sorry I kept you so long. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. It's been nice. Very nice. It's funny. I seem to relax a little when I'm with you. We left that one lay and went outside. Item three on expense account, two dollars. Taxi to Amy's apartment. There was a car parked two doors down with a man just sitting in it. I saw Amy give it a quick look. Then as she said goodnight to me at the door, I noticed that she slipped the catch on it. I sauntered across the street and stepped into the shadows. A moment later, the door of the parked car opened and her agent, Mike Pomeroy, got out and went into the apartment house. Then I realized I wasn't the only one watching this. Half a block down the street, I could see a figure in a shadowy doorway. I ran toward him, but he took off around the corner. When I reached the corner, he was nowhere in sight. Amy might have been taking this thing only half seriously, but I was real serious about it now. She said she had some very nice friends. But I had a strong hunch that one of these very nice friends was out to kill her. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your Giant Animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of the Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow, the Criterion Theater again, and a third-act curtain that wasn't in the script. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... 
Johnny. Honey Dollar. Al Sintel down at precinct headquarters, Johnny. Oh, hi, Al. Sorry I missed your call a few minutes ago. What's on your mind? An actress named Amy Bradshaw. Amy? One of my favorites. Me too. But right now I seem to be looking for a guy who doesn't feel that way about her. Huh? Al, it looks like somebody's trying to kill Amy Bradshaw. Better come down here and tell me all about it. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, New York City. To the Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. The threat of an attempt on her well-insured life. Expense account item 5, $1.75. Cab from my hotel to precinct headquarters to talk to Detective Lieutenant Al Centella. Al looked about the same as the last time I'd seen him. Rugged, competent, maybe a few pounds heavier. Sit down, Johnny, sit down. Thanks. Something about Amy Bradshaw, you said. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't know you were a friend of hers. Northwestern Indemnity holds a $25,000 life insurance policy on her. Here, take a look at this note. Amy got it several days ago. You are evil. You will be punished by sudden death. Oh, come on now, Johnny. A couple of nights ago, after the show, somebody shoved Amy off the curb and out into the traffic over in Times Square. Well, the same thing happens to me almost every time I'm around Times Square. You know what I smell in all this? Oh, sure. You probably smell a publicity stuff. I sure do. You think I'd fall for a thing like that? You know Amy Bradshaw very long? No. I'd seen her in a few shows, but last night was the first time I'd ever met her in person. If I didn't know you pretty well, I'd say you might be getting a little stage struck on her. Uh Uh-huh. What about the man who trailed Amy to her apartment last night? Oh? Who? I don't know. I chased him, but he had too much of a lead on me. I still wouldn't go jumping to any conclusions. Who you got to work on, for instance? Well, for one, David Coleman, her director. Then there's the producer, Emery Taylor, and his wife, Dora. From what Amy said, I gather Dora doesn't like her very well. Anybody else? And there's her agent, Mike Pomeroy. She seems to be pretty wrapped up in him. Old stable fool, huh? Yeah, looks like it. Also, a fellow named Porter Kane, who's usually hanging around the theater waiting for Amy. And finally, the man I really came to talk to you about. Who's that? Name is Bill York, her husband, but they're separated. Oh? She doesn't know where he is. You figure he might tie in somehow? He is the beneficiary of Amy's insurance policy. Well, I'll see if I can turn up an address on him for you. Okay, thanks, Al. In the meantime, I think I'll pay a call on this Porter Kane. See if I can find out just how good a fan he is. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, Giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1730 Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. 
Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1730. That's Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. Expense account item 6, 225. Cab to the apartment of Porter Kane in the East 70s. It was an expensive looking place. I got there about noon, but Porter Kane was just finishing breakfast, accompanied by Chopin. May I offer you a cup of coffee, Mr. Dollar? Oh, thanks. A blank, please. Yes. Now, you uh, came to see me about Amy Bradshaw, I believe. That's right, Mr. Kane. I represent Northwestern Indemnity Alliance. They hold a policy on Miss Bradshaw. You perhaps want some sort of character reference on her? You, uh, might put it that way. Well, in that case, you couldn't have come to one better qualified than I. You see, Amy is my career at present. Afraid I don't understand, Mr. Kane. Well, some years ago, I was relieved of the sordid but customarily necessary task of working for my bread and butter. The result is that I've been able to devote myself to a fascinating hobby. What kind of a hobby? I collect things. Oh, the objects of my interest vary, but uh, they all have one thing in common. Oh? Uh-huh. This signet ring I'm wearing, for instance. Yes, I noticed it. Very unusual. The crest is that of the Medici family, Renaissance Italy. The only ring of its kind in the world, so far as any of the authorities on that period are aware. Uh, that uh, vase on the table. The painting on the wall. Uh, that sculpture. One of a kind, huh? Precisely. Which brings us quite logically to Amy, who is... Clearly one of a kind. So? So I plan to add Amy to my collection. Just like that, huh? I'm certain Amy will see it my way in time. And I have time. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must dress for the matinee. Uh, Will I see you again, Mr. Dollar? Yes. You probably will, Mr. Kane. I was glad to get out of the hothouse atmosphere of Kane's apartment. Real weird, this character. And I had a hunch I'd better keep an eye on him. Item 7, $1.65, cab fare that evening to the Criterion Theater. I arrived half an hour before curtain time and headed for Amy's dressing room. Then as I approached her door... You'll listen real careful. I'll give it to you once again. You've been tossing wrong cues to Sheila for three nights now. You've been doing everything you can to upstage her and make her look bad. Mike, it's just that I've been nervous lately. Maybe I have made a few mistakes in my life. Amy, you know I've got plans for Sheila, and I don't want her looking bad in this play. You've got plans for Sheila. What about us? Amy, we can talk about that some other time. But for now, I just want you to understand, you're to lay off Sheila. I mean it. Is that a threat, Mike? Take it any way you like. It sounded like Pomeroy was coming outside, so I ducked around behind a piece of scenery and waited a moment. Then I went back to Amy's door. Oh, Johnny. Hello, Amy. You look tired. I am. I just had a little go around with Mike. Pomeroy? Uh huh. I've been fluffing some of my lines lately. He seems to think I've been doing it deliberately to make Sheila Mitchell look bad, but he's wrong. Have you found out anything yet, Johnny? No, not much. I still can't believe there's anything to it. It's so silly to let it upset me. Silly even to give it a thought. Well, try not to, Amy. Let me worry about it. All right. Did I ever tell you it's nice having you around? Johnny. I left her dressing room and started for the alley door, but somebody stepped out in front of me. It was Mike Pomeroy. Hello, Dollar. Oh, hi, Pomeroy. I was just talking to Dave Coleman, the director. He told me uh, he was the one who sent for you. He told me why. You didn't know about the threatening letter Amy got? No, no, I didn't. Look, uh, Dollar, every actress I've ever known has gotten at least one note like that during her career. You don't think this should be taken too seriously, then? No. Amy's pretty nervous these days. And as long as you're around stirring things up, she'll be worried about it. If there's anything to be done about it, I can handle it. In other words, you want me to mind my own business, that it? You said that, Dollar. I didn't. It might not be a bad idea. Funny thing. 
When somebody tells me to lay off a case, my interest in it always doubles. After the final curtain, I went backstage to wait for Amy. The stage door was open, and I could see Porter Kane waiting in the alley outside. So I went over to him. Well, Mr. Dollar, good evening. Hello, Kane. On duty again tonight? Perhaps that's one way of putting it. I thought I might have a little chat with Amy after she's changed. I'm afraid she has a date. Oh? Do you happen to know with whom? Yeah, me. Uh, Mr. Dollar, are you suggesting that I'm to regard you as some sort of rival? Not at all, Kane. I'm just suggesting that I'm a friend of Amy's. I see. Good night, Mr. Dollar. After Kane left, I stood beside the stage door and tried to figure out some of the angles on this case. There were too many of them. By the time I went in, the theater was dark, except for a dim light bulb over the stage, and everyone had gone. Everybody, that is, except Amy. I ran into the darkened theater. She was standing horrified next to the stairway by the dressing rooms, her eyes fixed on something that lay on the floor. Johnny! I was on my way out to meet you. I heard a swish through the air. This heavy sandbag. It barely missed me. Oh, Johnny. Stay back against the wall, Amy. You'll be okay there. I climbed the long ladder up to the catwalk above the stage where they sometimes use the sandbags to balance hunks of scenery. It was dark up there. I started edging along the catwalk. Suddenly, my foot hit a loose board. I almost lost my balance. A loose board that could have been left for me. And it was a long, long drop down to the stage. Whoever had been up there knew the theater pretty well. Finally, I went back down to Amy. She was trembling. Johnny. It's okay, Amy. It's okay. Johnny. Maybe I didn't take it seriously before, but I do now. Somebody dropped that sandbag from up there deliberately. Somebody is trying to kill me, and I'm scared, Johnny. I'm scared. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounce-O the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two-feet-long roller skating bear, Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman, Mortimer the Giant Mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the Great Giant Talking Santa, a roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of the Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow, a man steps onto the stage from out of the past and into a role he doesn't want to play. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Centella at police headquarters, Johnny. Yeah. You hear what happened at the Criterion Theater after the show last night? I was off duty when you called, but Sergeant Rogers gave me a fill-in this morning. 
So somebody tried to drop a sandbag on Amy Bradshaw backstage. Yeah, a real near miss. You still think these attempts on her life are publicity stunts? No, it looks like your hunch was right. I'll have a couple of my boys keep an eye on Amy. Thanks. Johnny, you wanted to know the whereabouts of this guy, Bill York, the husband Amy separated from... What have you got on him, Al? 768 West 4th Street, down in Greenwich Village. Thanks, I'll check it. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. New York City, expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Expense account item 8, 275. Taxi from my hotel to Greenwich Village to try and locate a writer named Bill York, who had separated from Amy six months ago. Amy was a good actress, but she couldn't hide the fact she was plenty scared by the attempts on her life in the last three days. My hunch was it was someone close to Amy, and Bill York was very much on my list. After all, he was the beneficiary on our life insurance policy. I hadn't been to this part of the village in two or three years, but from the looks of it, it hadn't changed a bit. Defiantly shabby and run down. A few beards here and there, a few gals with long, straight hair. Bookstores and bars, side by side. I checked at the address Al Centella had given me. It was a beat-up old rooming house. You come down here to interview the famous writer, something like that? Not exactly. Too bad. Here I thought you wanted to carry my message to America. No, I'm afraid that's a little out of my department, Mr. York. Amy did mention that you were a writer. I can tell you exactly what she said. She said, you know, uh, Bill's a writer, uh, sort of, right? (laughs) Well, as a matter of fact... Amy always felt it necessary to apologize for me. That was one thing about our marriage that was always so charming. Well, look, I didn't come here to discuss your marriage, York. I don't know what you're so bitter about. It's none of my business. But... Well, darling, what do I have to be bitter about? Here I am, an artist, living an unfettered life of freedom in Greenwich Village. What more could I ask? I guess I haven't read any of your books. Don't worry about it. You're in good company. You and the publishers. Oh, that's too bad. Must make a little problem in the grocery department. Oh, that doesn't worry me. You see, one can always manage to live comfortably in huck. Oh? And if one is willing to huck his soul, of course the returns are much greater. I don't get you. That's not surprising, because nobody else but me would call it my soul. It's just the manuscript for an unpublished novel. Three years of work and sweat and pain... But my clever pawnbroker, Mr. Pomeroy, has a fair idea what it means to me. Mike Pomeroy, Amy's agent? Charming chap. Quite shrewd. In other words, if you could raise some money, you could get this brainchild of yours out of hock from him. Tell me, how long has it been since you've seen Amy? Several months. Why? You haven't been uptown near her apartment the last few days, huh? No. You sure? Of course. Anything else? No, not for now. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly Holy happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. 
Yes, Giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund. But keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now, supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1870. That's Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. I was getting nowhere in my attempt to find out who was gunning for Amy Bradshaw, and I knew it. I called Mike Pomeroy, her agent, but he was out, so I took the next name on my list, the producer of Amy's play, Emery Taylor. Expense account item 9, 175, cab fare to Taylor's apartment in the mid-50s near the Museum of Modern Art. Taylor wasn't in, but his wife Dora was. She was sleek-looking and a little on the brittle side. She was sitting behind a small bar in the den, and she looked quite at home there. Drink? Thanks. Will your husband be back soon, Mrs. Taylor? Who knows? Yeah. Oh, thank you. What do you want to see him about? Amy Bradshaw. What about Amy Bradshaw? I wanted to ask him if he knew of anyone who might want to harm Amy for any reason. Oh, I could answer that better than Emery. There is someone? There certainly is. Who? Me. Why? Why? Would you like it if your husband was knocking himself out for your... Well, for a younger woman? Well, now, isn't that part of the business? Is it? That's not all. Amy's hurt plenty of people getting where she is. You think your husband's one of them? I hope not. Who has she hurt, Mrs. Taylor? Do you know Dave Coleman? Her director? He was very much in love with Amy a few months ago. Oh, I see. I don't like to see someone I like get the way he was. One night here, he had a couple too many. He said, uh, if he couldn't have her... uh, Oh. Funny. How quick he got over it, though. Never says anything about it anymore, huh? Not a word. What about Porter Kane? Oh, you've met him. Is he one of them that Amy's hurt? No, no, he's not in that category. Whatever happened to hurt him must have happened at about the age of five. What do you mean? Oh, isn't that when most of our troubles start? (laughs) I wouldn't know. I once paid a psychiatrist $500 to tell me that's when mine started. Your troubles? Sure. Can't you tell, Mr. Dollard? I'm the mixed-up type. Aren't we all, Mrs. Taylor? I left her still sitting behind the bar, and somehow I felt sorry for her. But she had given a new lead. David Coleman, Amy's director, who'd had it bad for Amy just a few months ago and had now completely recovered. Maybe. I made a mental note to have a little chat with Coleman that night. Then I put in another call to Mike Pomeroy. This time he was in, and I finally talked him into meeting me at a little bar on West 44th near the theater. But when I got there, I could see that he wasn't feeling very cooperative. Look, Dollar, I suggested once before, nice and polite, that maybe you should try minding your own business. I got the message all right, Pomeroy, and now I've got one for you. I am minding my own business. Hmm? This is what I was hired to do. The insurance company I represent holds a pretty hefty life insurance policy on Amy. And if she's in any danger, they want to know about it. I told you before, I think this whole thing's pretty silly. I had a talk with Bill York, the writer, this morning. Even though he and Amy are separated, you know, he's still the beneficiary on her policy. So? So he says he's in hock to you. He's a bum. He wasn't doing Amy any good. She was worrying about him. When they split up, I told him as long as he stayed away from her, didn't try to see her, I'd keep him in groceries. I see. But naturally, I wanted some security. The manuscript of his book, for instance? <laughs> Great unborn American novel. Well, apparently that manuscript means a lot to That's him. That's why I figured it'd be good security. What's the matter, Dollar? You look like you uh, smelled something bad. 
to I? What am I supposed to be? A philanthropist? Let me make one thing clear, Pomeroy. As far as the kind of loans you make, I agree with you. It's none of my business. But maybe I just got a sensitive note. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, now I want my dough back. Is there anything wrong with that? Not a thing. I've got a play lined up I know will go over big. I want to produce it. York's tab has run up to several thousand bucks now. I could use the money. I see. The stupid part of the whole deal is that York could pay me back within a couple of months if he wanted to. Oh. Sure. There's a lot of dough floating around to be made in television these days. But that prima donna thinks he's way above that sort of thing. This play you want to produce, Pomeroy, will it star Amy? No. Sheila Mitchell. Oh. Well, thanks for the information. Be seeing you. I doubt it. On my way over to the Criterion Theater, I thought about Pomeroy. A rugged customer. And I felt he was one more who wouldn't let anyone stand in the way of anything he wanted to do. After the show, I picked up Amy backstage and took her back to her apartment. She looked very tired and didn't say much. We said goodnight at the front entrance, and I started walking along the sidewalk. Then I spotted somebody in the shadows across the street again, watching. I could tell from his hat and coat he was the same one who'd been there the night before last. I kept on walking until I reached the corner, then circled halfway around the block to an alley and edged up on him from behind. He didn't see me until I dove at him. Well, Bill York. So, what are you doing here? So you haven't been near Amy for a long time, huh? Except tonight and the night before last, watching her apartment. Darling, Come on, York, start talking. And it better be good. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today. You may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals. Animals Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of the Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow, I find I have even more of a reason for keeping Amy alive than I'd realized. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Wright, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Sintella at police headquarters, Johnny. Better get over here to my hotel room, Al. I've got company. Who is it? Bill York. Amy Bradshaw's ex-husband? Right. I caught him watching her apartment half an hour ago, and he's the one who was watching it the other night. 
This time I had better luck catching him. Has he opened up yet? No, but he will. Johnny, take it easy with him. I think he's got plenty to tell us. Looks like he's the boy we're after, Al. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. New York City. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Amy, star of a Broadway play. And somebody was out to get her. Expense account item 10, $3. Repairs to one coat sleeve. Torn in the process of inviting Bill York up to my hotel room. Look, Dolly, you've got no right to drag me up here to your room this way. York, you're going to sit right here until you open up and tell me all about the attempt on Amy Bradshaw's life. What? You come in. Oh, Al. Hi, Johnny. York, this is Detective Lieutenant Al Centella. Now look here, Lieutenant. What's this all about? Well, I kind of thought that's what you'd tell us, Mr. York. But this is crazy. Why would I want to kill Amy? You're aware that you're still the beneficiary on Amy's insurance policy. What? Even if also, I Also, am... you need money, and you need it bad. You're several thousand bucks in debt to Mike Pomeroy, Amy's agent. He's been pressing you for it lately. Look, Dollar. And you know you can't get the manuscript of your novel out of hock from him until you pay off. You've got two strikes against you, York. Motive and opportunity. Opportunity? Sure, but motive? No, Dollar. I've never had any reason to kill Amy. It's true she and I couldn't make it together, but I guess that was more my fault than hers. Go on. You see, Amy's never let anything stand in the way of what she wanted. What she wanted, I didn't. I guess we just lived in two different worlds. What do you mean? She's always been a success, and I've always been a failure. You still haven't explained why you lied to me, York. Why? When I talked to you this morning, you told me you hadn't been near Amy for a long time. But when I caught up with you in front of her apartment tonight, I realized you were the same one who was watching it night before last. How about that, York? You fellas don't leave me much. What do you mean? Sure, once in a while I go stand outside her apartment house, look up at the light on the window, maybe think a little about how things might have been. That's all. Uh, maybe you better come downtown with me, York. We'll check your story further. If you're clean, you got nothing to worry about. All right, Lieutenant. Sergeant, take Mr. York down to the car and wait for me there. Johnny, who else have you talked to? Oh, everybody close to her. But the one who interests me most is her agent, Mike Pomeroy. He can be a pretty rough customer when he wants to. And he thinks Amy's standing in the way of a career for an actress he's currently interested in. Let's talk about somebody else for a moment. Who? Oh. You, Johnny. I think you're getting a little bit out of line. What do you mean? Down at police headquarters, we got a little black book. It tells us what to do and what not to do. It doesn't say anything about insurance investigators dragging possible suspects to their hotel room to question them. Listen, Al, when I'm assigned to a case, I usually try to break it any way I can. I know. It's just that I think you're taking this case pretty big. Meaning? Yesterday I told you that if I didn't know you better, I'd think you were falling for Amy a little yourself. Think it over, Johnny. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long. And all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off. 
off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush one dollar and ten cents for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1907. That's Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. <laughs> Expense account item 11, $4, drinks, for me. I thought about what Al Centella had said. The possibility I was falling for Amy Bradshaw. Thought about it for two hours. Finally, I decided I had to find out if he was right. I went over to Amy's apartment. It was good of you to come over, Johnny. I just can't seem to sleep lately. Yeah... I noticed there's a policeman on duty down in the lobby. Lieutenant Centella arranged for that. It's funny. It should make me feel better, but it doesn't. It just keeps reminding me of it. Threat on my life. I'm glad you're here, Johnny. So am I. Awfully glad. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but... Do you hear any objections? Oh, now, who could... Excuse me. Yeah, sure. Hello? Yes? Oh, Porter. What? No, I'm sorry. I... No, really, Porter, it's out of the question. No, I... Good night, Porter. Kane, huh? Yes, I suppose he means well. But he can be rather annoying. Do you have a cigarette, Johnny? Here. Thanks. You seem rather quiet tonight. Oh, just thinking, I guess. It's funny. Mm. Our meeting like this. Yeah. Just a few days ago, I didn't know you at all. And now... And now what? I don't know, Johnny. I don't know. It was a mistake, Johnny. I'm sorry. Was it? Yes. Johnny, I'm afraid I've hurt a couple of people in the past. I don't want to hurt you. Don't worry. You won't. That's the wonderful thing about being an actress. You play so many parts. The kiss. That was playing a part, huh? Even if it weren't, Johnny, it'd be no good. There'd always be something between us. It's right over there on the mantel. The clock? Yes. We can't turn it back. If I'd met you a long time ago before, Mike, or... But I didn't. No. So? Is the clock so bad, Amy? It is to an actress. Sometimes I pretend it isn't there. You ever do that, John? No, it doesn't do any good. But you can try. You can live a whole life trying. Isn't that really what we all do? I don't know. We go along playing our parts, doing what we have to do, pretending the clock isn't there. 
But all the while it is. And though we keep on fighting against it, we know we can't turn it back. We can't even stop it. One thing I'd accomplished, I guess. I decided I wouldn't be seeing Amy anymore after this case was wound up. Winding it up, though, was another question. And I was still as far from home as ever on it. But I couldn't seem to get Porter Kane and his quaint little hobby of collecting things out of my mind. Why, good evening, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mr. Kane. Come in, come in. Thanks. I know it's late. I'm sorry. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I was hoping I'd see you again. I don't want to keep you. I see your hat and coat. No, I'm not going out. I've just come in. Oh. Uh, You said you were hoping you'd see me again? Yes, I enjoyed our other little chat very much. I uh, suppose you came to talk some more about Amy Bradshaw. Matter of fact, Mr. Kane, I came to talk about you. Splendid. And about your hobby. Collecting. A fascinating hobby, Mr. Dollar. You take it pretty seriously, don't you? I've devoted most of my life to it. And I may say that I've succeeded rather brilliantly with it. Each item in my collection is incomparable, without equal. Yeah, one of a kind. And that, of course, is precisely why Amy is necessary to complete the collection. The crowning and final edition. Final? Yes. Uh, For your information, Mr. Dollar, when I've acquired Amy, I intend to cease my hobby. Oh. She will complete my collection. Without her, though, it is still incomplete. Mind if I ask you a couple of questions, Mr. Kane? Not at all. You seem to have been pretty successful with your collection. Have you ever run up against an item you wanted but couldn't get? Of course not. (laughs) That just doesn't happen. Has it ever happened? I can't remember that it ever... Yes. Yes, it did happen once. When? When I was nine years old. A playmate of mine had a lollipop that I admired greatly. He wouldn't give it to me, and he wouldn't sell it to me. What did you do? I I did the only logical thing there was to do. I smashed the lollipop, Mr. Dollar. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall, absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today. You may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of the Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow, well, it's the wind-up, and a pretty rough one. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... 
Johnny Dollar. It's Amy Bradshaw, Johnny. Amy, it's 1 a.m. Anything the matter? Yes, can you come over right away? Sure, your apartment? No, I'm in my dressing room at the Criterion Theater. At 1 o'clock in the... Amy, there's a policeman assigned to you. Is he with you? No, I... I went out the back way. I came over here alone. But why? He's supposed to be protecting you. Johnny... I can't explain now, but I think I finally know who's been trying to kill me. I want to talk to you right away over here. Hurry. Please hurry. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. New York City, expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Expense account item 12, $5. Taxi from my hotel to the Criterion Theater on West 44th. Two bucks for the fare, three bucks for getting me there in five minutes. Amy had sounded plenty scared over the phone. The cab skidded to a stop in front. I caught a glimpse of somebody at the other corner of the theater. It looked like Porter Kane. I couldn't be sure, and I didn't have time to find out right now. Backstage, it was quite dark, and I had to feel my way through some... The shot came from the direction of Amy's dressing room. Mike Pomeroy, her agent, was lying on the floor, dead. There was a gun on the floor, too, just inside the door. Johnny! Oh, Johnny! What happened, Amy? Amy, stop it! Tell me what happened. The door. The door? The, the shot. It, it came from the door. I ran outside the dressing room across the stage into the alley. No one in sight. Back inside, I found a light switch. So I phoned Al Centella at police headquarters, told him what had happened. Amy was quieter now. Johnny. Amy, look. Look, I know it's tough for you to talk right now, but you've got to try and tell me. I know. A little after midnight, Mike called me at my apartment. He said he wanted to talk to me about something important. His office is nearby, and he asked me to meet him here in my dressing room. So I came over right away. Go on. Mike and I started talking. Suddenly, I saw the door opening a crack. A hand with a gun. Mike. Mike. Easy, easy. Mike saw it, too. He he dove in between me and the door. And collected the slug. He he fell against the door and it slammed on the hand. The gun dropped. And the next thing I remember, you were in the room. You didn't see who was holding the gun? No, just the hand. Amy. There was something on one of the fingers that I recognized. A large signet ring? Yes, sir. Yeah. It belonged to the guy out on the sidewalk. Porter Kane. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost... 
Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund. But keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush one dollar and ten cents for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1918. That's Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1918, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. Lieutenant Centella arrived at Amy's dressing room, and Amy repeated her story to him. He sent a couple of his boys out to pick up Porter Kane. Al and Amy and I went down to headquarters. We left her in one room while we went into another to question Kane, who had been picked up at his apartment. See here, Lieutenant, I don't know what this is all about, but I certainly object to being routed out Just of... hold it, Kane. You know why you're down here. I certainly do not. You don't know that Mike Pomeroy's dead, eh? Amy's agent? Really? Really. Well, I never did like that chap. Quite an insensitive person. Well, he's real insensitive now, Kane. He's dead. How did it happen? Mike was shot by mistake. The real target was Amy. Good heavens, no. When's the last time you saw Amy? The night before last. I spoke to her briefly after the show. You haven't talked to her on the telephone? No. You're lying. Now, see here, Dollar. You phoned her at her apartment about 11 p.m. I was there. All right. I did telephone her. I suggested she meet me somewhere. I, I told her I'd wait for her outside her apartment. Go on. I saw her come out later by the alley, so I followed her to the theater, thinking she meant for us to talk there. But then I I heard a shot. So you admit being in the vicinity. Well, yes, but I definitely did not go into the theater. Didn't you? Kane, Amy got a look at the hand holding the gun. There was a ring on one of the fingers. Ring? Your ring. But she's completely mistaken. That's a very distinctive ring. It's not one that anybody be mistaken about. See here, Lieutenant, all of this, this wild supposition is based on the assumption that I had a motive for wanting to kill Amy. You told me what your motive was when I talked to you last evening in your apartment. What do you mean? I asked you what you'd do if you wanted something for your collection and couldn't get it. You told me a story about what happened when you were just a kid nine years old. But I, I Another say... Another kid did... had a lollipop you wanted. He wouldn't give it to you, so you smashed it. And that's what you were trying to do tonight in Amy's dressing room. You couldn't have her, so you tried to smash her. There wasn't much point in my hanging around. So I got Al Sintella's permission to take Amy back to her apartment. We could wait there for any new developments. Amy didn't say a word all the way. When we got there, she sat in a chair staring at the wall. When she finally spoke, it was more like she was talking to herself. He's dead. Amy. He's dead because of me. Stop talking that way. Mike Pomeroy jumped in the way of a bullet. If he hadn't, you'd be dead. It would have been better that way. Stop it, Amy. Johnny. Yeah. I think... You think what? Oh, just a minute. I'll get it. It was Al Centella down at police headquarters. When he finished talking, I didn't say anything. There wasn't anything to say. After I hung up, I stood there a moment, staring out the window. It had started to rain. I felt old and tired and empty and sick. I went back into the other room again. Amy was sitting there, looking at me. Johnny? Yeah, Amy? Was that call for me? No. Who was it? Lieutenant Centella. Oh. The gun that killed Mike Pomeroy. There were no fingerprints on it. You said you saw a bare hand with a ring on it holding the gun. A bare hand would have left fingerprints. You killed him, didn't you? Yes, Johnny. The attempts on your life, you faked them, didn't you, to convince people you were in danger so you could kill Pomeroy and we think the shot was intended for you. Why, Amy? You know why. (sighs) Yeah, I guess so. You loved Mike. You knew he was growing away from you. Very fast. You saw him get interested in a younger actress. You knew she was taking your place with him. To Mike, I was dead. 
I couldn't stand that. I really couldn't. So it... I started making it look like I was in danger. It wasn't very hard, Johnny. I'm a good actress. Yeah. After a while, I almost began to believe I was in danger. Something was after me. It was hunting me. It finally caught up with me, and I... did what I did. Which of us is the hunter, Johnny? And which is the hunted? Amy... Yes. I think one of Lieutenant Centella's men is waiting for you out in the hall. All right. Just one thing, Johnny. What is it? I'll need something now. Something. Don't forget me, Johnny. Give me that. That you can count on, Amy. She walked out of the room, and she didn't look back. I'm glad she didn't. Expense account item 13, $16.50. Transportation and incidentals from New York back to Hartford. Expense account total, $185.20. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Amy repeated her confession to Lieutenant Centella. Her trial's coming up soon. Sweet case. Well, tomorrow's another day. So they tell me. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar will return in a moment to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounce-O the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today. You may never hear this offer again. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing and cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week... A case with a great big question mark. Accident, suicide, or just plain murder? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Florence Walcott, Don Diamond, Larry Thor, Vic Perrin, and Carlton Young. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for...
Johnny Dollar. Pete Codley, Johnny. Guaranteed transport. Oh, hiya, Pete. Seen the papers? No, I just got up. Why? What's happened? Air crash, for one thing. Air crash? Where? Mexico. Flight 6, Aztec Caribbean line. Mexico City to Havana. Crashed in the mountains ten minutes after takeoff. Seven passengers and a crew of three. Survivors? The way it sounds, none. Oh, tough. How do you come into it, Pete? We underwrite a company that handles flight insurance down there. Three of the passengers bought policies at the airport. We're stuck for $75,000. This is a nice time of the year in Mexico, Johnny. What do you want me to do? Find out why it crashed? No, I know why it crashed. Somebody meant for it to. What do you mean? That plane blew up in midair. I'll get you a reservation. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Guaranteed Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Flight 6 matter. Item 1, $173.20, airline fare and incidentals, Hartford, Connecticut to Mexico City. I checked my baggage through customs and started making inquiries, and more inquiries, and then some more. And after the 14th, Ken Sabe, maybe is better you ask him, I found the office I was looking for. Or at least I thought I'd found it. The flowery Spanish title on the door translated roughly into Inspector General of the Department of Civil Air Transport. But when I opened the door, I wasn't so sure. Come in, Jack. Make yourself to home. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking for the... you found him. That's me. Don't let the big words on the door fool you. I'm all there is. There ain't no more. So come in. Shut the door. All right, thanks. (laughs) Is uh, your name uh, Dollar? That's right, Johnny Dollar. Macklin here. Mac Macklin. One time mongrel from the south side of Chicago. I got a wire from your office. Said you'd be in on Pan Am Flight 12. Pull up a chair and squat, will you? All right. Or what were you expecting? <laughs> Spanish grandee with a white silk shirt and black silk tie and a second cousin on the cabinet? Well, maybe. At least I wasn't figuring on a south side make with a 17th century desk and a cotton sweatshirt. Uh, well, now, here's what little dope we've got on the crash. Most of it you probably know already. I left on 20-minute notice. All I've seen is one newspaper item. I can use a lot more. Well, you won't get much more out of that report. We got a crew over at the wreckage around two hours ago. Survivors? No, he didn't have a chance. That crate is scattered over ten acres of mountainside. Didn't catch fire, though, so we might turn up something or other. Oh, I got a good man in charge up there, Juno Romero. You'll meet him later. I'm sending another jeep up there in a few minutes, and you can go along if you want. Thanks, I will. My company figures sabotage. Any chance they're wrong? Could it have been accidental? Equipment failure, personnel failure, something like that? Well, if I thought so, I'd be up there at the wreck myself. That'd be my kind of job. But this one's different. You know, it's detective work. Your kind of job. And Gino you know, Romero's. Now, he talks as soft as a girl out of finishing school. Looks a little like one, in fact. But underneath it, he's as sharp as a tack and tougher than an old boot full of nails. What actually happened when the plane went down? All I've heard is that it blew up in midair. That's right. Well, a few Indians were on the only ones who saw it. They were burning charcoal up on a slope at about 9,000 feet. They were watching the plane circle, gaining altitude. Then one big flash, the tail blew off. Pilot didn't have a chance. He rode it straight into the side of the mountain. The tail? That sounds like the baggage compartment. That's the way I figure it. An explosive of some kind. A time bomb smuggled on board before the takeoff. I'm covering that angle from this end. I'm rounding up every one of the baggage gang, the maintenance crew, anybody who had a chance to get near that plane before it left the field out there. And what have you found out? Well, so far, nothing. We're trying to check back, too, on the individual passengers, the plane crew, trying to find out who might benefit by having any one of them dead. Well, I guess that'll be your angle, too. Yeah. Yeah, at least as far as insurance is concerned. Well, there were three flight policies issued... And the names are in the reports here, so... Yeah, I know. I've got them. The home office gave them to me, along with the names of the beneficiaries. I haven't talked to any of them yet. I figured that you know how to go about it better than I would. And there's another possible insurance angle, and that's the cargo. Do you know if there was anything valuable on board? Worth destroying for the insurance, you mean? No, it was done by somebody who deliberately set out to kill one of the ten people on board that plane. 
And who didn't mind killing nine others to get that one? It was premeditated, cold-blooded. Now, you get him, Johnny. Get him for me, and then just leave me alone with him for about... Uh... Come in. One of you is Senor McLean, Inspector General de Departamento... De yes, that, that's me. What can I do for you, Jack? They will not give to me any information, Senor McLean. Not the police, nor the airline office, nor oh, anything. Who are you, and what information do you want? I am Ramon de Lagos, Senor, and I am here... De Lagos? Wait a minute. That's the name of one of the... Yes. Men. Look, uh, are you related to Maria de Lagos? My wife. She was on the plane. Now tell me, please, what news do you have? Have you reached the scene of the crash? Yes, we have. Two hours ago. And what did you... Is there any chance... I'm sorry, there were no survivors. No. Oh, no. I, I'm sorry, Senor de Lagos. It is too terrible. I, I didn't know you were here in the city or I'd have, I'd have let you know right away. I sent word to your office in Havana. I, I have been here for six weeks. Maria came for a visit only a few days ago. No. I know, that's, that's a rough deal. I, I, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, uh, this is Johnny Dollar from the States. Senor. Later, sir. He's here to investigate the cause of this thing. What is the use, senor? It will not return life to the dead. No, but I don't like to see a murderer get away with it. A murderer? Then the rumors are true. The plane was destroyed deliberately. It is hard to believe that anyone would... Senor McLean, what arrangements are being made? The, uh, the bodies will be brought down to the Federal District Hospital. And I'll see that you're notified. Gracias, senor. No, no, let's see. I, I believe your wife's brother, Don Serrano, is staying at the Hotel Regis. Yes, he is. But I am at the Monte Cassino. Don Serrano and I are not friendly. I see. All right, senor, then I'll contact you at the Monte Cassino as soon as I have word. You are very kind. And again, I'm... Well, I, I'm sorry. I... Yes, that is all one can say. Adios, senores. Know anything about him, Mac? Well, only what his wife filled out on the flight form. He's Cuban. Residence in business address, Havana. In the export game. And you know, of course, that his wife was one of the three people who took out accident policies. But naming a brother, Don Serrano, as beneficiary... I wonder why. Well, that's one of the six dozen questions you can ask when you start prowling. Look, I hate to rush you, Johnny, but I ought to start that jeep up the mountain. I'm ready any time. I'll let Gino know you're coming. You check with me if you want anything. You'll have full cooperation from the federal police and the government. And to repeat just one thing, Johnny. Yeah, I know. Whoever did it, get him. Check. The jeep driver was a young Mexican boy who had been brought up in the best and wildest chauffeuring traditions of the capital. He knew only one way to drive, with both accelerator and horn wide open. Since most of the other drivers were playing the same game, it was a sheer miracle that we ever got through the narrow streets of the city and finally reached the open valley. Maybe the colored postcard pasted on the dashboard, a picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe, had something to do with it. We finally left the last cart road and bumped along a narrow woodcutter's trail cleared and widened enough now so that we could drive into the crash area and miss the mile and a half walk the first rescue party had been forced to take. For some reason, only a small part of the wreckage had caught fire and burned, and the rest was strewn piecemeal along a great raw gash through the trees and brush. Men in uniforms of the Mexican army searched through the tragic debris, lifting, sorting, and collecting. And nearby, a silent group of Indians were watching, with the age-old sadness in their eyes. You are uh, Senor Dollar, no? Yes. Uh, Gino Romero, Senor. Oh, glad to know you, Gino. It's a terrible thing, no? Yeah. Any ideas yet? Uh, not of importance, but it's certain now this. It was caused by one explosion which has occurred in the baggage compartimento. Uh, venga, uh, Come on. We have found many pieces which can be identified. Uh, can be known which part of the plane they are in before the crash. I see. Toward the front, these pieces are more large, but in the back, near the tail, they are very little. Oh, here, uh, you look. These are pieces of the baggage, uh, muy pequeño, hmm? uh, very tiny. Oh, yeah, the crash itself wouldn't have done this. It had to be an explosion. Seguro. And look, it's burnt a little, each one of these pieces, but these more big ones from the seats of the plane, they are not burnt. 
Here, uh, you smell this one. Hmm? Yeah, I see what you mean. Either dynamite or nitroglycerin. Well, it's dynamite. We have found little tiny pieces of red paper from the wrappings on the sticks. Was dynamite. Any idea how much? How big a charge? One of the soldados, uh, Pascual, who have used most explosive, is think maybe 30 or 40 pounds. Light enough to be put on board in a piece of luggage. It's going to be tough, Gino. Plenty tough to... They're bringing out the bodies. The Indians set up a low, wailing dirge. And one of them taps softly on a native drum. A wordless terror before the ancient mystery. Death. One by one, the bodies passed us, borne by the silent soldiers. Madre de Dios, may they find peace. Then, for the first time, I noticed the girl, standing alone some distance away, watching without expression as the stretches passed her. She was young, blonde, and beautiful. Not conventionally so, but beautiful as a young animal is beautiful. And she looked very much out of place. You are observing the senorita, no? What's she doing up here? Quien sabe? She's strange, that one. Always she's look for danger. She's what you say, um, the, the daredevil. But it's like she always have the charm. Death has never find her. So perhaps she has come here to look on his face. Do you know who she is? Well, see, she's American. Her name is Marvel Terrence. Marvel Terrence? You have heard of her, senor? I'd heard of her all right. And I'd wondered what kind of a girl would have a first name like Marvel. And now I knew, partly at least. And I planned to find out a whole lot more. Three of the people who died on that plane had taken out flight policies. Maria de Lagos was one of them. The other two were men. Both of whom had named as beneficiary Marvel Terrence. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a fighting girl and a lucky break. And then murder cancels the score. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar here. Go ahead. McMacklin, Johnny. Is Gino around? Yeah, he's over across the slope at the moment. They're getting the bodies out of what's left of the plane. Well, how does it look? Anything new? Nothing we hadn't already guessed. It was an explosion, all right. Dynamite in the baggage compartment. Probably put on board in a piece of luggage. Well, that figures. I've run into something down here in the city along those same lines. What do you mean? The ground crew remembers one of the baggage handlers acting strange before Flight 6 took off last night. A man named Ramirez. What do you mean strange? Uh, 
They say he had one suitcase that he wouldn't let any of the other handlers touch. Put it on the plane himself just before takeoff. Hmm. Hey, you know anything about tigers, Mac? Tigers? I'm about to tangle with one. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. I was taking Gino Romero's word for it that the girl was a tiger. His word and my own instincts. At first glance, she seemed soft, shy, and lovely. Then you sensed a wildness about her. A kind of suppressed violence that brought you up short and made you stop and reappraise her. She leaned against a tree, watching the bodies of the plane crash victims being carried down the slope and placed in the army jeep, with no sign of emotion on her face. Cool, detached. She had no reason to be here, and I wondered why she was. The only way I knew of finding out was to ask her. Yes, what is it? You're Marvel Terrence, I believe. That's right, and I've not met you somewhere before. No, but you're about to. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an investigator for an insurance company up in the States. I'm sure it must be very interesting work. Sometimes, on some jobs. Other times, it's only dirty and disgusting. Like this time, for instance. Well, we all have our problems. Maybe I can help you with yours, Miss Terrence. Run along, will you? I'm not in the mood. Oh, you amaze me. I think that seeing ten bodies picked up and hauled away ought to put anyone in a gay, carefree mood. Look... Beat it. You came out here sightseeing, didn't you, 20 miles from town? So you must like this kind of thing. I had friends on that plane, Mr. Dollar. So did a lot of other people. But maybe not as good friends as you had. I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't care. E.H. Palmer and Jim Rourke? Were those your friends, Miss Terrence? Now, let's get this straight. I'm not interested in playing footsies or any other game you have in mind. You're wasting your time, Buster. Now, get going. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe you've got the wrong idea. This isn't just a social chat. No, you want to help me with my problem. Just one problem. I'm wondering how you're going to spend that $50,000. What? Yeah, that's a fair-sized chunk of money to drop right out of the sky. What are you talking about? What $50,000? The money you'll get from the deaths of your two friends, Palmer and Rourke. What do you mean? Say, tell me, were you with them at the airport last night when Flight 6 took off? Yes, I was. Then you must have known that they both took out flight policies. And that both of them named you as beneficiary. No. No, I didn't know. I I wasn't with them, exactly. At least, not up until takeoff. Then you claim this is all just a big surprise. Of course, I didn't know a thing about it. But it's just like them. It's what they do. Why did you come out here to the wreck, Miss Terrence? I don't know. Ed and Jim were my friends, and I... I don't know why I came, Mr. Dollar. She came because I brought her, mister. Hmm? No, Bill. But I didn't bring her here to be pushed around by some morbid curiosity, huh? No, please. This is Johnny Dollar, Bill. He's an insurance investigator. Bill Blakely, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello. He was asking me some questions. Why you? Because Ed and Jim both took out insurance policies in my name. What? Flight accident policies, $50,000 worth. Well, I'll Mr. Be... Blakely, you said Miss Terrence is here because you brought her. I wonder if you'd tell me why you're here. I don't know that it's any of your business. Sometimes I make things my business. And sometimes you may get your teeth knocked out. They're in pretty solid, Blakely. Yeah? Well, maybe... Bill, stop it. Sorry, Marvel. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were Bill's business partners. What business, Mr. Blakely? Engineering. We're building some roads around Mexico City. How many partners? Just the three of you? Yes, just... That's right, Dollar. The business belongs to me now. What about it? Nothing about it. Congratulations. One more crack Bill, like that. Bill, I said I've... stop it. Let's go, Marvel. I've got to get back to town. Wait for me at the truck. I'll be there in a few minutes. All right. Sit yourself. Dollar, just one thing. Don't push me. Blakely, ten people died over there on that hillside last night. They were murdered. I intend to find out who did it. And if it takes pushing to find out, then I'll push. See you around. Yeah. 
You probably will. This thing hit Bill pretty hard, Mr. Dollar. You have to make allowances. How long have you known him? A couple of months. And Palmer and Rourke? The same. It's nothing serious, nothing romantic, if that's what you're thinking. It was all just for fun. Was that all it was on their side? Oh, men always claim to be serious. But that's only part of the game. What else do you do, Miss Terrence, beside play the game? That's all. I'm a wealthy orphan, Mr. Dollar, and my only career is drifting around the world playing the game. I'm ornamental, irresponsible, and rather useless. Maybe not entirely useless. Just being ornamental has some importance in this world. So you play too, huh? I meant it. I guess I was pretty obnoxious when you spoke to me a while ago. Well, I suppose I asked for it. I'm staying at the Hotel Monte Cassino. Are you? I'd like to see you again. I could teach you the game, Johnny. Well, that's a very attractive offer. Outside of business hours. But you think I'm mixed up in this? No, I'm not sure. Well, think about it, Johnny. And call me at my hotel. The Monte Cassino. That's where Delagos is staying. Happen to know him? Ramon? Oh, yes, of course. Why? Well, one of the passengers killed on that plane was his wife. Didn't you know? I saw the name Delagos, but I... I didn't even know he had a wife. Another? Just for fun? I think you've got some wrong ideas about me, Johnny. Come see me and I'll straighten them out for you. All right. I will. And something else. You'll find it out anyway, so I may as well tell you. Tell me what? I had reservations on Flight 6, too. I was going over to Havana for the weekend. I canceled out at the last minute. I see. Maybe that's why I came out here. To see for myself. I'm not afraid of death. I've tempted it too many times to be. But it does fascinate me. I stood there watching and thinking. It could have been me being carried down that slope. Except for luck. Why did you cancel out at the last minute? I was talked out of making the trip. By whom? Bill Blakely. I watched her swing down the slope, lithe, erect, and lovely. A strange girl with an air of aloneness about her, an air that I felt would be with her even in the crowd. Strange, but also compelling, exciting. She might be involved or she might not. I didn't know. But I was sure of one thing. In either case, I was going to see her again. An hour later, Gino Romero and I were heading back toward the city in the government jeep, leaving behind us the wrecked plain, the crushed trees, and the lonely slope on the mountain. You have found the young lady of interest, senor? Yeah, I found her of interest. <laughs> Always she's doing the crazy things. Daredevil, flirting with the eyes, looking for danger. Playing the game, she calls it. Si, senor, playing the game. Que lastima. It is too sad that ten persons are not be playing the game now anymore. Oh, it's all right, Gino. I'm not that much under a spell. Que dice? If she's guilty in any way, I'll pin it on her just as quick as the next one. Oh, but I did it's not It's all right, mean forget that... it. No, I do not think she's guilty. It is not a thing she will do, and she does not need the money. She's very rich. Do you know that? Everybody says so. Well, that's what I mean. It's worth checking into. It's possible, but... I still do not think she would do such a thing. It is too terrible. And she's too beautiful. <laughs> Maybe I ought to give you the advice, Gino. Before the beauty of a woman, senor, we are all as brothers, like senor Bla uh, Blakely. I see he will look very disturbed. Yeah, he did get a little hot under the collar. What do you know about him, Gino? Almost nothing. He's come here for three months now, making the road. And his partners, Palmer and Rourke, were killed in the plane crash. What do you know about them? The same. Nothing. They all arrive together, always. They work together, play together. Then along came Marvel Terrence. True. They were all rivals for the senorita. And there is one thing. What's that? They have the building for the machinery outside the city, the warehouse, you call it. What about it? In this warehouse, they keep much dynamite. J. 
Gino dropped me in my hotel, the Del Prado, on Avenida Juarez. I changed clothes, cleaned up, sent some telegrams to the States. And about that time, Mac Macklin phoned up from downstairs and asked me to join him in the bar. Expense account item three, $16.40. Drinks and dinner with the chief inspector of the Federal Department of Civil Air Transport. And then some more drinks. I've been here seven years, Johnny. I like it. I feel at home here. I like the people and their way of life. But it'd still be good to see you all shy again. The snow piling up along the loop, and the wind ripping in off the lake. The crazy little joints along Baker Street. When were you there last, Mac? Uh, 1932. Oh, then you're about due. Well, why don't you take a couple of weeks and fly up there? No, no. Too much water under the bridge, Johnny. Too many little wars here and there in the world since 32. And two of them, McMacklin was flying in them. On one side or the other. Oh, what of it? Well, you know, Uncle Sam frowns on that kind of thing, Johnny. So we, we've got a sort of an understanding. I stay the heck away and he forgets about me. I see. <laughs> I've got no complaints, actually. I'm I, I'm doing all right here. But, but sometimes I sure do get homesick for the old town. Of course, it's probably changed so much that I... Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, Con permiso de telephone, uh, Senor Macri. Oh, thanks. I uh, plug it in. Hello, yeah? What? All right. Well, have you told the federal police? Yeah, I'll be here for a while. Adios. Well, we just lost our best angle, Johnny. What do you mean? That baggage handler, the one I figured slipped the dynamite on board the plane. The boys just now located him. His throat has been cut. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a bereaved relative lies, a frustrated lover comes up fighting, and a lovely lady in the case just vanishes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Oh? We have not met, Senor Dollar. No, or I'd have been sure to remember the name, Don Serrano. Wait a minute. You're Maria Delago's brother. That is correct. I was planning to call on you this morning, Don Serrano. That will not be necessary, Senor. Since I am taking the liberty of calling on you, I am downstairs in your hotel at this moment. Oh, I see. I believe I may be able to cast some light on the unfortunate tragedy which overtook my poor sister and the other passengers of that ill-fated airplane. Do you know something that hasn't come out? Rather a great deal, senor. I know the crash which resulted in the deaths of ten innocent people was the evil work of a diabolical maniac. Yes, well... A product of the warped mind of a scheming, worthless, unspeakable dog, a sneaking, money-hungry snake, a scurrilous, unprincipled... Don Serrano! See, si, senor. Come on up! Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. Item 5, $3.90, room service. Breakfast for myself and a pot of coffee for my visitor, Don Serrano de Almeido y Pico, I think. He was a thin, straight man with a small goatee and the face of a hawk. Stiff, formal, unbending. A classy grande type from an old school long out of business. And a man of much suppressed violence and hate. Once upon a time, senor, there existed a gentleman's code for the settlement of such matters as this. The duelo, as it was called. But we are living now in lesser and more decadent times. A man is no longer permitted to kill his enemies. He must suffer interference by the police, the Civil Air Transport Department, the government. And even special investigators from the States, huh? Is that what you mean? I was not speaking personally, Senor Dollar. You are as much a victim of the times as I am. Well, it doesn't seem to be irritating me as much. More coffee, Don Serrano? Uh, Gracias, no. Perhaps it is because uh, you have not lost your dearly beloved sister, Senor. Oh, maybe. In that, at least, you have my sympathy. But let's get to the point... You've done quite a lot of talking about wanting to kill somebody, but I'm still not too sure who or why or what. It is very simple, senor. Not to me. Suppose we start at the beginning. As you like. But who can ever say what is the beginning of anything? All right, then let's be arbitrary about it. Let's start three weeks ago when your sister Maria came here from Havana to join her husband, Ramon de Lagos. I believe you said Ramon had been here for a month at that time on uh, some kind of a business deal. A business deal? Do I look like a fool, senor? Oh, now, let's stick to the point. Women. That is his business, senor. Women with money. Then a week ago, Maria wired you, said she was terribly unhappy, and asked you to come at once. And when you got here, she told you what was the matter. She said Ramon was carrying on with an American girl named Marvel Terrence. A Jezebel, senor. So you took over. You got Maria an airline reservation back to Havana. On flight six, the one that crashed. And told her you'd handle Ramon. Oh, she was putty in his hands. He lied to her every day since they were married. And she always ended up by believing him. I told her in the beginning he was interested only in her wealth. Which amounts to how much? Oh, much. Even after Ramon's foolish dissipation over the last few years. What happens to her estate now? Half of it she was permitted to dispose of as she wished. She made a will some time ago in favor of Ramon. Against my advice, I may say. What about the other half? Now that reverts to me, senor. Oh? It is a matter of family tradition. Who managed your sister's estate before Ramon came into the picture? I did, senor. And quite profitably. I did not waste my energies on illicit follies and ludicrous intrigue. All right, all right. Night before last, then, you took Maria to the airport and saw her off on the plane. See. Si. What was she planning to do when she got back to Havana? Was she going to divorce Ramon? My sister was a very pious woman. May she rest in peace. A religion would never permit such an act. I see. And, of course, there was the matter of family tradition. Oh, naturally. Did Ramon go to the airport with you? I had not seen Ramon since the night before, nor had Maria. We had uh, quarreled violently over his disgraceful conduct. Did Ramon know that his wife was taking flight six? I informed him the night before. Did you or Maria see him at the airport? Oh, no, senor. He was much too clever. He managed to keep out of sight. Then how can you be sure he was there? Senor Dollar, who else would be so vile as to place an explosive on board the plane? Oh, well, now I can follow your reasoning, but... The matter is self-evident. Well, look, I'm afraid we need more than self-evidence, Don Serrano. Uh, the problem of evidence is your responsibility, senor. I have told you who committed the deed. No, you've told me who you suspect. Do you doubt my word? Not as far as it goes. Sure you won't have some more coffee? No, gracias. Do you happen to know this girl, Marvel Terrence? Uh, by sight, I mean. She has been pointed out to me. Mm -hmm. Did you see her at the airport? See, si, I did. I was under the impression she was going to leave on the plane. But after it departed, she was still in the terminal. Did you notice her talking to anyone before the takeoff? Yes, yes. To some American, I believe. Red hair, stocky build, about uh, 35? See, si, he would fit that description. Blakely. Did you see her talking to anyone else? Uh, any of the baggage handlers or the ground crew? I'm afraid I did not notice. Is it important? It could be. 
Well, uh, thanks for your information, Don Serrano. My only concern is to see justice done. I'm sure it will be. And now suppose we take a look at what you didn't tell me. Senor? The fact that Maria took out a flight accident policy for $25,000 and named you as her beneficiary. Well, I considered it a, a mere whim of my sister's. But the way things turned out, it was a pretty valuable whim, wasn't it, Don Serrano? For you, I mean. Senor, are you implying... I'm implying that Ramon wasn't the only one with a motive. Wasn't the only one who'll profit by Maria's death. You'll do pretty well yourself. Half her estate and $25,000 cash, that's not a bad deal. I should kill you for such an insult. You'd like to, wouldn't you? You're very big on this killing business. That's how you planned to handle things with Ramon, wasn't it? As soon as Maria went back to Havana. It is only what he deserves. And now you're trying to use me to do it. That's why you came here. You don't care about justice. All you want to do is get Ramon. He is guilty. If he is, Don Serrano, I'll find it out and I'll pin it on him. But if he isn't, I'm not going to be pushed into framing him. So you can take these dirty, underhanded insinuations of yours and you can... Get out, Don Serrano. Expense account item six, $12.60. Taxi fares in and around Mexico City. I checked with the federal police first. They had their best men working on the murder of the baggage handler at the airport. And so far, they'd turned up nothing. They didn't have a single lead. I went through their files on the other seven people who died on the plane. Nothing. The two pilots and the stewardess were Cuban and apparently had no close friends or enemies in Mexico City. Two of the passengers were Brazilians and were only traveling through en route from the States. And as far as the other two were concerned, there seemed to be no motive. So it came right back again to the three I was already working on. Maria Delagos and the two business partners, Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke. The three people who'd bought flight insurance policies... And that left me with four possible suspects. Ramon DeLagos, Maria's husband, Don Serrano, her brother, Marvel Terrence, and Bill Blakely, the partner of Palmer and Rourke. I checked with Inspector Mocklin, but he'd made no progress. With Gina Romero, no progress. I tried to reach Blakely, but he hadn't shown up at his office. I phoned Marvel Terrence and got a reluctant agreement from her to meet me for lunch. I waited for her at the Vendome for an hour. She didn't show up. Finally, at one o'clock, I went to her hotel. Si, senor, what can I do for you? I'd like to see Miss Marvel Terrence. I wonder if you... Ah, Miss Terrence, que senorita tan bonita, tan hermosa. Yeah, well, if you'll... She's the most beautiful woman where I've ever stayed at this hotel. Yeah, she's pretty gorgeous, all right. Would you mind Sometimes telling... I think everybody in the world is in love with this senorita. All day long, it is one man after another which call up to talk to Miss Terrence. Well, would you ring her and tell her I'm Two waiting? Two times so many calls we get on the switchboard while the senorita is living. That's very interesting. And now would you, you please... must forgive me, amigo. When I think of Miss Terrence, I lose all sense in my head. All right, all right. You're forgiven. Now, if you... What is it you wish, senor? Will you ring Miss Terrence and tell her I'm waiting down here in the lobby? Immediately, senor. Your name, please? Johnny Dollar. Johnny... Leo El... Leo... How you spell it, please? D O L L A R. L A R. Gracias. I will tell her at once that you. Sacre nombre. I had forgot. Forgot what? She's not here no more, senor. What? She has checked out of hotel at 11 o'clock this morning. Expense account item 7, $2.10. Lunch at the Monte Casino Hotel alone. I was sorry she'd skipped. I guess I was secretly hoping Marvel would turn out to be in the clear. But if she were, then why run out? It didn't add up. I paid my check and started to leave the dining room. And at the entrance, I ran square into a man I was planning to see later in the day. He didn't seem very happy about it. Senor Dollar. How are you, Ramon? It is a pleasure to see you again, senor. And I'd now, like to talk to you a couple me. of minutes. Come on, uh, let's step into the bar. But I have a most important engagement, senor. Oh, this is important, too. I understand you're a friend of Marvel Terrence's. Percy, it is my honor and pleasure. Well, she's checked out of the hotel here. Do you know where she went? Oh, senor, I do not discuss the private affairs of my friends. Oh, knock it off, Ramon. This isn't a tea party. Ten people have been murdered by an explosion aboard a plane. One of them was your wife, remember? I cannot help you. I know nothing of Miss Terrence's plans. And now... I talked to your brother-in-law this morning, Ramon, Don Serrano. He tells me you're the one who put the explosive on board the plane. It is a lie. He seemed pretty certain of it. He tells me you stand to inherit half of your wife's estate. Then he is better informed as to the details of the matter than I am. 
I do not know what happens to the estate, senor. He seems to think you wanted to get your wife out of the way in order to have a free hand with Miss Terrence. Don Serrano, as you may have noticed, is a bigoted and jealous old fool who thinks only of money. He knows better than that. What do you mean? Maria was different from the women of your country, senor. She understood such matters as my friendship with Miss Terrence. And accepted them? Except such times as Don Serrano goaded her into being foolish, yes. It is a difference of the Latin temperament, senor. I see. Then there was no trouble between you and Maria. None of importance. The trouble was Don Serrano. He has hated me from the day of our marriage, because from that moment on he no longer had any control over Maria's fortune. If you wish to discuss this further, senor, I will be happy to do so later, but I must leave now. Con su permiso. I watched him hurry out of the hotel. I had no real reason to stop him and no authority to. On sudden impulse, I crossed the lobby to the public phones, called the Hotel Regis, and asked for Don Serrano de Almeida y Pico. Don Serrano had checked out. No forwarding address. I called the Del Prado and asked for Bill Blakely. Mr. Blakely had checked out. No forwarding address. I left the phone booth and hurried back to the desk. The clerk was very sorry. Ramon de Lagos had checked out earlier in the day. No forwarding address. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a rendezvous in a tropic port. And a lot of things come together. Things like romance, desire, and death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Monklin's office, Gino Romero. Oh, Gino. What did you find out? Did you locate any of them, beneficiaries of the crash of Flight 6? Si, senor. It was an affair most simple. A matter of making a telephone call to the airport. Then they've left Mexico City. Si, senor. The senorita Marvel Terrence has taken the 10 o'clock plane this morning to Acapulco. Oh. Senor Blakely has taken the 11.30 plane to Acapulco. Senor Ramon de Lagos has taken the 2 o'clock... Plane to Acapulco. And what about Don Serrano? Oh, with him, he's different. At 2.45, he's depart from Mexico City in a special charter plane. Look, Gino, is there another flight to Acapulco this afternoon? But, of course, at 4.30. Already, I have two reservations. Good. I'll meet you at the airport. What's the flight number? Gino. I'm uh, scared to think of it. This one is also called Flight 6. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Mexico City, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account continued. 
Item 9, $63.45. Incidentals in Mexico City and plane fare to Acapulco. One more of the sharp contrasts of Mexico. We left the stiff formality of the city behind us, the cool, thin air of the high plateau, and 50 minutes later, we stepped off the plane and into the steaming heat of the tropics. Barefoot tourists in shorts and barefoot natives in white cotton dungarees. Soft brown skins and flashing teeth. Mangoes, papayas, and the heady scent of tropical flowers. Blue sky, blue Pacific, and a burning sun. And a bay so bright and beautiful it breaks your heart. Acapulco. Gina Romero of the Department of Civil Air Transport knew his way around. So I waited for him while he checked his contacts. Airport police, custom agents, limousine drivers. And in a few minutes, he'd made his rounds and rejoined me in front of the terminal. It is an affair more simple, senor. A merely matter of ask the question and listen to the answer. What did you find out, Gino? The senorita Miss Terns is there at the Hotel Los Flamingos. So? Senor Blakely is also stay there. Ramon de Lagos is go to the Hotel Caleta. And Don Serrano is stay at the Club de Pesca. So you see? Yeah, I see. All right, Gino, let's get going. And where we are going is to the... Uh... We'll put up at the Los Flamingos. That is what I'm expecting. Oh, she's very beautiful, senor. True, but there are even better reasons for staying there. Que dice? Well, in some way, I mean, I'm not sure how. I think this whole thing centers right around Marvel Terrence. You think it's possible she are guilty of the crash of the Flight 6 to collect the insurance? Maybe. Or she might have been used. Or maybe... Oh, I don't know, Gino. But it's about time we found out. Expense account, item 10, a dollar and fifty cents. Limousine fare from the airport to the hotel. The Flamingos is built on a point near the far end of the peninsula, set on a headland high above the white smother of surf below. And there, just before dusk, with the western sky, a yellow blaze of glory beyond the far rim of the Pacific, I found her. She was sitting on the open terrace by the edge of the cliff. And once again, she was alone. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. I suppose I should be surprised, but I'm not, really. I guess I rather expected you. Well, then wasn't it a waste of time to run away from Mexico City? I've always run away, I guess. And most of the time, I imagine you've been followed. Or maybe I wanted to face you here, where it's so beautiful. Where perhaps you'd be able to understand me a little better. Is that what you want, Marvel? To be understood? Doesn't every woman? I thought it was more often the man... And usually it's his wife who doesn't understand him, isn't it? I see this isn't going to be just a social chat. (laughs) Oh, I doubt if it could ever be just a social chat. Not with you. You've got too much impact for that. A compliment? That's a fact. There's no place else in the world with sunsets like the ones here. Every evening. It's like there's another land way off there in the west. The strange, bright, golden land. And it keeps calling, coaxing. Only in a little while, it'll disappear. And everything will be dark off there in the West. Maybe you do understand me, Johnny. Maybe that's why I'm half afraid of you. <laughs> Another reason I ran, maybe. I can be a fool, easy. Sort of hereditary defect, you might say. Well, that's a common affliction. Rarely fatal. Rarely doesn't help. Once is enough. You know something? When I die, I want to be buried up there in the middle of a sunset. It'd be kind of lonely, wouldn't it? I think I've always been lonely. Do you know I haven't a single living relative in the world, not one? I was 14 when my parents were killed in an auto accident. I stayed in a boarding school and the bank handled the estate. When I was 21, they turned it over to me. And since then, I've... I guess that's not what you want to know, though, is it? Not exactly. Want to tell me about it, Marvel? No. As a matter of fact, I don't. I don't even want to think about it. It would be better if you would. For whom? For me? I doubt it. I feel dirty, Johnny. Telling wouldn't change that. It might. Anything I'd tell you would be only suspicion, not fact. What in? Unless, of course, you're expecting a confession. Do you have one to make? No. But you know who caused Flight 6 to blow up and why, don't you? No. I can make a guess, that's all. Like to tell me that guess? 
You'll find out soon enough, Johnny, and I'd rather it didn't come from me. Eleven people have died, Marvel. I know. Ten on the plane that crashed and the baggage handler who was murdered later and whoever... You don't have to remind me of it. I couldn't forget it if I wanted to. I told you how I felt. Now drop it, Johnny. All right, all right. I didn't know. That's all I can claim. I just didn't know. What do you mean? Nothing. Look. It's dark out there now. And sunset's gone. There's always another one. I wonder. Have you ever met Don Serrano, brother-in-law of Ramon de Lagos? No, but he was pointed out to me. Did you see him at the airport the night Flight 6 was blown up? I don't remember. I don't think so. Did you see Ramon? No. Did he know you'd canceled your reservation that night? He didn't even know I had one. Have Ramon and Bill Blakely ever met? Yes, they met. And detested each other on sight. Well, that's understandable in view of the circumstances. Oh, I guess, but... Why are people like they are? Did you arrange for Blakely to follow you here? I didn't tell anybody I was coming. He was a good guesser. So was Ramon and Don Serrano. I know. They're all here. Why? They don't even know me. They don't want to know me. Not in any real way, but they're here. Oh, yeah, they're here. And I think you ought to tell me what you know, Marvel. Tomorrow, maybe. Not tonight. Let me have just one night, Johnny. All right. Take me to dinner. Dance with me. Laugh with me. Give me just one evening. Will you, Johnny? Sure. And thank my lucky star for the chance. You're sweet. I'm saying it now, without any strings. No matter how things work out, I'll still mean it. You're a sweet guy, Johnny. Give me time to change. I went to my room and made two phone calls while I waited for her. The operator at the Club de Pesca informed me that Don Serrano was not in. The clerk at the hotel, Caleta, said the same thing about Ramon de Lagos. I didn't leave my name with either of them. Bill Blakely was staying in room 23, a few doors on down the terrace, so I decided to go have a talk with him before I went out to dinner with Marvel Terrence. But as it happened, I didn't have to go to that much trouble. Yeah, who is it? Blakely, I'd like to talk to you. Come on in. Do you always cover your visitors with a gun? Only when I spot them listening outside my door. I don't know I what I saw you're... your shadow against the shutter there. You've been standing outside for the last five minutes, Blakely. You listened to me make a couple of phone calls. Did you learn anything you wanted to know? Dollar, suppose you were suspected of sabotaging an airliner and killing ten people. Wouldn't you want to know what kind of a case was being built up against you? What makes you think you're under suspicion, Blakely? I know I am. Ed Palmer and Jim Rourke were my partners. When they died on that plane, I became sole owner of the firm. There's the motive. I've got a warehouse full of dynamite in Mexico City. There's the method. I can go even farther than that. What do you mean? You mentioned one motive. Why didn't you mention the other one? What other one? Marvel Terrence. That crash not only eliminated a pair of business partners, it wiped out a couple of rivals. Just one thing wrong with that dollar. Marvel had a reservation on that plane herself. She only decided at the last minute not to go. I wouldn't have been gaining much if I'd killed her along with my rivals, as you call them. Uh Uh-huh. Maybe that's why you cornered her at the airport and argued her out of going. Yes, I... I did talk her out of the trip. But not because I'd planted an explosive on board. How do you feel about her, Blakely? I'd give my left arm. It wouldn't do any good. I'm just not the guy. I never have been and never will be. Maybe you are... She says she's having dinner with you tonight. That's right. She is. How do you feel about her, Dollar? I don't know. Expense account item 11, $26.40. Taxis, dinner, drinks, and dancing for two. The Copacabana with its blue lights and the surf right at your feet and a million stars low enough to touch the warm water of the bay lapping softly at the pilings. The Las Americas, the Casablanca, music, champagne, and the tropic night. And then finally, much later. Good night, Johnny, and thank you. Tonight, for the first time I can remember, I wasn't alone. 
And then, only an hour afterward, I was wakened out of a sound sleep. Senor Dollar. Right with you, Gino. What was it? It's a senorita, I think. She's a number eight. Come on. But she wasn't a number eight. Her door was standing open and the room was empty. We searched the terrace out toward the edge of the cliff where I talked with her at sunset. We saw the broken section of railing and found one of her slippers and a pack of her cigarettes lying nearby. In pitch darkness, we slid and scrambled down the steep path to the beach. And there, by the edge of the surf, we found her. The warm foam reached out for her, as though to carry her away. To that last sunset she'd loved so much. She looked very beautiful, but very much alone. As alone and as lonely as death. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a desperate killer is cornered and strikes back in a deadly counterattack. Final showdown. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Here is your call to Mexico City, senor. Oh, thanks. Hello? Macklin, Department of Civil Air Transport. Hi, Mac. Dollar, what have you learned in Acapulco? Uh, Not very much, I'm afraid. But you said you were following the girl down there. Marvel Terrence. Yeah, and a few others who might have had a hand in the explosion aboard Flight 6. Beneficiaries of the insured on that flight. What others? Ramon DeLagos, whose wife died in the crash. Don Serrano, her brother. Bill Blakely, whose business partners were aboard. Well, have you and Gino learned anything from them? From the girl? Not yet. But you said she might know who caused that explosion aboard the plane. Right, and she promised to talk. Well? Your little helper, Gino, and I just pulled her body out of the surf down below the hotel here. Johnny. Murder? Yeah. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Acapulco, Mexico, to the Home Office Guarantee Transport Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Flight 6 matter. Expense account, final page. <laughs> Item 12, $1.80 for the phone call to Mac Macklin in Mexico City. I had to get Mac out of bed to tell him what had happened. That Marvel Terrence had been murdered. That somebody had silenced the girl around whom the whole case had seemed to center since Flight 6 had exploded in midair three nights before and carried the passengers and crew to their deaths. Mac was shocked and offered any additional help I might need. 
But he had no new information at his end, and it was obvious now that any answers would have to be found right here in Acapulco. As I hung up the phone, Gino Romero came rushing in from the hotel terrace. Senor Dollar. What is it, Gino? A prowler is out on the hotel grounds. The police car has got to block off the road at the bottom of this slope. Good, come on. The stairs are over this way, senor. Right with you. A little light wouldn't hurt anything down here. It's no time. This way, into the brush is a footpath. All right, lead the way. Over there is only 100 feet to the cliff. The other side is the road for the hotel. Here is the only place anybody can go. It's down this slope. Yeah, but there are plenty of places to hide. And see, senor, but it's a matter... Oh, wait. Huh? Listen. Listen. We could hear someone moving through the jungle growth a few yards away, moving swiftly but cautiously. Then a sudden silence. Whoever it was, it also stopped and was listening for Gino and me. We waited for the fugitive to move again, straining our ears, trying to tag the location. Seconds passed. Then a slight rustle ahead of us. Gino nudged me and we slipped quietly toward the sound. Get your hands up. Well, well. Well, it's not you, senor Dollar. You seem to be quite a night owl, Don Serrano. Not ordinarily, senor. The circumstances which place me in this rather awkward position are not usual ones, I assure you. You were up there prowling around the hotel. Why? I was looking for my unmentionable brother-in-law. Ramon de Lagos? Why? What made you think he'd be here? I went to his hotel... He was not in his room. I knew he had not been able to see Miss Terrence since she had spent the evening with you. So I assumed he might be waiting for her here, at her hotel. And my assumption has, of course, been proven correct. Did you see him? No, but I heard the police discussing the murder of Miss Terrence. It was obviously Ramon's handiwork. Still after him, huh? My feeling about Ramon is not a secret, senor. Nor his about you. So why did you go to his hotel? To kill him. Why else? Time was running out, so we took Don Serrano back to the hotel to the police. One very important person hadn't put in an appearance. Gina went down to Bill Blakely's room, knocked on the door, then opened it with a pass key and went in. Blakely wasn't there. We searched the room. The bed has been sleeping, senor. Yeah, yeah, I notice. But for how long, that's the question. It's possible he was wake up when the senorita screams before she escaped. He might have been... He must have dressed. His pajamas are there on the floor. I wonder. I sabe if it was a quarrel of lovers, the jealousy. He did not like it when the senorita would go with you tonight. I don't think it's that simple, Gino. Let's get this bag open. Have a look inside. Maybe we can... It's not even locked. He seems to have been traveling light. He... There on the top, senor. Yeah, I see. What is it? A box of thirty-eight caliber cartridges spilled open. And that piece of oilcloth. He had a gun packed in here. No, it's gone. He got up, loaded a gun, and left. Took the gun with him. If it was before the scream, that's one thing. But if it was afterward, then... What are you thinking, senor? I think we'd better take the police with us. Get over to the Hotel Caleta and check up on our third suspect. Ramon? But Don Serrano said he is not there. Don Serrano could say anything. I think we'd better get over there, Gino, and do it fast. Clerk said room 34. That's the second door down. Let's see. Let's go. Roman. Roman. Who is it? Johnny Dollar. Open up. Watch yourself, Gino. See. Si. Come on in, Dollar. You're Blakely. Yeah. Better hand over the gun, Blakely. You won't get a chance to use it now. The police are out in the lobby. Okay. All right, thanks. Ramon didn't show up, huh? I wish he had. That's all I was asking, just one clear shot at him. Are you sure he's the one who killed her? Sure enough. Did you see him? No, but he's the one. She was scared of him, Dollar. She told me earlier in the afternoon, before you got down here to Acapulco. Told you what? She said Ramon had followed her here from Mexico City, that he'd been acting strange. She said she was glad I was staying at the same hotel, that she didn't want to see him or talk to him. Yeah, that figures all right. 
It checks with what she said to me last night. If she'd only given me a little more to go on. She was a real great kid, Dollar. The greatest as far as I was concerned. Yeah. As soon as I realized what had happened, I loaded my gun and came here to wait for him. I figured he'd try to get back to his room. But he didn't show. It's too bad. She was a real great kid. And I'd have died for her if she asked me to. I loved her. She was the... Here, I hear you saw There he is. Come on, Chino. Si, senor. Roman had been spotted. He started to enter the hotel, saw the police, turned and ran. He was armed with a pistol. He'd fired a shot at one of the police officers and then jumped over the balustrade and disappeared into the dark curve of Caleta Beach. The police cars quickly threw a cordon along the Bayfront Street and blocked off both ends of the stretch of shoreline. For the moment, Roman was trapped somewhere on that beach. He tipped his hand now, and he was desperate and dangerous, and he had a gun. Gino and I went out on the beach after him. There is many place to hide here. Not for long. They'll have some more police here within a few minutes. Come on. It's maybe better we wait here. I do not think Ramon is planned to be taken alive. I can still see that girl, Gino, lying at the foot of the cliff. Si, senor. I remember. I... I should spit it down. What is it? There, by the water, is... Oh, no, I am wrong, senor. It's only a boat pulled up on the sand. Yeah, it's a paddle boat. Well, I think it's better maybe we separate, senor. I look in the pavilion, the cabanas. You stay close by the water. In this way, we'll have him between us. Good idea, Gino. But you've got the rough end of it. Take care of yourself. Si, senor. Well... much cover along the shoreline here. Yes. Do not move, senor. Do not make a sound. Well, Roman. So you were hiding behind that boat. I have nothing to lose now, senor. If you make one move or try to call out, I will kill you. Yeah, I think you would. All right, then, what comes next? This boat. You will push it into the water. But be very careful. If you make any noise, even by accident, I will kill you. Quickly now. Hurry. Relax, Ramon. You don't have a chance anyway. We will see. Careful now. Be quiet. Good. Now get in, quickly. Sure. Take the paddle. Head out across the bay and be very quiet or I will kill you. All right, Ramon. You're just wasting your time. They'll have a police launch out here within ten minutes. I do not think so. They will not go. Quiet! Quiet! One more sound from that paddle and I will shoot. Marvel Terrence. Why did you kill her, Ramon? She made me crazy. So beautiful. And with so very much money. I thought she would be most easy once Maria, my wife, was dead. Then it was you who blew up the airliner in order to kill your wife and have a clear field to go after Marvel. Marvel did not know I was married, and Maria was going to tell so her... So you sabotaged a plane and killed her, along with ten other innocent people. And what happened tonight? Did Marvel turn you down? She said she was suspicious of me, and she was going to tell you about it in the morning. And she said she was falling in love with you. She made me crazy. I wish you had got back into that hotel, Ramon. I wish you'd got there before I did, while Bill Blakely was still waiting for you with a loaded gun in his hand. Be quiet and paddle faster. We must get farther up the coast in order... What is that? Police launch. What did you think? I told you you didn't have a chance. No, they could not get here so soon. Well, I forgot to mention the fact that they'd already phoned for one. And then they do not know yet we are out here. Good. Keep paddling. Quickly. He half turned his head to look back toward the launch. I took a chance and swung the paddle. His shot went wild and he didn't get a second try. I caught him back in the air and he dropped like a log. The police located our boat a few minutes later and hauled him over the gunnel and into the launch. And that should have been the end of it. But none of us realized Ramon's insane desperation. He'd only been pretending unconsciousness. On board the launch, he snatched a gun from one of the officers and tried to take over the boat. He didn't have a chance. He took a full volley of shots from three police pistols square in the chest. A 
Expense account item 13, $312.20. Hotel and incidentals in Acapulco and Mexico City and plane fare back to the States. Expense account total, $608.10. End of expense account, end of report. Remarks? I'll never see another sunset now without thinking of her somewhere out beyond it. I hope she doesn't feel alone anymore. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a dead girl comes to life in a case that's packed with lies. Yet every one of them comes true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ben Wright, Edgar Barrier, Don Diamond, Russ Thorson, and Jack Moyles. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly... Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Paul Kendrick, Johnny. Over at Eastern Allied Casualty, remember? Oh, sure, Paul. How are you? Seen any good fights lately? Prize fights, that is? Yeah, the championship bout at the stadium over in Mulville last week. Were you there? No, I had to miss it. But it didn't miss me. Huh? The minute Georgie hit the canvas in that fourth round, it cost me 50 bucks. Johnny... Do you remember Al Coronado? Are you kidding? I've watched that boy come up from the Golden Gloves. Well, he fought in one of the preliminary bouts. I know. I lost on him, too. Twenty bucks. Come on over, will you? And I'll tell you why the company may lose 50000 on it. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Allied Casualty Insurance Company, 422 Spidal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the squared circle matter. Expense account item one, a dollar ten cents, cab from my apartment to the offices of Eastern Allied. When I got upstairs into his personal cubicle, I found Paul Kendrick pacing the floor. Sit down, Johnny. Uh, have a drink if you want one. No, no thanks. Hey, looks like you're the one who could use a drink. What are you worried about? Don't tell me you've been hitting the company till for big money to bet on the fights. Johnny, I'm worried about murder. Listen. I'm all ears. How long since you've seen Al Coronado fight? Oh, six months, a year, maybe. But before that, when he was working all the local arenas, you and I were present every time he put on the gloves. So? We knew him when he had reflexes quick enough to... Well, 
Do you remember how he'd show off by picking a fly or mosquito out of the air, grabbing it between his fingers without even hurting it? Yeah, sure. He was no metal giant, not by a long shot, but he had the fastest eyes and hands I ever saw in a man. Right. But something has happened to him, something very wrong, and I think I know what it is. Listen. I'm listening. A few years ago, his manager, Ricky Malone, took out a $50,000 policy on him, annuity. So what? A lot of managers take out policies on their boys. And then get them killed? Look, Al is fighting again tomorrow night in a small town outside of Joplin. Joplin? Missouri? A little place just across the state line. Johnny, I want you to be there. You mean as a sort of bodyguard? I want you to see the fight, that's all. See Al Coronado fight. Yeah, but this murder correct. I'm having a copy of the policy made, and you can pick it up at the Joplin Post Office. General delivery. Now, Paul... I know, I know. I may be all wrong. This may only be a hunch without a single legitimate reason for suspicion. That's why I took a whole week to think it over before calling you. That's why I want somebody who knows Al as well as you and I do to... Look, will you go down there and see him? Well, I... We'll pay the freight. Pad your expense account, anything you like. Oh, now that's an attractive... But do it, Johnny. Will you? Item two, another dollar ten, back to my apartment to pack. Item three, one hundred twenty-four dollars even. Plane fare and incidentals to Joplin. By your leave, Paul, the incidentals included a new sports shirt, loud enough to startle the whole state of Arizona, an extra pack of razor blades, and a new toothbrush. Also, item four, three bucks, flowers for the stewardess, who managed to find me an extra bottle of champagne. I arrived at Joplin shortly before noon, and after checking into a hotel, found that by some miracle, a copy of Al's policy was waiting for me at the post office. A quick glance at it brings up item five, four dollars and a quarter, phone call. Well, what do you mean, holding out on you? I thought you said Ricky Malone took out the policy. He did, and pays all the premiums. But the beneficiary named is Frankie Fortina. Now, who's he? I don't know yet. Well, his address is in New York City. You better look him up, will you? I've been trying to. But the last time Fortina was at the address on the policy, it was a racetrack bookie joint. Oh, so that's why you're worried. Well, that's one reason. Well, if you learn anything about him, let me know, will you? I'm staying at the Beverly Arms. Okay, Johnny. Johnny. Yeah? Call me again, will you? After the fight tonight? Sure. I was tired, so I had a big lunch. That's item six. Went up to my room and slept. I overslept. It was nearly 9 o'clock when I woke up, so I grabbed a cab, that's item 7, and went out to the arena in the nearby town of Mount Elba. For five bucks, item 8, I managed to get a seat at ringside in time to catch the end of the last preliminary. The winner in one minute, ten The program told me Al was scheduled for the main event against some local boy named Rafe Cummings. I never heard of him, and I doubt if anybody outside of Tucson ever had. I understood why when he stepped into the ring. This kid looked like the rankest kind of amateur. Strong, sure, and in good condition, but clumsy. He almost tripped over his own size 15 feet. And it was no act to fool an opponent either. Al, when he came in, looked as good as ever. He gave me a quick glance of recognition, though I'm sure he knew nothing about me except possibly my name. At the opening bell, he came out fast. All the old speed and timing were there. Faint weave and flick out that light, but punishing left. Same old pattern, same old... Wait a minute. Those quick left jabs were only landing about one and four. As though he touched Cummings only when the clumsy ox happened to walk into him. But because of his speed, Al took nothing but a few light ones on the body. He kept his face well out of reach. Oh, yeah, his timing was perfect, but his aim was terrible. Every time he shot out his fist, he was three, four inches wide. Then a funny thing happened. At the end of the round, when Al went back to his corner, and remember, Rafe had only tapped him a few times on the body. When he went back to his corner and started to sit down, he almost missed the stool. Would have if one of the seconds hadn't named it under him. Funny. The second round got underway the same as the first. Al was all speed, dodging, weaving, keeping his face out of the way. But again, he wasn't hitting his mark. And then it happened. He missed Cummings wide, then practically ran into his glove, catching it hard in the cheek, and down he went. Why, there wasn't enough steam behind Cummings' glove to hurt it. But Al took the count. He'd been hurt by that tap on the face. Then another thing. The second he was counted out, his handlers practically hauled him out of the ring and back to his dressing room. And believe me, Al looked terrible. His eyes had a strange, almost faraway look. As though that little smack had knocked his brains loose. Had... My seat was on the far side of the ring, but I elbowed my way through the crowd and back to the row of dressing rooms in a hallway built on the one end of the building. Al! Al Coronado! 
I told you on the way up the aisle, Doc, huh? we don't need you. The boy's all right. Go on, Doc. Beat it. You hear me, Doc? Listen, this is Johnny Dollar. Huh? Old fan of Al's from Hartford. I want to see him. Some other time. No, no, right away. Come on, open up. I said some other time. Don't you understand? We're pulling out of this, Berg, and we ain't got time to stand around and talk. Now, look, buddy. Malone's the name. I'm Mel's manager, see? And when I say get out, I mean vamoose. Al, are you okay, boy? This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, no, you don't. Brother, that's where you're wrong. Hey, Al. Al. Good Lord, Al. What's the matter with you? Uh, Oh, hello, hello, Johnny. Hey, Al. Look at me. No, no, I mean straight at me. Here. Al. I'm I'm all right, Johnny. You're in bad shape. You should never have fought tonight. Oh, that that's all right. Where are your seconds, your trainer? Uh, Ricky, he don't don't let nobody in after fight. Look, Al, can you get up off that table, stand up and walk? Oh, sure, sure, Johnny. Then come on. I'm taking you out of here to no, a doctor. Johnny. Easy, Al. Don't look look behind Al, you, Ricky. Please, he's come up, on. he's got it. You bet I am, Della! Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Each Monday through Friday evening, most of these same stations bring you the Amos and Andy Music Hall, variety entertainment at its best, for top songs, informal visits with top stars, and for a never-ending supply of fun. Turn your home into the Amos and Andy Music Hall five nights a week. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Squared Circle Matter. came to, the dressing room was dark and quiet. After carefully falling off the table where they'd left me, I groped my way to the light switch, stumbling incidentally over the remains of the chair Ricky Malone had used on me. It was well after midnight, so I left by the dressing room window. The second I reached my hotel room, I put through a long-distance call, hoping Paul Kendrick would be in home, in bed. He was. Yeah. Hello? Johnny Dollar. And Paul, you're right. It'll be murder unless I can stop it. Hey, you awake. Oh, you mean Al Coronado. What's happened, Johnny? Plenty. And listen, that boy is more than punch drunk. He's had a brain injury of some kind. I'll bet on it. That's what I was afraid of. The tap on the face that knocked him out tonight wasn't enough to hurt a kitten. But a good solid blow would probably kill him. That's why he kept protecting his face. But Ricky Malone is making him keep on? Oh, well, I just met the gentleman, by the way. Well, what'd he say? Did you question him? Before I could, he cracked me over the head with a chair. Where is he now? Oh, I don't know. What are you going to do? See if the police can track them down. Malone said something about leaving town right away. Well, keep after him. Did you read that policy carefully? You kidding? I haven't had time. It's an annuity. That much I saw. Beginning in three or four years, it'll pay Al a nice little income for the rest of his life, if he survives. But the beneficiary name. Yes. Frankie Fortina, who gets the full face value of the policy if Al dies. Johnny. Yeah? I got a rundown on Fortina. You said he was a bookie at one time. That was the least of his crimes. He has a record as long as your arm. As I see it, he owns Al Coronado. Then you're probably thinking what I am. But Al hasn't been doing so well lately. He's taken a big drop in class. Isn't making the purses he used to. You know that? Yes. The ANBA keeps a complete record. So with this injury to his brain, the only way Fortina can clean up on him is by seeing him dead. That's right. Well, what about medical examinations before these fights? Ricky Malone could bribe his own mother, especially in some of the towns where Al has been fighting lately. That's yeah, possible, of course. Also, what you and I believe is wrong with Al is one of the hardest things in the world to detect. Yeah, yeah, I must admit he looked great when he entered the ring. Okay, Paul, one thing's in our favor. Neither Al nor Ricky Malone knows who I am, outside of being a fight fan. Just so Fortina doesn't learn different. Where is Fortina, by the way? I don't know. So, Johnny, whatever you do, be careful. <laughs> Expense account item 9, 370 for a couple of phone calls, some breakfast, then a taxi to police headquarters. I'll say this for the Joplin police. When they go into action, they really get things done. Within less than two hours, Sergeant Danny Ruskin dug up all the information I wanted. Well, that ties in with what Conroy found out at the airport. No, that does it, Herm. Thanks very much. Something? And I think it gives us the whole story, Johnny. Al and his manager, Ricky Malone, checked out of their hotel, the Rayberry, at one o'clock this morning. Just the two of them? Right. There was no third party by the name of Fortino or anything else. Just the two of them. 
Uh, they caught the 140 plane for Oklahoma City. Oh. And there they bought tickets routing them to Monterey, Mexico. Mexico? How soon can I get a plane? Going down there, huh? I told you, I gotta save that guy's life. All right, look, in Monterey, look up Sergeant Romelia Garcia, main homicide division. You mention my name, he'll give you anything you want. Good. Now, what about that plane? The deal on plane connections turned out to be bad. The best time I could make was by way of El Paso. That's item 10, $127, including incidentals. I finally pulled into Monterey shortly after 8 p.m. I parked my bag at the airport, taxied into town. Item 11, I went straight to main headquarters of the Policia. Sergeant Romilio Garcia was off duty. He'd gone to the fights. Item 12, $4 American for a fast taxi ride to the Plaza del Fisticuffs, or whatever they call it. There for item 13, 5 bucks, I had the sergeant paged over the PA system. After two or three minutes, a short, stocky, important-looking figure in police uniform stood up to the door. Senor Johnny Dollar? Yeah, that's right, Sergeant. How are you? You Americanos. Now, what is so important I must leave the excellent fights to talk with you, huh? The possible murder of an American fighter right here in your own ring. So what is that to be excited about? Something that happens all the time. It's because the Mexican fight is more better than the Americano fight. So if that is all it is bothering Incidentally, you... Sergeant Danny Ruskin of the Joppa Sergeant Police... Sergeant Danny... Why do you not say so at the beginning? Well, you didn't give me much of a chance. <laughs> How is it, my good friend, Sergeant Danny? Pues it's too long I have seen here. Yeah, well, look. Excellent man, Sergeant Danny. When I have trouble with one of our Mexican nationals who escape across the border and go all the way to Missouri, Joplin, it's Sergeant Danny who... Uh, but, but you have a problem, eh? Yeah. A fighter named of Al Coronado. Coronado. Oh, but of course, tomorrow night he is fighting here. And he will lose. Why do you say that? Come, look. Here on the, what do you call, uh, a billboard, a picture of the man he is to fight. So, El Toro Negro. That sounds more like the name of a bull than a... Holy... See, si, big man, is he not? Is this picture real? 240 pounds, senor. But Al Coronado only weighs in at 181. See, si. El Toro, big man. And senor Dollar, he is a killer. Our best. Three men he's knocked out of the ring. But nobody hurts him, so no wonder you worried. Sergeant, unless you and I can stop it, that won't be a fight tomorrow night. It'll be a premeditated, cold-blooded killing. Oh? How so? I showed Garcia my credentials. Then told him what I knew and what I suspected. But until we have proof of this, senor, to start what you call a international situation... You are not now in your own country, you know. Still, he agreed to cooperate. First thing, of course, was to locate Al and his manager. In this city of nearly 200,000, that could be pretty rough. But he said he'd try. He drove me by the airport to pick up my bag, then to a hotel. And there, as the bellhop unlocked the door of my room, I got a real break. The next door down the hall opened. Hey, kid, uh, how'd you like to bring me up a glass of warm milk, huh? Al! Al Coronado! Huh? Oh, oh, hi. Here, boy. Just put in my bags inside and leave the door open. Yeah, gracias, senor. Hey, Al. Are you alone? Oh, sure. Hey. hey. You're Johnny, ain't you? Yeah, that's right, Johnny. And I want to talk to you. I used to see you inside all the time up in Hartford, huh? You saw me in Joplin, too. Only you don't remember. Where's Ricky Malone, your manager? Oh, he said he had to go meet somebody. He's always going out. Look, Al, I'm an insurance investigator. Oh? Oh, I got some insurance. Yeah. One more fight and somebody's going to collect it. Oh, no, Johnny. That's my retiring money. The only one who'll retire on it is Frankie Fortina. Hey, Frankie, he's my owner. You know him? Hey. Who takes all the aspirin around here? Me. I get a lot of headaches all the time. But maybe that's... Why I ain't been hitting so good lately. Yeah. Here, catch this bottle. Hey, now... Ah, uh, now look what you did. No, no, Al. You look what you did. You missed that bottle by three inches. Uh, For the same reason you haven't been hitting well. Why you have these headaches. All right, I'll give it to you straight. You've had a brain injury, Al. One good wallop on that head will kill you. And that's just what Ricky and Fortina want. Ah, uh, no. Uh, Ricky always says they uh, keep my head protected, uh, so you must be wrong. Am I? 
Well, Rick is good to me. Why, you numbskull, he's trying to get you killed. I, you, Johnny, you're all wrong. You know the man you're up against tomorrow night? Well, I know his name. Well, he's the one scheduled to finish you off. Johnny, I, I don't believe that. Al, Al, listen, you gotta believe it. Now, where's the tell? Here. Uh, uh, who are you gonna call? Hello, this is an emergency. Get me Sergeant Romilio Garcia at Central Police Headquarters. Uh, cops? That's right, Al, and a doctor. Uh, no, look, Ricky says to stay away from doctors. All they do All is they can they... do is stop you from ever fighting again. And that would make you worth just $50,000 less to Frankie for... Sergeant Johnny Dollar, I found Al. Hotel room right next to mine, room 915. Bring a doctor, a brain specialist if you can, even if you have to drag him out of bed. Oh, look, we'll fight the international situation when we come to it. You get a doctor up here, you hear me? You hang up or I'll blow your head off. Well, Mr. Fortina, I believe. First, Kim Ricky. Sure, boss. He's clean. Huh? I hate to shoot an unarmed man, Dollar, but if you make one phony move... So you know who I am, huh? Well, Ricky here may be stupid in some ways, but he had sense enough to call me from Joplin after you broke in on him there. Finding out what you're up to wasn't difficult. Finding out what you're up to wasn't very tough either, Fortina. But it's all over. Not for me, Dollar. That's where you're wrong. That phone call I made was to the police. I know. To central headquarters. That's over three miles from here. By the time your sergeant finds a doctor and gets here, you'll be dead. And I will be gone. Have you forgotten that you have a border to cross, you Fortina? You think I'm stupid? Frankie Fortina has never been here. He's never been even in Mexico. Because my tourist card reads Charles Edward Smith. And since the next plane leaves for the States in about 20 minutes, Ricky... Yeah, boss? I think Mr. Dollar had better have an accident. Fall out of the window, perhaps. Oh, now, wait a minute, what? boss. I mean, well... Listen to me, Malone. I had two reasons for coming down here. To see if you were right about Dollar and to make sure of that fight tomorrow. You've been stalling with Al. You've taken too long. The heat is on up north. I need the dough. I told you, boss, that El Toro will do it tomorrow. Shut up. Uh, And look, if you take care of Dollar, what about me? What? Maybe you can get back to the States, but me, with with Dollar laying dead here, and and if Al talks... Al won't talk. You won't either. Frankie. Dollar has given us a perfect setup. He came here to Al's room. You found him here. Hmm? You had a fight. Dollar ends up in the street below. But what happens to me? Haven't I always taken care of you in the past when you were working for me? You know what will happen if you ever try to cross me. No, no. All right, all right, all right. I have contacts down here. I have plenty of them. I have lawyers, good ones. It's going to be self-defense, pure and simple. But what if Al talks? I told you before, Ricky... You've taken too long with him. Hey, Frankie, listen. While I hold this gun, you're going to take care of Al, too. The way you should have a long, long time ago in his Frankie, fights. I, I don't no, understand. No, no, listen to me, Frankie. You listen. I can't You've been do in it. this whole thing just as deep as I have. And deeper. Because you're the one who's kept Al fighting. You've paid off all those phony medicos. You set him up for this El Toro tomorrow night. <laughs> You'll do it, Ricky. No. Then I'll use the gun on all three of you. Frankie. You're out of your mind, Fortina. Am I? It will still look like a fight between you and Ricky. Boss. Al just happened to get hit accidentally by the gun that will be found beside your body. Boss. Hmm? Boss, I'll do it. (laughs) You bet you will. I'll do anything you say if you just help me get out of it. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Dollar is first. And, brother, if you think it's going to be easy... It's either the window or this gun, Dollar. So far as you're concerned, I don't care which. Go on, Ricky. Okay, Just remember, boss. your own life depends on it. You bet I... Boy, yeah. dirty, will you? The window, Ricky. The window, I said. Remember, it's your own life, Ricky. All right, Fortina. So you have got a gun. How? <laughs> uh, yeah, Johnny, I, I, I hit him, but... What I'll be. See, Senor Dollar, with one very fine, clean left hook. Well, Fortina was watching you and the uh, unfortunate Ricky. Yeah. You got here a little late, Garcia. You see, but uh, tell me, Senor, what makes you think this Al Coronado has lost his punch? Expense account item 13, $100. Legal expense, mainly a deposition for a lawyer to take to court. 
Just how Garcia got me out of having to stay in Monterey for a hearing, I will never know, but he did. As for Al Coronado, I suggest the company make some adjustment in his policy that'll permit paying his annuities immediately. And why not? The company should have investigated more thoroughly before issuing this policy anyway. And if it doesn't show a little heart, but I'm sure it will. Item 14, 250 Hotel and incidentals and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, four ninety one twenty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a fast trip to the West Coast to an impossible case involving an impossible man. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Harry Bartell, Herb Ellis, Victor Perrin, Jack Crucian, Les Tremaine, and Lawrence Dobkin. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by the FBI in Peace and War. Dan Coverly speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, Universal Adjustment. Oh, hi, Pat. What's on your mind? The sleek, lovely, beautiful Ellen Deere. On the strength of that description, I'll take her. And she's loaded. $325,000 worth of jewelry. Hey, that girl needs a bodyguard, sleek. Yeah, hey, yeah, Johnny. Needs a guard of some kind, only she isn't a girl. She's a boat. I've just lost my enthusiasm. What's the matter with the old tub? That's what I want you to find out, Johnny. That last crack suddenly got me interested again. Okay, Pat, I'll be right over. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Western Maritime and Property Insurance Company, Los Angeles, California. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Ellen Deere matter. Expense account item 190 cents taxi from my apartment at the offices of Universal Adjustment Bureau in Hartford. Pat McCracken's usual smile was noticeably missing when I walked in on him. Come in, Johnny, and sit down. Thanks. Oh, and you're to bill Western Maritime and property on this one instead of us. Okay, but how are you involved? We handle all their claims that are of any size. Sorry, you ever hear of Randolph Berman? Mm, I know of a jeweler down in New York. That's the one. And if you know him, Johnny, you've been putting too much gravy in your expense account. I said no of him. Hmm. Didn't he bring in the uh, star of Cape Town and the Kamandu Emerald? That's right. Everybody seems to think he's a crook, and yet somehow he manages to handle some of the finest jewels in the world. How can an honest man afford it? Yeah. This time it's the Betten House collection. It's out of Hungary. Oh, yeah, I read about that. 
Only I, I thought somebody down in Mexico owned it. Yeah, a fellow named Rigo Mariani, down in Guadalajara. He's the one who sold it to Randolph Berman. Okay, now. Is this Ellen Deere you mentioned, Berman's wife? Uh, no, no, no. Former, former wife. He's on about his fifth. All beautiful dumb dolls. But more important, it's the name of his 72-foot motor cruiser. Mm -hmm. And the Bermans have been traveling around in it, down the coast, through the canal, along the coast of Central America, and so on. Anyhow, when he got word that the Bettenhaus collection could be had, he wasted no time in getting to Guadalajara. And that's where Western Maritime and Property comes in. Right. They had already written a policy on the boat for 52000 Their main office in Los Angeles was close at hand, so he had them write the policy on the jewels. Is that where Berman is now in Los Angeles? Oh, no, no. He's still in Mexico. Didn't want to move with those priceless rocks until he was certain of the insurance. And before Weston would write it, of course, they wanted the collection of prey. Naturally. But who in Mexico? Uh, Jacques Jean-Pierre, the famous gemologist, was right there in Guadalajara, you know, to look over the collection himself. Ah. So he made the appraisal. The policy has been issued. 325000 I still don't see anything wrong with the whole deal, Pat. Well, there isn't anything wrong with it yet. But in spite of Berman's standing in the profession, he... His reputation, it isn't everything it might be. Yeah, come to think of it, wasn't there a killing or two involved in this acquisition of the Star of there Cape There have been Town? several things like that. He's been involved in attempts to smuggle in some valuable pieces. He's... Oh, well. He always managed somehow to come out smelling like a rose. Legally, perfectly clean, you understand? But you still don't trust him. Oh, no, no. And with his planning to carry that load of stuff around in his yacht. Yeah, see what you mean. If anything happened to those rocks or the boat, over 300 grand right out the window. Exactly. Now, belatedly, Western is worried about it. And they'll pay good money to have you assuage their worries. You have a Mexican tourist card? Sure, from my last fishing trip down there. And I think you better go down and guard that collection until Berman gets it safely up into the States. He's considered quite the host. He'll probably be perfectly willing to have you aboard. Now, this is the kind of assignment I like, yachting in the Blue Pacific. But surely he hasn't got his boat parked in Guadalajara. That's over 100 miles inland. Oh, no, it's at Mazatlan. And from what I've been able to learn, it's surrounded by armed guards day and night. Well, he has some engine work done. But as soon as that's finished, he'll head north to the States. So he says. Got a branch office in Los Angeles. He'll probably deliver the collection there. I just want to be sure he gets there, Johnny. Hmm? Okay, Pat. You can wire the boys at Weston that I'm on my way. <laughs> Item 2, 40, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Mazatlan via Los Angeles. The first leg of the flight to L.A. was uneventful. Except for a good-looking young blonde from Santa Barbara, whom I promised to look up as soon as this case is... Well, that's not for the expense account. <clears throat> when we arrived at the Los Angeles International Airport, I learned that I'd have a three-quarter hour wait for my plane to Mazatlan. So I grabbed a magazine, that's item three, 35 cents, when I heard my name being called on the PA system. Johnny Dollar, report to Pan American Airways desk. With the thought in mind that perhaps my little friend from the plane might have decided to stay over in L.A. Her name was Rita, by the way. I lost no time in getting over to the Pan Am desk. Uh, Mr. Dollar? Yeah? Uh, Johnny Dollar? That's right. I'm Arthur Arthur, Western Maritime and Property Insurance Company. Oh, yeah, how do, Mr. Arthur? Planning to go on down to Mazatlan with me? Uh, no, no. But, uh, meet Monsieur Jacques Jean-Pierre. Monsieur Dollar, I am honored. How are you, Mr. Jean-Pierre? Uh, this is the gentleman who appraised the Batten House collection for us. Oh, yes, yes. I so am an expert. So issue the policy on it to Mr. Berman. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he's done this sort of thing for us many times. Oh, I do not know Now, I'm many... afraid that he's brought us rather bad news. Something's already happened to the collection? Well, not exactly. Not for the whole collection. No, I no, mean. not the, the well, whole collection. Uh, uh, please. Uh, that is, I'm not quite sure. What I mean is... Yeah, just what do you mean, Mr. Arthur? Uh, perhaps I should explain to Monsieur Dollar, eh? Well, I think somebody better. Yes, you go ahead, Jean. Yeah, very well. Yes. And while you're doing it, I'll cancel the rest of Mr. Dollar's reservation to Mazatlan. Yes, I'll do that. Oh, clerk... Oh, no, wait a minute. First, let me find out what this is all about. Ah, oui, oui, oui. Oh, very well. Jacques here was in Guadalajara when the Bettenhaus collection became available for purchase. Uh -huh. uh, yes, Monsieur Dollar. I had gone there in the hope that some of the pieces might be purchased separately. So? Alas, such was not the case. The Mariani firm decided to dispose of the collection only as a whole. I see. 
Well, what's this bad news you have? Ah, I am getting to yes, that. Yes, you see, it's this no, way. No, please, please. Ah, yes, please. Well, then, then go ahead, John. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Monsieur Dollar, interested as I was, I looked over the collection very carefully, each individual piece. Oh, yeah? oh, and you knows. must believe me, to an expert like myself, every facet of every gem has a character all its own. A precious stone is like a face to me, always to be remembered. Yeah. Well, go on, please. I simply wish to make it clear to you, monsieur, that every item in the Bettenhaus collection is completely familiar to me. Oh, it is. As are many other important gems throughout the world. You know, each is like a friend. And each stone in them is like a face. To ah, you. precisely. Always to be remembered. Yes, yes. Hello. Yes. Well, uh... The, the, the collection is purchased by Monsieur Randolph Berman. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Mr. Berman. Please, please. Uh, uh, he wishes to insure it in Monsieur Arthur's company. Yeah, I know all that. Well, Monsieur Arthur requests by telephone that I appraise it. 325000 Ah, then you know. I know. So, I stay at Guadalajara a few days to wait Monsieur Arthur's check for my service. Yes. You want to be sure uh, the check please, please. I visit some of my old friends among the jewel setters. And then... Then, on the third day, what do you think happens? You tell me. Johnny, this is it. In the shop... No, no, please, yeah. monsieur. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. In the shop of my friend Garcia, Hernandez, I watch him work on the mound for a beautiful diamond. And suddenly, I see that the stone is an old friend. One from the Pettenhouse collection? Ah, oui. The caliber diamond that was supposedly in the possession of Monsieur Beaumont. You're sure of the identity of that stone, Mr. Jean-Pierre? Oh, please. As I told you, monsieur, a precious stone to yeah, me... Yeah, yeah, it's like a face to you. So what you figure, Arthur, is that you've insured a boatload of $300,000 worth of gems on the way to the USA, and maybe they're not on board. Exactly. Unless, of course... Mr. That... Jean-Pierre, did you tell Mr. Berman about this one stone? Oh, I went immediately to Mazatlan, where I knew he had his boat, the LND. Well, what did he say? Uh, alas, he had sailed away. Did you learn his destination? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Los Angeles, Johnny, right here. He has a branch office. Well, has he had time to get here yet? I don't think so. Have you tried radioing to his yacht? No, no, I've done nothing. You see, I didn't learn about this until Mr. Jean-Pierre arrived just a few hours ago. Yes, I came up on the aeroplane. The better to arrive and speak with Mr. Arthur before Monsieur Berman would arrive. Do you know where Berman plans to dock his boat? Well, I... I, 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 I probably the, the port in San Pedro, if he is coming here. But who can be sure? Usually on vacation trips, he, he docks down the coast of Balboa, the yacht club. Or, who knows, he might even... Yeah... He might have no intention of coming up to the States at all. He might not even have the jewels with him. He... Arthur, do you know where his branch office is? Oh, yes, uh, it's in Los Angeles. Uh, well, actually, it's in Beverly Hills. Got a car? Uh, yeah. Then let's go. Though he couldn't quite put his finger on it, Arthur was convinced that Randolph Berman was up to something and that his insurance company was going to have to take the rap. On the way into Berman's Beverly Hills office, we dropped Jean-Pierre at the Beverly Hilton and told him to sit tight in case we needed him again. Berman's office was in a nice modern building on South Beverly Drive, tastefully furnished with pictures of various famous jewels on the walls, but with nothing of particular value in evidence. However, I did notice that one wall held a built-in vault big enough for a reasonably sized bank. We were approached by a hand-rubbing, obsequious little character dressed in striped pants and cutaway coat and wearing thick glasses. Good morning, gentlemen. Is there any way I may be of service to you? Yeah, I think there is. Are you oh, the... Oh, Mr. Arthur, forgive me. I didn't recognize you for a moment. Mr. Carello, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hi. How do you do? Is there something I may show you, Mr. Dollar? Some little uh, bauble, perhaps, for a charming lady? Well, not at the moment, Mr. Carello. Oh. Oh, Mr. Arthur, there's no reason to mail this to you. Uh, let me see now. Oh, yes, here it is. Uh, here is a request for slight revision of the policy on the Bretton House collection. Oh? What's this? Oh, the wire was sent by Mr. Berman just before he embarked for Mazatland. I was going to put it into letter form to be more What's proper. It say? But well, uh, now here I'll, I'll read this. Please request Arthur revise Bettenhouse policy. Exclude Calabar Diamond, value four thousand, which I have sold private party in Guadalajara. Oh well, we kind of guessed wrong, didn't we, Johnny? Hmm. Mr. Carello. Yes. Has Mr. Berman wired you whether he's coming here? Oh, of course he is, with that collection. When? When is he going to arrive? Well, his lovely yacht, the Ellen Deere, should reach San Pedro Harbor late tonight. But that's what he wired me, and I intend to meet him there. Then I'm sure you won't mind if I go with you. Oh? Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar is a special investigator. 
investigators. Well, actually, I'm here just to help Mr. Berman protect that collection. Oh, excellent. Then you can arrange for the police escort. Yes, and alert the harbor police to guard the Allen Deer, as Mr. Berman requested. Did he request that? Oh, indeed. But apparently he hasn't been worried about anything happening to the collection while he's at sea. At sea? Oh. Oh. Surely you don't mean pirates or anything like that in this modern day and age. (laughs) You know something? At this point, I'm not quite sure what I mean, or even why I'm here. Uh, Well, of course... um, Well, well, of course what, Arthur? Oh, excuse me while I answer that. Well, I mean... Berman uh, Jewel. That is... uh, What? uh, Well, at least I'll feel better when the stuff is here in the vault. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, no. Carello at the phone paled visibly, then gasped and clutched the back of a chair for support as he listened on the phone. His jaw dropped, his eyes widened, and he shook his head once or twice in horrified disbelief. Finally, slowly, he hung up and came unsteadily toward us. Mr. Corello. Yeah, what is it, Mr. Corello? The... The Coast Guard. Yes? They said the Ellender, the yacht... Yes? Sunk. What? In 600 feet of water. In the outer channel... Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. What has it to do with money, the medium of exchange of mankind? A couple of thousand years ago, it was said that money alone sets the world in motion. That's one way of saying that money and economy are virtually one and the same thing. The economy of a nation depends on its commerce. Commerce depends on manufacturing and services. It has been proven that those nations which practice democracy have the greatest economics. That means money, more money for more people, and a greater freedom of opportunity to earn a higher standard of living. That's why democracy provides mankind with its richest legacy of freedom. Now, Act Two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Ellen Deer Matter. Expense account item four, seven dollars even for a fast taxi ride to Coast Guard headquarters in San Pedro, which is really the port of Los Angeles. By dint of elbowing my way in, I got directly to Captain Barney Thorson. I'm afraid you've got only half the story, Mr. Dollar. All I know, Captain, is that the Ellen Deer went down in some 600 feet of water in the outer channel. Total loss. That's correct. However, what you don't know is that the passengers, Mr. and Mrs. Berman and the crew, were picked up and brought in here. Oh, Outside of a little soaking and a little scare, they were perfectly all right. You see, the Ellen Deer had apparently had some engine trouble before she left Mazatlan. Yes, so I understand. Mexican authorities, with whom we fully cooperate, notified us we'd better keep an eye out for her. So when she reached the channel, we weren't surprised to get a radio call from her asking us to stand by that Universal Junk was kicking up. Is that what happened? By the time one of our cutters got within hailing distance, she was on the way down. That propeller shaft had whipped loose, torn through the hull, and the Ellen Deer was sinking fast. Ask me, that boat was overpowered, Dollar. How do you mean? Well, it must have been because sheer torque tore the whole engine loose from its mountings. And it plowed through the bottom along with everything else on board that was heavy. It was a big safe, for instance, anchored to midships. That was a what? A safe. A safe, you know, a small, heavy steel vault. Yeah, I know. That went down, too? Yeah, uh-huh, with the engine. It was all our boys could do to keep the owner from diving over after it. It was crying like a baby. You'd think you'd had the crown jewels in it. Maybe you're not too wrong at that. What? Not the crown jewels, perhaps, but a collection worth something over 300 grand. Now, what about salvage? Salvage operations in 600 feet of water in that channel? Oh, yeah. No, no, darling. Salvage, even if it were possible, it'd cost a couple of times the worth of that stuff, at least. The only passengers were the Burmans, huh? That's right. Prove three. And they weren't able to save anything? Nothing. Not of any consequence, that is. One of the crew didn't even have his shoes and shirt on. What about Berman and his wife? It's funny what people do in an emergency sometimes. What do you mean? Well, you've heard about the man whose house catches fire, gets panicky, throws all the china and the glassware out the window, and carries out the mattress. What are you getting at, Captain? The only thing that Berman saved in his excitement was two beat-up old hats and a fishing rod. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. And all his wife brought along was a handful of nylon stockings. 
She was hanging on to him for dear life. Oh, yeah, a big hat box with an evening dress half hanging out of it. And that's all? That's all. Hey, you know, that Mrs. Berman's quite a dish. Not too bright, but a real looker. Where are they now, Captain? They're headed for Beverly Hills. Beverly Wilshire was the hotel, I think. In any event, Dollar, I'm afraid your company is going to have a big, fat claim to pay. On the yacht, yes. What's that mean? What do you think? Item 5, 320, long-distance call to the police in Mazatlan. I wanted to be sure that the Benton House collection had been on board the Ellen Deer when she left port down there. Inspector Romulo assured me it had, that he'd checked the safe on the boat himself before allowing it to sail. Furthermore, he had insisted his own maritime service keep tabs on it up to the point where it made contact with the U.S. Coast Guard. In other words, the loot couldn't very well have been passed to someone else at sea. Item 6, 580 cab fare to Beverly Hills, where I dropped in at Berman's office. No, Mr. Dollar, he and Mrs. Berman are at the Beverly Wilshire. I'm sure you understand it's been necessary for them to buy a lot of clothes and things. Yeah, but he will come here. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, from his last phone call, I'd say he'll be here within the hour. All right, then I'll come back. Please ask him to stick around and wait for me if he doesn't mind. Of course, Mr. Dollar, I shall be glad to. Oh, incidentally, he has had me phone Mr. Arthur and ask that claim forms for both the Betton House collection and the loss of the cruiser be brought here to the office just as quickly as possible. Yeah, I'd figured as much. <laughs> Berman wasn't wasting any time. Oh, I know there still wasn't any concrete evidence that Berman was trying to pull a fast one. Ostensibly, the only reason for my trip out here was to watch over that fabulous jewel collection. And a lot of good I'd been. He'd lost the collection and his boat, and the company would have to pay. Then a wild idea hit me. I suddenly remembered something that had happened months ago. Last July, to be exact, when a big passenger liner... The Andrea Doria had sunk off the Atlantic coast. According to the papers, when the survivors were brought into the port, the usual customs inspection was waived. And it occurred to me at the time that every one of those people could have easily smuggled in anything he could carry or conceal in his clothing. I'm not saying it did happen. I'm sure it didn't. But it could have. And if such an idea occurred to me, why not to a man like Berman, who was already pretty well known for his tricks to evade customs? Item 6, 20 cents. Phone call to the Coast Guard and Captain Thorson. Thorson speaking. Johnny Dollar, Captain. Answer me just one question, will you? Sure. What? When you brought them in, were the Bermans required to pass through customs? Well, no, of course not. There'd hardly be any reason to... Thank you very much. (laughs) Item 7, 10 cents. Another call. This time to Arthur Arthur at Western Maritime and Property Insurance. You caught me in the nick of time, Johnny. I was just walking out the door. On your way to Berman's office? Why, yes. With a handful of claims forms? Yes. Now, listen. Get there as fast as you can. Get there ahead of him. What? So that you can see if he brings anything into the office, like the Betton House collection. What? Though I doubt if he'd be that foolish. Foolish or not, how could he, Johnny? That collection, unfortunately, is at the bottom of the ocean. Listen to me. Keep him there. Maybe on the pretext of having to wait for me. Any reason you can think of. I'm afraid I don't understand. Just hold him until I get there, understand? Very well, Johnny. But what are you going to do? Arthur, I may have to break in and rob a hotel room. I went out and stationed myself across the street from the Beverly Wilshire. Five minutes later, I saw Randolph Berman walk out the front door and head east on Wilshire Boulevard in the direction of his office on Beverly Drive. I waited a few minutes to make sure he didn't turn back, then entered the hotel. At the desk, I learned the number of Berman's suite on the ninth floor. Break in? It would have taken a battering ram. So I tried knocking. All right, all right. You don't have to bust down the door. What's the matter? You forget your key and... No. Get out of here, buddy. Randy said not to let anybody in. He's out buying us clothes. Oh, he'd tell you to let me in, baby. Hey, who are you? Fernandez sent me up here from Guadalajara. Oh, well, then come in. Oh, you are in. Yeah. Well, have a drink then. No, thanks. A girl's entitled to a couple of drinks after that dousing in the ocean, and you might as well... What about Hernandez? Your husband sold him the wrong stone from that collection. Sold? Oh, he gave it to him. Oh, then you know about it. Oh, Sure. So he could make a legit-looking change in the insurance and convince everybody he was 
on the up and... You sure you're from Hernandez? You kidding? How else would I know about the whole deal? I don't know. Hey, Randy said not to let anybody in here or he'd kill me. Dumb blonde, he called me. You? A smart, beautiful girl like you? Oh, hey, you're okay. My name's Vi. Come on, let's have a drink. No, no, thanks. Uh, listen, Vi, I've got to get the right stone from that collection, the caliber diamond. Then I'll leave this one I've got in my pocket here. Which one you got? Let me see it. Oh, no, no. Only Mr. Berman. And only when he gives me the calabar. Well, which one you got there, huh? Well, never mind. I'll show it to Mr. Berman. I just want to see it. Not until I get the calabar from the collection. So, if he isn't here, if he's taking it to the office, <laughs> I'll just... You think he's crazy? Let everybody know he... Well, let me see the one you have, huh? Now look, I just told you. Anyway, how do I know where I can trust you? I didn't even see you in Guadalajara. Oh, now you sound like Randy. Dumb blonde, he says. Keep the door locked. But I let the bellboy in with the drinks, and I let you in, didn't I? Now, let me see the one you got. Will you, if I get you the other one? From the hat box that didn't have to go through customs? How did you know? Hey, you're cutie. I bet you read about the Andrew Dorsey, just like Randy did. Come on, now let's Where is the hat box, Vi? Now, wait a minute. Maybe I am dumb. Who did you say you are? Where's the hat box? No. No, I won't tell you. You get out of here. Now, without the collection, Vi. No, you can't. He... Randy would kill me. He'd kill me if he even knew I let you in here. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Oh, please, Johnny, get out of here. The stuff in the bedroom? You can't go in there. I mean it. He'd kill me. Sorry, but that's your worry. Oh, no. Stop it or I'll set your eyes out. Hey, no, you can't. Pulling those claws, baby. No, you... Well, I hate to do this, but... No, no, help! Help! Yeah, that's right, that's right. Get the manager up here. Get the police up here. Police? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Then you'd really be in trouble. You'd be better off if Berman tried to kill you. Now, where's the stuff? It's in the closet, on the floor, in the hat box. Thanks. Well, well. Just a handful of weather fortune. Well. Oh, now, wait a minute, girl. Put down that bottle. I, I, I got to stop you. He'd kill me, don't you understand? Just for letting you in here. You don't know him. Look, baby, you're in this thing deep enough as it is. Don't try to make it any worse for yourself. But when he finds out that I... Listen. He's come back. And I open up. Get my hand full. What'll I do? Where'll I go? Right here, behind this closet door. Quick. Ah! Johnny, Just I... stay there. Hang on to that bottle and think over what I told you about getting in deep. Hi, right, where'd you get these drinks? You got somebody in here. Bellboy? Why, ah, you half-witted bird brain, I told you. Who are you? The name is Dollar, Mr. Berman. Insurance Dick? I just dropped by to pick up the Betton House collection. Put it down, Dollar. I'm a good shot with this thing. Yeah. And it wouldn't be the first time you killed over a handful of jewelry, would it? That's right. Won't be the last. But you'll never know about it. Now, where's Vi? How should I know? She let you in here? I murdered that dizzy blonde. That dizzy blonde is a lot smarter than you think. Where is she? What do you mean? By helping me, she has a chance of getting out of this mess you've involved her in. Of getting out clean. That dirty two-time and... Dollar, I'm going to kill you. You'd even like to involve her in that, too, wouldn't you? Thanks for the idea. I'll make it look like she killed you. Oh, no, you... Nice work with that bottle, Vi. Thought he missed you. Please, you won't let him... No, no, don't worry, baby. He won't bother anybody. Not for a long, long time. Item 8, $245 even. Incidentals during a couple of days of relaxation under the California sun and transportation back to Hartford. 
Expense account total, $453.95. Remarks? By way of getting off as easily as possible, Vi sang like a canary and incidentally cleared up a couple of other of his shady deals. Result? By the time his prison term runs out, he'll be too long dead to collect the insurance on his yacht. And a remark, send a report. Yours truly, Johnny Dog. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the DeSalle matter. And I promise you a double-barrel thrill in it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dog. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Howard McNear, Jay Novello, Jack Edwards, Barney Phillips, and Raymond Burr. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lud Barlow, Johnny. I'm on a spot. What's the matter? The Templeton house in Boston was knocked over sometime during the night. We have a $100,000 loss on our hands. Can you go over there right away? Well, I'll see what the plane situation is, Lud. Never mind the plane situation. Just pack up and get out to the airport. I'll meet you at Hangar 12. What? I'm chartering a plane for you. Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Mid-Eastern Indemnity Corporation Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Templeton matter. Expense account item one, five dollars even, cab fare for my apartment to hang a twelve at the airport. A twin-engine bonanza had been rolled out, and a fueling truck was pulled up alongside. A man in a sheepskin seemed to be supervising things. The man who seemed to be supervising him was Lud Barlow. When he saw me, he waved his briefcase. Hey, Johnny. Hi. Hi, you all set? Well, I'm here. That's what you mean, lad. Had all your luggage? Yeah, this is it. This is Tommy Clark, Johnny, your pilot. How are you? Hi, Tom. I'll uh, stow this gear for you. Oh, thanks. The faster we move on this, the better off we are. You know that. I know. Uh, This is the blanket policy. This is the itemized list. This is the itemized list broken down. You'll have to check the itemized against the sales. Your authorization procedure... 
And a description of stock records, including shipments received by Templeton House up to and including the first day of last week. Okay? Well, now maybe you'll tell me what this is all about. And when you get there, what? What it's all about. Let's start with Templeton House, huh? Biggest jewelry firm in Boston. You said they were robbed last night. Burglarized. Broken into somewhere between 5 and 7 o'clock in the morning. All set, Mr. Dollar. What'd they get away with? Well, that's for you to find out, Johnny. We carry a blanket policy on all their stock. Anything in the store in the way of merchandise is covered. On the phone, you said something about $100,000. It may be $200,000, Johnny. I take it you talked to somebody in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Did you talk to the police? Yes, for a minute. I told them I was sending a man. They're expecting you. Give your hand, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Who's in charge, lad? Lieutenant Roebuck. Roebuck? Yeah. Get your seatbelt, Mr. Della. Oh, sure. If you want to see those contents records, you'll be sure and tell them they're up to date. Who's the man with the company? What? The man at the company. Temple Sir. Stand clear, Mr. Bottle. Remember, Johnny, a client can face a thing like this a lot better if a man from the insurance company standing by. Huh? I'll try to remember that. Good luck and keep the informed. By the time we arrived at the Boston airport, I'd read over the policy and had a fair idea of the coverage involved. Expense account item two, ten dollars, more camp fare. I dropped my bags off at the Independence Hotel and had the driver take me over to Templeton House. Two police cars were parked in front of the building and two uniformed police officers were parked in the doorway. I'm sorry, mister, the store's not open today. Well, I'm from the insurance company. Oh, Lieutenant Robux in the back. Go ahead. At the back of the store, a white-coated intern and an ambulance attendant were working over a blanket wrap figure laid out on the stretcher. One of them was operating a plasma tube. The other was checking the pulse. A group of men, some in uniform, were watching closely. The tall, thin ones seemed to be in charge of things. (laughs) Roebuck? Uh, yeah. Johnny Dollar, Middle Eastern Indemnity. That wouldn't take you long. This, uh, Sergeant Younger, Sergeant Toohey, this is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. Hi, man. What's this? Oh, this... Man was a special patrolman working the area. He must have walked right into the middle of it and got himself shot. They've been giving him transfusions ever since they found him. Uh-huh. Said anything yet? I hasn't been conscious. Doc, how about it? Yeah, we can't do any more here, Lieutenant. We'll have to risk a trip to the hospital and try to operate. Okay, boys, load up. Right. Doc, this is Mr. Dollar, insurance company. How are you, Doc? Okay. Doc, we're going to want to talk to him the minute he comes around. I'm not going to promise you anything, Lieutenant. Well, see you. All right. Mr. Dolly, you didn't waste much time. I brought a contents list that might help you, but good. The best help we're going to get is from that patrolman. Come on, show you around. This is where they got in. Jimmy, huh? Yeah, most likely. There's marks there on the door jam. But as we can tell right now, they only took important stuff. Easy to move. Easy to break down and unload, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, you can see where they snipped the alarms, grounded the wires. Mm-hmm. Showcases aren't touched. No, they went straight for the safe, darling. Well, we really got something on our hands, huh? You don't just break into a store and open one of these things very easy. Someone did. The neighborhood was canvassed for possible witnesses. I spent the rest of the morning with Dorian Templeton, the owner of the company. By noon, we had taken an inventory of the missing stock and drawn up a tentative list. As far as I know, that about does it, Mr. Dollar. So what's the next step? I'll check this against the merchandise received reports, Mr. Templeton. It'll take a while. As soon as I have that finished, you can check it over again and file a formal claim. And then? The company will reimburse you in cash. Well, what are the chances for recovery in a case like this? Well, I could quote the actuaries, Mr. Templeton, but I won't. Why not? Whoever broke in here last night knew what they were about. They opened your vault the way you'd open your front door. They took what they wanted and got out very quickly. No alarm, no witnesses. The chances are they planned the rest of it just as well. They probably scattered. The police aren't sure how many men were involved. They know it was at least two men, possibly three. How did they arrive at that? One man working on the safe, another man looking out. Possibly two. The point is, the more men who are involved, the harder it'll be for them to take the jewelry, break it down, sell it, and stay out of sight. They're going to get away with it? I didn't say that. Well, nothing seems to have gone wrong with their plans so far. One thing went wrong. That special patrolman surprised them. 
True, he didn't have time to draw his gun or sound the alarm, but they had to shoot him. And if something hadn't gone wrong, they'd have been satisfied to knock him on the head. Uh, yes. Well, what happens now? Well, that's up to the police. I can tell you their investigation will take some time. Burglary is the toughest kind of thing to work on. Why? No witnesses. Uh, I never thought of that. Well, are you all cleaned up? Well, we got a tentative list. As soon as I check it, I'll give it to you. Okay. Mr. Templeton, I'd like to have you come with me now. Now? Yes, we'll want your statement, sir, and there's quite a bit of work to do with the employees. Uh, all right. Dollar, as soon as you get the list up, give me a ring, will you? Yeah, okay. Uh, any news about the policeman? Yeah. It's a murder case now. Expense account item three, $25. Stenographic fees. The public stenographer at the hotel helped me make a comprehensive list of the stolen items, which was verified by Templeton. The amount of loss was set at $100,000. By late afternoon, clerks, stenographers, accountants, designers, salespeople, stonecutters, all in Templeton's employ had made statements to Lieutenant Roebuck. The statements were in the process of being checked. A general roundup of known safe crackers and burglary suspects had begun. Expense account item four, $3.75 dinner. Lieutenant Roebuck and myself. Well, it's going to be a long night. Yeah. Any luck on the employees? Well, that's hard to say yet. One of them has a record. Hmm? Yeah, a fellow named Tabor. One of the janitors there. He's a two-time loser. I had him tucked away in a cell until we clear some of this other stuff away. Has he said anything? Oh, he denies all knowledge. As far as time incident goes, he was home sleeping when all this happened, but that doesn't rule him out of... Somehow getting that safe combination and passing it on to a friend. Yeah. Man with the records apt to have that kind of friends would be interested in just that kind of thing. Hey, uh, how much do you want me around? You're a free agent, Dollar. If you have any ideas, I'll listen. It's a tough baby, any way you look at it. Let me talk to Tabor. There might be a shortcut. Why not? John Tabor? That's right. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. I'd like to talk to you a minute. Okay, talk. You might be in a lot of trouble, Tabor. That'd be too bad. They tell me you're a two-time loser. If you don't believe what they tell you, you just go look it up for yourself. It's right down there in the books. How did you get that job at Templeton's? I asked for it. They know about your record? No. You keep it from them? I didn't broadcast it, would you? No. Okay. What other dumb questions have you got? Do you have any ideas about this? I've got a lot of ideas. Do you know anything about it? No. Need anything? What? Cigarettes, anything? I'm all set. Okay. My company faces a big loss in this case. We'd like to avoid that loss. There's a standard offer I'm authorized to make in some instances. I'm going to make it to you. If you have any knowledge of this crime and can furnish any information that will lead to the arrest of the persons involved and recovery of the merchandise, my company will guarantee you the best possible legal assistance in the event that information should incriminate you. That's pretty generous. Well, I have to say it to you. You can use your own judgment. Hey, guys. It's a pretty good offer when you think about it, Tabor. You have a record. The police can't pass you up without a lot of scrutiny. You know that. That record makes me a real hot one. I swiped a couple of cars, and now they think I might have opened that vault. No, they don't think that. But they have to find out if you might have contact with somebody who did open it. I don't know anything about it. In that case, you'll be released. Oh, sure. Sure, I'll be released when every cop in town had a go at me twice. I'll be released when the guys who did the job walk into the station and say we didn't mean it, we want to give it back. They've always got to have somebody to throw to the newspapers. Maybe. You know it and I know it. Nothing better than to throw some old ex-con in a can and hold him for questioning. Well, darling, you go for it? No. Uh, any more ideas? Turn him loose, Lieutenant. See whom he talks to and whom he meets. John Tabor was released without bail and a 24-hour watch was put on his residence. By 10 o'clock the next morning, the police had located three witnesses to the shots that had killed the special patrolman. However, none of them had seen the burglars or the car that was used. The district attorney's office issued an order impounding the financial records of Templeton House. 
A complete audit revealed that its affairs were in excellent shape. It also revealed that Templeton himself was the only man in the jewelry firm who had the combination to the vaults. His statements emphatically denied giving the combination to anyone. As far as the police were able to determine, he was telling the truth. The search for all known safe crackers extended into New York and Philadelphia and Chicago. On the morning of the third day, a claims adjuster arrived from Hartford with a check for $100,000, full payment on the claim. Two hours later, we had the first break on the case. Hey! Caller, hey! What? Oh! Hello, Lieutenant. Come on, get in. What's up? Well, the Harvard Division found a body down by the docks early this morning. All weighted down with 38 slugs. They were fired from the same gun that killed that special patrolman. They match, huh? Like the dimples on your knee. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. It is a rare event when a young man decides to leave civilization behind and hide himself away in the steaming jungle just so he can help his fellow humans in a remote corner of the world. The late Dr. Tom Dooley did just that when he left the United States to help the sick and starving jungle people in the little kingdom of Laos in Southeast Asia. Dr. Dooley's story is well known to nearly everyone. And all over the world, people talk of his little jungle hospital on stilts. That's where he treated the dread diseases of the jungle and trained native medical technicians so that they might help their own people. Dr. Dooley wrote and lectured to many people so that the work of his medical assistance program, Medico, might go on. It was not easy for someone so young and so talented to give up the bright lights of the city and plant himself down in an unknown jungle just for the purpose of helping unfortunate people he didn't even know. But through Medico, Dr. Tom Dooley wanted to help people. They wanted to help people to help themselves. Today, the work of Medico is going forward in a number of countries besides Laos. Young men are being sent to the United States to be schooled in medicine with the idea of returning to their own countries to help their own people. Hundreds of thousands of dollars' worth of medical supplies have been donated by American businessmen and pharmaceutical companies. Today, Dr. Tom Dooley's work is being continued for him. It is helping to create better understanding. It is... An injection of the spirit of freedom. The right of all men everywhere. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Templeton Matter. I spent the rest of the day with Lieutenant Roebuck at the morgue. The body that had been found in the harbor was a man about 35 to 40 years old. Slim Bill, dark hair. The labels had been cut out of his clothes and the laundry marks torn off. His fingerprints didn't check with anything in the local files. Roebuck put them on the wire to Washington and requested an urgent identification. Johnny Dollar. Blood Barlow, Johnny. What's this in the paper? Well, the special patrolman and the unidentified man were killed by the same gun. As soon as we get an identification, we can go to work. How about that ex-con that turned up working at Templeton's? Tabor? Well, they're still watching him. He might have been the case, man. So far, it's just an idea. I'd like a recovery on this one, Johnny. So would I. What do you think is possible? Well, two days ago, I would have said no. Today, things look better. For one thing, none of the merchandise has shown up on the market. For another thing, there'll be, there has to be, some kind of connection with this unidentified man. I just read your report on Templeton himself. He's out of the question as a suspect? So far, yeah. He's the only one who has the combination to the safe. There's no apparent motive for him to rob himself. But he's the only Don't one who Don't start has... yelling at me, Lud. I know what you're thinking. Find a motive. Well, give us time, boy. Give us time on everything. Lud? Oh, I guess I hate to pay off big claims. <laughs> you may get it back. Keep your pants on. Expense account item five, fifty dollars deposit for rented car. That afternoon, I drove from Boston to Creeksdale, the home of the Grantland Safe Company, where I met a man who looked as formidable as the product he manufactured. 
I am Grantland, sir. I found him standing inside a shiny new vault, ready for shipment. Beautiful thing, eh? On its way to South America tonight. Well, I... I never thought of a safe exactly that way, Mr. Grant. Ah, beauty, strength. Think for a moment, sir, the treasures it will someday hold. But I bore you, sir, with my enthusiasm. <clears throat> now then, you say you are here on a matter of vaults. One vault, Mr. Grantlin. No. The one your company sold and installed at the Templeton House in Boston 17 years ago. Yes. Have you read about the burglary? No, sir, I have not. Mm. Templeton House. Yes. The vault was opened. Blasted? Opened. Someone had a combination. I am bewildered, sir. Indeed I am. You want a thorough accounting for my organization, of course. Well, that's up to the police, Mr. Grantlin. Right now, for my own information... I wonder if you could tell me who might have the combination to that vault. Well, in answer to your question, I would first have to inspect our records. Well, I brought the serial numbers. Oh, well, let me see. Um, mm -hmm. That's as good as... Uh, the K series, Mr. Keating set the final combination. Mr. Keating? Yes, my chief engineer for years. And who else? Uh, myself, sir. I'd have a record of the combination in my own files. And who are those available to? Myself, sir. I keep them in my own vault. I see. Anyone else? No one here. The people in proper authority at Templeton. I'd like to meet Mr. Keating if I could. Impossible, Mr. Dollar. Why? Mr. Keating has been dead these six years. <laughs> I drove back to Boston, phoned Roebuck, and told him about my interview with Grantland. He said he'd already started looking into Grantland's background and expected to have a report within 36 hours. I was a little surprised when Dorian Tevelin called half an hour later and asked me to have lunch with him. Would you like a drink? No, not now, guys, no. I didn't know whether to call you or the police, Mr. Dollar. I finally decided on you. Uh-huh. What's the matter? Well, it's one of those strange things, uh... I'm not a particularly observant man, and I don't know why I observe this. Come on. However, last night, Mrs. Templeton and I went to a dinner dance at the country club. We thought with all this business, a little relaxation should do me some good. Yeah, sure. There was a young girl at the table next to ours, a very pretty girl whom I've never seen before. I happened to notice her handbag, jeweled affair, quite expensive. One of our items... Yeah. It didn't occur to me until we were leaving that it had been sampled stock, not for sale. What do you mean? It was stolen, Mr. Dollar. Why not the police, Mr. Templeton? I was going to call them first thing this morning and report it. And then I got a package in the mail. It was the handbag, intact. Crazy? You said it. Did you happen to get the name of the girl? I asked the Meta D. He said her name was Helen Tabor. That's not so crazy. Expense account item six, ten cents, one phone call. To Lieutenant Roebuck to see if John Tabor was still being watched. Roebuck said that two men were on duty watching his house at all times. I saw them when I drove up an hour later. They were parked across the street. Miss Tabor? Yes, who are you? Johnny Dollar, is your father in? Uh, he's sleeping right now. May I help you? I don't know. Didn't I see you at the country club last night? Why, yes, were you there? Couldn't keep my eyes off of you. Or your handbag. Oh. I'll talk to him, honey. Dad, is anything wrong? Nothing I can handle. Go ahead, fix up a pot of coffee. All right, Dad. Nice girl, Tabor. Yeah. Templeton was at the country club last night. He saw her. You can talk to me or you can talk to the police. I don't have to talk to anybody. The way it looks is that you cased the job. You might even have killed a special patrolman. He was shot close range. Could have been somebody new and trusted. You've got your share of things. That handbag was part of it. A little part of it. The way it looks, huh? And that's about it. 
Of course, I don't understand why you sent the handbag back, but then you've probably got a good story for that. Oh, I've got a good story. Nobody will believe it, but I've got a good one. It starts off by me saying I didn't help in that heist. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't case the place for anybody. I didn't even know it was coming off. Let's get to the handbag. I took that two days ago. I borrowed it. I've been borrowing stuff right along whenever my kid needed anything. I always come back in good shape. I told her they... They let me do it. She don't know anything. Borrow them. That's kind of a strange philosophy. I don't even know how to spell the word. I do know my kid's got a life ahead of her. I got to give her every chance to look good, act good, use her brains, meet the right people. Not just because the right people have money, but because they know more right people. It takes a, it takes a little extra to let her do things like that. You let her use the handbag because she had a date to go to a dance. Uh, you guys are all the same. I didn't expect you to believe it. Oh, relax. Maybe I do believe you. What? It sounds nutty enough to be the truth. It is the truth. All right. You taking me in? I'm going to tell Roebuck about this. He'll probably want to talk to you. He can check it better than I can. No, I haven't any authority to take you in. I wouldn't take you in anyhow. I'm interested in guys who walk into vaults. See you around. Hey, wait a minute. What? I never thought I'd see the day when I try to help a cop or anybody like a cop. Maybe this is the day. I, um, I saw the paper last night. Oh? Huh? The picture of that guy they found floating in the harbor... They tagged him yet? He's a John Doe until we hear from Washington. His name's Kylie. Billy Kylie. How do you know? I used to know him a long time ago. Billy Kylie? Yeah, from Philadelphia. Thanks. A check with the Philadelphia police and a comparison of fingerprints identified the man as William H. Kylie. His Boston address was on Parker Street. I drove out there with Lieutenant Roebuck. It was an ordinary, undistinguished apartment house. No one answered at apartment 12A, so we let ourselves in. The room had nothing to offer in the way of evidence. Well, did you find anything? No. Well, I'll ask some men come out here and give it a good going over. Well, maybe the manager or the tennis list, something will help us. Come on, let's go. Yeah. I'll be careful, though. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is Tim. Any trouble there? A little. Say that again. A little. I don't know who you are, but I know you're not Tim. Well, it sounds like we're getting something. Here, let me have the phone. I'll see if I can trace Don't bother. I know where we can find him. What? I'd recognize his voice anywhere. <laughs> It was dark by the time we got to the Grantland Safe Company factory in Creekstale. There was a single work light spreading a sickly yellow glow over the main floor loading platform. We were expected. It went off somewhere in the darkness of the building. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. All right, let's try for that stair in. Right. You see the flashes? There. All right. We'll have to try. Mr. Make... Dollar! Did you're alone. Answer him. Yeah? What are you doing here? Looking for $100,000 worth of jewelry and the answer to a couple of murders. <laughs> Funny? <laughs> you're very foolhardy, but you're courageous. A man of your perception could do well with a part of that money. No, thanks. I'll take it all. You will take nothing, sir. Keep him talking. I'll try to get under the stairs. Are you alone? For a little while. But I've got people coming, though. Ooh, people, eh? <laughs> Mr. Dollar? Still alive and kicking, Mr. Grantlin. You can't shoot around corners. No. <laughs> but then I don't have to shoot around the corner. <laughs> Very good shooting, sir. 
Granlund, I want a statement. No, no. No statement. No statement. He was dead before the ambulance arrived. And there was no statement. There was never a statement. As nearly as it could be pieced together, Grantland himself opened the vaults at Templeton House. William Kiley and possibly a man named Tim helped him. Kiley, of course, was killed for his efforts. Tim never appeared, was never identified. My hotel bill ran up to $168. That's item seven. Item eight, $35, car rental. I got $50 deposit back. Item nine, $32 and a half, airfare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $413.28. Remarks? Put that against $100,000 the insurance company didn't have to pay off. Danny Dollar. This is Barlow. I just talked to Roebuck in Boston. There's not one scrap of that jewelry anywhere in that whole safe factory. Not one piece. I know. What? Just about now, there's a safe at the port of New York being shipped to South America. It's a Grantland safe. And if you hurry over there, you can... <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Where have you been for the past 20 minutes? In the shower. For 20 minutes? Okay, so I'm a shiny dollar. So you're... Oh. Who's that? Max. Max Green at Assured Equity. Oh, hi, Max. What's on your mind? Four score and seven years ago... Our father's brought forth, but that doesn't answer my question. Johnny, you ever hear of the Meeks? Uh... New England family, stood away in the Mayflower, speak only to their money? That's the Meeks. What about them? No, not about them. It's about Mariah Meek and Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. She's lost her copy of it. Well, it shouldn't be hard to find her another one. That's where you're wrong, Johnny. Huh? It would be very hard. Might cost us $100,000. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Assured Equity and Trust Company, 325 Scott Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Meek Memorial matter. Expense account item one, one dollar and ninety cents, cab from my apartment of Max Green's office. He was standing in a haze of cigar smoke, ashes on his vest, and a worried look on his face. Oh, good morning, good morning, Johnny. Oh, you want a cigar? Oh, no, no, thanks. Let's sit up, sir. Excuse me. Listen, Johnny... 
What do you know about that speech that Lincoln made at Gettysburg? Well, I had to memorize it in school like every other kid. All right. You know how many words are in it? Um, maybe a couple of hundred. Why? Wait a minute. It's in this book. Here. It's page 143. Speech is printed here exactly as Mr. Lincoln released it to the newspapers after the Gettysburg Address. You find it? Yeah, but now what do you... Okay, total number of words, 268. Oh. But the first two drafts of that speech, including the one he read that day, contained only 266 words. So he padded his part. That's right. Two more words. Mm -hmm. How come? Oh, according to the historians, Lincoln ad-libbed the two additional words at the time he read it. Later on, when he made three new copies of the speech, he included those two words. You with me so far? Keep going, Max. Yes. All right. Right down at the end of it, just before Of the People, By the People, where he said that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, hmm? the words under God do not appear in the first two drafts you wrote. Yeah. Well, this is all very interesting, Max, but I still don't see what it is or what it has to do with me. Well, Mariah Meek's copy has disappeared. Oh. And Johnny, that copy happens to contain just 266 words. You mean she owns one of the first two original drafts? Handwritten by Mr. Lincoln himself while he was on the train riding to Gettysburg. Wowie. Yeah. Which is, of course, why we insured it for the full amount it cost her, which is $100,000 even. Of course, you made sure it was authentic before you issued the Oh, policy. naturally. Well, who'd she buy it from? An antique dealer down in Richmond, Virginia, a fellow named uh, Jason Penrod. Uh-huh. Well, where's she been keeping it? Under glass. In the Meek Memorial. What's that? Well, she collects Americana, so she had a museum built to keep it in, and she calls it the Meek Memorial. Follows? Mm -hmm. Follows. Also follows the most expensive item in the collection, the Gettysburg Address, would be the one to disappear. Oh, you're just an old pessimist, Max. You think somebody lifted it? What do you think? It walked out by itself. Okay, okay. So what are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to run newspaper ads. We're going to offer a $10,000 reward for information leading to its return. If anyone answers it, you let me know where you'll be, and I'll refer them to you. Good. When was it taken? The night before last. Is there any kind of market for something that rare? Uh, it's hard to say, Johnny. A hot camera would be easier to peddle. Sure. But a good many wealthy people, like Mrs. Meek, they make a hobby of collecting things, you know, antiques, objects of art, etchings. But whoever took this or buys it from the thief couldn't just let everybody see it. Well, it wouldn't matter to some people. They take it and put it in a vault and keep it there. Then what's the point in having it around? Pride of possession. You've got something no other collector could own. Mm. And, of course, it might not have really disappeared at all. You're thinking of fraud? A hundred grand is a lot of cash. <laughs> Expense account item two, one dollar and ninety cents. Cab fare back to my apartment. I wasn't particularly intrigued by this assignment... Rare documents, like anything else antique, have always seemed to be just one step from decay. And that sometimes goes for the people who collect such things. Item three, $16.10, transportation, including a round-trip ticket, Hartford to New Bedford, and cab fare to the Waiters Hotel. There was a convention in town, so I was lucky to get a room. After checking in, I called the Meek residence. Mrs. Meek was expecting me and said she'd have her car pick me up. I had just put down the phone when someone knocked on the door. Depends on what you're looking for. Well, I'm looking for Mr. Mr. J. J, did you say? Nobody by that name here. Oh, yeah. I, I see. I, I, I guess I got the wrong room. Yeah, well, uh, why don't you ask down at the desk? Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Funny. Where is it? I cracked the door open again. Watched him walk to the stairs. Then I took the elevator down the eight flights to the lobby. Half an hour later, I was in the back seat of the Meek limousine, heading toward the home out on Buzzard's Bay. It was a big, sprawling frame building facing on the beach. About 50 yards behind it, closer to the road, was the Meek Memorial Museum. I was starting up the front steps when the door opened. Mr. Dollar? Ah, that's right. I'm Paul Meek. I understand you have an appointment with my grandmother. Right again. Now come in, please. He's waiting for you upstairs in the sitting room. Okay, thanks. Uh, before you go up, I wonder if I could have a few words with you. Why not? Stay in here, then. You've never met my grandmother, have you? No, no, I haven't had that pleasure. Some people consider it a dubious one, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Uh, Mr. Dollar, this is my wife, Janice. This is me. Hi. How about a drink? Uh, thanks, not just now. 
How about you, old stick in the mud? You want another one? After a bit, Janice. And if I were you, I wouldn't have any more. But you're not me, are you? You will have to excuse my wife, Mr. Dollar. She, well, we've both been under a severe strain since moving here. Grandmother is blind, you know. No, I didn't know. Her sight began failing about four years ago. I'm surprised the insurance agent didn't tell you. Well, Mr. Green was so concerned over the theft of the Lincoln manuscript, I, I imagine it slipped his mind. Mm-hmm. And just how do you intend to locate that manuscript? I'm not so sure that I can. It would be a pity if you couldn't. It'd be just awful. It's grandmother's prized possession. She hasn't been herself since it was stolen. And being quite elderly, well, we're all very much concerned. Oh, my, yes. We're afraid she might die and leave us all that lovely money. Janice. It's the truth. You see, Pa and I don't have any money of our own, Mr. Dollar. We'll never have any until she does die. Instead of giving it to us now while we're young, you know what she does with it? Spends it buying junk for that soy old museum. Now, look. That's yeah. gratitude, isn't it? I bathe her feet or rub her feet and do all her dirty work. Janice, and... you've said quite enough. Mr. Dollar isn't interested in our personal problems. Oh, stick in the mud. All right. I'll be in the den if you want me. And that's the funniest thing I've said all day. If you want me. I'm sorry. She doesn't mean half of what she says. Uh, oh, that's grandmother's signal. Then hadn't we better go up? Yes. Yes, we'd better. We went up the broad staircase, through a hall, and into a bright, sunny room. Wrapped in an old kimono and shawl, Martha Meek sat in an invalid chair, facing the ocean. Paul introduced us, then sat down quietly near the door. Paul? Paul, I know you're there. Now answer me. Yes, grandmother. You go on downstairs. I want to talk with Mr. Dollar in private. Whatever you say. And close that door. Don't mind my back, Mr. Dollar. I couldn't see you if I looked into your face. Now then, when are you going to arrest that crook and bring my Lincoln speech back to me? Well, I, I'm going to need a lot of help and information, Mrs. Meek. Mm-hmm. What kind of information? Mostly about the museum. Like what? Well, do you know who was in there the night the manuscript disappeared? Certainly. That dirty robber was. Anyone else? Well, old Pete's always there. Supposed to be guarding the place, but he didn't do a very good job the other night. Got himself slugged. Does he live on the grounds? Yes. I brought him over from Naples ten years ago. He was my guide in Italy. Showed me around so nice I decided to bring him back. Tell me, is the memorial open to the public? It was going to be. I intended it to be once. But when my eyes... No, Mr. Dollar, I keep it locked most of the time. Uh-huh. And who discovered the manuscript was missing? Pete did, I guess. At least when he recovered, he ran yelling bloody murder up here to the house. Everybody went down to see what had happened. Everybody but me. They left me all to myself. Were there any strangers here in the house that night, Mrs. Meek? Anyone besides the servants and your grandson and his wife? One person, but he's no stranger. Who's that? Jason Penrod from Richmond. He's an art dealer. We were discussing some business. May I uh, ask what kind of business? Uh, it has nothing to do with you or the people you work for. Sorry. Where can I find Mr. Penrod? Uh, he's staying here now. If he isn't in his room, then he's most likely out in the memorial. Now, that's enough questions. You, give me a cigarette. Ma'am? What's the matter, you deaf? Give me a cigarette for Paul or that snoopy wife of his comes prowling around. <laughs> All right, sure. Light me. Yeah. <sighs> well, you want any more information? Pete's the one to talk to. All right, thanks. But what about your son and daughter-in-law? Were they inside the house at the time of the robbery? You don't suspect them, do you? Right now, I suspect everybody, Mrs. Meek. Even me? Yes, ma'am. Even you. Well, bless you, boy. I found Pete Vesuvio trimming the shrubbery just outside the memorial building. He seemed quite willing to talk to me. Uh, how you say what happened to me, mister? I'm uh, hit out? <laughs> Knocked out, Pete. Ah, see, si, senor. And because of this, I do not see anything. Nothing at all, huh? 
please, mister, do not use the insult. I am American citizen, first papers. And because of the kindness of my patron, I will soon be second papers. I know by heart the Constitution, United States, Gettysburg address, pledge allegiance to my flag. Yeah. You know how I know that these things which help me be citizen? Because of my lady, she's letting me work in a place where great papers are for me to read. Because of her, I would not hide anything, mister. Okay, Pete, okay. I'm convinced. But I'm sorry I cannot help you, mister. Well, it's not your fault. Hey, you like to hear me say Gettysburg address. Well, Do it very good. Learn it right from President's own writing. Some other time, Pete. Right now, I have to find Mr. Penrod. Oh, he's inside, mister. Counting the treasures. All of the beautiful things a lady can no longer see. You'll find him in a Section L, senor. <laughs> I found the small, neat-appearing art dealer just where Pete had said he'd be, peering into a glass case crowded with Derringer pistols. He had a notebook under his arm and seemed to be making some sort of inventory. Hey, oh, oh, dear. You, you gave me quite a fright, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I uh, wish I could concentrate like that. Oh, well, there's nothing more interesting to me than these fine old pistol things. <laughs> what history they must have, Mr. Uh, Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, the insurance investigator. Paul told me you were wondering about the place. I, I suppose you'd like to ask me some questions, hmm? If you don't mind. Oh, no, goodness, no. I understand you were with Mrs. Meek the night of the robbery. Uh, that is correct, sir. We heard the shouting. We ran out here just as fast as we could. I was the one who discovered the manuscript was missing. You have any idea how the thief got in here? No, sir, no, no. Unless someone forgot to lock the front door, or unless he had a key. <laughs> Well, has Mrs. Meek given out many of the keys? Well, in my opinion, too many. <laughs> Even I have one. What about Paul Meek and his wife? No, I don't think so. Well, they, they really aren't interested in the museum at all, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Uh, Mr. Penrod, I understand you're quite an authority on antique art and things like that. Well, I... Uh... Isn't taking inventory a little beneath your position? Well, I suppose it is, Mr. Dollar. But, uh, last week when I received dear Mariah's wire asking me to do it, I, I simply couldn't refuse it. She's been such a good customer of mine. Will she? Yes. You have any idea who might have wanted the Lincoln manuscript? Well, I know several persons who'd love to have it. You give most anything, but I don't know anyone with uh, the nerve to break in here and take it by force. You remember where Paul Meek and his wife were when you heard Pete shouting? They were right in here when I arrived. I see. Well, thanks for... Oh, just one more thing. Oh, yes? If you'd stolen the manuscript... Mr. Dollar... A hypothetical question, Mr. Penrod. But if you had, and you wanted to sell it at a good price with the least danger of being caught, how would you go about it? Well, I, I, I take it abroad, of course. I put it on the open market over there. Huh. You aren't planning on going abroad soon, are you, Mr. Penrod? Oh, gracious, no. <laughs> you know anyone who is? Anyone who, uh... Who oh, didn't Paul and Janice tell you? Oh, they're flying to Paris Wednesday night. I left the memorial and walked back to the house. The Meeks were in the study, engaged in their favorite pastime. When I told them what the art dealer had said, Paul set down his glass long enough to confirm the fact that they did have reservations and insisted that he had a logical explanation for not having told me of those plans earlier. Very logical explanation, Mr. Dollar. Let me handle this, Janice, please. Sure. Drink, Johnny? No, first I want to hear that explanation, if you don't mind, Paul. Of course I don't mind. Janice and me, were fed up. Why didn't you tell me about the plane reservations? Well, why should I have? I'm not even sure I'm going to use them. Oh? Grandmother's upset enough over losing that manuscript. Something else might... Well, anyhow, if the manuscript doesn't turn up within 48 hours, we're canceling our trip. Oh, no, please. Sorry, Janice, but that's the way it's got to be. She did it. What do you mean? It's an act, don't you see? Jason Penrod told her we were going to leave, so she had him hide the manuscript. And now this thing about her being so upset and having such a weak heart. It's an act to keep her precious darling boy tied to her apron string. I don't believe that. Well, just wait. You will. Anything else, Dollar? What does a trip to Paris cost, Paul? Well, it's not inexpensive. Your wife was complaining about being so broke. Haven't you ever heard of flying now and paying later? We have friends in Paris, Dollar. It won't cost as much to live once we get there. And we'll worry about paying for our ticket when we get back. Any other questions, Mr. Snooper? Yeah. Later. 
It was after seven when I finally got back to my hotel room. I ordered a drink and tried to make some kind of sense out of the information I'd gathered during the day. But it all added up to zero. I called Hartford and asked Max Green to look into the meek finances. Then I dressed for dinner. I was about to go downstairs when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I was told to call you. Yeah? It's about the ad. The ad? In tonight's paper about something missing from a certain memorial. Go on. Well, I called Hartford Collect. They said to call you. Yeah, that's right. Who is this? Now, my name's not important, Dollar, but that ten grand reward is. You think you can earn it? You meet me tonight, you'll see. Where? In the alley behind the Bourne Whaling Museum. Be there at 9.30 and be alone. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Expense account item four, 85 cents cab fare from my hotel to the Bourne Whaling Museum. I don't like wandering around dark alleys at night, alone in a strange town. It isn't the best way to stay alive. But at 9.29, I passed the old whaling museum and started down the alley. It was dark, no moon, and it was very quiet. I was about 20 yards in from the street when I saw him, curled up in a ball like he had a stomach ache. Only he didn't. Because somebody had made him very dead. I struck a match and turned him over. I'd only seen him once before, but I didn't have any trouble remembering where it had been. Right after I'd checked in, he'd knocked on my hotel room door. By mistake. At least that's what he'd said. After giving a statement to the local police who identified him, I went back to my hotel. Evening, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, say, uh, look, I know it's probably against all your rules, but uh, who had my room just before I checked in? Oh, I couldn't disclose that information, sir. Sorry. Oh, well, so am I. It'd mean a lot for me to know. Maybe even five bucks worth. Well, I... Uh... Well, sir, if it's that important... <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, let's see. Uh... Um... Yeah, yes, here it is. Uh, can you read his signature, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, thanks. Just fine. <laughs> The name I'd seen scrawled on the hotel register wasn't important now. At least not without something more to back it up. There was no law against checking out of a hotel. But there was a law against murder, if it could be proven. And that would be hard to do without finding a motive. So I went back to the Meek house to look for it. I paid off the taxi, that's item five, and started up the front steps. Oh, hi, Johnny. I thought it might be you. That's so? Mm-hmm. I hope you aren't mad at me for the things I said today. No, no, not at all. I've been a very bad girl. But everything's going to be all right now. It is. Mm-hmm. Or haven't you heard? Heard what? About dear old grandmother. She had a real bad stroke. Isn't expected to live. You, uh, aren't a bit sorry, are you? Would you be, if you were me? Dollar, you mind coming up here? No, not a bit, Paul. I'm trying to reach you at your hotel. Thank goodness you've come here. Did Janice tell you? Yeah. How is she? Bad. Doctor's given up. Says it's only a matter of hours. Uh, she told me to send for you, Mr. Dollar. Oh? I don't know why. But I've never been able to figure out a lot of things she did. All right, where is she? In there. Oh, Pete's with her, but go on in. Thanks. May they increase devotion to that cause for which they here gave her the last... Who is it? Oh, it's uh, Mr. Dollar, my lady. Hello, Mrs. Meek. Oh, thank you for coming, Mr. Dollar. I uh, go now. No, wait. Mr. Dollar, you have a moment, haven't you? Of course. I promised Pete the last time I visited the museum. I promised I'd let him recite some of the things he's learned while working there. Haven't been able to keep that promise till now. Go on, Pete. Please. Yes, my lady. They here give the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. That was wonderful. 
Thank you, my lady. Now I, I go. Well, Mr. Dollar, I have a confession to make to you. Yes? I lied to you. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't a very big lie, Mrs. Meek. Oh, but it was. I told you the business Mr. Penrod and I were discussing the night of the burglary. Yes. I told you it had nothing to do with you or the people you work for, remember? Yes, ma'am. Well, that was a lie. I'm broke, Mr. Dollar. All I have left in the world is this house and the things in the memorial. I see. That's why I sent for Jason Penrod. He purchased most of my treasures for me. He's evaluating them now. So Paul and Janice will know what they're worth when they go to sell them, which they'll do immediately. Mrs. Meek, don't you think you should try to rest now? Will you give me a cigarette? No, ma'am. Sorry. And you must rest. There isn't much else to do, is there? Good night, Mr. Dollar. Outside in the hall, Paul and Janice Meek were talking quietly to Jason Penrod. Off in the corner, standing with his back to the others, was Pete Vesuvio. Mr. Dora, is she... She is resting quietly. Oh, dear God. Why did you lie to me, Pete? What? I never lied to nobody. Who say I did? I say you did. You're crazy, mister. What lie I tell you? You said you learned the Gettysburg Address right from Mr. Lincoln's own writing in the museum. That's no lie. What's the matter you don't believe that, mister? I believe you, Pete. But I just had to be sure. Come on, let's join the others, shall we? Si. Well, good evening, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Penrod. Tell you any of the family secrets, Johnny? Not too many. You learn anything in there you didn't know before? Yeah. I know which one of you stole the Lincoln manuscript. One of us? Why, you're crazy, Dollar. We were all in the house at the time it happened. That's right. But one of you hired a little man named Leo Jones to do your dirty work. Jones called me earlier this evening. He was going to tell me which one of you it was. Evidently, he didn't like the deal he was getting. What was he doing, Penrod, trying to blackmail you? What are you talking about? I don't know any Leo Jones. Then why did he come around to my hotel room this morning? The same room you just checked out of. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. I imagine several persons have been to that room today. Sure, but they're still alive. Now, let's get to the phony Lincoln manuscript. Phony manuscript? It wasn't phony, Mr. Dollar. Wasn't it? Well, you correct me if I'm wrong, Penrod. After Mrs. Meek purchased one of the first two drafts of Mr. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, she started losing her sight. When she closed the museum to the public, you saw a chance to make yourself another $100,000 sale. So you switched copies of the manuscript, replacing that draft with one containing the words, Under God, which isn't worth anything close to hundred grand. What do you mean, Dollar? All right, let me quote. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and so on. What? The phrase, under God, was not in the manuscript he sold your grandmother. But it was in the copy old Pete has been studying in the museum. Right, Mr. Penrod? All of you, stay right where you are. You get what Jones got. Mr. Dollar. He won't go far, Pete. But I am the guard. The lady will want me to stop him. Pete, come back here. Keep away from me. Pete! Come on. Oh. You, uh, you tell the lady. I am a better guard now. Much better. See, si, senor. Yes, Pete. I did good. You did fine. Pete Vesuvio will live to apply for a second paper. <laughs> and in time, probably open a spaghetti joint in New Bedford. Penrod will be tried for murder. As yet, he hasn't disclosed the name of the person who purchased the stolen manuscript. But in time, I am sure he will. As for the Meeks, well, Mariah passed on later that night. But as she said, there was nothing left for her but to rest. Expense account total, including hotel and numerous incidentals, $98.30. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dave Lawler, Johnny, over at Surety Mutual and Trust Company. Oh, hi, Dave. Long time. Yeah, I know. Listen, do you own a pair of dark sunglasses and some real loud sports shirts? Mine are so loud I have to keep them in a soundproof drawer. Great. But where you'll be at this time tomorrow, nobody will give them a second look. Oh, like where? Well, according to the travel folders, it's, quote, the land where the summer spends the winter, unquote. In other words... Palm Springs, California. Dave, you're on. Good. But don't forget, this could be pretty expensive for your company. Oh, more than you know, Johnny. 75,000 hard cash. Ah, we. Oui. Unless you're able to prove the bracelet Dan Galloway gave to his child bride wasn't really stolen. For a trip to Palm Springs at this time of year, I think I could prove anything. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Franklin Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the suntan oil matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, $197.40. Airline fare and incidentals, Hartford to Palm Springs, California. I registered at La Casa de Paz on South Palm Canyon Drive, changed into casual clothes, and sauntered over to police headquarters. Detective Sergeant Lacey was about to leave for lunch, so I went along with him. Yeah, Dollar, you'd be surprised at how much stuff is lost in this town during the course of just one season. The report we got says it was stolen, Sergeant. Oh, sure, sure. But I doubt it. A $75,000 bracelet, just five days old? That'd be a little careless of the lady, wouldn't it? Well, if you were married to one of the biggest wildcatters in the oil business, maybe you could afford to be careless. What about Dan Galloway? Didn't you say he was drilling somewhere around here? About 80 miles south in the middle of the desert down by Salton Sea. Salton Sea. Oh, that's really a big inland lake that lies way down below sea level, isn't it? Want to bring me a check, Dottie? 245 feet below sea level, Dollar. There's oil there? Dan Galloway figures it this way. One of the most successful new fields that's been worked in years is deep under the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Louisiana. There are a lot of salt domes down there, and underneath them are big pools of oil. Millions of barrels. So, why not under the Salton Sea, which is all salt deposits? Who knows? Maybe he has something. Anybody else drilling down there? Uh, just Galloway. Who else needs it? I mean, any more than he does. Well, does he? All yours, Daddy. How would I know if Galloway needs it? But there has been talk around, you know. But if he's hard up, how could he afford that fancy bracelet last week? Yeah, or the uh, snazzy Italian sports car the week before that. I don't know either, darling. What about his wife? Oh, 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 that Roberta. What a doll. And in 3D, if you know what I mean, how an old coot like him could ever latch onto a pretty little chick like her. 
I take it Roberta's somewhat younger than her husband. Oh, not more than 35, 40 years. Oh, I see. How long have they been married? Mm, two, maybe three years. Uh, down in Dallas, I think it was. She's a Texas girl. Well, is it working out? I mean, are they happy? There's talk about that, too. What kind of talk? Oh, it's really just small-town gossip for the most part. Uh, ever hear of Sonny Wyman? Wyman? No. Well, Sonny's around Roberta's age. One of those kids who came up from nothing, but all the time knew exactly where he was going. You know, made a point of meeting the right people, shaking the right hands. Real nice kid, too. Uh, what's he do? Well, when the season's over here, he works Pasadena, Beverly Hills, and L.A. Always has something that'll intrigue his wealthy friends. This season, it's Italian sports cars. Uh, Cosmo Romas, I think they are. And he's the one who sold the Galloway's theirs, huh? Uh, he sold Roberta hers. Any angle there in connection with the bracelet? Huh? There is. You let me know. Well, if there isn't, what have you been working up to? Well, actually, nothing. You see, I still believe it was lost. <laughs> Expense account item two, $35 for rental of a drive-your-own car. I found the Galloway place about two miles out north and east of town. As I parked in the broad U-shaped driveway, I noticed a low, shiny, suntan color sports car standing in the shade of a date palm back by the garage. I started over to take a look at it. but the front door of the house opened, a Filipino boy appeared, took my name, and showed me into the living room. Through the solid wall of picture windows, I could see that the whole place was built around a kidney-shaped swimming pool. Huh. Mighty inviting. And so was Roberta, Mrs. Galloway, when she stepped into the room a minute or two later. Hi there, Mr. Dollar. My, it's nice of you to come all the way out here. Yeah, Sergeant Lacey was right. Roberta was a living doll. Twenty-two or three, trim, petite, and with a figure that... Well, let's not go into that. She said it would be more comfortable out on the lanai beside the pool. I just wish there was something I could tell you about that bracelet that had helped you find it, Mr. Dollar, but... Well... Just must have been stolen. Well, it makes no difference insofar as your claim is concerned, Mrs. Galloway. The company will still have to pay up, you know, unless, of course, it's found. Oh, I know that. How do you go about your investigation? I mean, uh, do you offer a reward or something? Uh, usually, yes. Uh, of course, it depends on... How much have they offered for my bracelet? Well, frankly, I haven't checked on that yet. But now, Mrs. How Galloway... How much would you guess, Johnny? Well, claim this size, probably somewhere between 10 and 30 percent. To... What's the matter, Johnny? Your ear's out a mile. Uh, nothing. I, I just thought I heard... Now, that's funny. I didn't hear a thing. But I had. Quick footsteps somewhere in the house. Then a door opened and closed. Then a few seconds later, the unmistakable growl of a high-powered engine thundering out through twin straight pipes. Dad, probably some hot rod fan in the neighborhood just drove by. Aren't they She all... prattled on for another hour or so and again asked about possibilities of a reward for her bracelet. But so far as helpful information was concerned, she came up with nothing. So I excused myself and drove back to town. I wanted to talk to the driver of that sports car. I also wanted to check with Wilhoyt Van Hook, the jeweler who had sold the bracelet. I found his shop on Palm Canyon Drive, a small place but very ultra-ultra. As I was about to enter the door... Mr. Dollar, got a minute? Oh, yeah, sure. Two or three minutes. And I, uh, I like your car. Mr. Wyman, isn't it? That's right. How'd you know? How'd you know mine? Yeah, real cloak and dagger stuff, huh? You, uh, you knew I was out at Berta's house, didn't you? Well, it seemed pretty obvious when I heard you hot-footed for the door and then heard this pint-sized monster of yours barrel off. Hey, you wouldn't like to buy a Cosmo Roma, would you? It's a real dilly. Oh, I'd like nothing better, but I'm out here on a job. Yeah, I know. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Well, you know anything that'll help me? Not much, I'm afraid. But I'll be glad to tell you anything I can. You going in to see Willie? Willie? Yeah, you know, Will Hoyt Van Hook, the jeweler. I was, yeah. Why? Do you know him? Know him? I sold him one of these. One exactly like mine. And we're both going to be in the rally they're holding next Sunday. You ever see a good sports car race? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. Well, we'll soon fix that. And look, uh, after you've talked to Willie, if you want to go down to where Dan Galloway is drilling his new well, I'll be glad to give you a lift. Good idea. But I don't want to take you out of your way. Oh, not at all. I was going that way anyhow. Besides, uh, I thought it might give us a chance to talk a little. Sure, why not? Why not? With a name like Wilhoyt Van Hook, I expected... 
Well, I don't know what I expected. As it turned out, he was a smartly dressed chap of about 40, tall and slim, blonde hair and quick blue eyes, an alert mind. I told him why I was in Palm Springs, showed him my credentials, and he immediately offered full cooperation. No, here we are, Mr. Dollar. Here's a copy of the appraisal. A duplicate of the statement I sent Dan Galloway. And here, yes, here's a sketch of the bracelet. Ah, very good. Diamonds here, emeralds, and the mounting is yellow gold. And worked, all of it. Mm Mm-hmm. One thing I can't help wondering about, Mr. Van Hook. Yes? Isn't a $75,000 bracelet a bit unusual for a shop in a resort town? As a matter of fact, it is. As you can see, I specialize in rare and exclusive sort of things. But very little over, say, ten or $12,000. Then the Galloway bracelet was an exception. Yes. After Dan told me what he had in mind to give to his wife, I had some sent over from Pasadena and Los Angeles by wholesalers with whom I do business. You know, had him shipped down on consignment. He liked one, and that was that. I see. Mr. Dollar, I wouldn't want this to go any farther, of course. But after all, jewelers and insurance companies are... Well, our businesses are pretty well tied together, at least on occasion. Yes, unfortunately. But what are you getting at? I'll tell you. Two days after the bracelet was delivered... One morning, just as I was opening up, Dan came in here. So? He was ill at ease. Looked worried. He said he had to have some cash quickly. He asked if I could possibly refund his money. Oh? Did you? No, because I couldn't. Things have been rather slow for me this season. Quite frankly, I'd used all I'd made on the bracelet to pay up some old bills. I told him as much and that I was sorry, but I just couldn't help him. Did Galloway say why he had to have that much cash right away? Yes. Well... I don't know much about oil drilling, but as I understand it, his test well is down some 400 feet further than he'd planned on going. And the day before he came in here, something on his rig had broken loose and left him with a highly expensive repair job before he could proceed any further. Apparently, it was all very serious and very expensive. Hmm. Strange his wife didn't seem to be bothered. I just talked to her. Berta? (laughs) Believe me, Mr. Dollar, she wouldn't be. In fact, I doubt if she even knows. Oh? Figure it out for yourself. A man of nearly 60 who has to give bracelets and fancy cars to his wife to keep up her interest. Well, you'd hardly expect him to tell her that kind of news, now would you? No, I suppose not. Especially if he's worried about the competition. And if you ask me, he has competition. If only he could see it. That suntan and chrome Cosmoroma was all Sonny Wyman claimed it was. It purred like a kitten performed beautifully. But I was more interested at the moment in what Sonny wanted to talk about. Johnny, I'm going to be perfectly blunt with you. I'll go along with that. Out at the house a while ago, I felt pretty foolish when you arrived and Berta insisted I hide until she could get you out on the lanai. Did she have any particular reason? Well, you see, we know that... Well, there's some talk going around about Berta and me. Any truth in it, Sonny? A little, I guess. You saw her. Oh, yeah? I mean, there's nothing serious between us. It's just that, well, with Dan away so much of the time, we, uh... Well, we have fun together. Yeah, sure. Now, what about the bracelet? You mean who might have stolen it? That's the general idea. I don't know. I have no idea. That, uh, sound funny to you? Should it? Well, after all, Dan and Berta keeping their house open to everybody. People in to swim, play badminton, cocktails, barbecues... I guess half the population of Palm Springs has been there at one time or another. And even if it weren't an invited guest, why, it'd be simple for someone to just sneak in and walk off with it. Providing, of course, they knew where it was kept. Well, yeah, someone who was close enough to... Well, yeah, I, uh... I heard uh, Berta ask you about a reward for it. You think a big enough reward would turn it up? I would think so. I understand that stolen jewelry brings about uh, 20 cents on the dollar. Sometimes it brings 20 cents... Sometimes 20 years. Uh, well, yeah. Well, I uh, j- just wonder. How's the car business doing, Sonny? Oh, great, great. It's really one of the reasons I'm driving out this way. Oh, a prospect? An oil-rich Indian or a well-to-do prairie dog? <laughs> Hardly. No, I told you we were having a sports car rally on Sunday. Well, being the promoter, so to speak, I'm going down to check the course. If you're still around, you ought to come. Oh, maybe I will. Having some good events, too. 
Willie Van Hook and I are running a match race. He's quite a bug, you know. And ever since I sold him the twin of this job, he's been working it over. Special carburetor, racing cams, everything. Yeah, no wonder I can't afford this kind of stuff. Oh, man. You'd be amazed at the amount of, amount of money that changes hands. Hey, wait a minute, Sonny. Rates. Isn't that an oil rig over there? Uh, yeah, Dan Galloway's. The rig itself's about uh, 50 feet out in the lake. The shack or office or whatever you want to call it's over the other way. You see? About a quarter of a mile beyond those Joshua trees. I'll drive you over. He did. There was an old car parked near the shack, so we figured Dan Galloway must be inside. Sonny Wyman dropped me in front of it, then took off in a cloud of dust and exhaust gas. I picked my way between the cactus plants, opened the door without knocking, and barged right in. Mr., uh... Oh. Oh, hello. Well, no use asking. If Mr. Galloway is here, I can see he isn't. No, he isn't. Is it all right if I wait? I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm Mrs. Galloway, Mr. Dollar. Huh? Hell, that is, I'm the first Mrs. Galloway. The former. The one who scrimped and saved while Dan was booming around every oil field all over the country trying to make his score. I'm the forgotten Mrs. Galloway. Oh, I, uh, well, I'm sorry. Are you expecting him back soon? <laughs> who knows? I've been waiting here three hours. But I'll wait three days if I have to. Promises, that's all, Promises. What do you mean, Mrs. Galloway? After working to help him the way I did for all those years, and then to be tossed over for somebody else who never did a lick of work in her life. Oh, sure. Give me anything I want if I let him free. So what have I got? Promises. Well, I, I'm sorry. But getting all upset is going to help. Well, wouldn't you be upset if you had more than $18,000 in back alimony coming to you? And with them living like royalty? Oh, I see. Well, he's not going to keep on getting away with it. That's why I'm here. Well, now that gun in your handbag isn't the what? answer, I'm afraid. How'd you know? I've seen that kind of bulge in a handbag before. You really have ideas about using it on him? Well? Well, I... Oh, I don't know. I... There are times when I feel as though killing would be too good for him. Then there are other times when... Oh, I, I don't know. Well, oh, here, better let me no. have it. No, leave me alone. Well, I'm not going to sit here and try to make sense with somebody as upset as you are who has a gun. Well, how would you feel? What would you do if you were me? How should I know? But killing him isn't the answer. Isn't it? Or sitting here shouting at me. Who are you, anyway? What are you doing here? I came out here to see your husband, your ex-husband, on business. What kind of business? A friend drove me out here and figured Dan would drive me back. But since he isn't around, there's no point of my staying here. Or you either. Well, maybe you aren't You have a say... car, so you and I are driving back to Palm Springs. I'm not leaving here till I see Dan. Until I get some money from him. Or see him dead. Maybe he's at the well. All right. Maybe he is over there. Now, come on. Why I took this on, I didn't know. But I couldn't leave that slightly frantic woman sitting there, waiting, with murder in her heart. For all I knew, she'd murdered Dan already. Better inspect the gun later. The road down toward the oil rig was just a pair of ruts in the desert sand. Then just as we cut in between some yucca plants and a wind-blown Joshua tree, I slammed on the brakes. <laughs> There, in the middle of the trail, lay a man's body, crushed and twisted. Dan Galloway had been carefully, repeatedly run over by a car. <laughs> Expense account item three, $1.19 for a quick phone call to Sergeant Lacey in Palm Springs and smelling salts and a bromide for Florida, the ex-Mrs. Galloway. Then I dropped her off at the Galloway house. She and Roberta ended up consoling each other while I huddled with Lacey in his office at headquarters. Some of the boys are still out there, Dollar, checking tire prints, taking pictures, and so on. No clue as to who ran Galloway down? Not yet. Looked to me as though Galloway stepped out of his own car to see whoever had pulled up in the other and was run down for his trouble. The car that did it ran around in a circle over and over him. Any suspects, Sergeant? You found his ex-wife, Flora, waiting for him in the field office, you said. That's right. And she was pretty nervous, on edge, you say. So? Also, she was carrying a gun. Oh, oh now, wait a minute. Now, any reason why she couldn't have run him down earlier, then gone back and just waited for somebody like you to come along? Somebody with whom she could then discover the body? Only one hitch. You told me yourself, Dollar, that she was pretty insistent about your going over there to look for Gannon. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, Sergeant, you're off on the wrong foot. Why? Because of the tracks left by the killer's car. They didn't match the tires on Flora's car. You checked? I checked. And if I were you, I'd have your boys find out whose car did make those tracks. I'm way ahead of you. Well, if you know, then what do you... Hey, wait a second. Yeah? Levine, Sergeant. I got news for you. Hey, listen to this, Dollar. About those tire tracks at the scene of the killing... Well, right on cue. They're the, the same make and size as the tires on Sonny Wyman's Cosmo Roma. You sure? 
Well, I told you, it's a scene. I thought it was a sports car by the small size of the circle the tracks made. Yeah? And knowing the feeling between Wyman and Galloway, I went right over to his place. Nice, clean tracks all over. And they match. You're holding Wyman? Oh, well, I don't know where he is, Sergeant. He wasn't at his place, and there was no answer to the phone at his showroom. Well, then get after him. Put out a flash on him. With that car, he shouldn't be too hard to find. Let me know when he's picked up. Yes, sir. What do you think, Sergeant? You know something, Dollar? I have a notion that when we find Sonny Wyman, we'll also find out what happened to that bracelet. Yeah, could be. One thing was certain. Dan Galloway could no longer be suspect in the case. But Roberta... Why not? Maybe she did know that Dan had run out of money. Maybe that's why she was so interested in the amount of reward for the bracelet. Now, what about Sonny Wyman? Well, it looked bad. A smart young opportunist out for the fast buck. And, of course, close to Galloway's wife. Anything he could do to hurt Galloway would help him. And now these tire tracks, the one solid clue to Galloway's killer. Sergeant Lacey and I drove out to the Galloway house. I know, Johnny. I haven't seen Sonny since he left here this afternoon. That's when you were here. He didn't call up? Why should he call up? Why shouldn't he call, Roberta, if he'd heard that Dan was killed? Now you listen here, Mr. Dollar. If you're trying to trick me into saying something about Sonny having anything to do with Dan's death, you're wasting your time. And what's more... Pardon me. Hello? Oh, yes. Just a minute. For you, Sergeant Lacey. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yes. Yes, when? Yeah, I see. Okay, Levine, thanks. Has he found Sonny Wyman? He sure has. And if you want to see him, you'll have to go to the coroner's office. What? Oh, no. Yeah, that souped-up car of his. A couple of miles out of town. Ran off a curve and over a hundred-foot bank. Within minutes, Lacey and I were at the scene of the accident, looking things over with the help of flashlights. Yeah, he must have been really burning up the road to spin and roll this far off the highway. But surely he must have been familiar with that curve. Oh, sure. He knew these roads around here as well as anybody in the county. Tires still in one piece, too. And these sport cars usually corner pretty well. Well, this one didn't. Hey, Lacey, look here. Yeah? This left rear fender. Looks to me like this car was sideswiped. Hey, you're right. Rolling over never make a long crease like that. Uh Uh-huh. And no, wait. If another car sideswiped him, there'd be paint on this fender. Paint from the other car. Sergeant, you're absolutely right. And since there's none here... Sergeant, you're absolutely wrong. How far to the nearest filling station? What? I want to make a couple of calls to some wholesale jewelers in Pasadena and Los Angeles. Right now, in the middle of the night? Right now. Wholesale jewelers? Expense account item four eleven dollars and ninety cents. phone calls to Pasadena and L.A. The third call yielded Mr. Alfred Mencken of Mencken Imports Incorporated, who was pretty cheerful about having been gotten out of bed. It's quite all right, Mr. Dollar. Now that I'm up, I'm wide awake almost. Well, I hate to throw something like this at you in the middle of the night, Mr. Mencken, but tell me, please. Did you ship a diamond and emerald bracelet to Will Hoyt Van Hook in Palm Springs within the past few weeks? Why, yes, Mr. Dollar. Oh? As a matter of fact, I sent him three. That was two weeks ago, and he returned them all. Returned them? When? Well, two of them the day after he got them. But the third one he kept for a while. I got it back just last Thursday. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you. You bet it does. Thanks very much. Lacey and I piled into one squad car, four patrolmen in another. It was several miles out to the little ranch where Van Hook lived, and Lacey and I chewed it over as we drove along. It don't hold out on me, Johnny. What if it made you think a Willie Van Hook is the one who drove Sonny Wyman off the road? Well, apparently there was no paint on that fender from the car that sideswiped him. Actually, there was. Holy... Of course. Van Hook's car is exactly the same color as Sonny's. Another thing. The car that ran down Galloway, like the one Sonny drove, even down to the tires, but not necessarily the same car. Plus the fact I couldn't help wondering about Van Hook all along. Yeah, but why? In a job like mine, you have to wonder about everybody connected with a case. Anything particular about Van Hook? Well, he told me that he'd use the money he got from Galloway to pay off some overdue bills. And yet, a few weeks ago, he was able to buy an $8,000 sports car. It ties up, Dollar. It all ties up. But how did Sonny Wyman figure in it? Oh, Sonny was a fellow who lived by his wits. He may have reached the same conclusion about Van Hook that I did. May have had an idea for latching onto the reward money. 
He mentioned the matter of reward to me a couple of times. Or he may have had ideas for blackmailing Van Hook. Another thing. Van Hook saw me drive away from his shop in Sonny's car. That meant he had to act fast. Get rid of Galloway, who'd given him back the bracelet, and, of course, take Sonny out of the picture, too. Yeah, it all seems to head up very nicely. And when we face Van Hook, we... well, there's his place now. Yeah, here's his driveway. Well, either he's skipped out or he's asleep. No lights on in the place. Well, if you ask me, he's far... No, no, wait. Yeah? The third window on the right. The blind was pulled away for a second or two. Well, then let's get out of this car. We're sitting ducks in here. Well, how about it, Sergeant? What do we do? You boys split up. Cover the back and sides of the house. He's in there? Yeah. Okay, boys. Come on. Hey, Johnny, maybe you better keep out of this. Are you kidding? I'm... Hey, listen. That car door, I'm sure of it. Yeah, I know. Holy... What's he up to? Gonna lock himself in and take the monoxide route? Come on. Are the back doors in that garage? Not that I know of. Here, wait a minute. Van Hook! This is the police! We've got men all around this place. Turn off that engine and come out of there with your hands over your head. Don't be a fool, Van Hook. You haven't got a chance. Come out of that garage. Hey, you see that? He drove right through the door of his garage. Come on, Lacey, the car. Get after him, you guys. Get moving. Yeah, come on, boys. Swiping habit. See what he did to that other patrol car? Yeah, they're okay. They're off and tailing us. Come on, step on it, Lacey. This is one time we ought to have a Cosmo Roma. Well, maybe he can outrun us, but with two cars on his tail, he may get careless, take chances. If so, yeah, hang on. Oh! Lacey, you could qualify for some of those road races yourself. That guy's out of his head. Main highway like this, full of trucks and trailers. Oh, don't worry about those guys. Those interstate truckers will give you a clear road after them. They're the best drivers in the country. Come on, hit your siren. You're right. Hey, you see, I told you those guys would give you the road. Holy... Look! The trailer in front of him! And the oncoming truck! Van Hook's trying to squeeze through! Pull up! Pull up, I will... Well, he squeezed through, all right. Squeezed right through the pearly gates. Expense account item five thirty eight dollars seventy five cents room two meals and valet service at the Casa de Paz. Item six one hundred ninety one dollars and sixty cents airfare and incidentals Palm Springs California back to Hartford. Expense account total four hundred seventy four dollars eighty four cents. Remarks. Well, justice is done in pretty strange ways sometimes. Kind of makes you think. Maybe it pays to tread the straight and narrow, doesn't it? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, international intrigue. A beautiful girl and a very clever chemist. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is written by Paul Franklin and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Barbara Eiler, Paula Winslow, Forrest Lewis, Frank Nelson, Sam Edwards, Austin Green, and Shep Mencken. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is this is George Reed. Well, nice to hear from you, George. Especially when I have no assignment. That, uh, that's fine. What's fine about it? No expense account to pay it means how do I keep the wolf in the door? Unless, of course, Floyd's of England has a case for me. Huh? Well? Uh, Johnny. Yeah? I, uh... Well, a few weeks ago, you were kidding at the time. Oh, now, George, how could I ever kid you? I'll uh, let that one go. Yeah, you better. The point is, you... Well, you rather jestingly asked me if instead of selling life insurance... Oh, no. Don't tell me. I'm afraid so. I'm afraid the company is saddled with what you might call a death insurance policy. You mean, instead of insuring somebody against dying, you've insured him against living? Yes, John. Okay, Georgie. Say no more. I'll be right over. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the hope to die matter. <laughs> Expense account item one, a dollar ten taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office, where I found him pacing the floor and wearing an even more worried expression than usual. And believe me, that's something. This thing has me so so riled up, Johnny, I can hardly see straight. Well, you should have known better than to issue a policy like that, George. I? It was Harry Baxter. Baxter? He filled in here for me while I was on vacation. I should have known better. What did he do? Sell a lot of policies that you shouldn't have to handle? No, just this one. And I swear I don't understand it. He of all people. All right, you said on the phone that it was kind of life insurance in reverse. That's exactly what it is. Explain, please. Well, usually, of course, we pay the face value of a policy when the insured dies. Right. In this case, however, the company will have to pay the $250,000 that the insured doesn't die. $250,000? Yes. How under the sun could a man be crazy enough to issue a policy like that? John, you know how it is. The company prides itself on the fact we'll insure anything. Not only life and property and health and so on, but the voice of a singer, the feet of a dancer, hands of a pianist, even the dimples on the knees of a chorus girl. Yeah, and singing mice, an old alley cat, a sick whale. Of course, I can't say that Harry wasn't in position to do it, but... Johnny, you've got to help me. First, you better tell me who and why and what it's all about. It's just the trouble. I don't know. Well, in that case, you don't know. I only got back here to the office this morning. I found our copy of the policy lying here on my desk. But if you don't even... Oh, look, I've handled some pretty screwy cases for you, George. Yes, but they've all finally made sense one way or the other. And Johnny, we have paid you some very nice fees. You can't deny that. George. Tell me, have I ever questioned your expense accounts? But death insurance, it doesn't make sense. Have I? Insuring somebody against living. Have I? I'm sorry, but this time the answer is no. Listen, if you take this on, I'll okay your expense account without even reading it. Death insurance. Expense account unlimited. Johnny? George, there are some things even a conniving, chiseling, unprincipled rascal like myself won't even... Unlimited? Johnny? Okay, George, I'll take it. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. Lloyds of England insure anything. At least that was their boast. And now it looked as though it had finally backfired on them. Because somebody in the organization, some character named Harry Baxter, had issued not life, but death insurance. If it hadn't been for my friendship for George Reed, <clears throat> well, plus his promise of unlimited expense account, I'd have thrown the whole problem right back into his face, as it was. Thanks, Johnny. From the bottom of my heart, I'll never forget you for this. Believe me, George, I'll never forget you for this. And if you can get us off the hook... All I can do is try, so come on, give me the dope on it. Yes. Now, here. The name of the insured is Miss Mary Ellen Markham. Uh, Yeah, I got it. Where does she live? 514 East 52nd Street, New York City. Uh, Pretty fancy address. Yes. 
Okay. Now tell me why this Mary Ellen has insured herself against living. Well, that's the point, Johnny. She hasn't. Well, now wait a minute. You, Albert Schwinner has. You mean somebody else took out this policy on her life? Or rather death? Yes. Holy... Well, what is this guy, a professional gunsel who's going to wipe her out and then collect? I suppose he's the beneficiary, too. Yes, he is. Oh, fine. Well, come on, who is... I don't know. As I told you, the policy was lying here on my desk when I got back this morning. I do know this much about him. It's Dr. Albert Schwinner. Doctor? What kind? Well, those are the things you've got to find out. Who he is, what he is, why he's bought insurance against this woman's living beyond November 10th. The 10th? Well, that's only a few days from now. Oh, George, this gets worse and worse. Well, if only Harry Baxter hadn't issued that policy. But he has. Oh, boy, you sure picked a dilly to fill in for you while you were away. Picked him? What else could I do? After all, he never did anything like this before. You've known him before? Are you serious? Of course I have. Why, Harry? Back all right, now look. Times are wasting and we haven't got much of it. I take it you want me to see if I can find some legal grounds for canceling this policy. Yes, immediately. Now, have you got an address on the beneficiary, this uh, Dr. Schwinner? No, I've been so upset about this whole thing, I haven't even looked. Yeah, let me see. According to this, he lives at... Hmm. What's the matter? Dr. Albert W. Schwinner... C.L. C.L.? What kind of a doctor is that? I don't know. The address is 14327 E Street, Union City, New Jersey. C.L. Well, I'll soon find out. Where can I reach this uh, Harry Baxter who sold the policy? In New York at the... Uh, here, I'll jot down the address. I still don't see how Baxter could get away with this. Well, after all, when you consider his position... Here. He offered no explanation at all. Well, I'm afraid I didn't give him much chance. I practically threw him out of here. Oh, I can't say that I blame you. And that's another thing. Look, Johnny, perhaps you can reason with... Oh, don't worry, George. He's number one on my calling list. I'll be talking to you. <laughs> Expense account item 2785, fare to New York and taxi to Harry Baxter's address. A real snooty one over near Sutton Place. And people don't live in that joint unless they've earned or chiseled a lot of money from somewhere. In the case of Baxter, I suspected a big chisel. My suspicion was considerably heightened when he opened the door. His apartment was luxury from stem to stern. As for Baxter himself... Dollar? Well, of course, old boy. I've heard a great deal about you from my dear friend and colleague, George Reed. Dear friend, huh? Well, you say that as though you doubted it. Oh, I know, that filling in for him while he was away, well... I really should have done better for the old thing, but I've had so many social obligations to meet these past few months, and after all, one must keep up with those things. Oh, I'm sure one must. Well, I did sell one policy, you know, a real dilly. Ah, oh, that's the understatement of the week. I suppose I can't really blame him for being a bit excited about it, but he gave me no chance to explain why I issued the policy. Why did you? Oh, now, really? Well... Well, I made it very clear to George that I would tell him when he calms down enough to be reasonable. Really, Mr. Dollar, he was in quite a tizzy. Brother, he still is. That's why he sent for me. But when he calms down, he'll be sorry he bothered you. Suppose you tell me why you issued that policy. You? No. What? No, I'll tell George when he's ready and when I'm ready. Oh, now, just a minute. And you may tell George I said exactly that. Goodbye, Dollar. You'll tell me, Baxter, right now. I'll do nothing of the sort. And what's more, since my plane for Europe is leaving shortly, I have no time to do, to, to... Would you kindly remove your foot from the door? Not until I get an answer from you. Now start talking. If you can show some legal cause... Legal why... cause? Furthermore, your behavior at the moment constitutes trespass, illegal entry, you know, call it what you like. And believe me, unless you leave here immediately, I shan't hesitate to ring up the police. All right, all right. Now look, just tell me one thing. I might. What? What is your connection with the beneficiary of this policy? Dr. Schwinner. That's right, Albert Schwinner. But Albert happens to be a very close. Personal friend. Oh, I might have guessed as much. All right, then tell me this. No, I'm sorry, just one question. I've given the answer. Goodbye. Hi, sir. Are you hard of hearing? Look I here now. Goodbye. Well, there was no point in trying to batter down the door of Harry Baxter's apartment, so I left. Downstairs in the lobby, I put in a phone call. That's item 355 cents to George Reed's office in Hartford. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but he seems to have stepped out for a few minutes. Oh, well, uh, then please tell him when he gets back that I want a complete rundown on Harry Baxter. Well, that shouldn't be difficult. Right. Having hired him, George shouldn't have much trouble getting that for me. Well, that isn't what I meant, Mr. Dollar. 
dollar. As a matter of fact, I think I can tell you just Now, let George do it. I'll call him back. Item 4, 65 cents taxi to Mary Ellen Markham's apartment on East 52nd Street. A uniformed nurse met me at the door, told me I could stay with Miss Markham only a very short time, then led me into the bedroom. And there, carefully propped up in bed, lay a pale, wan, tired woman who looked to be 65 or 70. The room was full of flowers. You may leave us, Mrs. Haskell. I'll ring when I need you. Yes, Miss Markham. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I'm sorry. I won't be able to speak with you very long. But as you can see... Yes, yes, I can, of course. I'll get right to the point. You must know, I'm sure, that someone has just taken out a policy on your... Well, an insurance policy on you. Yes. And you're so smart. And so... And so helpful with Harry Baxter. Oh. You see, I am suffering from a rare, incurable disease of the blood. I'm sorry. I don't have long to live. A few days, perhaps. A few weeks at the most. Excuse me. This is such an effort. Well, you, you're getting the best of care, I trust. Yes. It's the very best. Now, now, what do you wish to know? You know a Dr. Albert Schwinner, don't you? I have known Albert for many years. He's been great friends. Then why does he take out a policy that, well, that indicates he hopes that you'll die? Hopes? I'll die? Yes. What else could it be? Oh, you don't understand. Don't you see? Schwinner has bought insurance against your living beyond November 10th. Yes. Yes. My 50th birthday. You mean to say you're... The reason... The reason so. Yes? I'm sorry. You you mustn't. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. Yes, Yes. But just one more thing. Your doctor... The doctor who's taking care of you. Albert. Albert? This same Dr. Schwinner? Yes. Now. Now you must leave. of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. The little that Mary Ellen Markham had been able to tell me left me more puzzled than ever. I've never been given such a runaround in my life, deliberate or otherwise. But I didn't dare tax her strength further, so I left. Item five, another 55 cents for another call to George Reed in Hartford. This time he was in. Yes, Johnny, I must confess I'm calmed down a bit, but the first shock of learning that Mr. Baxter had issued that seemingly absurd policy... What do you mean, seemingly absurd? George's whole thing has been a tizzy, now a double-barreled one. Well, I tried to call Mr. Baxter a few minutes ago, but got no answer. I wanted to apologize, of course. Apologize? After all, since he's chairman of the board... Chairman of what board? The company, this company... What? I tried to tell you that this morning, but you didn't give me a chance. Harry Baxter is also the majority stockholder. Oh, brother. In any event, as I'm sure you can see, he must have had some good reason for that policy. And as soon as I can get him by phone... You won't. What? He just left for Europe. Where? I don't know, and right now I don't care. But if I can't contact him, Johnny, I don't dare cancel this policy until I've talked to him. And if Miss Markham should die before the 10th... Yeah, 250 G. You've got to carry on. Would you like to tell me how... If Mary Ellen Markham dies on or before November 10th, Floyd's of England pays Dr. Albert Schwinner $250,000 on a policy taken out by him. And he is her doctor with her life in his hands. And if there isn't something wrong with that setup, Expense account item six, eight dollars for a taxi to Schwinner's address in Union City, New Jersey. And there at last, I learned what the CL meant behind his name. 
It was an abbreviation, for this was the Albert Schwinner Clinic, devoted to the study of rare diseases of the blood. But Schwinner wasn't there. He'd gone to New York to see Miss Markham. Item seven, ten dollars even for a fast taxi ride back there to Manhattan. As the nurse led me into the unfortunate woman's apartment, he was just coming out of the bedroom door. Oh, Dr. Schwinner, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar, Harry Baxter told me I might expect you. Oh, he did, huh? Yes, he phoned me just before his plane took off for Europe. Pretty smart. You're an insurance investigator, aren't you? That is right. Oh, you may go in to see Miss Markham now, Mrs. Haskell. Very well, Doctor. How is Miss Markham, Doctor? Much better, thank God. Oh, why do you say that? What? If she dies before this week is out, you stand to collect a cool quarter of a million, don't you? I? No, the clinic. Isn't that the same thing? Hardly. Uh, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Now, you're concerned about the rather unorthodox insurance policy that Mr. Baxter issued. I certainly am. I think you'd better let me tell you the reason for it. I think you'd better. At the onset of her illness some 15 years ago, the best doctors in the country gave her five years to live at the most. And that's when you came into the picture? Yes. Because of the devotion, the concentration of all our efforts to this one field of medicine, the clinic was able for the first time to give her hope. Her hope was justified. We have given her years of life. But now, wait a minute, Doctor. She told us then that if she could be helped to live until she was 50... And that'll be on the 10th. Yes. That would prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that our methods, our practices were right. That we could prolong and possibly ultimately save not only her own, but thousands, perhaps millions of lives. Therefore, she agreed that if she reached 50, she would make an outright gift of $250,000 to the clinic and its work. Money which is much needed, by the way. But then it began to look as though she might never reach 50. Yes. And she suggested this unusual insurance policy. On her death, rather than on her life. I see. But why Harry Baxter, chairman of the board of the insurance company, its biggest stockholder, whatever... I don't get it. Baxter's own mother died of the same disease, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Of course. Then... He knew how necessary this money is to the clinic. Yes. And let's face it, Baxter is something of uh, an eccentric. And that's the reason he chose this... this offbeat way to make sure you get the financial help you need. Exactly. Then, if I try to get this policy canceled... A great many lives in the future may depend on its remaining in force. Of course, if you feel it your duty. Doctor, my duty as I see it is to do just exactly nothing. Mary Ellen Markham did live to see 50, but only for a few days. Just long enough to make her gift to the clinic. Harry Baxter and the company? Well... Harry came back from Europe, and he said he found some, quote, mistake, unquote, in the policy that requires the company to pay off on it anyway. <laughs> Eccentric? We should have more of them like that. Expense account total? Are you kidding? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Columbia Broadcasting System presents Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he's just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar. To home office, Honesty Life Insurance Underwriters, Terminal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Austin Farnsworth, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the investigation of policyholder Milfred Brooks III for your company. Expense account item one. 75 cents. Cab fare to your office in answer to your original hurry call. Tip to driver, one dollar. Expense account item two. 25 cents. Shoe shine. You remember, I got my shoes scuffed when I unsuspectingly walked through the private door to your office. Dollar. Hey, grab him. He's trying to jump out that window. Let's let go. Get him. I'll show you. Oh, no, you don't. Hey, let go, you fool. Get away. Oh. Had a nice try, sonny boy. Now pay attention to Fisher. No. Class dismissed. Well, Mr. Farnsworth, why didn't you tell me what you had waiting for me? I'd have worn my boxing gloves. Dollar, this was all a complete surprise to me. Well, just in case your little chum on the floor there wakes up in a hurry, I think I'll close the window. Now. My goodness, Dollar, what are you doing? I'm sitting on his head. I don't care if this guy tries killing himself again. I just don't want him to try and kill me. After all, we haven't even been introduced. Dollar... That happens to be one of our largest policyholders. His life is insured with this company in the amount of $2 million. Oh, now I can see why you're so anxious to keep him from putting a dent in the sidewalk. Precisely. He'd also put quite a dent in your company's bank account. By the way, Dollar, aren't you in danger of smothering the boy sitting on his head that way? Maybe. Now, tell me, what's this guy's name and what's his story? That, sir, is Milford Brooks III. As I said, we have him insured for $2 million. His mother and father left him with a paid-up policy for the sole purpose of enabling his heirs to pay the inheritance taxes on his estate when he dies. Unfortunately, due to the kind of life he's been leading, Brooks not only hasn't any heirs, he hasn't any money. He blew all his cash? That's right. Now he's trying to get some out of us by threatening to kill himself. And that policy pays off on suicide. In a mortuary, he'd uh, be a millionaire, huh? Please, Dollar. Sorry, go on. One half hour ago... Milford walked into this office and changed the beneficiary in his policy. When that was done, he proceeded to demand, not request, mind you, $500,000 in cash. Oh, I'll say that's quite a touch. When I explained to him that there was no loan provision in his insurance policy, he threatened suicide. He said I could either give him the half million cash or pay off the two million on his policy. So all you have to do is to keep him alive. And he's managed to make that no small problem. The man he named as his new beneficiary, just before he made his demand for the cash, is... Well... It's downright frightening. Why? Who is it? One of the most notorious gamblers in the East. His name is Hatcher. Harold Hatcher. Oh. <laughs> you know him? Yeah. Say, that kid's been a post office pinup boy for a lot of years. Well, there's the situation, Dollar. I'm engaging you to protect Milford Brooks' future. Yeah, what there is of it. The way this lad operates, you think he had but two lives to give for his country. He's not only set himself up to get knocked off by somebody else, he's just dying to do the job himself. Well, it just means that you'll have to work twice as hard. Oh, it also means something else. What's that? That you'll have to pay me twice as much money. Oh, you'll get your money. The situation demands sacrifice, I'm afraid. But protect the boy, Dollar. Give him something to live for, an interest in life. An interest in life, huh? Let's see. I know. Here, this should help. What's that you've got there? It's what's commonly referred to in the more successful bachelor circles as my little black book. Now, let's see. Um, Ruby? No, her favorite expression is drop dead. Um, uh, Bernadine? No, she'd be the new beneficiary by midnight. Oh, here's one. Here. Butter. Butter? Hey, Farnsworth, would you mind passing me that phone, the one with the long cord? No, no, not at all. <sighs> My little friend here is showing signs of life. Here, here you are. Maybe you should let him breathe a bit more. Ah, uh, don't worry. He'll be all right. Hello? Hello, I want to call New York. Person to person. Miss Theodora Butts. Yeah, that's right. And you'll get her at Hudson 2-4292. Dollar, 
You're not thinking of taking this boy to New York, are you? Well, I'm going there myself, and you want me to keep an eye on him, don't you? Don't fret, Farnsworth. All is not lost. Well, you do worry me sitting on his head that way. Hello? Hello, Butter? Butter, this is Johnny Dollar. I'll be in town, and I don't want to see you. Look, here's what I want you to do. Yes, yes, this is all right to say over the telephone. I want you to reserve a table at the hatchery in my name for 10 o'clock tonight. Will you do that? Okay, I'll see you in a few hours. Huh? But I can't make it any earlier. I'm sitting up on a sick friend. Okay, goodbye. I'm not sure that I agree with your methods. Oh! What's the matter, Dollar? Did he hit you? Hit me? No, he bit me. Expense account, item three. Liquor, $18. Keeping Milford Brooks the third peaceful seemed to be the immediate problem, and a bottle of rare old brandy seemed to be the immediate answer. I poured most of it into him, loaded him into my car, and we headed for New York. As we passed through New Haven, he opened one eye, looked up, saw the Yale Bowl, and gave three cheers for old Eli. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. (laughs) Old Yale would sure be proud of you. Why anybody would want to insure you for $2 million is more than I can figure. Yeah, well, my daddy loved me very much, and my mother loved me very much. Not only that, but I love somebody very much. And not only that, but I hate somebody very much. Hey, you want to know something? Huh. Next to one other guy, I hate you most of anybody else. Here, yeah, lover boy, it's cocktail hour again. Time for your bottle. <laughs> Rolling along the Merritt Parkway, I felt very much alone with my own thoughts. And believe me, they weren't very pleasant company. The way it stacked up for me, Brooks had built up a fat gambling debt to Harold Hatcher and had been forced to make him his beneficiary. The suicide threat that he was holding over Honesty Insurance Company was a little tougher to figure, unless he was trying to finance a trip for himself to get away from the man with a custom-tailored murder motive, Hatcher. My hungry little mind nibbled away on those unsavory morsels of food for thought all the way to Butter's apartment. Hey, where are you taking me? I want to go to New York. If you don't behave, Buster, I'll punch your ticket. Johnny, darling, welcome to New York. Fastest trip I ever made. Quiet. Well, where did you find this? In a box of Cracker Jacks. Come on, let me in. Oh, I don't know about you, Johnny. Some men bring me flowers and some bring me candy. What do you bring me, a boiled owl in a Brooks Brothers suit? Oh, I'm pleased to meet you. My name is Brooks, but I haven't got any brothers. Lucky them. Fix the pillows on the couch, will you? I'd look more at home in the bathtub. Oh, come on, Buster. Lie down. Oh, I'm charmed. Thank you. All right, this kid's liquor sure can hold him. He's passed out. How long have you been playing nursemaid to this bottle, baby? Leave me into the bar, sweet. Let's get away from this buzzsaw, and I'll tell you all about it. Sure, come along. Horrible examples don't seem to bother you, do they? If you knew how that guy's been bothering me. What did you do to him? Oh, let's just say he put the bite on me. Ah, the river sure does look pretty tonight. Like a brandy? Well, anything but. I've been sniffing that second hand all the way from Hartford. Oh, make it a bow root beer. Hey, butter. See that big boat out there? Mm-hmm. Oh, I sure would like to be on it with you. Sailing off to faraway romantic places. (laughs) Get with it, darling. That's the 125th Street Ferry. (laughs) Here's your root beer. Come on now. Tell Butter all about it. First things first. Now that I've got a dad's old-fashioned root beer, how about giving me one of Mom's new-fashioned kisses? And then I'll tell you all about it. Mm. A few seconds later, I proceeded to tell her all about it, and it wasn't easy. Everything about her kept flagging down my train of thought. She was a sympathetic listener to my story until I gave her the answer to her first and only question. Where do I fit into all this? Well, baby, I thought you understood. My job is to give the poor, misguided boy something to live for. That's you. Well, <laughs> he should live what? so long. Now, butter, wait a minute. Well, don't butter me. Now, don't, don't, don't get excited now. You misunderstand. I really mean it. I thought if he, he just got a look at you, realized that things like you exist, you'd make any man glad to be alive. If you can't stand it, I'll take him away. But I sure need you, Butter. Come on, baby. Melt a little. I wouldn't let you get hurt. You know that. 
Did I hurt you? No, I'm getting used to it. People have been taking pokes at me all day. I'm sorry. Oh, that's better. Want some more root beer? Uh Uh-uh. I want some more of you. How about another kiss? Well, help yourself. Darn. I'll get it, Johnny. Okay, and if a man man, man answers, hang up, will you? Don't worry. Hello. Yes, this is Hudson 24292. Well, that depends. Who's calling? Oh, just a moment. Uh, It's for you, Johnny, of Mr. Farnsworth. Huh? Oh, okay, I'll take it. Thanks. Say, uh, while I'm talking, be a good girl, will you? And take a look at Milford in the other room. And while you're at it, get me in the root beer, huh? Oh, sure. The service is good around here. Hello, Farnsworth? Yes, Dollar. I'm glad I got you. How'd you get this number? It's the one you called from my office. I remembered it. I have a photographic mind. I hope you haven't got a picture of what I'm thinking. What do you want? I want to know how Milford is. I mean, is he still alive? Of course he's alive. Good, good. Do you suppose I could talk to him? I mean, do you think he'll talk to me? Well, the last time I saw him, he was sound asleep. I'll take a look. Hold the phone. A butter. Oh, butter! Hey, butter! Hello, Farnsworth? Yes, yes. Do you have any aspirin there at your house? Why, of course, Dollar. Why? Well, you better take a handful. Milford Brooks III just took a powder. I'll call you back. You let anything happen to him and you'll need the aspirin. I've already got a headache. When Milford left, he took my girl with him. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, we want to remind you that it was 437 years ago next Sunday, the famed Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon began his search for the Fountain of Youth. By sheer coincidence, the man who's still looking for it, Jack Benny, will be heard on CBS next Sunday at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. And now, back to Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Well, nobody could say I wasn't working fast. I had only been in town for an hour, and I had already succeeded in not only losing your $2 million baby, Milford Brooks III, Mr. Farnsworth, but in losing my million dollar baby, Theodora Butts. I tried to put myself in Milford Brooks' $40 shoes, but they wouldn't fit. You can't outthink a maniac. The best I could do was figure either that he was on his way to commit suicide, or that Harold Hatcher, the man who now stood to collect two million bucks in the event of Milford's death, had snatched him out of Butter's apartment. With birds of that type flocking together, Butter stood a good chance of being a dead duck. I spent an hour unsuccessfully shaking down the neighborhood for them. I questioned cab drivers, harness bulls, bartenders. Then I decided to ask for help from higher up. And I don't mean that I said a prayer. Expense account, item four. Five cents. Phone call. Police headquarters. Give me missing persons. Any particular one? Don't be a wise guy. Lieutenant Fisher. Yes, sir. Hello, Dollar. What did you lose? Uh, Practically everybody. Let's start with a girl. Theodora Butts. You mean you lost your girl? (laughs) Why don't you call Dorothy Dix? Don't waste time being clever. Just check your reports, will you? Hold on. Buddington. Bumpus. Byers. Nope. Nothing on her, Dollar. Okay, well, uh, try this one. Brooks, Milford III. Bullseye. Brooks, Milford III. He hasn't been reported missing, and we haven't found him yet. But, uh, we think we know where he is. Oh, this kind of a question I always hate to ask. Where? The Hudson River. At 11.15 tonight, his top coat, complete with identification, was found taking a ride on the 125th Street Ferry. Anything else? Mm, Nothing much. Package of matches was found under the coat, monogram. Uh, You don't happen to know anybody whose initials are H.H., do you? H.H.? Well, as always, Horace Height. Thanks, Fisher. I'll check back with you later. I'll be here. Expense account, item five. Nightclubs, $28. Harold Hatcher's hatchery was in a cellar under a hotel, but the prices were high enough to raid a penthouse. The club was draped in too much satin, its lady customers in too little. 
The decor was French provincial, music Brazilian, and the food was nowhere. The drinks looked weak and the waiters looked strong. All in all, the joint was a sight for sore eyes, for making them sore. The only pretty thing in the place was a blonde. She came strolling up to my table, her hips unconsciously sending subtle little messages back to the rumba band. She opened her mouth, slit her tongue over her lower lip, and let a few warm, soft words slide out. Looking for someone? Oh, well, you'll do until the real thing comes along. Sit down. Thanks. Uh, no, I won't have a drink. My name is Janelle. I understand you were asking about Mr. Hatcher. Yeah, you know him? More than somewhat. Are you uh, Mrs. Hatcher by any chance? I might be. Does that mean you might admit it or that you might talk him into it someday? I'll ignore that. What do you want to see him about? A mutual friend, Milford Brooks. I know most of the quiet clothes boys around here, so you aren't a cop. You don't look like the type to be a society friend of the Brooks family. So what are you? I'll ignore that. Is uh, Hatcher around? He might be. Oh, come on now. Where is his office? At the top of the stairs in the back. Can I expect any trouble getting in? <laughs> you act like you just saw a B picture. Harold is doing his best to act like an honest businessman these nights. You won't have any trouble. How do you know? Because Harold sent me down here to look you over. I think you're all right. Oh, so I've won myself the good housekeeping seal of approval, huh? Keeping house with you would meet with my approval. I ran for my life. I had a slow walk across the dance floor, edged my way through a cluster of tables, and went up the back stairs. When I located the door to Hatcher's office, I knocked once and went in. Come on in. Thanks. I'm Johnny Dollar. I've been hired by Honesty Life Insurance Underwriters to protect the interest of a guy named Milford Brooks III. What's that supposed to mean to me? You know him, don't you? Well, he isn't exactly one of my boozing buddies. How much money does he owe you? We've got him on the books for a few grand. Why? They picked up his top coat tonight on the 125th Street Ferry. He wasn't in it. It might have been a suicide, or it might have been a knockover made to look like a suicide. What's your choice? Where do you get off asking me to make a choice? Where were you around 11.30 tonight? What's it to you? I don't know. I just thought you might like to rehearse a few answers. The law will be asking you some questions real soon now. I don't know why I should tell you, but I was driving around in my car getting some air. Uh, you better do better than that. They found a match folder under Brooks' coat. It had your initials on it. You're out of your mind. The guy owed me a couple hundred thousand. You think I'm going around knocking off my own assets? I don't know whether you're stupid or bright, Hatcher. Don't worry about it. I know. What about that insurance policy? What insurance policy? Now, look, Hatcher, we're big boys now. We both know that changing the beneficiary of an insurance policy is a legal transaction. That means witnesses. That means it isn't secret. You mind telling me what you're trying to say? That you and the Honesty Insurance Company and I all know that Brooks made you the beneficiary in his policy and that you stand to come into two million bucks when they fish out his body. I don't know anything about it. Motives don't come much bigger. I'm telling you, this is all news to me. You or nobody else is going to move me off that story. I feel the same about mine. It doesn't take a genius to know that Brooks didn't love you two million dollars worth. There's only one logical reason for his making you the beneficiary that I can see. You forced him into it. Who'd believe anything else? Who cares? They'd have to prove it. And, brother, that can't be done. Now, how would you like... Wait a minute. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, okay, Rocky. Thanks for the news. Dollar, did you turn me in? Oh, they're here, huh? Yeah. No, I didn't turn you in. What's the matter? You got a good story, Hatcher? You're not worried, are you? Here, have a cigarette. Thanks. Oh, I got like. Oh, worked the first time. Yeah. Nope, I'm not worried. I'll be out in 48 hours. You'll be lucky if you're out in 48 years. Okay, boys, come on in. The homicide boys invited Hatcher down to headquarters. He accepted and invited them down to the bar for a no-hard-feelings drink. They accepted. I walked back down the stairs into the club. The place hadn't changed... Same stale customers, the same stale music, same stale air. And the same lovely Janelle sitting at the same unlovely table. Hello. How'd you make out? Oh, I left before they started playing 20 questions. But I wouldn't worry. You've got a smart boy in the bar there. In some ways, maybe. What'd he hand you? A big round zero. Wouldn't talk, huh? About what? Oh, just a little doodad. A $2 million life insurance policy. Wait a minute. That young Brooks kid? Yeah, that's right. Oh, I knew it. 
I tried to tell him, but he wouldn't listen to me. Tried to tell who what? Hatcher. Did he get into trouble about that policy? It just looks funny, him being made the beneficiary. You knew about it, huh? I suppose you also know what was behind it. Sure, Melford owed him some money. A lot of money. It's in writing. What kind of writing? It's a personal note that Brooks was going to get back if he made Harold beneficiary. It's up in his office. Hey, you must be awful close to Hatcher. I'm the close, friendly type. I'll have that drink now. You've earned it, beautiful. She had earned it, and I had a hunch as to why. If ever I saw a gal busy putting the skids under her boyfriend, she was. Even if she helped send him up on a murder rap, I would have bet a quick 50 that she'd tipped him to the police. It's happened before if the boyfriend is the murdering type, and it's a nice, neat, legal method of disposal. Janelle led me back up the stairs and into Hatcher's office. I sent her back down to watch the bar to divert Hatcher in case he decided he'd forgotten something. Brooks's personal note made out to the gambler was easy to find, lying neatly in the middle of the top desk drawer. But I found something even more interesting when I went through his wardrobe closet. I began to see a glimmer of light. And then, encouraged by not too much thinking on my part, it turned into a veritable bonfire, which I hoped wouldn't be too hot for me to handle. Did you find everything? Honey, if I were a judge, I'd be ready to sentence a guilty party. Good. Oh, uh, waiter, the check. Where are you going, to the police? Bright girl. I'll see you later. Expense account, item six. Cab fare, one dollar. Tip to driver, one dollar. Once out of the hatchery, I walked to the corner, got into a taxi, and waited. In just a few minutes, my favorite suspect came out of the club, jumped into a taxi, and the chase was on. We nuzzled our way through the traffic over to 2nd Avenue and headed downtown. Then he took a right turn on 45th Street over to Lexington and headed uptown. But they didn't lose us. At 72nd, the cab ahead turned right and pulled to a stop. My driver was on his toes, and his toes were on his brake. We stopped, too, half a block behind. You want I should wait? No, oh, here you are. Keep the change. It was a garage that belonged to a residence on a parallel street a block away. I made out a for sale sign on one of the big doors. The living quarters upstairs were dark enough to look interesting, so I indulged in a bit of genteel breaking and entering. Entering that old barn didn't take much breaking. I crept up the stairs. They sounded like they were left over from an old ghost story. And so did the first voice I heard when I stopped, halfway up. So we've got to be careful. Especially about that Johnny Dollar. Are you sure he didn't follow you? That voice sounded awful dry to be coming from a guy who supposedly had spent most of the night snoozing on the bottom of the Hudson River. It was Milford Brooks III. Get up on your feet, Brooks. Now, wait a minute. No. I started this thing slugging you. I might as well finish it the same way. Leave him alone. He's mine. Pull in the claws, Angel, and sit on his lap. Oh, oh you... You Connecticut hick, I'll... I'll kill you. Look, I'm the last guy in the world who enjoys physical violence. Give or take. But believe me, you two are coming mighty close to changing my whole character. Now settle down before I really lose my head. Get off of me. Uh, I should have known better than to get mixed up with a low-class nobody like you. Cut. We've pushed the lady around enough, Brooks. Tell me to be careful. Why didn't you think of that before you let him here? Wipe your nose, big boy. Now, uh, don't you get go getting fat-headed gorgeous. Neither one of you is exactly what I'd call a mastermind. When you planted that match folder underneath the top coat on the ferry boat, you both should have been more careful. Huh. You think so? You bet I think so. If I were planning a piece of evidence to incriminate Mr. Harold Hatcher, I would have left a cigarette lighter. I found one in the pocket of every suit he owns back there in his closet in the club. It wasn't hard to figure out that that guy never carries a book of matches. What do you want? I'm only interested in one thing, saving the insurance company $2 million. And Buster, I think you've done it for me. Wait, look, Dollar. This is insurance fraud. It has been ever since you put on that fake suicide attempt. Trying to extort 500,000 bucks out of the company for you and Janelle. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Dollar. So much for the company. Now, something a little more personal and a little more serious. Where is my girl? Well, she's, she's all right, Dollar. I, I couldn't help it. I had to get out of that apartment. She caught me leaving. I had to take her with me. Where is she? she... 
Well, I, I didn't mean to hurt her. I was afraid she'd yell. Oh, you miserable... Well, I'll little... tell you where she is, Dollar. I put her in a cab and sent her to the emergency hospital. Get up. Oh, no. No, Dollar, please, please. I'll let me give explain. you the beating Wait yell. Harold! Hatcher! You had your fun, Dollar. Now I want mine. How did you get here? New York City, world's most efficient police force, remember? When they think maybe a guy's jumped off a ferry boat and nobody's seen him do it, they check the turnstile counters at each end. In the case of Brooks here, as many people got off that boat as got on. Yeah, that makes sense. They'd hardly hold a guy for murder just because somebody else lost a top coat. How'd you know we were here? You know me, Janelle. You never go any place that I don't know about. Okay, Brooks, you felt like explaining. Now I feel like listening. Get it up. I... I don't know what you mean. I know what you mean, Hatcher. One, he gave you a big, fat $2 million motive for murder. And two, he did his best to make it look like you did murder him with that broken-down match cover plant on the ferry boat. Why? Well, they wanted to get rid of you and live happily ever after. The big mistake they made was in trying to shake the insurance company down for some ready cash. And you, baby. Harold, You please. put him up to it, didn't you, you cheap little muscler? No, Harold! Calm down, Hatcher. You don't need a gun around here. They're tame. You don't know me very well, Dollar. I'm going to teach all of you amateurs a lesson. How these things are really done. Come on, Brooks. No, 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 Hatcher. You can have everything I've got. For a second, it looked like Hatcher was going to take everything. But I hadn't gone that far to see Brooks knocked off with me as a witness. Hey, maybe I wasn't going to be a witness. Maybe I was going to be a victim, too. When that thought hit me, that's when I flew across the room and hit Hatcher on a do-or-die flying tackle from behind. Hatcher went down shooting. I went down kicking, and a lucky boot knocked the gun out of his hand. I beat him to it and swung it straight into his skull. Oh. Half the people in the room were lying there bleeding. Brooks from a gunshot, Hatcher from the gun butt. Janelle and I both stood there panting. But believe me, not for each other. We well, stood that way until the police arrived. <laughs> Johnny, I hate being in the hospital, but I look awful. Butter, honey, you look lovely in white. This patch on my head? Johnny, they had to cut a big hunk of my hair off to put in the stitches. Oh, that awful man. Well, if it'll make you feel any better, baby, that awful man got taken care of. He's upstairs in the same hospital. Oh, Johnny, you didn't show No, Butter, I didn't have to. Harold Hatcher saved me the trouble. They don't know yet whether Mr. Brooks is going to live or die, but it doesn't make much difference to me or to the insurance company. He signed a statement admitting attempted fraud. Serves him right hitting a lady on the head. Oh, Johnny, what am I going to do? My hair will look awful. It'll take months for it to grow out. Now, don't worry, Butter. I'll buy you something to cover it up. I know a guy over on Fifth Avenue who claims he makes something that looks prettier on a woman's head than her hair. <laughs> Expense account, item seven. Six hundred and forty dollars. Ladies' hats. To cover the lump on ladies' head. Expense account item eight, twenty dollars. Tip to nurse for reminding Butter on the hour, every hour, that accidents will happen. Expense account item nine, seven dollars. Mileage driving back to Hartford. Expense account total, eleven hundred eighty-two dollars and twenty-three cents. Which you may say, Mister Farnsworth, is a lot of money for one man to spend in a day and a half. But you must bear in mind that the amount at stake was two million dollars, and you know the price of stake these days. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Listen in again next week when CBS brings you yours truly, Johnny Dollar, with Charles Russell as Johnny. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd, with music by Mark Warno, and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Get out of bed and get your gumshoes on, Johnny. You're going to be busy. Who's this? Ed Bonner, and I'm calling you from Hartford. Heard you were in Boston this week. Get over to the Elwood Paper Department store right away. Oh, call me 
me later, Ed, would you? It's still 8 o'clock Look, in the morning. Look, we got $300,000 worth of liability insurance on their fur department. Sure, sure, later. Now they haven't got a fur department anymore. Just had 85 minks stolen. What? Edmund O'Brien, in another transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to... Mr. Ed Bonner, Mutual Liability Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during investigation of burglary affecting policy issued to Elwood Faber Department Store, Boston, Massachusetts, or the 85 Little Minks. Expense account, item, $1.90, taxi fare to Stewart Street entrance of Elwood Faber Department Store, where a police emergency ambulance was standing open. Two police officers were helping a man in a white coat load a blanket-wrapped figure onto the ambulance litter. I got my first information from the intern. Ah, huh, what's up? Oh, I didn't work the wagon. I pick up where everything else left off. This guy's name's Cronin. He's a night watchman here. Dead? Oh, about an inch away. We already gave him a transfusion upstairs. If the bullets don't kill him, the exposure will. What does that mean? Besides holes in his chest, he's also got frostbite. Somebody plugged him, let him lay in the cold storage vault where they keep the furs. How long ago? Oh, who knows? All right, Percy, wind it up. Let's get out of here. Come on. A sordid group of reporters and cameramen seemed to be converging toward a freight elevator just inside the store entrance. I converged with them, and we all rode up to the fifth floor where two plainclothesmen from burglary detail stopped us. I showed my ID card, argued for five minutes, and finally got a frown and a thumb jerk. I walked across 35 yards of expensive carpeting through a cubbyhole office door into a large room. Standing in front of a huge refrigerated vault was a tall man in a black Stetson. His name was Delaney. We shook hands. Quite a thing, Dollar. Some guys walked out of here last night with 85 mink coats. It's a mess. You got a cigarette? Yeah, sure. Here you are. Thanks. The store's going to be closed all day while the burglary squad goes over it with everything they got. You can do what you have to do, too. Thanks, Lieutenant. I appreciate that. What do you figure? Freight elevator or stairs? Either or both. I don't know. They must have had a panel truck or a big limo in that alley. Yeah, I noticed that on my way up. We'd keep any car hidden from the street, and they'd be able to work without being bothered. I got a man coming down to check for tire tracks, but it won't do any good. Whoever they were, they did it quiet, and they did it neat. Neat? Yeah. Quiet? Uh, you mean that night watchman, Cronin? Well, there must have been some noise when he walked into them and got shot. Uh, I hope he lives to tell us something. He's in tough shape. How about this? The vault? Just like the banks have, only smaller. And they can also hang meat in it. Not pried or blasted or cut into, just plain old-fashioned tumble work. Sandpapered fingers and all. That huh? wouldn't surprise me. Somebody was plenty good. Not even marks of a jimmy or pry tool to feel an edge. Just picked and plucked as nice as you please, and 14 little tumblers fell back. And the door swung open. I thought that kind of thing stopped with Jimmy Valentine. Yeah, so did I. Who reported it? A guy named Dmitri Stroganov, manager of the fur department. Come on. He's in his office now giving a statement to a couple of my boys. You can have a listen in. Oh, I can say I asked you, gentlemen, that I just hope... There's your pigeon, darling. How could such things happen to Dmitry Stroganoff? Aha! Lieutenant Delahanne. Uh, (laughs) Mr. Stroganoff, this is Mr. Dollar. He represents your insurance company. Oh, oh, your acquaintanceship, Mr. Dollar, above all else I am glad to make. Aha! 85 mean coats valued at $300,000. Coin of the realm. You have, of course, brought check for sale. Yes? Uh, No. What? The adjuster will do that, Mr. Stroganoff. I'm an investigator, but don't worry, you... Week by week, month by month, 14 years, I get two words from the insurance company. Two words, pay premium. Now it's Stroganoff's turn to say back his two words. Pay Stroganoff. Believe me, Mr. Stroganoff, your money's waiting for you in a vault in a bank in Hartford where nobody can get it but you. Waltz, ba, ba, pa. Uh, Suppose you go right on with your statement, Mr. Stroganoff. Uh, We have to have it, you know. Why is my aid for mink in this direction? I answer you. Customer telephones Friday. Send over mink coat right away, she says. I send. Night comes, she wears coat to party. To breakfast next morning, she's also wearing coat. Maybe eggs she's eating. 
to party Saturday and to cocktail Sunday also. Monday? Aha. My husband does not like court. I'm sending back, she says. Mink. Real tough, Mr. Stroganoff. You can never tell what people will do next. I, now, Dmitry Stroganov, can tell. Look, if you'll just answer a few questions... This morning, even as I arise, comes to me a feeling of doom. Yes. Yes. Well, now, about... Something is going to happen bad, I said to myself. And when I get here, no, no, even before I get here, I slip and fall. No, no, even before that, parking ticket for too long past. No, no, even before that. <laughs> He went on like that for quite a while. And the police stenographer took down every word. His whole testimony typed up into 23 single-spaced pages. But only the following was of any use. Stroganoff arrived at the store at approximately 8.45, found the vault door open and inside the wounded watchman Cronin. Also, the mink coat's gone. Stroganoff notified insurance company. Stroganoff notified police in that order. Expense account, item... One dollar and thirty-five cents for two ham sandwiches, two bottles of beer, all of which I shared with Lieutenant Delaney and Stroganoff's office. And all kinds of heists. Jewels, trucks, cars, banks. But this is the best so far. A real 14-carat double-breasted A number one dilly. That's what it is, Dollar. How'd they get in that safe? They just opened it up and walked in the same way you walk in your own front door, Lieutenant. Yeah, but how? Who's that good? Who? Well, there's the, the creepy kid. They always say he's that good. You and me both know Creepy died 12 years ago at Dunamore. And, uh, and there was Dancing Dan Marathon. Dancing Dan? He couldn't open a two-bit padlock if he had the key. Who is good, Johnny? Who could do it? I wish I knew. <sighs> Stroganoff's the only one in the stall who knows the combo. The only one. But I don't know. But you aren't taking any chances. Didn't I see two of you men tail him out of here? You bet your life you did. And by the way... Didn't you put in a call to your office and have him checked on? You bet your life I did. Eh, cop work. All the time we got... Delaney. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Richie. Well, give it to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Hospital, though. The night watchman? Cronin died ten minutes ago without saying a word. Mm -hmm. I was hoping he'd be able to fill in some gaps. Hmm. Well, he does. At least one. Which one? The other watchman's story about playing the radio. Yeah. What other watchman? Al Reedy. Oh, I'm sorry, Dollar. Maybe you passed him on. Well, tell me about him. Was he shot too? No, 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 no. We questioned him first thing this morning. You see, Cronin made the rounds, and Reedy held down the office. Reedy didn't know nothing about anything last night. He was listening to his radio in his office downstairs. What gap does that fill? And Doc says Cronin got it with a thirty-two. Not it fit. They don't make much noise, and a man leaning into a radio close. Reedy, huh? Well, where can I find him? Right here. He's waiting in the locker room. Why, right, do you want to talk to him? Yeah. Mind? Oh, help yourself, Dollar. Thanks. Oh, Dollar. Yeah? You're looking for $300,000 worth of mink coats. I'm looking for a killer. Don't be a wise guy when you do your poking around, huh? I'll, uh... I'll try to keep my nose clean, Lieutenant. Yeah? Hello. You Al Reedy? You another cop? In a way, yeah. In what way? Insurance investigator. All right, Mr. Insurance Investigator. Am I supposed to tell you something that'll tip the whole thing? No, Mr. Night Watchman. You're just supposed to tell me how things went for you last night. Swell. I sat in my office from ten to six, went home, went to bed... Got picked up by two big flat-footed coppers at 7.30. And here I am. How'd things go with you last night? You sound a little put out, Reedy. Or are you used to places being heisted where you work? What kind of a nasty crack is that? What'd you see in here last night while you were doing all your night watching? Nothing. No freight elevator moving? No. No sounds on the stairs? No. And you didn't hear the shots that plugged Cronin? No, I didn't. Why? Because I sit in my office and listen to disc jockeys. The radio's liable to smother a lot of noise. Wrong answer. Well, the cops like it. I don't. Give me a better one. I'll have to look for it. But I'll find it, mister. I'll show you. I'll show you. Will. But you'll never find those guys you tromped off of those coats last night. You sound awful sure of that. I am. Because you'll spend all your time on someone like me, trying to make something out of nothing, just to show everybody how good you are. 
Reedy, if you're clean, you haven't got anything to worry about. Well, maybe, but answer me this. Who's going to say when a guy's clean? When he's right or wrong? A lot of filing cabinets in a building somewhere? Answer me, investigator. Who knows? Who's going to say? Ah, uh, let me alone. Just let me alone. <laughs> I didn't know what to make of Al Reedy, but I did know I wanted to know more about him. At the personnel office, I pulled out his application card. It looked good enough, and then I suddenly put it back. I had a hunch, and I headed for the Middleton Safe Company. The president and chief designer of the Middleton Safe Company was standing under a blue light in the center of a newly completed vault. He seemed lost in the huge room of shiny, gleaming metal all around him. Uh, please excuse me for not receiving you in my office, Mr. Dollar. Inspection day? <laughs> yes, something like that. Now, this one, this is what I call the big haze. Beautiful, isn't she? Completed a fortnight ago for a firm of South American bankers. You work on the safes and vaults yourself, Mr. Middleton. Indeed I do. The drama of it captured me as a youth. To compose and weld and conform metal into an impregnable stronghold. Oh, it's fascinating, huh? Yes, yes, of course. Fine metal, case-hardened, perfectly alloyed Ohio steel. Strength, Mr. Dollar. Strength. But then I bore you, sir. <laughs> and now then, why are we meeting? So you can tell me something about safes and vaults, Mr. Middleton. Oh, I dare say I could, sir. But I'm afraid you'll have to be more specific. All right. Tell me, tell me about the kind of vault you manufactured for the Elwood Faber department store. A vault for... Oh, yes, 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 the fur vault. Oh, yes, of course. What precisely do you wish to know about that vault? How someone could open it without knowing the combination. Oh, an impossible occurrence. Have you read the morning papers? Papers? What about them? That particular vault was opened last night and all the furs taken. Yeah, well, what do you say? Looted? Well, that's impossible. It happened. That's why I'm here. Yeah, this is quite a... Sh oh, dear me, Mr. Dollar. Of course, you'll want a thorough account from my organization. Of course. And I shall be glad to furnish you with any information that might be helpful. I'd like to know how the combination was set and who knows it. But I'd have to know the serial numbers on that particular vault. Yeah, try these. Oh, well, you're a very efficient man, Mr. Dollar. I see you've jotted them down. Well, let's go up to my office and look them up. Oh, no, 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 sir. That won't be necessary. I recognize these serials. D... Four, five, three, six. Oh, D. Oh, D stands for Dana. And uh, Mr. Dana set the final combination. Mr. Dana? Uh, my chief engineer for years. And who else besides him would know it? Myself and the person in proper authority at Elwood Faber, of course. Well, that would be strong enough. Anyone else here? No, sir. I'd like to talk to Mr. Dana, then. Well, I'm afraid that's quite impossible, sir. Oh? Albert Dana has been dead for seven years. Up to and including that point, I had a whole lot of nothing to go on. But by the time I got back to Boylston Street, heading for my hotel, things began to happen. A police car pulled up at the curb, and a familiar Stetson on top of a familiar head leaned out of the window. Hey, Dollar, you. Yeah, hello, Delaney. Hop in. Just come by to get you. I, uh, thought you might be interested in a guy. What guy? No one we found floating down the Charles River an hour ago. Who is he? I don't know. But it looked like he's got the same enemies as a night watchman named Cronin. Huh? Yeah. There were two thirty-two slugs in him. We wouldn't have picked it so fast, only that's the second pair been through ballistics in one day. And they match? Like your two front teeth. The same gun killed the night watchman and the guy in the river. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, it's a family night on the Bing Crosby Show again this Wednesday. Brother Bob and Bing's son Gary already have scored with the Groner this month. And tomorrow night, Bing's 14-year-old twins, Philip and Dennis, make their debut as a guest team. You'll hear the kids trying to sell Dad a membership in the Bing Crosby Fan Club, a scheme that backfires. And you'll hear some rare and wonderful singing. CBS cordially invites you to hear the Bing Crosby Show... This Wednesday and every Wednesday, over most of these same CBS stations. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. I spent half the 
night at the city morgue and police headquarters with Lieutenant Delaney, examining the body they found in the Charles River and trying to identify him. All the labels were ripped out of his clothes and the laundry marks were cut off. We were left with just his physical characteristics and fingerprints. The mug file didn't duplicate him, and the prints didn't check with anything in town. So they sent them to the FBI in Washington. I got to my hotel at 4 a.m. to get some sleep, and I got it. Three of the shortest hours worth I ever had. Dollar? I'll tell her when he comes in. This is Ed Bonner, Johnny. How would you like to be fired? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, Mr. Bonner, sir. Uh, 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 what can I do for you? Turn up with 85 mink coats. What have you been doing since yesterday? Sleeping? Uh... Bonner, I've I've run my legs down to my knees. Honest, I I've been trying to find out something, anything. I, I I've peeked into so many corners. I've I've got television eyes. And I've got a weak heart. Unless we find those first in twenty four hours, we have to pay off Elwood Faber three hundred thousand dollars. Well, what are you going to do? Take it out of my pay? If we have to. We'll start by selling your body to a medical school. Please, Johnny, do something. Ooh. Bonner, what's Elwood Faber's financial position? Triple A. Couldn't be better. They wouldn't steal him. How about the fur man, Stroganoff? He's always had money. Family. All right, Bonner. I'll keep after it. I'll call you when I get something. Johnny, don't take my shouting personally, but this is a big one. Give it everything you've got. I forced myself to get out of bed, take a shower, and get my clothes on. I started for the door and had no idea where I was going. Aha, Mr. Dollar. When somebody did my thinking for me. To see you personally, I, Stroganoff, maestro of the Elwood paper for department, am here. Do you have any news? News? Every paper in the country it should hit twice. Never in my 30 years of association with that foul little beast, the mink, has anything like this happened. What happened? You wouldn't believe me. Look, I'm pretty gullible. Well, it's incredible. I don't blame you for not believing me. Are we going to keep up this game, or do you tell me? Don't get huffy with Stroganoff. I will tell you. This morning, wrapped in dirty cardboard box, is arriving at the fur department. Guess what? A mean coat. Incredible? Incredible indeed. You mean one of the coats was returned by mail? Right. Well, that's, that's encouraging. I am not overjoyed. You still owe me for 84 coats. <laughs> Item, $1.90 for cab fare to Elwood Faber. It didn't make any sense that the men or man who committed murder to make the heist would return anything. But one coat had come back. And in the pocket, I found a small piece of slick cardboard. It was only a third of an inch long, but there were three words on it. Country Club Dance. I was lucky. The country club secretary had a guest list, and one name on it stuck out like the nose on Jimmy Durante. Patricia Reedy. Yes? Oh, Miss Reedy? Yes. Who, who are you? My name's Johnny Dollar. Your uh, father is employed at Elwood Faber, isn't he? That's right, but I... Is he in now? Oh, he's probably in bed. May I help you? Well, I don't know. I, uh, I saw you at the country club dance the other night. Oh, were you there? Oh, I couldn't keep my eyes off you. Especially, especially when you had that mink coat on. Oh, the mink? Well, I... I want to talk with this guy, Pat. Well, what do you want, Dollar? Some information. Uh, Patty, will you make some coffee or something? All right, Dave. Anything else? Oh, nothing I can't handle. Okay, Dollar, what are you doing here? Who asked you into my house? My job. I came to find out about a mink coat that showed up at Elwood Faber this morning. Look, uh, let's go out in the hall and talk. Okay. All right, Reedy, let's hear it. Now, don't go into a long song and dance. I'll tell you everything. Just the way it was. And I'd be real interested. The way I figure it, you helped in the theft. You maybe even killed Cronin. You kept one of the coats, but you got scared you might be caught with it, so you sent it back. Your daughter left the dance ticket in the pocket. All right. Here's the story right down the line. I didn't help in the heist. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't even know what was happening. Like I told you, I was in my office listening to the radio. Tell me, Reedy. Ever been arrested? Well, Dollar, you're smart enough to find it out sooner or later. I serve time, sure. Might as well know. Lots of them. Elwood Faber would be interested to know a trusted watchman served time. Well, what'd you expect me to do when I got out? Curl up and die? I gotta live, too. I'm straight now. I... Well, almost. I had a wife and a kid. A wife died. You've seen the kid in there. For Thirteen years of her life, she had nothing. But now I'm trying to make up for that. Everything I do is for her, not for me. 
What about the coat? Sure, I took it. I borrowed it. Before the safe was locked up for the night. I've been borrowing stuff right along. Whenever my kid needed anything. I always return them in good shape. Told Pat they let me do it. She don't know nothing. That's kind of a strange philosophy. I don't even know how to spell philosophy. But I do know this. That girl in there has a life ahead of her. Her mind's behind me. I got to give her every chance I can to look good, to act good, to use her brains, to meet the right people and go to the right places. Not just for dough, you understand. A millionaire husband. But just for a right guy and a, and a fair crack at happiness. Uh-huh. Ah, oh, you guys are all the same. You work from a little book, printed directions. Everything's black and white in life. Nobody's human. Oh, well, that's that. I don't know what you're going to do. But I hope it don't blast that kid's life to pieces. Reedy, you should have thought of this a long time ago. I don't want any lectures. You'll shut up and you'll listen to me. I think I believe you. You're right. Maybe we do work from printed directions a little too much. Well, I can use a little judgment on my job. I think, for now, I'll forget everything you've told me. And forget where that coat came from. Go on back to bed. Go on, Reedy. Well, I didn't expect that from you, Dollar. Reedy, I know what bad breaks are like, too. Oh, I... 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 Oh, come on, come on. Look, you'll, you'll have me doing that in a minute. Hey, Dollar. I don't go in for this stool pigeon stuff. I never have. But now I see it another way. It doesn't matter what you tell as long as you tell it to the right guy. What does that mean? I'm going to give you something. It'll take them at least 24 hours to identify the guy they found on the Charles River. Picture in the paper this morning. Well, I can tell you right now who he is. Who? Who is he? Ted Gray. Worked in Elwood Faber about six weeks. Was fired two weeks ago. How do you know? Oh, I, I just know. Personnel at Elwood Faber confirmed Ted Gray had worked there and was fired for insubordination. His address was 1432 Parkhurst Avenue, and I was over there in 15 minutes. It was an ordinary, undistinguished apartment house. No one answered when I knocked at apartment 12A. But the door was unlocked. Except for the furniture, the room had almost nothing to offer. I poked around for half an hour before I saw the phone numbers written on the wallpaper next to the phone. There were 14 numbers, and I started calling them right down the line. The first seven produced such things as Ling Chi Chinese Hand Laundry, the Happy Hour Liquor Store, and several other things that didn't have the particular information I needed. On the eighth call, I got the Hello? Is Harry there? Uh, Harry? Uh, Harry who? Harry Gordon. But I'm sorry. You must have the wrong number. Oh. Sorry. That's quite all right. Maybe he didn't know Harry, but I knew him. At least his voice. I called Lieutenant Delaney and told him where I was going. It was dark by the time I got to the Middleton Safe Factory. There was a single work light spreading a sickly yellow glow over the main floor of the loading platform. There wasn't a sound when I entered... That was too good to last. I went off somewhere in the darkness, and I dropped behind a medium-sized safe and waited for a gun flash. Dollar! Johnny Dollar! What are you doing here? Looking for 84 mink coats, Middleton. I thought that was you on the phone, Dollar. How much money do you miss? Not much, but save your breath. You're going to need it to run. A man of your talents could do a lot in South America. With a hundred thousand and a business... I could never remember all those Spanish verbs. Thanks. Have you got anybody coming? Lots of people, Middleton. Lots. If I hit you, how'd I know you weren't a burglar? You know, I'll never give up. And you'll have to shoot better than that. Ah, uh, you missed me ten feet. Oh, my windage screw is off. Is that the thirty-two you used on Ted Gray? No. This time I have a Luger. Special work. I can fix that. Oh. That Luger didn't help you much, Middleton. That's an ignominious thing. Yeah. You blew a good light. I could never find what I wanted. Look, I know why you kicked the watchman over, but why your own boy, Gray? He was in on this deal with me, but held out a coat for him. Uh-uh. That shows you how wrong you can be. It wasn't Ted Gray. 
You see, Middleton? Oh. Dollar! Over this way. Yeah, you've been shooting up the town, Dollar. Now, what's this? Jessup K. Middleton, he's your boy. Yeah, boy, for what? For the fur heist and the bodies at the morgue. Uh, how do you know? Well, there's a safe full of furs on its way to South America somewhere. If you hurry, you might stop it at the port of New York. Well, why would he kill the guy in the river? And who was that guy? Ted Gray. He was the man who cased the Elwood Favor job. He reported 85 coats ready to go. And when only 84 showed up, Middleton thought he was holding back on him. Oh, well, okay, Johnny. Thanks for doing all the work. I was just lucky, Delaney. Yeah, you sure were. You could have been hit where it hurt worse. Come on, let's have the ambulance doctor look at that shoulder. This is the only way to live. Miss Reedy, you... Make it. Pat. Pat. Hmm. You know, you're great on your feet. Well, what about you, Johnny? Dancing with your arm in a sling. Well, I, uh, I took the no-hands course at Arthur Murray's. <laughs> Pardon me, Mr. Dollar. There's a phone call at your table. Oh, thanks, waiter. Come on, Pat. Johnny Dollar. At Bonner, Dollar. Bonner? Uh-uh. I won't take another job for at least a week. No, it's not that. Well, what is it? Are you afraid I'll put a night out on the swindle sheet? You aren't finished. Not finished? Hey, you got the coats, didn't you? Yeah, we found the safe down at the dock. Caught it just before it was loaded for South America. There were 84 coats in it, all right. But you know the one that was sent back in the mail? It's been stolen again. One still missing. Oh, really? Oh, oh that. Oh, Yeah. Well, you know, Bonner, somehow I, uh, I have a feeling that last coat will be in the mail tomorrow. Are you sure? Positive. So long, Mr. Bonner. So long, Johnny. Who was it? Who? Oh, nobody important. You know something, Pat? You look just grand and mink. Well, the coat did show up the next day and in the mail. Maybe she'll have one of her own someday. Me? I stuck around Beantown for a few days to get a better look at, at the Bunker Hill Monument, Paul Revere's home, and her deep blue eyes, which uh, which began hinting at wedding bells. So, expense account item, eleven seventy five back home, but fast. Expense account total, $384.16. Yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and was written tonight by E. Jack Newman and John Michael Hayes with music by Leith Stevens. Featured in our cast were Harry Bartell, Joseph Kearns, Hans Conried, Bill Johnstone, Howard McNear, and Gloria Blondell. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Join us next week when Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. If you've got a piece of string handy, you better tie it around your fingers so you won't forget to file your income tax return. The deadline is March 15th, you know, and March 15th is right at hand. So to avoid penalties, file your returns promptly, but don't be in such a hurry that you forget to sign your name or attach your withholding statement. Now stay tuned for The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you meet Gene Autry every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> WBBM FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Is this Joe Benson? You call me? Oh yeah, Lieutenant. I'm from Federal Underwriters. 
Loan away from Hartford? Yeah. They sent me to get a report on the National Savings and Loan holdup. Oh, I see. How's the watchman? Well, he died about a half hour ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Shot three times. Hardly had a chance. Did he ever regain consciousness? Yes. Long enough to give us a make on one of the four guys who heisted the place. Oh, well, that's something. Look, uh, if you want a report, you better come on down and get it firsthand. I'll be there in ten minutes, Lieutenant. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Federal Underwriters Incorporated, 223 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Dameron matter. Expense account item one, $240, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to San Francisco. I arrived ten hours after the news of the National Savings and Loan holdup reached the office. Lieutenant Benson was waiting for me when I got to the city hall. Yeah, you're just in time, Dollar. My men picked up Bernie Manners a few minutes ago. He's down the hall. Manners? He the one you got an identification on? Yes. Watchman looked at some mugs we pulled from the files and spotted him right away. Said Manners was one of the four men who did the job. Oh, it's quick work. Uh, Shall we go on down? Yeah, sure. What about this, Manners? Well, he's a two-time loser... 25 arrests on his card. All the way from narcotics violation to armed robbery. We'll see what he has to say before we check out his mama sheet. How'd they get him? When the watchman made him while we put out an APB. One of the units spotted him because he was going into a saloon. Uh, This way. Oh. Have any trouble? No. They uh, find anything on him? Two dollars and 40 cents. No gun, nothing. You, uh, you got a smoke? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm fresh out. Yeah, here you go. Oh, thanks. Well, uh, what do you think of our weather out here? Oh, pretty nice, pretty nice. We're still having snow. <laughs> I haven't been east in 13 years. Forgotten what it looks like. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I didn't have nothing to do with nothing. This matters? Yeah. Sergeant Friedman, Johnny Dollar. Hi. Hi. Hello, Bernie. Hello, Lieutenant. Well, let's have it. Of what? A story on the National Savings and Loan Job. I don't know anything about the National Savings and Loan Job. Four men walked in there about midnight last night, shot the watchman, cracked the safes, and got away with $65,000. Now you know about it? I don't know anything. What are you guys trying to hang on me? Where were you last night, Bernie? When last night? Between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock? I was in my room, sleeping. Can you prove you were sleeping last night in your room? Who can prove that we're sleeping? In a lane, ladies, somebody like that. I don't know. What do you know? Huh? How about the national savings job? Nothing. I don't know nothing. Look, Bernie, you can make this thing a whole lot easier. I can? Now, who worked it with you? Who were the other three men in on it? Oh, come on, Bernie. You were always pretty good at talking. I'm not going to tell you anything. I don't have anything to tell you. How are you making a living these days? What? What do you do for a living? 
Oh, I've been driving a truck up to last week. Yeah? Where? Coast trucking outfit. Did you quit? I was fired. Why? I got in a beef with the boss. Check that. Yeah. Lieutenant Benson and Sergeant Friedman continued to question the suspect. He refused to admit any part in the burglary of the National Savings and Loan Company or to name any people who were connected with it. An hour went by. He still refused to talk. Two hours. Uh, I'm getting tired. So am I. All of us are tired, Bernie. Now, look, why don't you open your face so we can get some rest? I have told you I didn't have anything to say. <sighs> Who's this joker? Me? My name's Dollar, Bernie. I'm from the insurance company. What's he doing here? Worrying about you and your friends. <laughs> you don't have to worry about me, Dollar. I'll try not to. I uh, thought maybe you was a lawyer. Do I get to see a lawyer? What do you want to see a lawyer for? To get out of here, that's why. You aren't getting out of here, Bernie, you know that. Uh... Now, tell us all about it. Come on, Bernie, you know it's all over. We got enough to take you into court right now. Uh, don't give me that. Uh -huh. Don't you believe it? No. Hand me that. Yeah, sure. There you go. Thanks. You know what this is, Bernie? No. It's a notarized statement from the watchman that was killed. His name was Fuller. I talked to him just before he died. You know what this says? It says that you were one of the four men who robbed the National Savings and Loan Company last night. Listen. Me. Please state your full name. Him. Henry Fuller. Me. Where do you live? Him. 235 22nd Avenue. Me. I understand that you are seriously hurt. Is that true? Him. Yes. Me. Do you believe that you are about to die from injuries you have received? Him. Yes. Me. Have you any hope of recovery from the effects of these injuries? Him. No. Listen, I... Shut up, Bernie, and listen. Me. Who caused the injuries from which you are suffering? Him. One of the robbers. Me. Is this a picture of one of the men who caused your injuries? Him. Yes. He was looking at a mugshot of you, Bernie. There were four witnesses in that hospital room when Fuller made this statement. It's a positive identification on you. Well? Can I have a glass of water? Later, maybe. Who were the other men? I don't know what you're talking about. Questioning went on. Another hour passed. Everybody got pretty tired. Manners still admitted nothing. It was the usual method of interrogation. Hammer away. Hammer away. Sooner or later, he'd spill something important. Lieutenant Benson knew his job. Once more, Bernie. Who were the other men? For the 20th time, there were no other men. There were four of you, Bernie. Why didn't we play bridge? Tell us what you did all day yesterday. What? Start with from the time you got up. I try to remember. Yeah, we're all interested. Well, what is this? Go on, Bernie. Tell it. Well, I got up about ten. I fooled around all day, and I got to bed early. Very nice. What do you want me to tell you? What you did all day, who you were with, where you went. Oh, it's... And after you tell us that, you can tell us how you worked on the National Savings and Loan Office. I'll tell you nothing, nothing. All right, what's your name? What? What's your name? Bernie Manish, you know my name. Where do you live? I told you. Tell us your address. 2020 Army Street. Who worked with you? Nobody, nobody. Yeah, just a minute. Vince? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that'll do it. Yeah. That was about you, Bernie. What about me, Lieutenant? What about me? 
Guess what the crime lab found tucked behind one of the cushions in the front seat of your car. Oh. Twenty thousand dollars, Bernie. You didn't hide it very well. I didn't think you'd be looking. Did you use your car? Yeah. Who were the others? Eddie Page, Jack Ivers. One more. You're the guy was called Chick. I didn't know him. Chick one. Just Chick. He figured the whole thing. Uh, who contacted you? Eddie. He put me in on. But Chick ran it. Where can we get hold of Chick? I don't know. Now, what about ADP? I don't know. Jack Ivers. No. It won't do you any good to lie now. Buddy. I'm not lying. I just don't know where you can get hold of any of them. Now, what'd you do after the job? Well, we all got in my car and beat it. I let them off near the Fairmont. All three of them? Yeah. That way you split the money? No, we did that before we left the loan company. Look, I, I'm, I'm tired. Now, one more thing. Who shot Fuller? This chick. Are you sure? Well, he was the only one who had a gun. Sure, I'm sure. Why'd they shoot him? I couldn't figure that myself. We're all leaving the place. The watchman was all tied up and it was no trouble. Chick walked over, stuck the gun in his back and let him have it. Bernie Manners gave us a description of the man known only as Chick. It was pretty much the same as the description given by the watchman. A check through the moniker files revealed a possible 23 persons who answered the general description and background of Chick. Manners was shown a picture of each one. Couldn't identify any of them. I went back to my hotel and went to bed. The next morning, I was with Lieutenant Benson. They checked the slugs taken from Fuller's Barney. Any luck? Now, they came from a forty-five automatic revolver. Looks like it might be a Colt. Well, that checks with what Manners said. Yeah, but nothing in our files on the gun itself. Manners is in the mug room now. If this chick ever did time in any California prison, we'll have him on file. The hard way, huh? Hard case. Man's been killed. What about the other two, Page and Ivers? Ivers was released from San Quentin three months ago. The parole office gave us an address for him on Turk Street. Quinlan Friedman went out there, but the people who run the rooming house say Ivers hasn't been around for two days. I've got the place staked out. What was he in San Quentin for? Grand Theft Auto. Did four years. That the only time he fell? Mm-hmm. Page has had a little more experience. He's older than Manners or Ivers. He's a two-time loser. Both convictions were for armed robbery. Police in Denver wanted for questioning, too. Any leads on him? No local address. He has a sister who lives in Eureka. Police there are talking to him. Should be getting something pretty soon. Communication's been broadcasting this every 30 minutes all night long. I left Lieutenant Benson so I could talk with the auditors who'd been working with the people at National Savings and Trust. By that time, they determined that $68,000 had been taken in the robbery. I spoke to the claims adjuster who'd flown in from Hartford and the officials of the company. I explained the situation with the police and the recovery of $20,000 of the stolen money. They agreed to suspend their claim pending the arrest of the other three suspects and the possible recovery of the entire loot. Expense account item two, ten cents, phone call. I checked with Lieutenant Benson about four o'clock. Hi. Hi. You're just in time. We got a lead on page. Oh, yeah? 1485 Clare Street. I'll meet you out in front. Right. Expense account item three, $1.35. Cab fare to the address on Clare Street. Hi. Hi. In there? Yeah. You want to be in on this? If it's all right with you. Okay. Friedman's covering the back entrance. Quinlan's in the lobby. Let's go. Hey. How'd you get it? The Eureka police talked to Paige's sister. Said she'd been writing him here under the name of Ernest Lawyers. Oh. Uh, want to take it over there? Yeah. Who's there? They're looking for Mr. Lawyers. You, Mr. Lawyers? Yeah. What do you want? Package. Who from? Well, it's, uh... Mrs. William Redding. Eureka, California. I have to sign for it. Okay. You want to see I... You alone, Page? <laughs> Who are you? Police. Get your hat. Come on, let's go. Want to take a look over there, Donald? Yeah. 
What is this? Bernie Manners spilled it all. Look out. He's got a gun. Drop that page. Oh, good, mister. Why, you lousy cut. All right. All right. Come on, get up. Put your hands out. All right, let's go, Paige. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Sergeants Quinlan and Friedman took the suspect, Eddie Page, downtown. I drove over to the emergency hospital with Lieutenant Benson where they patched up the cut in his temple where Page had slugged him with his gun. After that, we returned to headquarters. Sergeant Friedman met us outside the interrogation room. How do you feel, Joe? Oh, headache. And what about him? Real quiet so far. Mm, fine. We went over the apartment. Now, you'll be happy about this, Dollar. More money? 15000 stuck in his suitcase. Mm, your insurance company's doing well so far. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see about Tough Boy. Remember me? I remember both of you. How's your head? I'll get over it. How's your chin? I'd like to get at you again. Kind of like to get at you. That's all he's been saying ever since he landed. You're tied in with Bernie Manners and Jack Ivers on this thing, Page. Am I? Yeah. And that's enough for us. I suppose you're going to send me to prison. I suppose we are. <laughs> Some talk. Who's Chick? Chick? The other guy. I don't know. Where's Ivers? I don't know. Bernie had to stay in here six hours. How long are you going to take, Paige? As long as you like. We've got all the time in the world. So have I. You know, we found your cut of the job in your room. Bernie's already told us about you. You're not going to admit anything, huh? Why should I? Man was killed on that job. As a murder charge to go along with everything else. Do tell. You can make it easy on yourself, Paige. <laughs> Easier for you. Okay. That's the way you want it. Friedman. Yeah. You and Quinlan stay with this bird. Stay with him if it takes all night and all day and all night. I want to see how long he can last. Well, now okay. You're... Come on, darling. Well, what now? I'm hungry. Spence account item four, six dollars and thirty-five cents. Drinks and dinner for Lieutenant Benson and myself. After eating, we returned to the interrogation room and the questioning of the suspect, Eddie Page. Although he knew there was enough evidence against him to make a burglary and homicide charge stick, he still refused to admit his part in the burglary or to give us the full name of the man known simply as Chick. <laughs> About 10 o'clock that night, a man who ran a drugstore on Geary Street telephoned that he thought he might have some information that would help. I drove over there with Lieutenant Benson. Foggy. Yeah, sure is. Hey, 
Oh, good evening. Can I help you, please? Uh, we'd like to talk to Mr. Smith. Yeah. Oh, you're the police? Well, I'm Smith. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Benson. This is Mr. Dollar. Uh, how do you do? You said you had something that might help, Mr. Smith? Indeed I do, Mr. Dollar. Indeed I do. I read all about the burglary in the papers yesterday, and, well, I have this. Hmm. A bill wrapper from National Savings and Loan. Yes. Now, where'd you get this, Mr. Smith? I found it on the floor, right here in the store. You know who dropped it? Uh, yes, I think so. Who? Well, a man who was in here earlier. I think he dropped it. What did he look like? Well, he, he was tall. He was kind of husky. Oh, he was about 35 years old, I'd say. He wore kind of a dark hat and a trench coat. You ever seen him in here before? No, just tonight. What did he buy, Mr. Smith? Quite a few things. Well, like what? Well, three bottles of scotch. And some mixer, and some ice, and some cigarettes. Uh-huh, I see. Oh, when did you find the wrapper? Uh, right after he paid me for the things. What size bill did he give you? It was a 50. You still have it? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, could we look at it, please? Well, surely, yes, this way. Here you are. Thanks. No, huh? Brand new. Uh, did you happen to notice if he left in a car, Mr. Smith? No, he was on foot. When I found the wrapper on the floor and then remembered the newspaper story, I ran outside to take a look to see which direction he went. He walked right across the street. Do you mean he might possibly live around here? I think so. Like, uh, like right there, you see? He went into the Alden Hotel. How long ago was this? Oh, my, that was not over 15 minutes ago. Hey! What? That, that's him, just coming out on the street there. Get back. Can you see his face? No, no, not yet. Is he one of the men you're looking for? I don't know yet. Sounds like it. Lieutenant. Yeah? Take a look. Jack Ivers. Let's go. Uh, you. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, call downtown. Hey, you. Hold it up just a minute. He's going for the alley. Yeah. Ducked right in there, I think. Yeah. Be careful, Johnny. Okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Throw out the gun, Ivers. You don't have a chance. Down! Yeah. He's gonna try for that fence down there. Yeah, let's go. You can't see us in the shadows. And he made the fence. Yeah, come on. See anything? Oh, too dark. Somewhere in here. Hey. Over there? Yeah. Anything? No. The apartment house. The one in the back door. Yeah. Get down. You okay? Okay. Ivers! This is your last chance! He'll get hurt if we don't stop him. That did it. What's it look like? Oh, he's done for. Well, I better phone in. Jack Ivers, one of the suspects connected with the burglary of the National Savings and Loan Office, died instantly while attempting to escape arrest. While we waited for the coroner's men to arrive, we searched his body and found $12,000 of the stolen money concealed in a money belt around his waist. I accompanied Lieutenant Benson to the Alden Hotel, where we learned from the desk clerk that Ivers had checked in the previous day using the name of David Ward. The clerk said that he shared the room with a man who'd registered as Charles Daly. Daly was still in the room, as far as the clerk knew. We went upstairs. Well, this is Chick. It's been a good day's work. Yeah. Uh, 210. Yeah. Here we go. Could have sneaked out. Uh, let's find out. Well, well, I 
I'll be. <laughs> Drunk? As you can get. <laughs> That's the way I like to pick them up. Quiet. The man passed out in the hotel room was identified as Chester Dameron, Toledo, Ohio. A check with authorities there revealed he had a criminal record covering 17 years. His nickname was Chick. Along with Eddie Page and Bernie Manners, he was indicted on charges of burglary and murder. The remainder of the stolen money was found in his hotel room. All told, 99 and 39 one hundredths percent of the loot was recovered, excepting what Ivor spent for whiskey. Pretty good for federal underwriters. Expense account item five, $63.30. Miscellaneous while in San Francisco. Item six, same as one. My plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Total expense account, $551.10. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar... Brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role, and was written by E. Jack Newman, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Bill Johnstone, Clayton Post, Bill Conrad, Peter Leeds, and Howard McNear. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Many of the war orphans of Korea are dying of starvation and exposure. Without your help, they cannot live. We can send them food through CARE, the American Package Sending Relief Agency. One $10 CARE food package will feed four children for a month. Send your contribution to CARE's local office or to CARE New York or CARE Los Angeles. This is the CBS.